This is Audible. Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. By Hannah Arendt, introduction by Amos Elon. Narrated by Wanda McCadden. Copyright 1963-1964 by Hannah Arendt. Copyright renewed 1991-1992 by Lottie Kohler. Introduction copyright 2006 by Amos Elon. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Penguin Group USA Incorporated and was produced in the year 2011 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Introduction The Excommunication of Hannah Arendt In December 1966, Isaiah Berlin, the prominent philosopher and historian of ideas, was the guest of his friend Edmund Wilson, the well-known American man of letters. An entry in Wilson's diary mentions an argument between the two men. Berlin gets violent, sometimes irrational prejudice against people, Wilson noted, for example against Hannah Arendt, although he has never read her book about Eichmann. In a memoir in the Yale Review in 1987, Berlin made exactly the same charge against Wilson and elaborated upon this in a 1991 interview with the editor of Wilson's diary. We don't know the outcome of this quarrel. One thing we do know. More than three years after the publication of Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil first appeared in print, the civil war it had launched among intellectuals in the United States and in Europe was still seething. Describing the debate that raged through his own and other families in New York, Anthony Grafton later wrote that no subject had fascinated and aroused such concern and serious discussion as the series of articles Hannah Arendt had published in The New Yorker about the Eichmann trial and the book that grew out of them. Three years after the publication of the book, people were still bitterly divided over it. No book within living memory had elicited similar passions. A kind of excommunication seemed to have been imposed on the author by the Jewish establishment in America. The controversy has never really been settled. Such controversies often die down, simmer, and then erupt again. It is perhaps no accident that at this time of a highly controversial war in Iraq, Arendt's books are still widely read, and that even though close to 300,000 copies of her book on Eichmann alone have so far been sold, this new edition is now published by Penguin. Eichmann in Jerusalem continues to attract new readers and interpreters in Europe, too. In Israel, where the Holocaust was long seen as simply the culmination of a long, unbroken line of anti-Semitism, from Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar to Hitler and Arafat, and David Ben-Gurion, the architect of the 1960 show trial, wanted it that way, the growing interest among young people in this book suggests a search for a different view. A new Hebrew translation was recently published to considerable acclaim. In the past, the difficulty of many Israelis to accept Arendt's book ran parallel to another difficulty, foreseen by Arendt early on, the difficulty of confronting, morally and politically, the plight of the dispossessed Palestinians. The Palestinians bore no responsibility for the collapse of civilization in Europe, but ended up being punished for it. In Europe, the collapse of communist totalitarianism contributed to the renewed interest in Arendt's work. Interest was further kindled by the publication in the past several years of Arendt's voluminous correspondence with Karl Jaspers, Mary McCarthy, Hermann Broch, Kurt Blumenfeld, Martin Heidegger, and her husband Heinrich Blücher. All bear witness to a rare capacity for friendship, intellectual and affectionate. Arendt's correspondence with Blücher is the record also of the intense, lifelong conversation of a marriage that, for two hunted fugitives, was a safe haven in dark times. It still seems to me unbelievable that I could achieve both a great love and a sense of identity with my own person, she wrote Blücher in 1937, in what is one of the most remarkable love letters of the twentieth century. And yet I achieved the one only since I also have the other— I also now finally know what happiness is. The letters shed a fascinating light on her thinking and on some of the intimate feelings that went into the making of Eichmann in Jerusalem. You were the only reader to understand what otherwise I have never admitted, she wrote Mary McCarthy, namely that I wrote this book in a curious state of euphoria. Like Arendt's biography, Rachel Farnhagen, The Life of a Jewish Woman, written before her emigration to the United States, 
Eichmann in Jerusalem was an intensely personal work. The writing helped give her relief from a heavy burden. As she wrote Mary McCarthy, it was a cura posterior, the delayed cure of a pain that weighed upon her as a Jew, a former Zionist, and a former German. The main thesis of Eichmann in Jerusalem was summed up, not very felicitously, in its subtitle. It is odd and sometimes mind-boggling to follow the overheated debates of four decades ago. Irving Howe claimed in his memoirs that the polemic in America was partly due to feelings of guilt, pervasive and unmanageable, yet seldom until then emerging into daylight. For this reason, Howe thought something good came out of the confrontation with Arendt. Some of the accusations voiced against the style and tone of the first version of her book, as published in The New Yorker, were well-founded and were excised in the book. For example, her description of Leo Beck as the Jewish Führer. Others were patently false. For example, it was claimed that Arendt had exonerated Eichmann but condemned the Jews. She had done nothing of the sort. Nor had she assaulted the entire court proceeding, as was frequently claimed. She only attacked the melodramatic rhetoric of the state prosecutor. She supported the death sentence, as meted out by the court, but would have preferred a differently formulated verdict. Contrary to frequent accusations, she never questioned the legitimacy of a trial in Israel by Israeli judges. Nor did she, as was frequently maintained, make the victims responsible for their slaughter by their failure to resist. In fact, she bitterly attacked the state prosecutor who had dared make such a heartless claim. Still, this accusation even found its way into the Encyclopedia Judaica. In a similar vein, she was falsely accused of having claimed that Eichmann was an enthusiastic convert to Zionism and even to Judaism. Hand-me-downs from one critic to another drew on alleged references in the book, which no one seemed to have checked. The argument was by no means restricted to academic circles, but exercised young and old historians, philosophers, journalists, as in the case of Grafton's father, priests of several faiths, atheists, community functionaries, and professional propagandists. The attacks were often intensely personal. Many published reviews were serious, meticulously documented, fair, and well-reasoned. Others were clannish, full of personal invective, and of a surprisingly hackneyed intellectual level of mean personal innuendo. The book undoubtedly seems less controversial now than forty years ago, as new generations of scholars take a fresh, less partisan look also on Arendt's other writings on Jewish history, Israel, and Zionism. Eichmann in Jerusalem is best read today in conjunction with these other essays. Most were published long before Eichmann in publications some of them now defunct, like Menorah Journal, the New York German language refugee weekly Aufbau, the Review of Politics, the Jewish Frontier, and Jewish Social Studies. They spell out a conviction, which in Eichmann is for the most part only implied, that like other 19th century nationalisms, Zionism had already outlived the conditions from which it emerged and ran the risk of becoming, as Arendt once put it, a living ghost amid the ruins of our times. A decade or so earlier, she had still been an ardent disciple of the German Zionist leader Kurt Blumenfeld, the father of post-assimilationist Zionism, an advocate of compromise with the Palestinians, either territorial or through establishing a joint secular binational state. At the time of writing Eichmann in Jerusalem, she'd all but despaired of this, and bleakly foresaw decades of war and bloody Palestinian-Israeli clashes. In the 1930s, she anticipated her criticism in Eichmann of the ghetto Judenrata by opposing the transfer of goods agreement between the Zionists and the Nazis, an agreement that enabled German Jews to transfer some of their frozen assets to Palestine at a highly punitive exchange rate, but ran counter to an attempted worldwide Jewish boycott of German goods. The Zionists for whom emigration to Palestine was the overwhelmingly important priority, justified this violation as a dialectical necessity. By this time, Arendt had little patience left for all Weltanschauungen. She became more and more disillusioned with official Zionist policy in Palestine because of its failure to achieve a peaceful modus vivendi with the Arab population. She foresaw the spread of religious and nationalist fundamentalism among Israelis. These warnings seemed at the time as provocative as her book on the Eichmann trial. She argued on both moral and pragmatic grounds 
insisting that Israelis must share power and or territory with Palestinian Arabs. In retrospect, her warnings displayed considerable foresight. Today's readers may be more willing to accept both her essays and her book on Eichmann on their merits. This was certainly not the case when Eichmann first came out. Most Jewish readers and many others were outraged. Friendships broke over it. Not long before, Israeli diplomats had successfully convinced the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith that criticism of Zionism or Israel was a form of anti-Semitism. Some of the published attacks on Arendt's book are astonishing in their unbridled vehemence. In Israel, the reaction was more complicated and the criticism was muted compared to the reaction in America. Outrage was much less pronounced, perhaps because on a first reading, Arendt's critique of Jewish communal leaders in Nazi-occupied Europe appeared to confirm Zionist cliché descriptions of diaspora Jews as servile, passive lambs who had meekly gone to the slaughter. Several of Arendt's critics have since expressed some regret at their past fervor. Arendt was already dead when such apologies were first heard. Arendt subscribed to no isms and mistrusted sweeping theories. Her intuitions on the nature of political evil may find more sympathetic ears these days than when the book was first published. Evil, as she saw it, need not be committed only by demonic monsters, but with disastrous effect by morons and imbeciles as well, especially if, as we see in our own day, their deeds are sanctioned by religious authority. With her disregard of conventional scholarship and academic norms, she remains a stimulating intellectual presence. Thirty or forty years ago, the mixture of social analysis, journalism, philosophical reflections, psychology, literary illusion, and anecdote found in the best of her work exasperated and annoyed critics. Today, it fascinates and appeals. Arendt went to Jerusalem in 1961 as a reporter for The New Yorker. The idea was not The New Yorker's, but her own. She felt she simply had to attend the trial. She owed it to herself as a social critic, displaced person, witness, and survivor. She had never seen a Nazi butcher like Eichmann, she wrote to the Rockefeller Foundation, and this was probably her only chance. To attend this trial was an obligation she owed her past. She was interested, as she put it, in understanding Eichmann's mind, if he had one, and through the testimonies at the trial to explore the totality of the moral collapse the Nazis caused in respectable European society. The result, as it first came out in The New Yorker and later in expanded form in the book, was largely the report of a trial, an attempt to examine the extent to which the court confronted with a crime it could not find in the law books, succeeded in fulfilling the demands of justice. The book combines philosophy and day-to-day -day observation and is reminiscent not only in its suggestive style but in its sarcasms and ironies of Karl Marx's 18th Brumaire of Napoleon III. The resultant storm broke out mainly because of Arendt's portrait of Eichmann as a diligent yet banal bureaucratic criminal. The term banality actually appears only on the last page, but is implicit throughout the entire book. Eichmann's mediocrity and insipid character struck Arendt on her first day in court. Her initial reaction, expressed in letters to Jaspers, McCarthy and Blucher, was impressionistic. He isn't even sinister, she wrote. Arendt used the common German term unheimlich, which can also be translated as uncanny. He was like a ghost in a spiritualist source. What was more, he had a cold and was sneezing inside his bulletproof glass cage. She ought to have known better. Hitler would not have cut a better figure under the circumstances. Out of power, most tyrants and serial murderers seem pathetic or ordinary, harmless or even pitiful, as Saddam Hussein did coming out of his rat hole with an unkempt beard. Was she, perhaps at this early stage, a victim of what might be called the fallacy of physiognomy? We all succumb to it at times. Arendt was interested not only in physiognomy, but also in graphology. The science of physiognomy was a popular intellectual pastime during her youth in Germany. Her teacher, Martin Heidegger, according to Karl Jaspers, imperiously dismissed Jaspers' terror at watching a man like Hitler seeking to be Germany's chancellor with the exclamation, Just look at his hands! A few days into the trial, however, Arendt consciously moved away from exteriors. 
Eichmann is actually stupid, she wrote Jaspers, after listening to one of Eichmann's exhortations. But then, somehow, he is not. Er ist eigentlich dumm, aber auch irgendwie nicht. Her private letters from Jerusalem enable us to trace the slow development of her thesis. She ploughed through the 3,000-page transcript of Eichmann's pre-trial interrogation by the Israeli police captain Avner Les, and gradually came to think that it was mostly, as she first put it, a kind of brainlessness on Eichmann's part that had predisposed him to becoming the faceless bureaucrat of death and one of the worst criminals of all time. She emphasized Eichmann's moral and intellectual shallowness, his inner void. He was probably not lying when he told Les that he could never be a doctor because he could not bear the sight of blood. She concluded that Eichmann's inability to speak coherently in court was connected with his incapacity to think, or to think from another person's point of view. His shallowness was by no means identical with stupidity. He personified neither hatred or madness, nor an insatiable thirst for blood, but something far worse, the faceless nature of Nazi evil itself within a closed system run by pathological gangsters aimed at dismantling the human personality of its victims. The Nazis had succeeded in turning the legal order on its head, making the wrong and the malevolent the foundation of a new righteousness. In the Third Reich, evil lost its distinctive characteristic by which most people had until then recognized it. The Nazis redefined it as a civil norm. Conventional goodness became a mere temptation, which most Germans were fast learning to resist. Within this upside-down world, Eichmann, perhaps like Pol Pot four decades later, seemed not to have been aware of having done evil. In matters of elementary morality, Arendt warned, what had been thought of as decent instincts were no longer to be taken for granted. In The Origins of Totalitarianism, she still held on to a Kantian notion of radical evil, the evil that, under the Nazis, corrupted the basis of moral law, exploded legal categories, and defied human judgment. In Eichmann in Jerusalem, and in the bitter controversies about it that followed, she insisted that only good had any depth. Good can be radical. Evil can never be radical, it can only be extreme, for it possesses neither depth nor any demonic dimension. Yet, and this is its horror, it can spread like a fungus over the surface of the earth and lay waste the entire world. Evil comes from a failure to think. It defies thought, for as soon as thought tries to engage itself with evil and examine the premises and principles from which it originates, it is frustrated because it finds nothing there. That is the banality of evil. Eichmann was ambitious and eager to rise in the ranks, but he would not have killed his superior to inherit his job, nor did he display any distinctive thought of his own. It was his banality that predisposed him to become one of the greatest criminals of his time, Arendt claimed. She complained that while in the trial Eichmann had been accused absurdly, she thought, of having been the very architect, the brain behind the Holocaust, his essential brainlessness was never even brought up or discussed. It wasn't discussed partly because it was so hard to grasp. But it also was left unmentioned because Eichmann's trial was a show trial, staged by Ben-Gurion, at least partly for political reasons, to prove conclusively that the Holocaust had simply been the largest anti-Semitic pogrom in history. Eichmann's alleged banality was the main reason the book provoked such a storm. Most people still assumed that murder was committed by monsters or demons. Another reason was a brief comment on the Nazi-appointed Jewish council's Judenrat. Unable to see through the Nazi scheme, acting in the vain hope that they were serving the best interests of local Jews, the distinguished notables of the Judenrata had inadvertently become instruments of Nazi determination to eliminate a maximum number of Jews with a minimum of administrative effort and cost. Neither of the two points, of course, was new— Dostoevsky would not have regarded Arendt's banality of evil as a cheap catchword, as Gershom Sholem did in an open letter to Arendt, accusing her of heartlessness. When the devil visits Karamazov, he turns out to be a shabby, stupid, and vulgar lout. Before Arendt, others had emphasized the discrepancy between the personal mediocrity of monsters like Hitler or Stalin and the horrendous evil they unleashed on the world. 
Nearly everybody who attended the trials of mass killers after the war, some of them respected doctors and pharmacists, came away with the disconcerting impression that the killers looked pretty much like you and me. The Israeli court psychiatrist who examined Eichmann found him a completely normal man. More normal at any rate than I am after examining him. The implication being that the coexistence of normality and bottomless cruelty explodes our ordinary conceptions and present the true enigma of the trial. In a similar vein, Simone de Beauvoir said that at his trial after the war, the French Nazi Pierre Laval seemed commonplace and inconsequential, an unimaginative and feeble little fellow. Similarly, long before Arendt's book, many in Israel and elsewhere had charged the Judenrater with complicity in the Nazi scheme. Six years before the book came out, in a sensational libel case heard in the District Court of Jerusalem, the presiding judge had spoken far more critically about the Judenrata and about Jewish collaboration with the Nazis than Arendt did in that brief passage. Similar charges had been made for years in several well-known books. Jean-Francois Steiner's Treblinka, Tadeusz Borowski's This Way for the Gas, ladies and gentlemen, and, of course, Raoul Hilberg's monumental The Destruction of the European Jews, a book that Arendt repeatedly referred to. What was new, and especially provocative in Arendt's account, was the insistence on challenging Jewish communal leadership. What might they have done differently? Her answers, offered only tentatively, derived from her view of the function of truth in politics. Should the Judenrata have told the Jews the truth, when they knew it, about where they were being deported to. How many might have been able to save themselves somehow had they known the truth? Why were the Judenrata notables so disciplined and servile to authority? Some community leaders were well aware that the deportees were going directly to Auschwitz and not to some resettlement area in the East, as the Nazis claimed. Open rebellion was, of course, unthinkable under the circumstances— on the other hand, why didn't the leaders of the Jewish councils refuse to accept the responsibilities assigned them by the Nazis? Insofar as they had moral authority, why didn't they advise the Jews to run for their lives or try to go underground? If there had been no Jewish organizations at all, and no Judenrata, Arendt suggested, the deportation machine could not have run as smoothly as it did. The Nazis might have been forced to drag out millions of people one by one from their homes. In such circumstances, could not more Jews have been saved? If the Judenrater had not been so Germanically disciplined, if they hadn't compiled detailed lists of potential deportees, if they hadn't supplied the Nazis with these lists, if they had refrained from collecting the keys and detailed inventories of vacated apartments for the Nazis to hand over to Aryans, if they hadn't summoned the deportees to show up on a certain day at a certain hour at a certain railway station with provisions for a three- or four-day journey, would fewer people have died? Others had asked such questions before. But Arendt went further, implying that Jewish leaders had inadvertently allowed themselves to fall into a fiendish trap and become part of the system of victimization. The whole truth was that if the Jewish people had really been unorganized and leaderless, there would have been chaos and plenty of misery, but the total number of victims would hardly have been between four and a half and six million people, she wrote. It is clear why this sentence was seen by so many as insensitive and shocking. That the Jews did have leaders and notables and local and national organizations was well known. Many had served them well in the past. Many were doing their best to ameliorate suffering. Only a few among them fully understood the extent of Nazi plans for genocide. What would Arendt have said of these leaders if they had fled abroad, as many of them certainly could have, abandoning the Jews who depended on them? Would her argument have been less shocking, had Arendt shown more understanding for the ghastly dilemmas facing the leaders who remain behind? Would she have shocked less if she had raised questions about their behaviour, instead of contemptuously attacking them. She did recognize that beleaguered people have a tendency to hope against hope, that somehow things will turn out better if they can only buy time. Would she have shocked her readers less had she registered doubt instead of attacking? Would it have shocked less had she said explicitly that the Jewish leaders inadvertently collaborated in their own destruction? This was certainly what she meant to say. Walter Lacour 
wrote early in the controversy that Arendt was attacked less for what she said than for how she said it. She was inexcusably flippant, as when she referred to Leo Beck, the revered former chief rabbi and head of the Berlin Judenrater, as the Jewish Führer. She excised the remark in the second printing. At times her style was brash and insolent, the tone professorial and imperious. She took a certain pleasure in paradox, and her sarcasm and irony seemed out of place in a discussion of the Holocaust. A good example was her obviously ironic remark that Eichmann had become a convert to the Zionist solution of the Jewish problem. It was widely misunderstood and misinterpreted. Her sarcasm was often self-defeating. Arendt's biographer, Elizabeth Young Bruel, has wisely written that Arendt posed the true moral issue, but obscured it with needless irony. With chutzpah, too, perhaps. Too often she claimed a monopoly on objectivity and truth. Not just truth, but repeatedly the whole truth. For instance, the whole truth was, the whole truth is. She claimed to understand Eichmann better than others, and freely dispensed advice to the prosecutor and defense lawyer, she despised both, and to the three judges whom she admired. Eichmann's judges, immigrants from Weimar, Germany, come off best in her book. We now know from her private correspondence that she'd come to Jerusalem with preconceived ideas about Israel, its political system, its government, and its policies toward the Arabs. She was horrified by Ben-Gurion's attempt to use the trial as a means of creating a sense of national unity among a mass of demoralized new immigrants. She also had a tendency to draw absolute conclusions on the basis of casual evidence. The Israeli police force, she wrote to Jaspers, gives me the creeps, speaks only Hebrew, and looks Arabic. Some downright brutal types among them. They would obey any order. If she really believed this, it is little wonder that she also believed that Ben-Gurion had staged the trial solely to force more reparations money out of the German government. She was sure that Ben-Gurion had a secret agreement with Adenauer not to allow the name of the notorious Hans Globke to come up during the trial. Globke was a high official in Adenauer's government who, under the Nazis, had compiled the official legal commentary to the Nuremberg racial laws. Globke's name, nevertheless, came up time and again during the trial. Outside the courthouse doors, she decried the Oriental mob as if one were in Istanbul or some other half-Asiatic country. She was rightly horrified by the Pays and the Kaftan Jews, Orthodox East European Jews, who make life impossible for all the reasonable people here. Reasonable Israelis, in Arendt's eyes, were the Yekes, German-speaking immigrants from Germany and Austria, including her own relatives and old friends from Freiburg, Heidelberg and Berlin. It was fortunate, she told Jaspers, that Eichmann's three judges were of German origin, indeed the best of German jury. Jaspers answered back in the same vein. Let us hope the three German Jews gain control. She overreacted to the shoddy patriotism of the chief prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, who used the trial to serve Ben-Gurion's deterministic view of Jewish history. In a letter to Jaspers, she described Hausner as a typical Galician Jew, very unsympathetic, boring, constantly making mistakes. Probably one of those people who don't know any language. It would have been interesting to hear what she might have said later when, under the governments of Golda Meir and Menachem Begin, the Holocaust was mystified into the heart of a new civil religion and at the same time exploited to justify Israel's refusal to withdraw from occupied territory. She certainly had a point in criticizing Israel for its overly nationalistic and too rapid claim of a particular moral value, but she overdid it. In later years, Arendt agreed that some of her catchwords were erroneous or exaggerated. Most mistaken was the famous or infamous subtitle on the cover of her book. The phrase, banality of evil, entered popular dictionaries and books of familiar quotations. In retrospect, she was sorry she had used it. It had led her into an ambush. Were she writing now, she told a television interviewer in 1971, she would not have used those words. By the time she said this, the great uproar was over. She still stood accused of exculpating the murderers and offending the memory of the dead. Her comments on the Judenrater took up only a dozen out of 312 pages. They were in no way essential to the book's main argument. She seems to have added them almost as an afterthought after rereading Raoul Hilberg's book. 
She was outraged at Hausner's self-righteous berating of certain witnesses with questions like, Why did you not rebel? The tragic role of the Judenrater was barely mentioned at the trial, least of all by the prosecution. This made her suspicious. Her quarrel was not with the murdered Jews, but with some of their leaders and with the Israeli prosecution, which she suspected was covering up for them. Her suspicion would be proven right. The aim of the show trial had not been to convict Eichmann or examine the Judenrater. Two decades after the trial, the deputy prosecutor, Gabriel Bach, later a Supreme Court justice, told an interviewer that if all those witnesses had appeared in court and told stories of the Judenrater, no one would have remembered Eichmann. At first, Arendt could not understand the uproar over her remarks on the Judenrata. Then she decided it was because she had inadvertently dragged out a past that had not been laid to rest. She became slightly paranoid, convincing herself that prominent ex-members of the Judenrata now occupied high positions in the Israeli government. But the only name she was able to cite was that of a low-ranking press officer in a minor Israeli ministry. The tone of reviews in the American press seemed to confirm her worst suspicions. The New York Times picked an associate of the Israeli chief prosecutor to review the book. In the left-wing Partisan Review, a journal that had lionized her and published her work for years, Lionel Abel now wrote that she had made Eichmann aesthetically palatable, while his victims are aesthetically repulsive. Eichmann, Abel claimed, came off better in her book than his victims. The Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith sent out a circular urging rabbis throughout America to denounce Arendt from the pulpit on the Jewish high holidays. Similar measures would later be made against Rolf Hochhut for displacing guilt from the Nazis to the Pope. Hochhut, of course, had done nothing of the sort, nor had Arendt diminished Eichmann's immense guilt, for which she felt he more than deserved to die. The Judenrata had made the task of the Nazis easier, but the Nazis alone had slaughtered the Jews. The scandal soon grew to outsized proportions. Saul Bellow excoriated Arendt in Mr. Samler's Planet for using the tragic history of the Holocaust to promote the foolish ideas of Weimar intellectuals. Banality is the adopted disguise of a very powerful will to abolish conscience. A nationwide campaign was launched in the United States to discredit her in the academic world. There was a startling disproportion between the ferocity of the reaction and its immediate cause. A group of lecturers, some flown in from Israel and England, toured the country, decrying Arendt as a self-hating Jew, the Rosa Luxemburg of nothingness. Four separate Jewish organizations hired scholars to go through her text line by line in order to discredit it and to find mistakes, though most of them turned out to be minor, incorrect dates and misspelled names. A review of the book in the Intermountain Jewish News was headlined, Self-Hating Jewess Writes Pro-Eichmann Book. Other reviewers criticized her for saying that Eichmann's trial had been a show trial. But Ben-Gurion's intentions from the beginning, when he ordered Eichmann kidnapped and brought to trial in Israel, and in his public statement afterwards, certainly gave credence to the view that it was indeed a show trial— his purpose, in Ben-Gurion's words, was to educate the young and the entire world and to give the Jewish people a voice in making a historic accounting with its persecutors. In France, the weekly Nouvelle Observateur published selected excerpts of the book and asked, Et elle Nazi? Is she, that is, Arendt, a Nazi? The reaction in Israel to Arendt's comments on the Judenrater was generally milder than in the United States. The first reviews in the Israeli press were respectful. The respected Israeli newspaper Haaretz reprinted long excerpts of the book in a generally sympathetic context. This was not surprising. In admonishing the Judenrater, Arendt had sounded more like the old-fashioned Zionist she had once been. Zionism, after all, had been a movement of Jewish self-criticism. Months later, the literary critic Shlomo Grodzensky, a recent immigrant from the United States, launched the first Israeli attack on Arendt in the semi-official daily Davor. He began by criticizing Arendt's willingness to publish her text in The New Yorker, among advertisements for Tiffany jewelry and elegant fur coats. Grodzensky insinuated that she'd done it for material gain. He decried the deadly, undermining element in a Jew of Mrs. Arendt's type. She is the poison that feeds on itself and wanders with her everywhere, even to Auschwitz and Jerusalem. No Israeli publisher brought out a translation— 
but a book-length diatribe against Eichmann, a translation from an American book, was published as early as 1965. The first Hebrew translation of Eichmann in Jerusalem, or any of Arendt's other books, came out only in 1999. In an open letter in Encounter, Gershom Scholem harshly blamed Arendt for her lack of tact and sympathy, Herzenstadt, especially in her discussion of Leo Beck and other members of the Judenrater. Many readers today will agree with him about this. But I doubt if as many would also follow him in his appeal to Arendt to show more Ahavat Israel, love of Israel, by which he meant more patriotism, more emotional involvement. That was precisely what Arendt believed she must avoid. And yet a careful reading of Sholem's public letter to Arendt shows how ambivalent, indeed, partially in agreement he was on the touchy subject of the Judenrat. I cannot refute those who say that the Jews deserved their fate because they did not take earlier steps to defend themselves, because they were cowardly, etc., he writes. I came across this argument recently in a book by that honest Jewish anti-Semite, Kurt Tucholsky. I cannot deny that Tucholsky was right. Unlike Arendt, Sholem did not presume to judge. I was not there, he wrote. Arendt's answer to this was that the refusal to take a position undermined the very foundations of historiography and jurisprudence. Would Sholem have reacted as harshly if Arendt had shown more empathy for the plight of the Jewish leaders? If, for example, she had written, Leo Beck in his blindness or naivete, or words to this effect, perhaps he might even have made some judgments of his own. Thinking, judging, and acting were closely linked in this and in other books by Hannah Arendt. Her position was that if you say to yourself, who am I to judge, you are already lost. In her lifetime, Arendt continued to be marked, as it were, by the debate set off by her book. Even though many years have passed since she died, she is still the subject of controversy. One saw this a few years ago when a sensational book was published on the innocent love affair she had as a teenager with Martin Heidegger. The author depicted her as a self-hating Jew and as a silly bimbo, sexually entrapped for life by her aging Nazi professor, a married man with two children. The book gave a crude version of her long and complex relationship with Heidegger. Yet some reviewers seemed to take a particular satisfaction in the book's simplistic account. As Tony Ute wrote a few years ago in the New York Review of Books, Arendt made many small errors for which her critics will never forgive her, but she got many of the big things right, and for this she deserves to be remembered. She would have been wryly amused by the reawakened interest in her work. She once said that the saddest form of fame was posthumous fame. At the height of the scandal over Eichmann in Jerusalem, Jaspers wrote to console her. A time will come, he wrote, which she will not live to see, when Jews will erect a monument to her in Israel, as they were just then doing for Spinoza. This has not yet happened, but we could be getting there. Oh, Germany, hearing the speeches that ring from your house, one laughs. But whoever sees you reaches for his knife. Bertolt Brecht 1. The House of Justice Beth Hamish Pass, the House of Justice. These words shouted by the court usher at the top of his voice make us jump to our feet as they announce the arrival of the three judges, who, bareheaded in black robes, walk into the courtroom from a side entrance to take their seats on the highest tier of the raised platform. Their long table, soon to be covered with innumerable books and more than 1,500 documents, is flanked at each end by the court stenographers. Directly below the judges are the translators, whose services are needed for direct exchanges between the defendant or his counsel and the court. Otherwise, the German-speaking accused party, like almost everyone else in the audience, follows the Hebrew proceedings through the simultaneous radio transmission, which is excellent in French, bearable in English, and sheer comedy, frequently incomprehensible in German. In view of the scrupulous fairness of all technical arrangements for the trial, it is among the minor mysteries of the new state of Israel that, with its high percentage of German-born people, it was unable to find an adequate translator into the only language the accused and his counsel could understand. For the old prejudice against German Jews, once very pronounced in Israel, is no longer strong enough to account for it. 
remains as explication the even older and still very powerful vitamin P, as the Israelis call protection in government circles and the bureaucracy. One tier below the translators, facing each other and hence with their profiles turned to the audience, we see the glass booth of the accused and the witness box. Finally, on the bottom tier, with their backs to the audience, are the prosecutor with his staff of four assistant attorneys and the counsel for the defense, who during the first weeks is accompanied by an assistant. At no time is there anything theatrical in the conduct of the judges. Their walk is unstudied, their sober and intense attention, visibly stiffening under the impact of grief as they listen to the tales of suffering, is natural. Their impatience with the prosecutor's attempt to drag out these hearings forever is spontaneous and refreshing. Their attitude to the defence, perhaps a shade over polite, as though they had always in mind that Dr. Servatius stood almost alone in this strenuous battle in an unfamiliar environment, their manner toward the accused always beyond reproach. They are so obviously three good and honest men that one is not surprised that none of them yields to the greatest temptation to play-act in this setting, that of pretending that they, all three born and educated in Germany, must wait for the Hebrew translation. Moshe Landau, the presiding judge, hardly ever withholds his answer until the translator has done his work, and he frequently interferes in the translation, correcting and improving, evidently grateful for this bit of distraction from an otherwise grim business. Months later, during the cross-examination of the accused, he will even lead his colleagues to use their German mother tongue in the dialogue with Eichmann, a proof, if proof was still needed, of his remarkable independence of current public opinion in Israel. There is no doubt from the very beginning that it is Judge Landau who sets the tone, and that he is doing his best, his very best, to prevent this trial from becoming a show trial under the influence of the prosecutor's love of showmanship. Among the reasons he cannot always succeed is the simple fact that the proceedings happen on a stage before an audience, with the usher's marvellous shout at the beginning of each session producing the effect of the rising curtain. Whoever planned this auditorium in the newly built Bethlehem, the House of the People, now surrounded by high fences, guarded from roof to cellar by heavily armed police, and with a row of wooden barracks in the front courtyard, in which all comers are expertly frisked, had a theatre in mind, complete with orchestra and gallery, with proscenium and stage, and with side doors for the actor's entrance. Clearly, this courtroom is not a bad place for the show trial David Ben-Gurion, Prime Minister of Israel, had in mind— when he decided to have Eichmann kidnapped in Argentina and brought to the district court of Jerusalem to stand trial for his role in the final solution of the Jewish question. And Ben-Gurion, rightly called the architect of the state, remains the invisible stage manager of the proceedings. Not once does he attend a session. In the courtroom he speaks with the voice of Gideon Housney, the attorney general, who, representing the government, does his best, his very best, to obey his master. And if... Fortunately, his best often turns out not to be good enough. The reason is that the trial is presided over by someone who serves justice as faithfully as Mr. Hausner serves the State of Israel. Justice demands that the accused be prosecuted, defended, and judged, and that all the other questions of seemingly greater import, of how could it happen and why did it happen, of why the Jews and why the Germans, of what was the role of other nations, and what was the extent of co-responsibility on the side of the Allies, of how could the Jews, through their own leaders, cooperate in their own destruction, and why did they go to their death like lambs to the slaughter, be left in abeyance. Justice insists on the importance of Adolf Eichmann, son of Karl Adolf Eichmann, the man in the glass booth built for his protection. Medium-sized, slender, middle-aged, with receding hair, ill-fitting teeth, and near-sighted eyes, who throughout the trial keeps craning his scraggy neck toward the bench, not once does he face the audience, and who desperately, and for the most part successfully, maintains his self-control, despite the nervous tick to which his mouth must have become subject long before this trial started. On trial are his deeds— not the sufferings of the Jews, not the German people or mankind, not even anti-Semitism and racism. And justice, though perhaps an abstraction for those of Mr. Ben-Gurion's turn of mind, proves to be a much sterner master than the Prime Minister with all his power. The latter's rule, as Mr. Hausner is not slow in demonstrating, is permissive. 
It permits the prosecutor to give press conferences and interviews for television during the trial. The American program, sponsored by the Glickman Corporation, is constantly interrupted, business as usual, by real estate advertising, and even spontaneous outbursts to reporters in the court building. He is sick of cross-examining Eichmann, who answers all questions with lies. It permits frequent side glances into the audience and the theatrics, characteristic of a more than ordinary vanity, which finally achieves its triumph in the White House with a compliment on a job well done by the President of the United States. Justice does not permit anything of the sort. It demands seclusion. It permits sorrow rather than anger, and it prescribes the most careful abstention from all the nice pleasures of putting oneself in the limelight. Judge Landau's visit to this country shortly after the trial was not publicized, except among the Jewish organizations for which it was undertaken. Yet no matter how consistently the judges shunned the limelight, there they were, seated at the top of the raised platform, facing the audience as from the stage in a play. The audience was supposed to represent the whole world, and in the first few weeks it indeed consisted chiefly of newspaper men and magazine writers who had flocked to Jerusalem from the four corners of the earth. They were to watch a spectacle as sensational as the Nuremberg trials, only this time the tragedy of jury as a whole was to be the central concern. For if we shall charge Eichmann also with crimes against non-Jews, this is not because he committed them, but surprisingly because we make no ethnic distinctions. Certainly a remarkable sentence for a prosecutor to utter in his opening speech. It proved to be the key sentence in the case for the prosecution. For this case was built on what the Jews had suffered, not on what Eichmann had done. And according to Mr. Hausner, this distinction would be immaterial because there was only one man who had been concerned almost entirely with the Jews, whose business had been their destruction, whose role in the establishment of the iniquitous regime had been limited to them. That was Adolf Eichmann. Was it not logical to bring before the court all the facts of Jewish suffering, which of course were never in dispute, and then look for evidence which in one way or another would connect Eichmann with what had happened? The Nuremberg trials, where the defendants had been indicted for crimes against the members of various nations, had left the Jewish tragedy out of account, for the simple reason that Eichmann had not been there. Did Mr. Hausner really believe the Nuremberg trials would have paid greater attention to the fate of the Jews if Eichmann had been in the dock? Hardly. Like almost everybody else in Israel, he believed that only a Jewish court could render justice to Jews, and that it was the business of Jews to sit in judgment on their enemies. Hence the almost universal hostility in Israel to the mere mention of an international court which would have indicted Eichmann not for crimes against the Jewish people, but for crimes against mankind committed on the body of the Jewish people. Hence the strange boast, we make no ethnic distinctions, which sounded less strange in Israel, where rabbinical law rules the personal status of Jewish citizens, with the result that no Jew can marry a non-Jew. Marriages concluded abroad are recognized, but children of mixed marriages are legally bastards, Children of Jewish parentage born out of wedlock are legitimate, and if one happens to have a non-Jewish mother, he can neither be married nor buried. The outrage in this state of affairs has become more acute since 1953, when a sizable portion of jurisdiction in matters of family law was handed over to the secular courts. Women can now inherit property and in general enjoy equal status with men. Hence it is hardly respect for the faith or the power of the fanatically religious minority that prevents the government of Israel from substituting secular jurisdiction for rabbinical law in matters of marriage and divorce. Israeli citizens, religious and non-religious, seem agreed upon the desirability of having a law which prohibits intermarriage, and it is chiefly for this reason, as Israeli officials outside the courtroom were willing to admit, that they are also agreed upon the undesirability of a written constitution in which such a law would, embarrassingly, have to be spelled out. The argument against civil marriage is that it would split the House of Israel and would also separate Jews of this country from Jews of the diaspora, as Philip Gillen recently put it in Jewish Frontier. 
Whatever the reasons, there certainly was something breathtaking in the naivete with which the prosecution denounced the infamous Nuremberg Laws of 1935, which had prohibited intermarriage and sexual intercourse between Jews and Germans. The better informed among the correspondents were well aware of the irony, but they did not mention it in their reports. This, they figured, was not the time to tell the Jews what was wrong with the laws and institutions of their own country. If the audience at the trial was to be the world, and the play the huge panorama of Jewish sufferings, the reality was falling short of expectations and purposes. The journalists remained faithful for not much more than two weeks, after which the audience changed drastically. It was now supposed to consist of Israelis, of those who were too young to know the story or, as in the case of Oriental Jews, had never been told it. The trial was supposed to show them what it meant to live among non-Jews, to convince them that only in Israel could a Jew be safe and live an honourable life. For correspondence, the lesson was spelled out in the little booklet on Israel's legal system, which was handed to the press. Its author, Doris Lankin, cites a Supreme Court decision whereby two fathers who had abducted their children and brought them to Israel were directed to send them back to their mothers, who, living abroad, had a legal right to their custody. And this, adds the author, no less proud of such strict legality than Mr. Hausner, of his willingness to prosecute murder even when the victims were non-Jews, despite the fact that to send the children back to maternal custody and care would be committing them to waging an unequal struggle against the hostile elements in the diaspora. But in this audience there were hardly any young people, and it did not consist of Israelis, as distinguished from Jews. It was filled with survivors, with middle-aged and elderly people, immigrants from Europe, like myself, who knew by heart all there was to know, and who were in no mood to learn any lessons, and certainly did not need this trial to draw their own conclusions. As witness followed witness, and horror was piled upon horror, they sat there and listened in public to stories they would hardly have been able to endure in private when they would have had to face the storyteller. And the more the calamity of the Jewish people in this generation unfolded, and the more grandiose Mr. Hausner's rhetoric became, the paler and more ghost-like became the figure in the glass booth, and no finger-wagging, and there sits the monster responsible for all this, could shout him back to life. It was precisely the play aspect of the trial that collapsed under the weight of the hair-raising atrocities. A trial resembles a play in that both begin and end with the doer, not with the victim. A show trial needs even more urgently than an ordinary trial a limited and well-defined outline of what was done and how it was done. In the centre of a trial can only be the one who did. In this respect he is like the hero in the play. And if he suffers, he must suffer for what he has done, not for what he has caused others to suffer. No one knew this better than the presiding judge— before whose eyes the trial began to degenerate into a bloody show, a rudderless ship tossed about on the waves. But if his efforts to prevent this were often defeated, the defeat was, strangely, in part the fault of the defence, which hardly ever rose to challenge any testimony, no matter how irrelevant and immaterial it might be. Dr. Servatius, as everybody invariably addressed him, was a bit bolder when it came to the submission of documents and the most impressive of his rare interventions occurred when the prosecution introduced as evidence the diaries of Hans Frank, former governor-general of Poland, and one of the major war criminals hanged at Nuremberg. I have only one question. Is the name of Adolf Eichmann, the name of the accused, mentioned in those twenty-nine volumes? In fact, there were thirty-eight. The name Adolf Eichmann is not mentioned in all those twenty-nine volumes? Thank you. No more questions. Thus the trial never became a play. But the show Ben-Gurion had had in mind to begin with did take place, or rather the lessons he thought should be taught to Jews and Gentiles, to Israelis and Arabs, in short, to the whole world. These lessons, to be drawn from an identical show, were meant to be different for the different recipients. Ben-Gurion had outlined them before the trial started in a number of articles designed to explain why Israel had kidnapped the accused. There was the lesson to the non-Jewish world. 
We want to establish before the nations of the world how millions of people, because they happen to be Jews, and one million babies, because they happen to be Jewish babies, were murdered by the Nazis. Or in the words of Davor, the organ of Mr. Ben-Gurion's Mapai party, Let world opinion know this, that not only Nazi Germany was responsible for the destruction of six million Jews of Europe. Hence again in Ben-Gurion's own words, We want the nations of the world to know, and they should be ashamed. The Jews in the diaspora would remember how Judaism, four thousand years old with its spiritual creations and its ethical strivings, its messianic aspirations, had always faced a hostile world, how the Jews had degenerated until they went to their death like sheep, and how only the establishment of a Jewish state had enabled Jews to hit back as Israelis had done in the War of Independence, in the Suez Adventure, and in the almost daily incidents on Israel's unhappy borders. And if the Jews outside Israel had to be shown the difference between Israeli heroism and Jewish submissive meekness, there was a lesson for those inside Israel, too. The generation of Israelis who have grown up since the Holocaust were in danger of losing their ties with the Jewish people and, by implication, with their own history. It is necessary that our youth remember what happened to the Jewish people. We want them to know the most tragic facts in our history. Finally, one of the motives in bringing Eichmann to trial was to ferret out other Nazis, for example, the connection between the Nazis and some Arab rulers. If these had been the only justifications for bringing Adolf Eichmann to the District Court of Jerusalem, the trial would have been a failure on most counts. In some respects, the lessons were superfluous, and in others, positively misleading. Antisemitism has been discredited, thanks to Hitler, perhaps not forever, but certainly for the time being, and this not because the Jews have become more popular all of a sudden, but because, in Mr. Ben-Gurion's own words, most people have realized that in our day, the gas chamber and the soap factory are what antisemitism may lead to. Equally superfluous was the lesson to the Jews in the diaspora, who hardly needed the great catastrophe in which one-third of their people perished to be convinced of the world's hostility. Not only has their conviction of the eternal and ubiquitous nature of anti-Semitism been the most potent ideological factor in the Zionist movement since the Dreyfus Affair, it was also the cause of the otherwise inexplicable readiness of the German-Jewish community to negotiate with the Nazi authorities during the early stages of the regime. Needless to say, these negotiations were separated by an abyss from the later collaboration of the Judenrater. No moral questions were involved yet, only a political decision whose realism was debatable. Concrete help, thus the argument ran, was better than abstract denunciations. It was real politique without Machiavellian overtones, and its dangers came to light years later, after the outbreak of the war, when these daily contacts between the Jewish organizations and the Nazi bureaucracy made it so much easier for the Jewish functionaries to cross the abyss between helping Jews to escape and helping the Nazis to deport them. It was this conviction which produced the dangerous inability of the Jews to distinguish between friend and foe, and German Jews were not the only ones to underestimate their enemies, because they somehow thought that all Gentiles were alike. If Prime Minister Ben-Gurion, to all practical purposes the head of the Jewish state, meant to strengthen this kind of Jewish consciousness, he was ill-advised. For a change in this mentality is actually one of the indispensable prerequisites for Israeli statehood, which by definition is made of the Jews a people among peoples, a nation among nations, a state among states— depending now on a plurality which no longer permits the age-old and unfortunately religiously anchored dichotomy of Jews and Gentiles. The contrast between Israeli heroism and the submissive meekness with which Jews went to their death, arriving on time at the transportation points, walking on their own feet to the places of execution, digging their own graves, undressing and making neat piles of their clothing and lying down side by side to be shot, seemed a fine point. And the prosecutor, asking witness after witness, why did you not protest? Why did you board the train? Fifteen thousand people were standing there and hundreds of guards facing you. Why didn't you revolt and charge and attack? Was elaborating it for all it was worth. But the sad truth of the matter is that the point was ill-taken, 
for no non-Jewish group or people had behaved differently. Sixteen years ago, while still under the direct impact of the events, David Rousset, a former inmate of Buchenwald, described what we know happened in all concentration camps. The triumph of the SS demands that the tortured victim allow himself to be led to the noose without protesting, that he renounce and abandon himself to the point of ceasing to affirm his identity. And it is not for nothing, it is not gratuitously out of sheer sadism that the SS men desire his defeat. They know that the system which succeeds in destroying its victim before he mounts the scaffold is incomparably the best for keeping a whole people in slavery, in submission. Nothing is more terrible than these processions of human beings going like dummies to their deaths. Les Lourdes de Notre Mort, 1947 The court received no answer to this cruel and silly question, but one could easily have found an answer had he permitted his imagination to dwell for a few minutes on the fate of those Dutch Jews who in 1941 in the old Jewish quarter of Amsterdam dared to attack a German security police detachment. 430 Jews were arrested in reprisal, and they were literally tortured to death, first in Buchenwald and then in the Austrian camp of Mauthausen. For months on end, they died a thousand deaths, and every single one of them would have envied his brethren in Auschwitz and even in Riga and Minsk. There exist many things considerably worse than death, and the SS saw to it that none of them was ever very far from their victims' minds and imagination. In this respect, perhaps even more significantly than in others, the deliberate attempt at the trial to tell only the Jewish side of the story distorted the truth, even the Jewish truth. The glory of the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto and the heroism of the few others who fought back lay precisely in their having refused the comparatively easy death the Nazis offered them before the firing squad or in the gas chamber. And the witnesses in Jerusalem, who testified to resistance and rebellion, to the small place it had in the history of the Holocaust, confirmed once more the fact that only the very young had been capable of taking the decision that we cannot go and be slaughtered like sheep. In one respect, Mr. Ben-Gurion's expectations for the trial were not altogether disappointed. It did indeed become an important instrument for ferreting out other Nazis and criminals, but not in the Arab countries, which had openly offered refuge to hundreds of them. The Grand Mufti's connections with the Nazis during the war were no secret. He had hoped they would help him in the implementation of some final solution in the Near East. Hence newspapers in Damascus and Beirut, in Cairo and Jordan, did not hide their sympathy for Eichmann or their regret that he had not finished the job. A broadcast from Cairo on the day the trial opened even injected a slightly anti-German note into its comments, complaining that there was not a single incident in which one German plane flew over one Jewish settlement and dropped one bomb on it throughout the last World War. That Arab nationalists have been in sympathy with Nazism is notorious. Their reasons are obvious, and neither Ben-Gurion nor this trial was needed to ferret them out. They never were in hiding. The trial revealed only that all rumours about Eichmann's connection with Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the former Mufti of Jerusalem, were unfounded. He had been introduced to the Mufti during an official reception, along with all other departmental heads. The Mufti had been in close contact with the German Foreign Office and with Himmler, but this was nothing new. If Ben-Gurion's remark about the connection between Nazis and some Arab rulers was pointless, his failure to mention present-day West Germany in this context was surprising. Of course, it was reassuring to hear that Israel does not hold Adenauer responsible for Hitler, and that, for us, a decent German, although he belongs to the same nation that twenty years ago helped to murder millions of Jews, is a decent human being. There was no mention of decent Arabs. The German Federal Republic, although it has not yet recognized the state of Israel, presumably out of fear that the Arab countries might recognize Ulbricht's Germany, has paid $737 million in reparation to Israel during the last ten years. These payments will soon come to an end, and Israel is now trying to negotiate a long-term loan from West Germany. Hence, the relationship between the two countries, and particularly the personal relationship between Ben-Gurion and Adenauer, has been quite good. And if, as an aftermath of the trial, some deputies in the Neset, the Israeli parliament, succeeded in imposing certain restraints on the cultural exchange program with West Germany, this certainly was neither foreseen nor hoped for by Ben-Gurion. It is more noteworthy that he had not foreseen, or did not care to mention, 
that Eichmann's capture would trigger the first serious effort made by Germany to bring to trial at least those who were directly implicated in murder. The Central Agency for the Investigation of Nazi Crimes, belatedly founded by the West German state in 1958 and headed by Prosecutor Erwin Schuller, had run into all kinds of difficulties, caused partly by the unwillingness of German witnesses to cooperate and partly by the unwillingness of the local courts to prosecute on the basis of the material sent them from the central agency. Not that the trial in Jerusalem produced any important new evidence of the kind needed for the discovery of Eichmann's associates, but the news of Eichmann's sensational capture and of the impending trial had sufficient impact to persuade the local courts to use Mr. Schuller's findings and to overcome the native reluctance to do anything about murderers in our midst by the time-honoured means of posting rewards for the capture of well-known criminals. The results were amazing. Seven months after Eichmann's arrival in Jerusalem, and four months before the opening of the trial, Richard Baer, successor to Rudolf Hoess as commandant of Auschwitz, could finally be arrested. In rapid succession, most of the members of the so-called Eichmann Commando, Franz Novak, who had lived as a printer in Austria, Dr. Otto Hunscher, who had settled as a lawyer in West Germany, Hermann Krumi, who had become a druggist, Gustav Richter, former Jewish advisor in Romania, and Willy Zopf, who had filled the same post in Amsterdam, were arrested also. Although evidence against them had been published in Germany years before, in books and magazine articles, not one of them had found it necessary to live under an assumed name. For the first time since the close of the war, German newspapers were full of reports on the trials of Nazi criminals, all of them mass murderers. After May 1960, the month of Eichmann's capture, only first-degree murder could be prosecuted. All other offences were wiped out by the statute of limitations, which is 20 years for murder, and the reluctance of the local courts to prosecute these crimes showed itself only in the fantastically lenient sentences meted out to the accused. Thus, Dr. Otto Bradfisch of the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing units of the SS in the East, was sentenced to ten years of hard labor for the killing of 15,000 Jews. Dr. Otto Hunscher, Eichmann's legal expert and personally responsible for a last-minute deportation of some 1,200 Hungarian Jews, of whom at least 600 were killed, received a sentence of five years of hard labor. And Josef Lechtala, who had liquidated the Jewish inhabitants of Slutsk and Smolevichi in Russia, was sentenced to three years and six months. Among the new arrests were people of great prominence under the Nazis, most of whom had already been denazified by the German courts. One of them was SS General Karl Wolf, former chief of Himmler's personal staff, who, according to a document submitted in 1946 at Nuremberg, had greeted with particular joy the news that, for two weeks now, a train has been carrying every day 5,000 members of the chosen people from Warsaw to Treblinka, one of the eastern killing centers. Another was Wilhelm Kopper, who had at first managed the gassing in Kelner and then become successor to Friedrich Wilhelm Kruger in Poland. One of the most prominent among the higher SS leaders, whose task it had been to make Poland Judenrein, in post-war Germany, Kopper was director of a chocolate factory. Harsh sentences were occasionally meted out, but were even less reassuring when they went to such offenders as Erich von dem bach zelewski former general of the higher SS and police leader corps. He had been tried in 1961 for his participation in the Rome Rebellion in 1934 and sentenced to three and one-half years. He was then indicted again in 1962 for the killing of six German communists in 1933, tried before a jury in Nuremberg and sentenced to life. Neither indictment mentioned that bach Zalewski had been anti-partisan chief on the Eastern Front, or that he had participated in the Jewish massacres at Minsk and Mogilev in White Russia. Should German courts, on the pretext that war crimes are no crimes, make ethnic distinctions? Or is it possible that what was an unusually harsh sentence, at least in German post-war courts, was arrived at because bach Zelewski was among the very few who actually had suffered a nervous breakdown after the mass killings, had tried to protect Jews from the Einsatzgruppen, and had testified for the prosecution at Nuremberg. 
He was also the only one in this category who in 1952 had denounced himself publicly for mass murder, but he was never prosecuted for it. There is little hope that things will change now, even though the Adenauer administration has been forced to weed out of the judiciary more than 140 judges and prosecutors, along with many police officers with more than ordinarily compromising pasts, and to dismiss Wolfgang Immelwar Frankel, the chief prosecutor of the Federal Supreme Court, because, his middle name notwithstanding, he had been less than candid when asked about his Nazi past. It has been estimated that of the 11,500 judges in the Bundesrepublik, 5,000 were active in the courts under the Hitler regime. In November 1962, shortly after the purging of the judiciary, and six months after Eichmann's name had disappeared from the news, the long-awaited trial of Martin Fellens took place at Flensburg in an almost empty courtroom. The former higher SS and police leader, who had been a prominent member of the Free Democratic Party in Adenauer's Germany, was arrested in June 1960, a few weeks after Eichmann's capture. He was accused of participation in, and partial responsibility for, the murder of 40,000 Jews in Poland. After more than six weeks of detailed testimony, the prosecutor demanded the maximum penalty, a life sentence of hard labor. And the court sentenced Felens to four years, two and a half of which he had already served while waiting in jail to be tried. Be that as it may, there is no doubt that the Eichmann trial had its most far-reaching consequences in Germany. The attitude of the German people toward their own past, which all experts on the German question had puzzled over for fifteen years, could hardly have been more clearly demonstrated. They themselves did not much care one way or the other, and did not particularly mind the presence of murderers at large in the country, since none of them were likely to commit murder of their own free will. However, if world opinion, or rather what the Germans called das Ausland, collecting all countries outside Germany into a singular noun, became obstinate and demanded that these people be punished, they were perfectly willing to oblige, at least up to a point. Chancellor Adenauer had foreseen embarrassment and voiced his apprehension that the trial would stir up again all the horrors and produce a new wave of anti-German feeling throughout the world, as indeed it did. During the ten months that Israel needed to prepare the trial, Germany was busy bracing herself against its predictable results by showing an unprecedented zeal for searching out and prosecuting Nazi criminals within the country. But at no time did either the German authorities or any significant segment of public opinion demand Eichmann's extradition, which seemed the obvious move, since every sovereign state is jealous of its right to sit in judgment on its own offenders. The official position of the Adenauer government that this was not possible because there existed no extradition treaty between Israel and Germany is not valid. That meant only that Israel could not have been forced to extradite. Fritz Bauer, Attorney General of Hessen, saw the point and applied to the federal government in Bonn to start extradition proceedings. But Mr. Bauer's feelings in this matter were the feelings of a German Jew, and they were not shared by German public opinion. His application was not only refused by Bonn, it was hardly noticed and remained totally unsupported. Another argument against extradition, offered by the observers the West German government sent to Jerusalem, was that Germany had abolished capital punishment and hence was unable to mete out the sentence Eichmann deserved. In view of the leniency shown by German courts to Nazi mass murderers, it is difficult not to suspect bad faith in this objection. Surely the greatest political hazard of an Eichmann trial in Germany would have been acquittal for lack of mens rea, as J.J. J. Janssen pointed out in the Rheinische Merkur. There is another more delicate and politically more relevant side to this matter. It is one thing to ferret out criminals and murderers from their hiding places, and it is another thing to find them prominent and flourishing in the public realm, to encounter innumerable men in the federal and state administrations and generally in public office whose careers had bloomed under the Hitler regime. True, if the Adenauer administration had been too sensitive about employing officials with a compromising Nazi past— there might have been no administration at all. But the truth is, of course, the exact opposite of Dr. Adenauer's assertion that only a relatively small percentage of Germans had been Nazis and that a great majority had been happy to help their Jewish fellow citizens when they could. At least one German newspaper, the Frankfurter Rundschau, 
asked itself the obvious question, long overdue, why so many people, who must have known, for instance, the record of the chief prosecutor, had kept silent? And then came up with the even more obvious answer, because they themselves felt incriminated. The logic of the Eichmann trial, as Ben-Gurion conceived of it, with its stress on general issues to the detriment of legal niceties, would have demanded exposure of the complicity of all German offices and authorities in the final solution of all civil servants in the state ministries, of the regular armed forces with their general staff, of the judiciary and of the business world. But although the prosecution, as conducted by Mr. Hausner, went as far afield as to put witness after witness on the stand, who testified to things that, while gruesome and true enough, had no or only the slightest connection with the deeds of the accused, it carefully avoided touching upon this highly explosive matter, upon the almost ubiquitous complicity which had stretched far beyond the ranks of party membership. There were widespread rumours prior to the trial that Eichmann had named several hundred prominent personalities of the Federal Republic as his accomplices, but these rumours were not true. In his opening speech, Mr. Hausner mentioned Eichmann's accomplices in the crime who were neither gangsters nor men of the underworld, and promised that we should encounter them, doctors and lawyers, scholars, bankers and economists, in those councils that resolved to exterminate the Jews. This promise was not kept, nor could it have been kept in the form in which it was made. For there never existed a council that resolved anything, and the robed dignitaries with academic degrees never decided on the extermination of the Jews. They only came together to plan the necessary steps in carrying out an order given by Hitler. Still, one such case was brought to the attention of the court, that of Dr. Hans Globke, one of Adenauer's closest advisers, who, more than twenty-five years ago, was co-author of an infamous commentary on the Nuremberg Laws, and somewhat later author of the brilliant idea of compelling all German Jews to take Israel, or Sarah, as a middle name. But Mr. Globke's name, and only his name, was inserted into the district court proceedings by the defence, and probably only in the hope of persuading the Adenauer government to start extradition proceedings. At any rate, the former Ministerial Rat of the Interior and present Staatssekretär in Adenauer's Chancellery doubtless had more right than the ex-Mufti of Jerusalem to figure in the history of what the Jews had actually suffered from the Nazis. For it was history that, as far as the prosecution was concerned, stood in the centre of the trial. It is not an individual that is in the dock at this historic trial, and not the Nazi regime alone, but anti-Semitism throughout history. This was the tone set by Ben-Gurion, and faithfully followed by Mr. Hausner, who began his opening address, which lasted through three sessions, with Pharaoh in Egypt and Haman's decree to destroy, to slay, and to cause them to perish. He then proceeded to quote Ezekiel. And when I, the Lord, passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, In thy blood live, explaining that these words must be understood as the imperative that has confronted this nation ever since its first appearance on the stage of history. It was bad history and cheap rhetoric. Worse, it was clearly at cross-purposes with putting Eichmann on trial suggesting that perhaps he was only an innocent executor of some mysteriously foreordained destiny, or for that matter even of anti-Semitism, which perhaps was necessary to blaze the trail of the blood-stained road travelled by this people to fulfil its destiny. A few sessions later, when Professor Salo W. Barron of Columbia University had testified to the more recent history of Eastern European Jewry, Dr. Servatius could no longer resist temptation and asked the obvious questions. Why did all this bad luck fall upon the Jewish people, and don't you think that irrational motives are at the basis of the fate of this people? Beyond the understanding of a human being? Is not there perhaps something like the spirit of history, which brings history forward without the influence of men? Is not Mr. Hausner basically in agreement with the school of historical law? An allusion to Hegel. And has he not shown that what the leaders do will not always lead to the aim and destination they wanted? Here the intention was to destroy the Jewish people, and the objective was not reached, and a new and flourishing state came into being. The argument of the defence, 
had now come perilously close to the newest anti-Semitic notion about the elders of Zion, set forth in all seriousness a few weeks earlier in the Egyptian National Assembly by Deputy Foreign Minister Hussein Zulfikar Sabri. Hitler was innocent of the slaughter of the Jews. He was a victim of the Zionists, who had compelled him to perpetrate crimes that would eventually enable them to achieve their aim, the creation of the State of Israel. Except that Dr. Servatius, following the philosophy of history expounded by the prosecutor, had put history in the place usually reserved for the elders of Zion. Despite the intentions of Ben-Gurion and all the efforts of the prosecution, there remained an individual in the dock, a person of flesh and blood, and if Ben-Gurion did not care what verdict is delivered against Eichmann, it was undeniably the sole task of the Jerusalem court to deliver one. 2. The Accused Otto Adolf, son of Karl Adolf Eichmann and Maria Ne Schefferling, caught in a suburb of Buenos Aires on the evening of May 11, 1960, flown to Israel nine days later, brought to trial in the district court in Jerusalem on April 11, 1961, stood accused on 15 counts. Together with others, he had committed crimes against the Jewish people, crimes against humanity, and war crimes during the whole period of the Nazi regime, and especially during the period of the Second World War. The Nazis and Nazi collaborators' punishment law of 1950, under which he was tried, provides that a person who has committed one of these offences is liable to the death penalty. To each count, Eichmann pleaded, not guilty in the sense of the indictment. In what sense, then, did he think he was guilty? In the long cross-examination of the accused, according to him, the longest ever known, neither the defence nor the prosecution, nor, finally, any of the three judges ever bothered to ask him this obvious question. His lawyer, Robert Servatius of Cologne, hired by Eichmann and paid by the Israeli government, following the precedent set at the Nuremberg trials, where all attorneys for the defence were paid by the Tribunal of the Victorious Powers, answered the question in a press interview. Eichmann feels guilty before God, not before the law. But this answer remained without confirmation from the accused himself. The defence would apparently have preferred him to plead not guilty on the grounds that under the then-existing Nazi legal system he had not done anything wrong, that what he was accused of were not crimes but acts of state, over which no other state has jurisdiction, par in parem imperium known habit that it had been his duty to obey, and that in Servatius's words he had committed acts for which you are decorated if you win and go to the gallows if you lose. Thus Goebbels had declared in 1943, We will go down in history as the greatest statesmen of all times, or as their greatest criminals. Outside Israel, at a meeting of the Catholic Academy in Bavaria, devoted to what the Rheinische Merkur called the ticklish problem of the possibilities and limits in coping with historical and political guilt through criminal proceedings, Servatius went a step farther and declared that the only legitimate criminal problem of the Eichmann trial lies in pronouncing judgment against his Israeli captors, which so far has not been done. A statement, incidentally, that is somewhat difficult to reconcile with his repeated and widely publicized utterances in Israel, in which he called the conduct of the trial a great spiritual achievement, comparing it favorably with the Nuremberg trials. Eichmann's own attitude was different. First of all, the indictment for murder was wrong. With the killing of Jews, I had nothing to do. I never killed a Jew or a non-Jew, for that matter. I never killed any human being. I never gave an order to kill either a Jew or a non-Jew. I just did not do it. Or, as he was later to qualify this statement, it so happened that I had not once to do it, for he left no doubt that he would have killed his own father if he had received an order to that effect. Hence he repeated over and over what he had already stated in the so-called Sasson documents, the interview that he'd given in 1955 in Argentina to the Dutch journalist Sasson, a former SS man who was also a fugitive from justice, and that after Eichmann's capture had been published in part by Life in this country and by Der Stern in Germany, that he could be accused only of aiding and abetting the annihilation of the Jews, which he declared in Jerusalem to have been one of the greatest crimes in the history of humanity. 
The defense paid no attention to Eichmann's own theory, but the prosecution wasted much time in an unsuccessful effort to prove that Eichmann had once, at least, killed with his own hands a Jewish boy in Hungary, and spent even more time and more successfully on a note that Franz Rademacher, the Jewish expert in the German Foreign Office, had scribbled on one of the documents dealing with Yugoslavia during a telephone conversation, which read, Eichmann proposes shooting. This turned out to be the only order to kill, if that is what it was, for which there existed even a shred of evidence. The evidence was more questionable than it appeared to be during the trial, at which the judges accepted the prosecutor's version against Eichmann's categorical denial, a denial that was very ineffective, since he had forgotten the brief incident, a mere 8,000 people, which was not so striking, as Servatius put it. The incident took place in the autumn of 1941, six months after Germany had occupied the Serbian part of Yugoslavia. The army had been plagued by partisan warfare ever since, and it was the military authorities who decided to solve two problems at a stroke by shooting a hundred Jews and gypsies as hostages for every dead German soldier. To be sure, neither Jews nor gypsies were partisans, but in the words of the responsible civilian officer in the military government, a certain Stadtrat Harald Turner, the Jews we had in our camps, anyhow. After all, they too are Serb nationals, and besides, they have to disappear, quoted by Raoul Hilberg in The Destruction of the European Jews, 1961. The camps had been set up by General Franz Burma, military governor of the region, and they housed Jewish males only. Neither General Burma nor Staatsrat Turner waited for Eichmann's approval before starting to shoot Jews and gypsies by the thousand. The trouble began when Burma, without consulting the appropriate police and SS authorities, decided to deport all his Jews, probably in order to show that no special troops operating under a different command were required to make Serbia Judenrein. Eichmann was informed, since it was a matter of deportation, and he refused approval because the move would interfere with other plans. But it was not Eichmann, but Martin Luther of the Foreign Office, who reminded General Burma that... In other territories, meaning Russia, other military commanders have taken care of considerably greater number of Jews without even mentioning it. In any event, if Eichmann actually did propose shooting, he told the military only that they should go on doing what they'd done all along, and that the question of hostages was entirely in their own competence. Obviously, this was an army affair, since only males were involved. The implementation of the final solution in Serbia started about six months later, when women and children were rounded up and disposed of in mobile gas vans. During cross-examination, Eichmann, as usual, chose the most complicated and least likely explanation. Rademacher had needed the support of the head office for Reich Security, Eichmann's outfit, for his own stand on the matter in the Foreign Office, and therefore had forged the document. Rademacher himself explained the incident much more reasonably at his own trial before a West German court in 1952. The army was responsible for order in Serbia and had to kill rebellious Jews by shooting. This sounded more plausible, but it was a lie, for we know from Nazi sources that the Jews were not rebellious. If it was difficult to interpret a remark made over the phone as an order, it was more difficult to believe that Eichmann had been in a position to give orders to the generals of the army. Would he then have pleaded guilty if he had been indicted as an accessory to murder? Perhaps, but he would have made important qualifications. What he had done was a crime only in retrospect, and he had always been a law-abiding citizen because Hitler's orders, which he had certainly executed to the best of his ability, had possessed the force of law in the Third Reich. The defense could have quoted, in support of Eichmann's thesis, the testimony of one of the best-known experts on constitutional law in the Third Reich, Theodor Mounts, currently Minister of Education and Culture in Bavaria, who stated in 1943, in Gestalt und Recht der Polizei, the command of the Führer is the absolute centre of the present legal order. Those who today told Eichmann that he could have acted differently simply did not know or had forgotten how things had been. He did not want to be one of those who now pretended that they'd always been against it, whereas in fact they had been very eager to do what they were told to do. 
However, times change, and he, like Professor Mounts, had arrived at different insights. What he had done, he had done. He did not want to deny it. Rather, he proposed to hang myself in public as a warning example for all anti-Semites on this earth. By this, he did not mean to say that he regretted anything. Repentance is for little children. Even under considerable pressure from his lawyer, he did not change this position. In a discussion of Himmler's offer in 1944 to exchange a million Jews for 10,000 trucks and his own role in this plan, Eichmann was asked, Mr. Witness, in the negotiations with your superiors, did you express any pity for the Jews, and did you say there was room to help them? And he replied, I am here under oath and must speak the truth. Not out of mercy did I launch this transaction, which would have been fine, except that it was not Eichmann who launched it. But he then continued quite truthfully, My reasons I explained this morning, and they were as follows. Himmler had sent his own man to Budapest to deal with matters of Jewish emigration, which, incidentally, had become a flourishing business, for enormous amounts of money Jews could buy their way out. Eichmann, however, did not mention this. It was the fact that here matters of emigration were dealt with by a man who did not belong to the police force that made him indignant, because I had to help and to implement deportation, and matters of emigration, on which I considered myself an expert, were assigned to a man who was new to the unit. I was fed up. I decided that I had to do something to take matters of emigration into my own hands. Throughout the trial, Eichmann tried to clarify, mostly without success, this second point in his plea of not guilty in the sense of the indictment. The indictment implied not only that he had acted on purpose, which he did not deny, but out of base motives and in full knowledge of the criminal nature of his deeds. As for the base motives, he was perfectly sure that he was not what he called an inner Schweinehund, a dirty bastard in the depths of his heart. And as for his conscience, he remembered perfectly well that he would have had a bad conscience only if he had not done what he had been ordered to, to ship millions of men, women, and children to their death with great zeal and the most meticulous care. This, admittedly, was hard to take. Half a dozen psychiatrists had certified him as normal. More normal at any rate than I am after having examined him, one of them was said to have exclaimed while another had found that his whole psychological outlook, his attitude toward his wife and children, mother and father, brothers, sisters and friends, was not only normal but most desirable. And finally, the minister who'd paid regular visits to him in prison after the Supreme Court had finished hearing his appeal reassured everybody by declaring Eichmann to be a man with very positive ideas. Behind the comedy of the soul experts lay the hard fact that his was obviously no case of moral, let alone legal, insanity. Mr. Hausner's recent revelations in the Saturday Evening Post of things he could not bring out at the trial have contradicted the information given informally in Jerusalem. Eichmann, we are now told, had been alleged by the psychiatrist to be a man obsessed with a dangerous and insatiable urge to kill, a perverted, sadistic personality, in which case he would have belonged in an insane asylum. Worse, his was obviously also no case of insane hatred of Jews, of fanatical anti-Semitism or indoctrination of any kind. He personally never had anything whatever against Jews. On the contrary, he had plenty of private reasons for not being a Jew-hater. To be sure, there were fanatic anti-Semites among his closest friends, for instance, Laszlo Endre, state secretary in charge of political, that is, Jewish affairs in Hungary, who was hanged in Budapest in 1946. But this, according to Eichmann, was more or less in the spirit of some of my best friends are anti-Semites. Alas, nobody believed him. The prosecutor did not believe him because that was not his job. Counsel for the defense paid no attention because he, unlike Eichmann, was to all appearances not interested in questions of conscience. And the judges did not believe him because they were too good, and perhaps also too conscious, of the very foundations of their profession, to admit that an average, normal person, neither feeble-minded nor indoctrinated nor cynical, could be perfectly incapable of telling right from wrong. They preferred to conclude from occasional lies that he was a liar, and missed the greatest moral and even legal challenge of the whole case. 
Their case rested on the assumption that the defendant, like all normal persons, must have been aware of the criminal nature of his acts. And Eichmann was indeed normal, insofar as he was no exception within the Nazi regime. However, under the conditions of the Third Reich, only exceptions could be expected to react normally. This simple truth of the matter created a dilemma for the judges, which they could neither resolve nor escape. He was born on March 19, 1906, in Zerlingen, a German town in the Rhineland famous for its knives, scissors, and surgical instruments. Fifty-four years later, indulging in his favorite pastime of writing his memoirs, he described this memorable event as follows. Today, fifteen years and a day after May 8, 1945, I begin to lead my thoughts back to that 19th of March of the year 1906, when at five o'clock in the morning I entered life on earth in the aspect of a human being. The manuscript has not been released by the Israeli authorities. Harry Mulish succeeded in studying this autobiography for half an hour, and the German-Jewish weekly Der Aufbau was able to publish short excerpts from it. According to his religious beliefs, which had not changed since the Nazi period, in Jerusalem Eichmann declared himself to be a Gottglaubiger, the Nazi term for those who had broken with Christianity, and he refused to take his oath on the Bible. This event was to be ascribed to a higher bearer of meaning, an entity somehow identical with the movement of the universe, to which human life, in itself devoid of higher meaning, is subject. The terminology is quite suggestive. To call God a Hurin Zinnestrager meant linguistically to give him some place in the military hierarchy, since the Nazis had changed the military recipient of orders, the Befelsempfanger, into a bearer of orders, a Befelsdrager, indicating, as in the ancient bearer of ill tidings, the burden of responsibility and of importance that weighed supposedly upon those who had to execute orders. Moreover, Eichmann, like everyone connected with the final solution, was officially a bearer of secrets, a Geheiminstrager, as well, which, as far as self-importance went, certainly was nothing to sneeze at. But Eichmann, not very much interested in metaphysics, remained singularly silent on any more intimate relationship between the bearer of meaning and the bearer of orders, and proceeded to a consideration of the other possible cause of his existence, his parents. They would hardly have been so overjoyed at the arrival of their firstborn had they been able to watch how in the hour of my birth the norn of misfortune, to spite the norn of good fortune, was already spinning threads of grief and sorrow into my life. But a kind, impenetrable veil kept my parents from seeing into the future. The misfortune started soon enough. It started in school. Eichmann's father, first an accountant for the Tramways and Electricity Company in Zerlingen, and after 1913 an official of the same corporation in Austria, in Linz, had five children, four sons and a daughter, of whom only Adolf, the eldest, it seems, was unable to finish high school, or even to graduate from the vocational school for engineering into which he was then put. Throughout his life, Eichmann deceived people about his early misfortunes, by hiding behind the more honourable financial misfortunes of his father. In Israel, however, during his first sessions with Captain Avner Less, the police examiner who was to spend approximately 35 days with him and who produced 3,564 typewritten pages from 76 recorder tapes, he was in a bullion mood, full of enthusiasm about this unique opportunity to pour forth everything I know and by the same token to advance to the rank of the most cooperative defendant ever. His enthusiasm was soon dampened, though never quite extinguished, when he was confronted with concrete questions based on irrefutable documents. The best proof of his initial, boundless confidence, obviously wasted on Captain Less, who said to Harry Mulish, I was Mr. Eichmann's father, confessor, was that for the first time in his life he admitted his early disasters, although he must have been aware of the fact that he thus contradicted himself on several important entries in all his official Nazi records. Well, the disasters were ordinary. Since he had not exactly been the most hard-working pupil, or one may add the most gifted, his father had taken him first from high school and then from vocational school long before graduation. Hence the profession that appears on all his official documents, construction engineer, 
had about as much connection with reality as the statement that his birthplace was Palestine and that he was fluent in Hebrew and Yiddish. Another outright lie Eichmann had loved to tell, both to his SS comrades and to his Jewish victims. It was in the same vein that he had always pretended he had been dismissed from his job as salesman for the vacuum oil company in Austria because of membership in the National Socialist Party. The version he confided to Captain Less was less dramatic, though probably not the truth either. He had been fired because it was a time of unemployment when unmarried employees were the first to lose their jobs. This explanation, which at first seems plausible, is not very satisfactory, because he lost his job in the spring of 1933, when he had been engaged for two full years to Veronica or Vera Lieble, who later became his wife. Why had he not married her before, when he still had a good job? He finally married in March 1935, probably because bachelors in the SS, as in the Vacuum Oil Company, were never sure of their jobs and could not be promoted. Clearly bragging had always been one of his cardinal vices. While young Eichmann was doing poorly in school, his father left the tramway and electric company and went into business for himself. He bought a small mining enterprise and put his unpromising youngster to work in it as an ordinary mining labourer, but only until he found him a job in the sales department of the Oberes der Reichischen Elektrobau Company, where Eichmann remained for over two years. He was now about twenty-two years old, and without any prospects for a career, the only thing he had learned, perhaps, was how to sell. What then happened was what he himself called his first break, of which again we have two rather different versions. In a handwritten biographical record he submitted in 1939 to win a promotion in the SS, he described it as follows. I worked during the years of 1925 to 1927 as a salesman for the Austrian Electrobau Company. I left this position of my own free will, as the Vacuum Oil Company of Vienna offered me the representation for Upper Austria. The key word here is offered, since according to the story he told Captain Less in Israel, nobody had offered him anything. His own mother had died when he was ten years old, and his father had married again. A cousin of his stepmother, a man he called Uncle, who was president of the Austrian Automobile Club and was married to the daughter of a Jewish businessman in Czechoslovakia, had used his connection with the general director of the Austrian Vacuum Oil Company, a Jewish Mr. Weiss, to obtain for his unfortunate relation a job as travelling salesman. Eichmann was properly grateful. The Jews in his family were among his private reasons for not hating Jews. Even in 1943 or 1944, when the final solution was in full swing, he had not forgotten. The daughter of this marriage, half-Jewish, according to the Nuremberg laws, came to see me in order to obtain my permission for her emigration into Switzerland. Of course I granted this request, and the same uncle came also to see me to ask me to intervene for some Viennese Jewish couple. I mentioned this only to show that I myself had no hatred for Jews— for my whole education through my mother and my father had been strictly Christian. My mother, because of her Jewish relatives, held different opinions from those current in SS circles. He went to considerable lengths to prove his point. He had never harboured any ill feelings against his victims, and what is more, he had never made a secret of that fact. I explained this to Dr. Lohenherz, head of the Jewish community in Vienna, as I explained it to Dr. Kastner, vice-president of the Zionist organization in Budapest. I think I told it to everybody. Each of my men knew it. They all heard it from me sometime. Even in elementary school, I had a classmate with whom I spent my free time, and he came to our house, a family in Linz by the name of Seba. The last time we met, we walked together through the streets of Linz, I already with the party emblem of the NSDAP, the Nazi party, in my buttonhole, and he did not think anything of it. Had Eichmann been a bit less prim, or the police examination, which refrained from cross-examination, presumably to remain assured of his cooperation, less discreet, his lack of prejudice might have shown itself in still another aspect. It seems that in Vienna, where he was so extraordinarily successful in arranging the forced emigration of Jews, he had a Jewish mistress, an old flame from Linz. Russian Shanda, sexual intercourse with Jews, was probably the greatest crime a member of the SS could commit. 
and though during the war the raping of Jewish girls became a favourite pastime at the front, it was by no means common for a higher SS officer to have an affair with a Jewish woman. Thus Eichmann's repeated violent denunciations of Julius Streicher, the insane and obscene editor of Der Stürmer, and of his pornographic anti-Semitism, were perhaps personally motivated, and the expression of more than the routine contempt an enlightened SS man was supposed to show toward the vulgar passions of lesser party luminaries. The five and a half years with the vacuum oil company must have been among the happier ones in Eichmann's life. He made a good living during a time of severe unemployment, and he was still living with his parents, except when he was out on the road. The date when this idyll came to an end, Pentecost, 1933, was among the few he always remembered. Actually, things had taken a turn for the worse somewhat earlier. At the end of 1932, he was unexpectedly transferred from Linz to Salzburg, very much against his inclinations. I lost all joy in my work. I no longer liked to sell, to make calls. From such sudden losses of Arbeitsfreude, Eichmann was to suffer throughout his life. The worst of them occurred when he was told of the Führer's order for the physical extermination of the Jews, in which he was to play such an important role. This, too, came unexpectedly. He himself had never thought of such a solution through violence, and he described his reaction in the same words. I now lost everything, all joy in my work, all initiative, all interest. I was, so to speak, blown out. A similar blowing out must have happened in 1932 in Salzburg, and from his own account it is clear that he cannot have been very surprised when he was fired, though we need not believe his saying that he had been very happy about his dismissal. For whatever reasons, the year 1932 marked a turning point of his life. It was in April of this year that he joined the National Socialist Party and entered the SS, upon an invitation of Ernst Kaltenbrunner, a young lawyer in Linz who later became chief of the head office for Reich Security, the Reichische Heitshauptamt, or RSHA, as I shall call it henceforth, in one of whose six main departments, Bureau 4, under the command of Heinrich Müller, Eichmann was eventually employed as head of Section B4. In court, Eichmann gave the impression of a typical member of the lower middle classes, and this impression was more than borne out by every sentence he spoke or wrote while in prison. But this was misleading. He was rather the déclassé son of a solid middle-class family, and it was indicative of his come-down in social status that while his father was a good friend of Kaltenbrunner's father, who was also a Lintz lawyer, the relationship of the two sons was rather cool, Eichmann was unmistakably treated by Kaltenbrunner as his social inferior. Before Eichmann entered the party and the SS, he had proved that he was a joiner, and May 8, 1945, the official date of Germany's defeat, was significant for him mainly because it then dawned upon him that thenceforward he would have to live without being a member of something or other. I sensed I would have to live a leaderless and difficult individual life, I would receive no directives from anybody. No orders and commands would any longer be issued to me. No pertinent ordinances would be there to consult. In brief, a life never known before lay before me. When he was a child, his parents, uninterested in politics, had enrolled him in the Young Men's Christian Association, from which he later went into the German youth movement, the Wondervogel. During his four unsuccessful years in high school, he had joined the Jungfrontkampfeverband, the youth section of the German-Austrian Organization of War Veterans, which, though violently pro-German and anti-Republican, was tolerated by the Austrian government. When Kaltenbrunner suggested that he enter the SS, he was just on the point of becoming a member of an altogether different outfit, the Freemasons' Lodge Schlaraffia, an association of businessmen, physicians, actors, civil servants, etc., who came together to cultivate merriment and gaiety. Each member had to give a lecture from time to time whose tenor was to be humour, refined humour. Kaltenbrunner explained to Eichmann that he would have to give up this merry society because, as a Nazi, he could not be a Freemason, a word that at the time was unknown to him. The choice between the SS and Schlaraffia, the name derives from Schlaraffenland, the glutton's cloud cuckoo land of German fairy tales, might have been hard to make, but he was kicked out of Schlaraffia anyhow. He had committed a sin that, even now, as he told the story in the Israeli prison, 
made him blush with shame. Contrary to my upbringing, I had tried, though I was the youngest, to invite my companions to a glass of wine. A leaf in the whirlwind of time, he was blown from Schlaraffia, the never-never land of tables set by magic and roast chickens that flew into your mouth, or more accurately from the company of respectable Philistines with degrees and assured careers and refined humour, whose worst vice was probably an irrepressible desire for practical jokes, into the marching columns of the Thousand-Year Reich, which lasted exactly twelve years and three months. At any rate, he did not enter the party out of conviction, nor was he ever convinced by it. Whenever he was asked to give his reasons, he repeated the same embarrassed clichés about the Treaty of Versailles and unemployment. Rather, as he pointed out in court, it was like being swallowed up by the party against all expectations and without previous decision. It happened so quickly and suddenly. He had no time and less desire to be properly informed. He did not even know the party programme. He never read Mein Kampf. Kaltenbrunner had said to him, Why not join the SS? And he had replied, Why not? That was how it had happened, and that was about all there was to it. Of course, that was not all there was to it. What Eichmann failed to tell the presiding judge in cross-examination was that he had been an ambitious young man who was fed up with his job as travelling salesman even before the vacuum oil company was fed up with him. From a humdrum life, without significance and consequence, the wind had blown him into history, as he understood it, namely into a movement that always kept moving, and in which somebody like him, already a failure in the eyes of his social class, of his family, and hence in his own eyes as well, could start from scratch and still make a career. And if he did not always like what he had to do, for example, dispatching people to their death by the train load instead of forcing them to emigrate, if he guessed rather early that the whole business would come to a bad end, with Germany losing the war, if all his most cherished plans came to nothing, the evacuation of European Jewry to Madagascar, the establishment of a Jewish territory in the Nisko region of Poland, the experiment with carefully built defence installations around his Berlin office to repel Russian tanks, and if, to his greatest grief and sorrow, he never advanced beyond the grade of SS Obersturmbannführer, a rank equivalent to Lieutenant Colonel. In short, if, with the exception of the year in Vienna, his life was beset with frustrations, he never forgot what the alternative would have been. Not only in Argentina, leading the unhappy existence of a refugee, but also in the courtroom in Jerusalem, with his life as good as forfeited, he might still have preferred, if anybody had asked him, to be hanged as Obersturm von Führer A.D. in retirement, rather than living out his life quietly and normally as a travelling salesman for the Vacuum Oil Company. The beginnings of Eichmann's new career were not very promising. In the spring of 1933, while he was out of a job, the Nazi Party and all its affiliates were suspended in Austria because of Hitler's rise to power. But even without this new calamity, a career in the Austrian Party would have been out of the question. Even those who had enlisted in the SS were still working at their regular jobs. Kaltenbrunner was still a partner in his father's law firm. Eichmann therefore decided to go to Germany, which was all the more natural because his family had never given up German citizenship. This fact was of some relevance during the trial. Dr. Servatius had asked the West German government to demand extradition of the accused and failing this to pay the expenses of the defence, and Bonn refused on the grounds that Eichmann was not a German national, which was a patent untruth. At Passau, on the German border, he was suddenly a travelling salesman again, and when he reported to the regional leader, he asked him eagerly if he had perhaps some connection with the Bavarian Vacuum Oil Company. Well, this was one of his not infrequent relapses from one period of his life into another— Whenever he was confronted with telltale signs of an unregenerate Nazi outlook, in his life in Argentina and even in the Jerusalem jail, he excused himself with, There I go again, the old song and dance, the alto tour. But his relapse in Passa was quickly cured. He was told that he'd better enlist for some military training. All right with me, I thought to myself, why not become a soldier? and he was sent in quick succession to two Bavarian SS camps, in Lechfeld and in Dachau. He had nothing to do with the concentration camp there, where the Austrian Legion in exile received its training. 
Thus he did become an Austrian, after a fashion, despite his German passport. He remained in these military camps from August 1933 until September 1934, advanced to the rank of Scharfuhrer, corporal, and had plenty of time to reconsider his willingness to embark upon the career of a soldier. According to his own account, there was but one thing in which he distinguished himself during these fourteen months, and that was punishment drill, which he performed with great obstinacy in the wrathful spirit of "'Serves my father right if my hands freeze. Why doesn't he buy me gloves?' But apart from such rather dubious pleasures, to which he owed his first promotion, he had a terrible time. The humdrum of military service, that was something I couldn't stand, day after day always the same, over and over again the same. Thus bored to distraction, he heard that the security service of the Reichsführer SS, Himmler's Sicherheitsdient, or SD, as I shall call it henceforth, had jobs open, and applied immediately. 3. An Expert on the Jewish Question In 1934, when Eichmann applied successfully for a job, the SD was a relatively new apparatus in the SS, founded two years earlier by Heinrich Himmler to serve as the intelligence service of the party, and now headed by Reinhard Heydrich, a former Navy intelligence officer who was to become, as Gerald Reitlinger put it, the real engineer of the final solution. The Final Solution, 1961. Its initial task had been to spy on party members, and thus to give the SS an ascendancy over the regular party apparatus. Meanwhile, it had taken on some additional duties, becoming the Information and Research Center for the Secret State Police, or Gestapo. These were the first steps toward the merger of the SS and the police, which, however, was not carried out until September 1939, although Himmler held the double post of Reichsführer SS and chief of the German police from 1936 on. Eichmann, of course, could not have known of these future developments, but he seems to have known nothing either of the nature of the SD when he entered it. This is quite possible, because the operations of the SD had always been top secret. As far as he was concerned, it was all a misunderstanding, and at first a great disappointment, for I thought this was what I had read about in the Münchener Illustrierten Zeitung. When the high party officials drove along, there were commando guards with them, men standing on the running boards of the cars. In short, I had mistaken the security service of the Reichsführer SS for the Reich Security Service. And nobody set me right, and no one told me anything— for I had not the slightest notion of what now was revealed to me. The question of whether he was telling the truth had a certain bearing on the trial, where it had to be decided whether he had volunteered for his position or had been drafted into it. His misunderstanding, if such it was, is not inexplicable. The SS, or Schutzstaffeln, had originally been established as special units for the protection of the party leaders. His disappointment, however, consisted chiefly in that he had to start all over again, that he was back at the bottom, and his only consolation was that there were others who had made the same mistake. He was put into the information department, where his first job was to file all information concerning Freemasonry, which in the early Nazi ideological muddle was somehow lumped with Judaism, Catholicism and Communism, and to help in the establishment of a Freemasonry museum. He now had ample opportunity to learn what this strange word meant that Colton Brunner had thrown at him in their discussion of Schlaraffia. Incidentally, an eagerness to establish museums commemorating their enemies was very characteristic of the Nazis. During the war, several services competed bitterly for the honor of establishing anti-Jewish museums and libraries. We owe to this strange craze the salvage of many great cultural treasures of European Jewry, the trouble was that things were again very, very boring, and he was greatly relieved when, after four or five months of Freemasonry, he was put into the brand-new department concerned with Jews. This was the real beginning of the career which was to end in the Jerusalem court. It was the year 1935 when Germany, contrary to the stipulations of the Treaty of Versailles, introduced general conscription and publicly announced plans for rearmament, including the building of an air force and a navy. 
It was also the year when Germany, having left the League of Nations in 1933, prepared, neither quietly nor secretly, the occupation of the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland. It was the time of Hitler's peace speeches. Germany needs peace and desires peace. We recognize Poland as the home of a great and nationally conscious people. Germany neither intends nor wishes to interfere in the internal affairs of Austria, to annex Austria, or to conclude an Anschluss. And above all, it was the year when the Nazi regime won general and unhappily genuine recognition in Germany and abroad, when Hitler was admired everywhere as a great national statesman. In Germany itself, it was a time of transition. Because of the enormous rearmament program, unemployment had been liquidated. The initial resistance of the working class was broken, and the hostility of the regime, which had at first been directed primarily against anti-fascists, communists, socialists, left-wing intellectuals, and Jews in prominent positions, had not yet shifted entirely to persecution of the Jews qua Jews. To be sure, one of the first steps taken by the Nazi government back in 1933 had been the exclusion of Jews from the civil service. Which in Germany included all teaching positions from grammar school to university, and most branches of the entertainment industry, including radio, the theatre, the opera, and concerts, and in general their removal from public offices. But private businesses remained almost untouched until 1938, and even the legal and medical professions were only gradually abolished, although Jewish students were excluded from most universities and were nowhere permitted to graduate. Emigration of Jews in these years proceeded in a not unduly accelerated and generally orderly fashion, and the currency restrictions that made it difficult but not impossible for Jews to take their money, or at least the greater part of it, out of the country were the same for non-Jews. They dated back to the days of the Weimar Republic. There were a certain number of Einzelaktionen, individual actions putting pressure on Jews to sell their property at often ridiculously low prices. But these usually occurred in small towns, and indeed could be traced to the spontaneous individual initiative of some enterprising stormtroopers, the so-called SA men, who, except for their officer corps, were mostly recruited from the lower classes. The police, it is true, never stopped these excesses, but the Nazi authorities were not too happy about them because they affected the value of real estate all over the country. The emigrants, unless they were political refugees, were young people who realized that there was no future for them in Germany, and since they soon found out that there was hardly any future for them in other European countries either, some Jewish emigrants actually returned during this period. When Eichmann was asked how he had reconciled his personal feelings about Jews with the outspoken and violent anti-Semitism of the party he had joined, he replied with the proverb. Nothing's as hot when you eat it as when it's being cooked, a proverb that was then on the lips of many Jews as well. They lived in a fool's paradise, in which, for a few years, even Streicher spoke of a legal solution of the Jewish problem. It took the organized pogroms of November 1938, the so-called Kristallnacht or Night of Broken Glass, when 7,500 Jewish shop windows were broken, all synagogues went up in flames, and 20,000 Jewish men were taken off to concentration camps to expel them from it. The frequently forgotten point of the matter is that the famous Nuremberg Laws issued in the fall of 1935 had failed to do the trick. The testimony of three witnesses from Germany, high-ranking former officials of the Zionist organization who left Germany shortly before the outbreak of the war, gave only the barest glimpse into the true state of affairs during the first five years of the Nazi regime. The Nuremberg Laws had deprived the Jews of their political, but not of their civil rights. They were no longer citizens, Reichsbürger, but they remained members of the German state, Staatsangehörige. Even if they emigrated, they were not automatically stateless. Sexual intercourse between Jews and Germans and the contraction of mixed marriages were forbidden. Also, no German woman under the age of forty-five could be employed in a Jewish household. Of these stipulations, only the last was of practical significance. The others merely legalized a de facto situation. Hence, the Nuremberg laws were felt to have stabilized the new situation of Jews in the German Reich. They had been second-class citizens, to put it mildly, since January thirty, nineteen thirty-three. 
their almost complete separation from the rest of the population had been achieved in a matter of weeks or months, through terror, but also through the more than ordinary connivance of those around them. There was a wall between Gentiles and Jews, Dr. Ben O'Cone of Berlin testified. I cannot remember speaking to a Christian during all my journeys over Germany. Now the Jews felt they had received laws of their own and would no longer be outlawed. If they kept to themselves, as they had been forced to do anyhow, they would be able to live unmolested. In the words of the Reichsvertretung of the Jews in Germany, the National Association of All Communities and Organizations, which had been founded in September 1933 on the initiative of the Berlin community and was in no way Nazi-appointed, the intention of the Nuremberg Laws was to establish a level on which a bearable relationship between the German and the Jewish people became possible, to which a member of the Berlin community, a radical Zionist, added, Life is possible under every law. However, in complete ignorance of what is permitted and what is not, one cannot live. A useful and respected citizen one can also be as a member of a minority in the midst of a great people. Hans Lamm, Über die Entwicklung des Deutschen Judentums, 1951. And since Hitler, in the Rome Purge in 1934, had broken the power of the SA, the stormtroopers in brown shirts, who had been almost exclusively responsible for the early pogroms and atrocities, and since the Jews were blissfully unaware of the growing power of the black-shirted SS, who ordinarily abstained from what Eichmann contemptuously called the Stürmer methods, they generally believed that a modus vivendi would be possible. They even offered to cooperate in the solution of the Jewish question. In short, when Eichmann entered upon his apprenticeship in Jewish affairs, on which, four years later, he was to be the recognized expert, and when he made his first contacts with Jewish functionaries, both Zionists and assimilationists talked in terms of a great Jewish revival, a great constructive movement of German Jewry and they still quarrelled among themselves in ideological terms about the desirability of Jewish emigration, as though this depended upon their own decisions. Eichmann's account during the police examination of how he was introduced into the new department, distorted, of course, but not wholly devoid of truth, oddly recalls this fool's paradise. The first thing that happened was that his new boss, a certain von Mildenstein, who shortly thereafter got himself transferred to Albert Speer's organization Tote, where he was in charge of highway construction, he was what Eichmann pretended to be, an engineer by profession, required him to read Theodor Hetzel's Der Judenstadt, a famous Zionist classic, which converted Eichmann promptly and forever to Zionism. This seems to have been the first serious book he ever read, and it made a lasting impression on him. From then on, as he repeated over and over, he thought of hardly anything but a political solution, as opposed to the later physical solution, the first meaning expulsion and the second extermination, and how to get some firm ground under the feet of the Jews. It may be worth mentioning that as late as 1939, he seems to have protested against desecrators of Herzl's grave in Vienna, and there are reports of his presence in civilian clothes at the commemoration of the 35th anniversary of Herzl's death. Strangely enough, he did not talk about these things in Jerusalem, where he continuously boasted of his good relations with Jewish officials. In order to help in this enterprise, he began spreading the gospel among his SS comrades, giving lectures and writing pamphlets. He then acquired a smattering of Hebrew, which enabled him to read, haltingly, a Yiddish newspaper— not a very difficult accomplishment, since Yiddish, basically an old German dialect written in Hebrew letters, can be understood by any German-speaking person who has mastered a few dozen Hebrew words. He even read one more book, Adolf Bohm's History of Zionism. During the trial, he kept confusing it with Herzl's Judenstadt, and this was perhaps a considerable achievement for a man who, by his own account, had always been utterly reluctant to read anything except newspapers— and who, to the distress of his father, had never availed himself of the books in the family library. Following up Böhm, he studied the organizational setup of the Zionist movement with all its parties, youth groups, and different programs. This did not yet make him an authority, but it was enough to earn him an assignment as official spy on the Zionist offices and on their meetings. 
It is worth noting that his schooling in Jewish affairs was almost entirely concerned with Zionism. His first personal contacts with Jewish functionaries, all of them well-known Zionists of long standing, were thoroughly satisfactory. The reason he became so fascinated by the Jewish question, he explained, was his own idealism. These Jews, unlike the assimilationists whom he always despised, and unlike Orthodox Jews who bored him, were idealists like him. An idealist, according to Eichmann's notions, was not merely a man who believed in an idea or someone who did not steal or accept bribes, though these qualifications were indispensable. An idealist was a man who lived for his idea, hence he could not be a businessman, and who was prepared to sacrifice for his idea everything and especially everybody. When he said in the police examination that he would have sent his own father to his death if that had been required, he did not mean merely to stress the extent to which he was under orders and ready to obey them. He also meant to show what an idealist he had always been. The perfect idealist, like everybody else, had of course his personal feelings and emotions— but he would never permit them to interfere with his actions if they came into conflict with his idea. The greatest idealist Eichmann ever encountered among the Jews was Dr. Rudolf Kastner, with whom he negotiated during the Jewish deportations from Hungary, and with whom he came to an agreement that he, Eichmann, would permit the illegal departure of a few thousand Jews to Palestine, the trains were in fact guarded by German police, in exchange for quiet and order in the camps from which hundreds of thousands were shipped to Auschwitz. The few thousands saved by the agreement, prominent Jews and members of the Zionist youth organizations, were, in Eichmann's words, the best biological material. Dr. Kastner, as Eichmann understood it, had sacrificed his fellow Jews to his idea, and this was as it should be. Judge Benjamin Halivai, one of the three judges at Eichmann's trial, had been in charge of the Kastner trial in Israel, at which Kastner had to defend himself for his cooperation with Eichmann and other high-ranking Nazis. In Halivai's opinion, Kastner had sold his soul to the devil. Now that the devil himself was in the dock, he turned out to be an idealist. And though it may be hard to believe, it is quite possible that the one who sold his soul had also been an idealist. Long before all this happened, Eichmann was given his first opportunity to apply in practice what he had learned during his apprenticeship. After the Anschluss, the incorporation of Austria into the Reich in March 1938, he was sent to Vienna to organize a kind of emigration that had been utterly unknown in Germany, where up to the fall of 1938 the fiction was maintained that Jews, if they so desired, were permitted but were not forced to leave the country. Among the reasons German Jews believed in the fiction was the program of the NSDAP formulated in 1920, which shared with the Weimar Constitution the curious fate of never being officially abolished. Its 25 points had even been declared unalterable by Hitler. Seen in the light of later events, its anti-Semite provisions were harmless indeed. Jews could not be full-fledged citizens, they could not hold civil service positions, they were to be excluded from the press, and all those who had acquired German citizenship after August 2, 1914, the date of the outbreak of the First World War, were to be denaturalized, which meant they were subject to expulsion. Characteristically, the denaturalization was carried out immediately, but the wholesale expulsion of some 15,000 Jews, who from one day to the next were shoved across the Polish border at Zbatsin, where they were promptly put into camps, took place only five years later, when no one expected it any longer. The party program was never taken seriously by Nazi officials. They prided themselves on belonging to a movement, as distinguished from a party, and a movement could not be bound by a program. Even before the Nazis' rise to power, these 25 points had been no more than a concession to the party system and to such prospective voters as were old-fashioned enough to ask what was the program of the party they were going to join. Eichmann, as we have seen, was free of such deplorable habits. And when he told the Jerusalem court that he had not known Hitler's program, he very likely spoke the truth. The party program did not matter. You knew what you were joining. The Jews, on the other hand, were old-fashioned enough to know the 25 points by heart and to believe in them. 
whatever contradicted the legal implementation of the party program, they tended to ascribe to temporary revolutionary excesses of undisciplined members or groups. But what happened in Vienna in March 1938 was altogether different. Eichmann's task had been defined as forced emigration, and the words meant exactly what they said. All Jews, regardless of their desires and regardless of their citizenship, were to be forced to emigrate, an act which in ordinary language is called expulsion. Whenever Eichmann thought back to the twelve years that were his life, he singled out his year in Vienna as head of the Center for Emigration of Austrian Jews as its happiest and most successful period. Shortly before, he had been promoted to officer's rank, becoming an Untersturmführer or lieutenant, and he'd been commended for his comprehensive knowledge of the methods of organization and ideology of the opponent, jury. The assignment in Vienna was his first important job. His whole career, which had progressed rather slowly, was in the balance. He must have been frantic to make good, and his success was spectacular. In eight months, 45,000 Jews left Austria, whereas no more than 19,000 left Germany in the same period. In less than 18 months, Austria was cleansed of close to 150,000 people, roughly 60% of its Jewish population, all of whom left the country legally. Even after the outbreak of the war, some 60,000 Jews could escape. How did he do it? The basic idea that made all this possible was, of course, not his, but almost certainly a specific directive by Heydrich, who had sent him to Vienna in the first place. Eichmann was vague on the question of authorship, which he claimed, however, by implication. The Israeli authorities, on the other hand, bound, as Yad Vashem's bulletin put it, to the fantastic thesis of the all-inclusive responsibility of Adolf Eichmann and the even more fantastic supposition that one, that is, his mind was behind it all, helped him considerably in his efforts to deck himself in borrowed plumes, for which he had in any case a great inclination. The idea, as explained by Heydrich in a conference with Goring on the morning of the Kristallnacht, was simple and ingenious enough. Through the Jewish community, we extracted a certain amount of money from the rich Jews who wanted to emigrate. By paying this amount and an additional sum in foreign currency, they made it possible for poor Jews to leave. The problem was not to make the rich Jews leave, but to get rid of the Jewish mob. And this problem was not solved by Eichmann. Not until the trial was over was it learned from the Netherlands State Institute for War Documentation that Erich Radjakovich, a brilliant lawyer whom Eichmann, according to his own testimony, employed for the handling of legal questions in the central offices for Jewish emigration in Vienna, Prague and Berlin, had originated the idea of the emigration funds. Somewhat later, in April 1941, Rodjakovich was sent to Holland by Heydrich in order to establish there a central office which was to serve as a model for the solution of the Jewish question in all occupied countries in Europe. Still enough problems remained that could be solved only in the course of the operation, and there is no doubt that here Eichmann, for the first time in his life, discovered in himself some special qualities. There were two things he could do well better than others. He could organize and he could negotiate. Immediately upon his arrival, he opened negotiations with the representatives of the Jewish community, whom he had first to liberate from prisons and concentration camps, since the revolutionary zeal in Austria, greatly exceeding the early excesses in Germany, had resulted in the imprisonment of practically all prominent Jews. After this experience, the Jewish functionaries did not need Eichmann to convince them of the desirability of emigration, Rather, they informed him of the enormous difficulties which lay ahead. Apart from the financial problem already solved, the chief difficulty lay in the number of papers every emigrant had to assemble before he could leave the country. Each of the papers was valid only for a limited time, so that the validity of the first had usually expired long before the last could be obtained. Once Eichmann understood how the whole thing worked, or rather did not work, he took counsel with himself and gave birth to the idea which I thought would do justice to both parties. He imagined an assembly line, at whose beginnings the first document is put, and then the other papers, and at its end the passport would have to come out as the end product. This could be realized if all the officers concerned, 
the Ministry of Finance, the income tax people, the police, the Jewish community, etc., were housed under the same roof and forced to do their work on the spot in the presence of the applicant, who would no longer have to run from office to office and who presumably would also be spared having some humiliating chicaneries practiced on him and certain expenses for bribes. When everything was ready and the assembly line was doing its work smoothly and quickly, Eichmann invited the Jewish functionaries from Berlin to inspect it. They were appalled. This is like an automatic factory, like a flour mill connected with some bakery. At one end you put in a Jew who still has some property, a factory or a shop or a bank account, and he goes through the building from counter to counter, from office to office, and comes out at the other end without any money, without any rights, with only a passport, on which it says you must leave the country within a fortnight. Otherwise you will go to a concentration camp. This, of course, was essentially the truth about the procedure, but it was not the whole truth. For these Jews could not be left without any money, for the simple reason that without it no country at this date would have taken them. They needed, and were given, their Verzeigergeld, the amount they had to show in order to obtain their visas and to pass the immigration controls of the recipient country. For this amount, they needed foreign currency, which the Reich had no intention of wasting on its Jews. These needs could not be met by Jewish accounts in foreign countries, which in any event were difficult to get at because they had been illegal for many years. Eichmann therefore sent Jewish functionaries abroad to solicit funds from the great Jewish organizations, and these funds were then sold by the Jewish community to the prospective emigrants at a considerable profit, one dollar, for instance, was sold for ten or twenty marks, when its market value was 4.20 marks. It was chiefly in this way that the community acquired not only the money necessary for poor Jews and people without accounts abroad, but also the funds it needed for its own hugely expanded activities. Eichmann did not make possible this deal without encountering considerable opposition from the German financial authorities, the ministry and the treasury, which, after all, could not remain unaware of the fact that these transactions amounted to a devaluation of the mark. Bragging was the vice that was Eichmann's undoing. It was sheer rodomontade when he told his men during the last days of the war, I will jump into my grave laughing because the fact that I have the death of five million Jews, or enemies of the Reich, as he always claimed to have said, on my conscience gives me extraordinary satisfaction. He did not jump and if he had anything on his conscience it was not murder, but as it turned out that he had once slapped the face of Dr. Josef Lohenherz, head of the Vienna Jewish community, who later became one of his favorite Jews. He had apologized in front of his staff at the time, but this incident kept bothering him. To claim the death of five million Jews, the approximate total of losses suffered from the combined efforts of all Nazi offices and authorities, was preposterous, as he knew very well, but he had kept repeating the damning sentence ad nauseam to everyone who would listen, even twelve years later in Argentina, because it gave him an extraordinary sense of elation to think that he was exiting from the stage in this way. Former Legationsrat Horst Grell, a witness for the defense, who had known Eichmann in Hungary, testified that in his opinion Eichmann was boasting. That must have been obvious to everyone who heard him utter his absurd claim. It was sheer boasting when he pretended he had invented the ghetto system or had given birth to the idea of shipping all European Jews to Madagascar. The Theresienstadt ghetto, of which Eichmann claimed paternity, was established years after the ghetto system had been introduced into the eastern occupied territories, and setting up a special ghetto for certain privileged categories was, like the ghetto system, the idea of Heydrich. The Madagascar plan seems to have been born in the bureaus of the German Foreign Office, and Eichmann's own contribution to it turned out to owe a good deal to his beloved Dr. Lohenherz, whom he had drafted to put down some basic thoughts on how about four million Jews might be transported from Europe after the war, presumably to Palestine, since the Madagascar project was top secret. When confronted at the trial with the Lohenherz report, Eichmann did not deny its authorship, it was one of the few moments when he appeared genuinely embarrassed. What eventually led to his capture was his compulsion to talk big. He was fed up with being an anonymous wanderer between the worlds, and this compulsion must have grown considerably stronger as time passed, 
not only because he had nothing to do that he could consider worth doing, but also because the post-war era had bestowed so much unexpected fame upon him. But bragging is a common vice, and a more specific and also more decisive flaw in Eichmann's character was his almost total inability ever to look at anything from the other fellow's point of view. Nowhere was this flaw more conspicuous than in his account of the Vienna episode. He and his men and the Jews were all pulling together, and whenever there were any difficulties, the Jewish functionaries would come running to him to unburden their hearts, to tell him all their grief and sorrow, and to ask for his help. The Jews desired to emigrate, and he, Eichmann, was there to help them, because it so happened that at the same time the Nazi authorities had expressed a desire to see their Reich Judenrein. The two desires coincided, and he, Eichmann, could do justice to both parties. At the trial he never gave an inch when it came to this part of the story, although he agreed that today, when times have changed so much, the Jews might not be too happy to recall his pulling together, and he did not want to hurt their feelings. The German text of the taped police examination, conducted from May 29, 1960, to January 17, 1961, each page corrected and approved by Eichmann, constitutes a veritable gold mine for a psychologist, provided he is wise enough to understand that the horrible can be not only ludicrous but outright funny. Some of the comedy cannot be conveyed in English, because it lies in Eichmann's heroic fight with the German language, which inevitably defeats him. It is funny when he speaks pass him of winged words, Glüflügelte Worte, a German colloquialism for famous quotes from the classics, when he means stock phrases, Redensarten, or slogans, Schlagwörter. It was funny when, during the cross-examination on the Sassen documents, conducted in German by the presiding judge, he used the phrase Kontrageben, to give tit-for-tat, to indicate that he had resisted Sassen's efforts to liven up his stories. Judge Landau, obviously ignorant of the mysteries of card games, did not understand, and Eichmann could not think of any other way to put it. Dimly aware of a defect that must have plagued him even in school, it amounted to a mild case of aphasia. He apologized, saying, Officialese, Amtssprache, is my only language. But the point here is that Officialese became his language because he was genuinely incapable of uttering a single sentence that was not a cliché. Was it these clichés that the psychiatrists thought so normal and desirable? Are these the positive ideas a clergyman hopes for in those to whose souls he ministers? Eichmann's best opportunity to show this positive side of his character in Jerusalem came when the young police officer in charge of his mental and psychological well-being handed him Lolita for relaxation. After two days, Eichmann returned it, visibly indignant. Quite an unwholesome book. Das ist aber ein sehr unfreulicher Buch, he told his guard. To be sure the judges were right when they finally told the accused that all he had said was empty talk, except that they thought the emptiness was feigned and that the accused wished to cover up other thoughts which, though hideous, were not empty. This supposition seems refuted by the striking consistency with which Eichmann, despite his rather bad memory, repeated word for word the same stock phrases and self-invented clichés. When he did succeed in constructing a sentence of his own, he repeated it until it became a cliché. Each time he referred to an incident or event of importance to him. Whether writing his memoirs in Argentina or in Jerusalem, whether speaking to the police examiner or to the court, what he said was always the same, expressed in the same words. The longer one listened to him, the more obvious it became that his inability to speak was closely connected with an inability to think, namely, to think from the standpoint of somebody else. No communication was possible with him, not because he lied, but because he was surrounded by the most reliable of all safeguards against the words and the presence of others, and hence against reality as such. Thus, confronted for eight months with the reality of being examined by a Jewish policeman, Eichmann did not have the slightest hesitation in explaining to him at considerable length and repeatedly why he had been unable to attain a higher grade in the SS, that this was not his fault. He had done everything, even asked to be sent to active military duty. Off to the front, I said to myself, then the Standartenführer, Colonel C, will come quicker. 
In court, on the contrary, he pretended he had asked to be transferred because he wanted to escape his murderous duties. He did not insist much on this, though, and strangely he was not confronted with his utterances to Captain Less, whom he also told that he had hoped to be nominated for the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing units in the East, because when they were formed in March 1941 his office was dead, there was no emigration any longer, and deportations had not yet been started. There was, finally, his greatest ambition, to be promoted to the job of police chief in some German town. Again, nothing doing. What makes these pages of the examination so funny is that all this was told in the tone of someone who was sure of finding normal human sympathy for a hard luck story. Whatever I prepared and planned, everything went wrong. My personal affairs as well as my years-long efforts to obtain land and soil for the Jews. I don't know. Everything was as if under an evil spell. Whatever I desired and wanted and planned to do, fate prevented it somehow. I was frustrated in everything, no matter what. When Captain Less asked his opinion on some damning and possibly lying evidence given by a former colonel of the SS, he exclaimed, suddenly stuttering with rage, I am very much surprised that this man could ever have been an SS Standartenführer. That surprises me very much indeed. It is altogether... Altogether unthinkable. I don't know what to say. He never said these things in a spirit of defiance, as though he wanted even now to defend the standards by which he had lived in the past. The very words SS or Korea or Himmler, whom he always called by his long official title Reichsführer SS and Chief of the German Police, although he by no means admired him, triggered in him a mechanism that had become completely unalterable. The presence of Captain Less, a Jew from Germany, and unlikely in any case to think that members of the SS advanced in their careers through the exercise of high moral qualities, did not for a moment throw this mechanism out of gear. Now and then the comedy breaks into the horror itself, and results in stories presumably true enough whose macabre humour easily surpasses that of any surrealist invention. Such was the story told by Eichmann during the police examination about the unlucky Kommerzialrat Storfer of Vienna, one of the representatives of the Jewish community. Eichmann had received a telegram from Rudolf Huss, commandant of Auschwitz, telling him that Storfer had arrived and had urgently requested to see Eichmann. I said to myself, OK, this man has always behaved well, that is worth my while. I'll go there myself and see what is the matter with him. And I go to Ebner, chief of the Gestapo in Vienna, and Ebner says, I remember it only vaguely, if only he had not been so clumsy, he went into hiding and tried to escape, something of the sort. And the police arrested him and sent him to the concentration camp, and according to the orders of the Reichsführer, Himmler, no one could get out once he was in. Nothing could be done, neither Dr. Ebner nor I nor anybody else could do anything about it. I went to Auschwitz and asked Hurst to see Storfer. Yes, yes, Hurst said, he is in one of the labor gangs. With Storfer afterward, well, it was normal and human. We had a normal human encounter. He told me all his grief and sorrow. I said, well, my dear old friend, ja, mein lieber guter Storfer, we certainly got it, but rotten luck. And I also said, Look, I really cannot help you, because according to orders from the Reichsführer, nobody can get out. I can't get you out. Dr. Ebner can't get you out. I hear you made a mistake that you went into hiding or wanted to bolt, which, after all, you did not need to do. Eichmann meant that Storfer, as a Jewish functionary, had immunity from deportation. I forget what his reply to this was. And then I asked him how he was, and he said, yes, he wondered if he couldn't be let off work. It was heavy work. And then I said to Hurst, work, Stoffer won't have to work. But Hurst said, everyone works here. So I said, OK, I said, I'll make out a chit to the effect that Stoffer has to keep the gravel paths in order with a broom. There were little gravel paths there, and that he has the right to sit down with his broom on one of the benches. To Storfer, I said, Will that be all right, Mr. Storfer? Will that suit you? Thereupon he was very pleased, and we shook hands, and then he was given the broom and sat down on his bench. 
It was a great inner joy to me that I could at least see the man with whom I had worked for so many long years and that we could speak with each other. Six weeks after this normal human encounter, Stauffer was dead. Not gassed, apparently, but shot. Is this a textbook case of bad faith, of lying self-deception combined with outrageous stupidity? Or is it simply the case of the eternally unrepentant criminal? Dostoevsky once mentions in his diaries that in Siberia, among scores of murderers, rapists, and burglars, he never met a single man who would admit that he had done wrong. You cannot afford to face reality because his crime has become part and parcel of it. Yet Eichmann's case is different from that of the ordinary criminal, who can shield himself effectively against the reality of a non-criminal world only within the narrow limits of his gang. Eichmann needed only to recall the past in order to feel assured that he was not lying and that he was not deceiving himself, for he and the world he lived in had once been in perfect harmony. And that German society of 80 million people had been shielded against reality and factuality by exactly the same means, the same self-deception, lies and stupidity that had now become ingrained in Eichmann's mentality. These lies changed from year to year, and they frequently contradicted each other. Moreover, they were not necessarily the same for the various branches of the party hierarchy or the people at large. But the practice of self-deception had become so common almost a moral prerequisite for survival, that even now, 18 years after the collapse of the Nazi regime, when most of the specific content of its lies has been forgotten, it is sometimes difficult not to believe that mendacity has become an integral part of the German national character. During the war, the lie most effective with the whole of the German people was the slogan of the Battle of Destiny for the German people, Der Schicksalkampf des Deutschen Volkes, coined either by Hitler or by Goebbels, which made self-deception easier on three counts. It suggested first that the war was no war, second that it was started by destiny and not by Germany, and third that it was a matter of life and death for the Germans who must annihilate their enemies or be annihilated. Eichmann's astounding willingness in Argentina as well as in Jerusalem to admit his crimes was due less to his own criminal capacity for self-deception than to the aura of systematic mendacity that had constituted the general and generally accepted atmosphere of the Third Reich. Of course he had played a role in the extermination of the Jews. Of course, if he had not transported them, they would not have been delivered to the butcher. What, he asked, is there to admit? Now he proceeded, he would like to find peace with his former enemies, a sentiment he shared not only with Himmler, who had expressed it during the last year of the war, or with the Labour Front leader Robert Ley, who before he committed suicide in Nuremberg had proposed the establishment of a conciliation committee, consisting of the Nazis responsible for the massacres and the Jewish survivors, but also unbelievably with many ordinary Germans, who were heard to express themselves in exactly the same terms at the end of the war. This outrageous cliché was no longer issued to them from above. It was a self-fabricated stock phrase, as devoid of reality as those clichés by which the people had lived for twelve years. And you could almost see what an extraordinary sense of elation it gave to the speaker the moment it popped out of his mouth. Eichmann's mind was filled to the brim with such sentences. His memory proved to be quite unreliable about what had actually happened. In a rare moment of exasperation, Judge Lando asked the accused, What can you remember? If you don't remember the discussions at the so-called Vance Conference, which dealt with the various methods of killing. And the answer, of course, was that Eichmann remembered the turning points in his own career rather well, but that they did not necessarily coincide with the turning points in the story of Jewish extermination, or, as a matter of fact, with the turning points in history. He always had trouble remembering the exact date of the outbreak of the war or of the invasion of Russia. But the point of the matter is that he had not forgotten a single one of the sentences of his that at one time or another had served to give him a sense of elation. Hence, whenever during the cross-examination the judges tried to appeal to his conscience, they were met with elation, and they were outraged as well as disconcerted when they learned that the accused had at his disposal a different elating cliché for each period of his life and each of his activities. In his mind, there was no contradiction between 
I will jump into my grave laughing, appropriate for the end of the war, and I shall gladly hang myself in public as a warning example for all anti-Semites on this earth, which now, under vastly different circumstances, fulfilled exactly the same function of giving him a lift. These habits of Eichmann's created considerable difficulty during the trial, less for Eichmann himself than for those who had come to prosecute him, to defend him, to judge him, and to report on him. For all this, it was essential that one take him seriously, and this was very hard to do, unless one sought the easiest way out of the dilemma between the unspeakable horror of the deeds and the undeniable ludicrousness of the man who perpetrated them and declared him a clever, calculating liar, which he obviously was not. His own convictions in this matter were far from modest. One of the few gifts fate bestowed upon me is a capacity for truth insofar as it depends upon myself. This gift he had claimed even before the prosecutor wanted to settle on him crimes he had not committed. In the disorganized rambling notes he made in Argentina, in preparation for the interview with Sasson, when he was still, as he even pointed out at the time, in full possession of my physical and psychological freedom, he had issued a fantastic warning to future historians to be objective enough not to stray from the path of this truth recorded here. Fantastic? because every line of these scribblings shows his utter ignorance of everything that was not directly, technically, and bureaucratically connected with his job, and also shows an extraordinarily faulty memory. Despite all the efforts of the prosecution, everybody could see that this man was not a monster, but it was difficult indeed not to suspect that he was a clown. And since this suspicion would have been fatal to the whole enterprise— and was also rather hard to sustain in view of the sufferings he and his like had caused to millions of people. His worst clowneries were hardly noticed and almost never reported. What could you do with a man who first declared with great emphasis that the one thing he had learned in an ill-spent life was that one should never take an oath? Today, no man, no judge could ever persuade me to make a sworn statement to declare something under oath as a witness. I refuse it. I refuse it for moral reasons, since my experience tells me that if one is loyal to his oath, one day he has to take the consequences. I have made up my mind once and for all that no judge in the world or any other authority will ever be capable of making me swear an oath to give sworn testimony. I won't do it voluntarily, and no one will be able to force me. And then— after being told explicitly that if he wished to testify in his own defence he might do so under oath or without an oath, declared without further ado that he would prefer to testify under oath, or who repeatedly and with a great show of feeling assured the court, as he had assured the police examiner, that the worst thing he could do would be to try to escape his true responsibilities, to fight for his neck, to plead for mercy, and then, upon instruction of his counsel, submitted a handwritten document containing his plea for mercy. As far as Eichmann was concerned, these were questions of changing moods, and as long as he was capable of finding, either in his memory or on the spur of the moment, an elating stock phrase to go with them, he was quite content, without ever becoming aware of anything like inconsistencies. As we shall see, this horrible gift for consoling himself with clichés did not leave him in the hour of his death. 4. The First Solution Expulsion Had this been an ordinary trial, with the normal tug-of-war between prosecution and defence to bring out the facts and do justice to both sides, it would be possible to switch now to the version of the defence and find out whether there was not more to Eichmann's grotesque account of his activities in Vienna than meets the eye, and whether his distortions of reality could not really be ascribed to more than the mendacity of an individual. The facts for which Eichmann was to hang had been established beyond reasonable doubt long before the trial started, and they were generally known to all students of the Nazi regime. The additional facts that the prosecution tried to establish were, it is true, partly accepted in the judgment— that they would never have appeared to be beyond reasonable doubt if the defence had brought its own evidence to bear upon the proceedings. Hence, no report on the Eichmann case, perhaps as distinguished from the Eichmann trial, could be complete without paying some attention to certain facts that are well enough known, but that Dr. Servatius chose to ignore. 
This is especially true of Eichmann's muddled general outlook and ideology with respect to the Jewish question. During cross-examination, he told the presiding judge that in Vienna he regarded the Jews as opponents with respect to whom a mutually acceptable and mutually fair solution had to be found. That solution I envisaged as putting firm soil under their feet so that they would have a place of their own, soil of their own, and I was working in the direction of that solution joyfully. I cooperated in reaching such a solution, gladly and joyfully, because it was also the kind of solution that was approved by movements among the Jewish people themselves, and I regarded this as the most appropriate solution to this matter. This was the true reason they had all pulled together, the reason their work had been based upon mutuality. It was in the interest of the Jews, though perhaps not all Jews understood this, to get out of the country. One had to help them, one had to help these functionaries to act, and that's what I did. If the Jewish functionaries were idealists, that is, Zionists, he respected them, treated them as equals, listened to all their requests and complaints and applications for support, kept his promises as far as he could. People are inclined to forget that now. Who but he, Eichmann, had saved hundreds of thousands of Jews? What but his great zeal and gifts of organization had enabled them to escape in time? True, he could not foresee at the time the coming final solution, but he had saved them, that was a fact. In an interview given in this country during the trial, Eichmann's son told the same story to American reporters. It must have been a family legend. In a sense, one can understand why counsel for the defense did nothing to back up Eichmann's version of his relations with the Zionists. Eichmann admitted, as he had in the Sassen interview, that he did not greet his assignment with the apathy of an ox being led to his stall, that he had been very different from those colleagues who had never read a basic book, that is, Herzl's Judenstadt, worked through it, absorbed it, absorbed it with interest, and who therefore lacked inner rapport with their work. They were nothing but office drudges, for whom everything was decided by paragraphs, by orders, who were interested in nothing else, who were, in short, precisely such small cogs, as, according to the defence, Eichmann himself had been. If this meant no more than giving unquestioning obedience to the Führer's orders, then they had all been small cogs. Even Himmler, we are told by his masseur, Felix Kirsten, had not greeted the final solution with great enthusiasm, and Eichmann assured the police examiner that his own boss Heinrich Müller would never have proposed anything so crude as physical extermination. Obviously, in Eichmann's eyes, the small cog theory was quite beside the point. Certainly, he had not been as big as Mr. Hausner tried to make him. After all, he was not Hitler, nor for that matter could he compare himself in importance as far as the solution of the Jewish question was concerned with Müller or Heydrich or Himmler. He was no megalomaniac, but neither was he as small as the defence wished him to be. Eichmann's distortions of reality were horrible because of the horrors they dealt with, but in principle they were not very different from things current in post-Hitler Germany. There is, for instance, Franz Josef Strauss, former Minister of Defence, who recently conducted an election campaign against Willy Brandt, now mayor of West Berlin, but a refugee in Norway during the Hitler period. Strauss asked a widely publicised and apparently very successful question of Mr. Brandt. What were you doing those twelve years outside Germany? We know what we were doing here in Germany. With complete impunity, without anybody's batting an eye, let alone reminding the member of the Bonn government that what Germans in Germany were doing during those years has become notorious indeed. The same innocence is to be found in a recent casual remark by a respected and respectable German literary critic, who was probably never a party member. Reviewing a study of literature in the Third Reich, he said that its author belonged with those intellectuals who at the outbreak of barbarism deserted us without exception. This author was, of course, a Jew, and he was expelled by the Nazis and himself deserted by Gentiles, people like Mr. Heinz Beckmann of the Rheinische Merkur. Incidentally, the very word barbarism, today frequently applied by Germans to the Hitler period, is a distortion of reality. It is as though Jewish and non-Jewish intellectuals had fled a country that was no longer refined enough for them. Eichmann, 
though much less refined than statesmen and literary critics, could on the other hand have cited certain indisputable facts to back up his story, if his memory had not been so bad, or if the defence had helped him. For it is indisputable that during the first stages of their Jewish policy, the National Socialists thought it proper to adopt a pro-Zionist attitude, Hans Lamm. And it was during these first stages that Eichmann learned his lessons about Jews. He was by no means alone in taking this pro-Zionism seriously. The German Jews themselves thought it would be sufficient to undo assimilation through a new process of dissimulation and flocked into the ranks of the Zionist movement. There are no reliable statistics on this development, but it is estimated that the circulation of the Zionist weekly Die Jüdische Hundschau increased in the first months of the Hitler regime from approximately five to 7,000 to nearly 40,000. And it is known that the Zionist fundraising organizations received in 1935 to 36 from a greatly diminished and impoverished population three times as much as in 1931 to 32. This did not necessarily mean that the Jews wished to emigrate to Palestine. It was more a matter of pride. Wear it with pride the yellow star, the most popular slogan of these years, coined by Robert Welch, editor-in-chief of the Jüdische Hundschau, expressed the general emotional atmosphere. The polemical point of the slogan, formulated as a response to Boycott Day, April 1, 1933, more than six years before the Nazis actually forced the Jews to wear a badge, a six-pointed yellow star on a white ground, was directed against the assimilationists and all those people who refused to be reconciled to the new revolutionary development, those who were always behind the times, dear Ewige Gestrigen. The slogan was recalled at the trial with a good deal of emotion by witnesses from Germany. They forgot to mention that Robert Welch, himself a highly distinguished journalist, had said in recent years that he would never have issued his slogan if he had been able to foresee developments. But quite apart from all slogans and ideological quarrels, it was in those years a fact of everyday life that only Zionists had any chance of negotiating with the German authorities, for the simple reason that their chief Jewish adversary, the Central Association of German Citizens of Jewish Faith, to which 95% of organized Jews in Germany then belonged, specified in its bylaws that its chief task was the fight against anti-Semitism. It had suddenly become, by definition, an organization hostile to the state, and would indeed have been persecuted, which it was not, if it had ever dared to do what it was supposed to do. During its first few years, Hitler's rise to power appeared to the Zionists chiefly as the decisive defeat of assimilationism. Hence the Zionists could, for a time at least, engage in a certain amount of non-criminal cooperation with the Nazi authorities. The Zionists, too, believed that dissimulation, combined with the emigration to Palestine of Jewish youngsters, and, they hoped, Jewish capitalists, could be a mutually fair solution. At the time, many German officials held this opinion, and this kind of talk seems to have been quite common up to the end. A letter from a survivor of Theresienstadt, a German Jew, relates that all leading positions in the Nazi-appointed Reichsvereinigung were held by Zionists, whereas the authentically Jewish Reichsvertretung had been composed of both Zionists and non-Zionists. Because Zionists, according to the Nazis, were the decent Jews, since they too thought in national terms. To be sure, no prominent Nazi ever spoke publicly in this vein, from beginning to end, Nazi propaganda was fiercely, unequivocally, uncompromisingly anti-Semitic, and eventually nothing counted but what people who were still without experience in the mysteries of totalitarian government dismissed as mere propaganda. There existed, in those first years, a mutually highly satisfactory agreement between the Nazi authorities and the Jewish Agency for Palestine, a Havara, or transfer agreement, which provided that an emigrant to Palestine could transfer his money there in German goods and exchange them for pounds upon arrival. It was soon the only legal way for a Jew to take his money with him, the alternative then being the establishment of a blocked account which could be liquidated abroad only at a loss of between 50 and 95 percent. The result was that in the 30s, when American Jewry took great pains to organize a boycott of German merchandise, Palestine, of all places, was swamped with all kinds of goods made in Germany. 
Of greater importance for Eichmann were the emissaries from Palestine who would approach the Gestapo and the SS on their own initiative, without taking orders from either the German Zionists or the Jewish Agency for Palestine. They came in order to enlist help for the illegal immigration of Jews into British-ruled Palestine, and both the Gestapo and the SS were helpful. They negotiated with Eichmann in Vienna. And they reported that he was polite, not the shouting type, and that he even provided them with farms and facilities for setting up vocational training camps for prospective immigrants. On one occasion, he expelled a group of nuns from a convent to provide a training farm for young Jews. And on another, a special train was made available, and Nazi officials accompanied a group of emigrants, ostensibly headed for Zionist training farms in Yugoslavia, to see them safely across the border. According to the story told by Yon and David Kimcher, with the full and generous cooperation of all the chief actors, the secret roads, the illegal migration of a people, 1938 to 1948, London, 1954, these Jews from Palestine spoke a language not totally different from that of Eichmann. They had been sent to Europe by the communal settlements in Palestine, and they were not interested in rescue operations. That was not their job. They wanted to select suitable material. And their chief enemy, prior to the extermination program, was not those who made life impossible for Jews in the old countries, Germany or Austria, but those who barred access to the new homeland. That enemy was definitely Britain, not Germany. Indeed, they were in a position to deal with the Nazi authorities on a footing amounting to equality, which native Jews were not, since they enjoyed the protection of the mandatory power. They were probably among the first Jews to talk openly about mutual interests, and were certainly the first to be given permission to pick young Jewish pioneers from among the Jews in the concentration camps. Of course, they were unaware of the sinister implications of this deal, which still lay in the future. But they too somehow believed that if it was a question of selecting Jews for survival, the Jews should do the selecting themselves. It was this fundamental error in judgment. That eventually led to a situation in which the non-selected majority of Jews inevitably found themselves confronted with two enemies: the Nazi authorities and the Jewish authorities. As far as the Viennese episode is concerned, Eichmann's preposterous claim to have saved hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives, which was laughed out of court, finds strange support in the considered judgment of the Jewish historians, the Kimchers. Thus, what must have been one of the most paradoxical episodes of the entire period of the Nazi regime began. The man who was to go down in history as one of the arch murderers of the Jewish people entered the list as an active worker in the rescue of Jews from Europe. Eichmann's trouble was that he remembered none of the facts that might have supported, however faintly, his incredible story. While the learned counsel for the defence probably did not even know that there was anything to remember. Doctor Savatius could have called as witnesses for the defence the former agents of Alia Beth, as the organisation for illegal immigration into Palestine was called. They certainly still remembered Eichmann, and they were now living in Israel. Eichmann's memory functioned only in respect to things that had had a direct bearing upon his career. Thus, he remembered a visit he had received in Berlin from a Palestinian functionary, who told him about life in the collective settlements, and whom he had twice taken out to dinner. Because this visit ended with a formal invitation to Palestine, where the Jews would show him the country, he was delighted. No other Nazi official had been able to go to a distant foreign land, and he received permission to make the trip. The judgment concluded that he had been sent on an espionage mission, which no doubt was true, but this did not contradict the story Eichmann had told the police. Practically nothing came of the enterprise. Eichmann, together with a journalist from his office, a certain Herbert Hagen, had just enough time to climb Mount Carmel in Haifa before the British authorities deported both of them to Egypt and denied them entry permits for Palestine. According to Eichmann, the man from the Haganah, the Jewish military organization which became the nucleus of the Israeli army, came to see them in Cairo, and what he told them there became the subject. Of a thoroughly negative report, Eichmann and Hagen were ordered by their superiors to write for propaganda purposes. This was duly published. Apart from such minor triumphs, Eichmann remembered only moods and the catchphrases he made up to go with them. The trip to Egypt had been in 1937, prior to his activity in Vienna, and from Vienna he remembered no more than the general atmosphere and how elated he had felt. 
In view of his astounding virtuosity in never discarding a mood and its catchphrase, once and for all when they became incompatible with a new era, which required different moods and different elating phrases, a virtuosity that he demonstrated over and over during the police examination, one is tempted to believe in his sincerity when he spoke of the time in Vienna as an idyll. Because of the complete lack of consistency in his thoughts and sentiments, this sincerity is not even undermined by the fact that his year in Vienna, from the spring of 1938 to March 1939, came at a time when the Nazi regime had abandoned its pro-Zionist attitude. It was in the nature of the Nazi movement that it kept moving, became more radical with each passing month, but one of the outstanding characteristics of its members was that psychologically they tended to be always one step behind the movement, that they had the greatest difficulty in keeping up with it, or, as Hitler used to phrase it, that they could not jump over their own shadow. More damning, however, than any objective fact, was Eichmann's own faulty memory. There were certain Jews in Vienna whom he recalled very vividly, Dr. Lohenherz and Kommerzialrat Stoffer, but they were not those Palestinian emissaries who might have backed up his story. Josef Lohenherz, who after the war wrote a very interesting memorandum about his negotiations with Eichmann, one of the few new documents produced by the trial, it was shown in part to Eichmann, who found himself in complete agreement with its main statements, was the first Jewish functionary actually to organize a whole Jewish community into an institution at the service of the Nazi authorities. And he was one of the very, very few such functionaries to reap a reward for his services. He was permitted to stay in Vienna until the end of the war, when he emigrated to England and the United States. He died shortly after Eichmann's capture in 1960. Storfer's fate, as we have seen, was less fortunate, but this certainly was not Eichmann's fault. Storfer had replaced the Palestinian emissaries who had become too independent, and his task, assigned to him by Eichmann, was to organize some illegal transports of Jews into Palestine without the help of the Zionists. Storfer was no Zionist and had shown no interest in Jewish matters prior to the arrival of the Nazis in Austria. Still, with the help of Eichmann, he succeeded in getting some 3,500 Jews out of Europe in 1940, when half of Europe was occupied by the Nazis, and it seems that he did his best to clear things with the Palestinians. That is probably what Eichmann had in mind when he added to his story about Storfer in Auschwitz with a cryptic remark, Storfer never betrayed Judaism, not with a single word, not Storfer. A third Jew... Finally, whom Eichmann never failed to recall in connection with his pre-war activities, was Dr. Paul Epstein, in charge of emigration in Berlin during the last years of the Reichsvereinigung, a Nazi-appointed Jewish central organization, not to be confused with the authentically Jewish Reichsvertragung, which was dissolved in July 1939. Dr. Epstein was appointed by Eichmann to serve as Judenaltester, Jewish elder in Theresienstadt where he was shot in 1944. In other words, the only Jews Eichmann remembered were those who had been completely in his power. He had forgotten not only the Palestinian emissaries, but also his earlier Berlin acquaintances, whom he had known well when he was still engaged in intelligence work and had no executive powers. He never mentioned, for instance, Dr. Franz Meyer, a former member of the executive of the Zionist organization in Germany, who came to testify for the prosecution about his contacts with the accused from 1936 to 1939. To some extent, Dr. Meyer confirmed Eichmann's own story. In Berlin, the Jewish functionaries could put forward complaints and requests. There was a kind of cooperation. Sometimes, Meyer said, we came to ask for something, and there were times when he demanded something from us. Eichmann, at that time, was genuinely listening to us and was sincerely trying to understand the situation. His behavior was quite correct. He used to address me as Mr. and to offer me a seat. But in February 1939, all this had changed. Eichmann had summoned the leaders of German Jewry to Vienna to explain to them his new methods of forced emigration. And there he was, sitting in a large room on the ground floor of the Rothschild Palais, recognizable, of course, but completely changed. I immediately told my friends that I did not know whether I was meeting the same man. So terrible was the change. Here I met a man who comported himself as a master of life and death. He received us with insolence and rudeness. He did not let us come near his desk. We had to remain standing. 
Prosecution and judges were in agreement that Eichmann underwent a genuine and lasting personality change when he was promoted to a post with executive powers. But the trial showed that here too he had relapses, and that the matter could never have been as simple as that. There was the witness who testified to an interview with him at Theresienstadt in March 1945, when Eichmann again showed himself to be very interested in Zionist matters. The witness was a member of a Zionist youth organization and held a certificate of entry for Palestine. The interview was conducted in very pleasant language, and the attitude was kind and respectful. Strangely, counsel for the defense never mentioned this witness's testimony in his plaidoyer. Whatever doubts there may be about Eichmann's personality change in Vienna, there is no doubt that this appointment marked the real beginning of his career. Between 1937 and 1941, he won four promotions. Within 14 months, he advanced from Untersturmführer to Hauptsturmführer, that is, from second lieutenant to captain, and in another year and a half, he was made Obersturmbahnführer, or lieutenant colonel. That happened in October 1941, shortly after he was assigned the role in the final solution that was to land him in the district court of Jerusalem. And there, to his great grief, he got stuck. As he saw it, there was no higher grade obtainable in the section in which he worked. But this he could not know during the four years in which he climbed quicker and higher than he had ever anticipated. In Vienna he had shown his mettle, and now he was recognized not merely as an expert on the Jewish question, the intricacies of Jewish organizations and Zionist parties, but as an authority on emigration and evacuation, as the master who knew how to make people move. His greatest triumph came shortly after the Kristallnacht in November 1938, when German Jews had become frantic in their desire to escape. Goring, probably on the initiative of Heydrich, decided to establish in Berlin a Reich Center for Jewish Emigration, and in the letter containing his directives, Eichmann's Viennese office was specifically mentioned as the model to be used in the setting up of a central authority. The head of the Berlin office was not to be Eichmann, however, but his later greatly admired boss Heinrich Müller, another of Heydrich's discoveries. Heydrich had just taken Müller away from his job as a regular Bavarian police officer. He was not even a member of the party, and had been an opponent until 1933, and called into the Gestapo in Berlin because he was known to be an authority on the Soviet-Russian police system. For Müller, too, this was the beginning of his career— though he had to start with a comparatively small assignment. Müller, incidentally, not prone to boasting like Eichmann and known for his sphinx-like conduct, succeeded in disappearing altogether. Nobody knows his whereabouts, though there are rumours that first East Germany and now Albania have engaged the services of the Russian police expert. In March 1939, Hitler moved into Czechoslovakia and erected a German protectorate over Bohemia and Moravia. Eichmann was immediately appointed to set up another emigration centre for Jews in Prague. In the beginning, I was not too happy to leave Vienna, for if you have installed such an office, and if you see everything running smoothly and in good order, you don't like to give it up. And indeed, Prague was somewhat disappointing, although the system was the same as in Vienna, for the functionaries of the Czech Jewish organisations went to Vienna, and the Viennese people came to Prague, so that I did not have to intervene at all. The model, in Vienna, was simply copied and carried to Prague. Thus the whole thing got started automatically. But the Prague centre was much smaller, and I regret to say there were no people of the calibre and the energy of a Dr. Lohenherz. But these, as it were, personal reasons for discontent were minor, compared to mounting difficulties of another entirely objective nature. Hundreds of thousands of Jews had left their homelands in a matter of a few years, and millions waited behind them. For the Polish and Romanian governments left no doubt in their official proclamations that they too wished to be rid of their Jews. They could not understand why the world should get indignant if they followed in the footsteps of a great and cultured nation. This enormous arsenal of potential refugees had been revealed during the Evian Conference called in the summer of 1938 to solve the problem of German Jewry through intergovernmental action. It was a resounding fiasco and did great harm to German Jews. The avenues for emigration overseas now became clogged up, 
just as the escape possibilities within Europe had been exhausted earlier. And even under the best of circumstances, if war had not interfered with his program, Eichmann would hardly have been able to repeat the Viennese miracle in Prague. He knew this very well. He really had become an expert on matters of emigration, and he could not have been expected to greet his next appointment with any great enthusiasm. War had broken out in September 1939, and one month later Eichmann was called back to Berlin to succeed Müller as head of the Reich Center for Jewish Emigration. A year before this would have been a real promotion, but now was the wrong moment. No one in his senses could possibly think any longer of a solution of the Jewish question in terms of forced emigration. Quite apart from the difficulties of getting people from one country to another in wartime, the Reich had acquired, through the conquest of Polish territories, two or two and a half million more Jews. It is true that the Hitler government was still willing to let its Jews go. The order that stopped all Jewish emigration came only two years later, in the fall of 1941. And if any final solution had been decided upon, nobody had as yet given orders to that effect. Although Jews were already concentrated in ghettos in the East and were also being liquidated by the Einsatzgruppen, it was only natural that emigration, however smartly organized in Berlin in accordance with the assembly line principle, should peter out by itself, a process Eichmann described as being like pulling teeth. Listless, I would say, on both sides— on the Jewish side because it was really difficult to obtain any emigration possibilities to speak of, and on our side because there was no bustle and no rush, no coming and going of people. There we were, sitting in a great and mighty building, amid a yawning emptiness. Evidently, if Jewish matters, his specialty, remained a matter of emigration, he would soon be out of a job. 5. The second solution, concentration. It was not until the outbreak of the war on September 1, 1939, that the Nazi regime became openly totalitarian and openly criminal. One of the most important steps in this direction, from an organizational point of view, was a decree signed by Himmler that fused the security service of the SS, to which Eichmann had belonged since 1934 and which was a party organ, with the regular security police of the state, in which the secret state police, or Gestapo, was included. The result of the merger was the head office for Reich Security, RSHA, whose chief was first Reinhard Heydrich. After Heydrich's death in 1942, Eichmann's old acquaintance from Linz, Dr. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, took over. All officials of the police, not only of the Gestapo, but also of the criminal police and the order police, received SS titles corresponding to their previous ranks, regardless of whether or not they were party members. And this meant that in the space of a day, a most important part of the old civil services was incorporated into the most radical section of the Nazi hierarchy. No one, as far as I know, protested or resigned his job. Though Himmler, the head and founder of the SS, had since 1936 been chief of the German police as well, the two apparatuses had remained separate until now. The RSHA, moreover, was only one of twelve head offices in the SS, the most important of which, in the present context, were the head office of the order police, under General Kurt Dalug, which was responsible for the rounding up of Jews, and the head office for administration and economy, the SS Wirtschaftsverwaltungsschaptamt, or WVHA, headed by Oswald Pohl, which was in charge of concentration camps and was later to be in charge of the economic side of the extermination. This objective attitude, talking about concentration camps in terms of administration and about extermination camps in terms of economy, was typical of the SS mentality and something Eichmann, at the trial, was still very proud of. By its objectivity, Sachlichkeit, the SS dissociated itself from such emotional types as Streicher, that unrealistic fool, and also from certain Teutonic Germanic party bigwigs who behaved as though they were clad in horns and pelts. Eichmann admired Heydrich greatly because he did not like such nonsense at all, and he was out of sympathy with Himmler because, among other things, the Reichsführer SS and chief of the German police, though boss of all the SS head offices, had permitted himself, at least for a long time, to be influenced by it. 
During the trial, however, it was not the accused SS Obersturmbahnführer A.D. who was to carry off the prize for objectivity. It was Dr. Servatius, a tax and business lawyer from Cologne, who'd never joined the Nazi party, and who nevertheless was to teach the court a lesson in what it means not to be emotional, that no one who heard him is likely to forget. The moment, one of the few great ones in the whole trial, occurred during the short oral plaidoyer of the defence, after which the court withdrew for four months to write its judgment. Servatius declared the accused innocent of charges bearing on his responsibility for the collection of skeletons, sterilizations, killings by gas, and similar medical matters. Whereupon Judge Halevi interrupted him. Dr. Servatius, I assume you made a slip of the tongue when you said that killing by gas was a medical matter, to which Servatius replied, It was indeed a medical matter, since it was prepared by physicians. It was a matter of killing, and killing, too, is a medical matter. And perhaps to make absolutely sure that the judges in Jerusalem would not forget how Germans, ordinary Germans, not former members of the SS or even of the Nazi party, even today can regard acts that in other countries are called murder, he repeated the phrase in his comments on the judgment of the first instance, prepared for the review of the case before the Supreme Court. He said again that not Eichmann, but one of his men, Rolf Gunther, was always engaged in medical matters. Dr. Servatius is well acquainted with medical matters in the Third Reich. At Nuremberg, he defended Dr. Karl Brandt, Hitler's personal physician, plenipotentiary for hygiene and health, and chief of the euthanasia program. Each of the head offices of the SS in its wartime organization was divided into sections and subsections, and the RSHA eventually contained seven main sections. Section 4 was the Bureau of the Gestapo, and it was headed by Gruppenführer Major General Heinrich Müller, whose rank was the one he had held in the Bavarian police. His task was to combat opponents hostile to the state, of which there were two categories to be dealt with by two sections— Subsection 4A handled opponents accused of communism, sabotage, liberalism, and assassinations, and subsection 4B dealt with sects, that is, Catholics, Protestants, Freemasons, the post remained vacant, and Jews. Each of the categories in these subsections received an office of its own, designated by an Arabic numeral so that Eichmann eventually, in 1941, was appointed to the desk of 4B4 in the RSHA. Since his immediate superior, the head of 4B, turned out to be a non-entity, his real superior was always Müller. Müller's superior was Heydrich and later Kaltenbrunner, each of whom was in his turn under the command of Himmler, who received his orders directly from Hitler. In addition to his twelve head offices, Himmler presided over an altogether different organizational setup, which also played an enormous role in the execution of the final solution. This was the network of higher SS and police leaders who were in command of the regional organizations. Their chain of command did not link them with the RSHA. They were directly responsible to Himmler, and they always outranked Eichmann and the men at his disposal. The Einsatzgruppen, on the other hand, were under the command of Heydrich and the RSHA, which of course does not mean that Eichmann necessarily had anything to do with them. The commanders of the Einsatzgruppen also invariably held a higher rank than Eichmann. Technically and organizationally, Eichmann's position was not very high. His post turned out to be such an important one only because the Jewish question, for purely ideological reasons, acquired a greater importance with every day and week and month of the war, until in the years of defeat, from 1943 on, it had grown to fantastic proportions. When that happened, his was still the only office that officially dealt with nothing but the opponent jury. But in fact, he'd lost his monopoly— because by then all offices and apparatuses, state and party, army and SS, were busy solving that problem. Even if we concentrate our attention only upon the police machinery and disregard all the other offices, the picture is absurdly complicated, since we have to add to the Einsatzgruppen and the higher SS and police leader corps, the commanders and the inspectors of the security police and the security service. Each of these groups belonged in a different chain of command that ultimately reached Himmler, but they were equal with respect to each other, 
and no one belonging to one group owed obedience to a superior officer of another group. The prosecution, it must be admitted, was in a most difficult position in finding its way through this labyrinth of parallel institutions, which it had to do each time it wanted to pin some specific responsibility on Eichmann. If the trial were to take place today, this task would be much easier, since Raoul Hilberg, in his The Destruction of the European Jews, has succeeded in presenting the first clear description of this incredibly complicated machinery of destruction. Furthermore, it must be remembered that all these organs, wielding enormous power, were in fierce competition with one another, which was no help to their victims, since their ambition was always the same, to kill as many Jews as possible. This competitive spirit, which of course inspired in each man a great loyalty to his own outfit, has survived the war, only now it works in reverse. It has become each man's desire to exonerate his own outfit at the expense of all the others. This was the explanation Eichmann gave when he was confronted with the memoirs of Rudolf Hurst, commander of Auschwitz, in which Eichmann is accused of certain things that he claimed he never did and was in no position to do. He admitted easily enough that Hurst had no personal reasons for saddling him with acts of which he was innocent, since their relations had been quite friendly. But he insisted in vain that Hurst wanted to exculpate his own outfit, the head office for administration and economy, and to put all the blame on the RSHA. Something of the same sort happened at Nuremberg, where the various accused presented a nauseating spectacle by accusing each other, though none of them blamed Hitler. Still, no one did this merely to save his own neck at the expense of somebody else's. The men on trial there represented altogether different organizations, with long-standing, deeply ingrained hostility to one another. Dr. Hans Globke, whom he met before, tried to exonerate his own Ministry of the Interior at the expense of the Foreign Office, when he testified for the prosecution at Nuremberg. Eichmann, on the other hand, always tried to shield Müller, Heydrich, and Koltenbrunner, although the latter had treated him quite badly. No doubt one of the chief objective mistakes of the prosecution at Jerusalem was that its case relied too heavily on sworn or unsworn affidavits of former high-ranking Nazis dead or alive. They did not see, and perhaps could not be expected to see, how dubious these documents were as sources for the establishment of facts. Even the judgment, in its evaluation of the damning testimonies of other Nazi criminals, took into account that, in the words of one of the defense witnesses, it was customary at the time of the war crime trials to put as much blame as possible on those who were absent or believed to be dead. When Eichmann entered his new office in Section 4 of the RSHA, he was still confronted with the uncomfortable dilemma that on the one hand forced emigration was the official formula for the solution of the Jewish question, and on the other hand emigration was no longer possible. For the first, and almost the last, time in his life in the SS, he was compelled by circumstances to take the initiative, to see if he could not give birth to an idea. According to the version he gave at the police examination, he was blessed with three ideas. All three of them, he had to admit, came to naught, Everything he tried on his own invariably went wrong. The final blow came when he had to abandon his private fortress in Berlin before he could try it out against Russian tanks. Nothing but frustration, a hard luck story if there ever was one. The inexhaustible source of trouble, as he saw it, was that he and his men were never left alone, that all these other state and party offices wanted their share in the solution, with the result that a veritable army of Jewish experts had cropped up everywhere and were falling over themselves in their efforts to be first in a field of which they knew nothing. For these people Eichmann had the greatest contempt, partly because they were Johnnies come lately, partly because they tried to enrich themselves and often succeeded in getting quite rich in the course of their work, and partly because they were ignorant. They had not read the one or two basic books. His three dreams turned out to have been inspired by the basic books, but it was also revealed that two of the three were definitely not his ideas at all, and with respect to the third, well, I do not know any longer whether it was Stalecker, his superior in Vienna and Prague, or myself who gave birth to the idea, anyhow the idea was born. This last idea was the first chronologically. It was the idea of Nisko and its failure was for Eichmann the clearest possible proof of the evil of interference. 
The guilty person in this case was Hans Frank, Governor-General of Poland. In order to understand the plan, we must remember that after the conquest of Poland and prior to the German attack on Russia, the Polish territories were divided between Germany and Russia. The German part consisted of the western regions, which were incorporated into the Reich, and the so-called eastern area, including Warsaw, which was known as the General Government. For the time being, the eastern area was treated as occupied territory. As the solution of the Jewish question at this time was still forced emigration, with the goal of making Germany Judenrein, it was natural that Polish Jews in the annexed territories, together with the remaining Jews in other parts of the Reich, should be shoved into the general government, which, whatever it may have been, was not considered to be part of the Reich. By December 1939, evacuations eastward had started, and roughly one million Jews, 600,000 from the incorporated area and 400,000 from the Reich, began to arrive in the general government. If Eichmann's version of the Nisko adventure is true, and there is no reason not to believe him, he, or more likely his Prague and Vienna superior, Brigade de Führer Brigadier General Franz Stalecker, must have anticipated these developments by several months. This Dr. Stalecker, as Eichmann was careful to call him, was in his opinion a very fine man, educated, full of reason, and free of hatred and chauvinism of any kind. In Vienna, he used to shake hands with the Jewish functionaries. A year and a half later, in the spring of 1941, this educated gentleman was appointed commander of Einsatzgruppe A and managed to kill by shooting in little more than a year, he himself was killed in action in 1942, 250,000 Jews, as he proudly reported to Himmler himself, although the chief of the Einsatzgruppen, which were police units, was the head of the security police and the SD, that is, Reinhard Heydrich. But that came later. And now, in September 1939, while the German army was still busy occupying the Polish territories, Eichmann and Dr. Stalecker began to think privately about how the security service might get its share of influence in the East. What they needed was an area as large as possible in Poland to be carved off for the erection of an autonomous Jewish state in the form of a protectorate. This could be the solution. And off they went on their own initiative without orders from anybody to reconnoitre. They went to the Radom district on the San River, not far from the Russian border, and they saw a huge territory, villages, marketplaces, small towns, and we said to ourselves, that is what we need, and why should one not resettle Poles for a change, since people are being resettled everywhere? This will be the solution of the Jewish question, firm soil under their feet, at least for some time. Everything seemed to go very well at first. They went to Heydrich, and Heydrich agreed and told them to go ahead. It so happened, though Eichmann in Jerusalem had completely forgotten it, that their project fitted very well in Heydrich's overall plan at this stage for the solution of the Jewish question. On September 21, 1939, he had called a meeting of the heads of departments of the RSHA and the Einsatzgruppen, operating already in Poland, at which general directives for the immediate future have been given. Concentration of Jews in ghettos, establishment of councils of Jewish elders, and the deportation of all Jews to the general government area. Eichmann had attended this meeting, setting up the Jewish Center of Emigration, as was proved at the trial through the minutes, which Bureau 06 of the Israeli police had discovered in the National Archives in Washington. Hence Eichmann's, or Stalecker's, initiative amounted to no more than a concrete plan for carrying out Heydrich's directives. And now, thousands of people, chiefly from Austria, were deported helter-skelter into this godforsaken place, which an SS officer, Erik Rajakovich, who later was in charge of the deportation of Dutch Jews, explained to them, The Führer has promised the Jews as a new homeland. There are no dwellings, there are no houses. If you build, there will be a roof over your heads. There is no water, the wells all around carry disease, there is cholera, dysentery, and typhoid. If you bore and find water, you will have water. As one can see, everything looked marvellous, except that the SS expelled some of the Jews from this paradise, driving them across the Russian border, and others had the good sense to escape of their own volition. But then, Eichmann complained, 
the obstructions began on the part of Hans Frank, whom they had forgotten to inform, although this was his territory. Frank complained in Berlin, and a great tug of war started. Frank wanted to solve his Jewish question all by himself. He did not want to receive any more Jews in his general government. Those who had arrived should disappear immediately. And they did disappear. Some were even repatriated, which had never happened before, and never happened again, and those who returned to Vienna were registered in the police records as returning from vocational training, a curious relapse into the pro-Zionist stage of the movement. Eichmann's eagerness to acquire some territory for his Jews is best understood in terms of his own career. The Nisko plan was born during the time of his rapid advancement, and it is more than likely that he saw himself as the future governor-general like Hans Frank in Poland, or the future protector like Heydrich in Czechoslovakia of a Jewish state. The utter fiasco of the whole enterprise, however, must have taught him a lesson about the possibilities and the desirability of private initiative. And since he and Starlecker had acted within the framework of Heydrich's directives and with his explicit consent, this unique repatriation of Jews, clearly a temporary defeat for the police and the SS, must also have taught him that the steadily increasing power of his own outfit did not amount to omnipotence, that the state ministries and the other party institutions were quite prepared to fight to maintain their own shrinking power. Eichmann's second attempt at putting firm ground under the feet of the Jews was the Madagascar project. The plan to evacuate four million Jews from Europe to the French island off the southeast coast of Africa, an island with a native population of 4,370,000 and an area of 227,678 square miles of poor land, had originated in the Foreign Office and was then transmitted to the RSHA. Because, in the words of Dr. Martin Luther, who was in charge of Jewish affairs in the Wilhelmstrasse, only the police possessed the experiences and the technical facilities to execute an evacuation of Jews en masse and to guarantee the supervision of the evacuees. The Jewish state was to have a police governor under the jurisdiction of Himmler. The project itself had an odd history. Eichmann, confusing Madagascar with Uganda, always claimed to having dreamed a dream once dreamed by the Jewish protagonist of the Jewish state idea, Theodor Herzl, but it is true that his dream had been dreamed before, first by the Polish government, which in 1937 went to much trouble to look into the idea, only to find that it would be quite impossible to ship its own nearly three million Jews there without killing them, and somewhat later by the French foreign minister, Georges Bonnet, who had the more modest plan of shipping France's foreign Jews, numbering about 200,000, to the French colony. He even consulted his German opposite number, Joachim von Ribbentrop, on the matter in 1938. Eichmann, at any rate, was told in the summer of 1940, when his emigration business had come to a complete standstill, to work out a detailed plan for the evacuation of four million Jews to Madagascar. And this project seems to have occupied most of his time until the invasion of Russia a year later. Four million is a strikingly low figure for making Europe Judenrein. It obviously did not include three million Polish Jews, who, as everybody knew, had been being massacred ever since the first days of the war. That anybody except Eichmann and some other lesser luminaries ever took the whole thing seriously seems unlikely, for, apart from the fact that the territory was known to be unsuitable, not to mention the fact that it was, after all, a French possession, the plan would have required shipping space for four million in the midst of a war and at a moment when the British Navy was in control of the Atlantic. The Madagascar plan was always meant to serve as a cloak under which the preparations for the physical extermination of all the Jews of Western Europe could be carried forward. No such cloak was needed for the extermination of Polish Jews. And its great advantage with respect to the army of trained anti-Semites who try as they might always found themselves one step behind the Fuhrer, was that it familiarised all concerned with the preliminary notion that nothing less than complete evacuation from Europe would do. No special legislation, no dissimulation, no ghettos would suffice. When a year later the Madagascar project was declared to have become obsolete, everybody was psychologically, or rather logically, prepared for the next step. 
since there existed no territory to which one could evacuate, the only solution was extermination. Not that Eichmann, the truth revealer for generations to come, ever suspected the existence of such sinister plans. What brought the Madagascar enterprise to naught was lack of time, and time was wasted through the never-ending interference from other offices. In Jerusalem, the police, as well as the court, tried to shake him out of his complacency. They confronted him with two documents concerning the meeting of September 21, 1939, mentioned above. One of them, a teletyped letter written by Heydrich and containing certain directives to the Einsatzgruppen, distinguished for the first time between a final aim requiring longer periods of time and to be treated as top secret, and the stages for achieving this final aim. The phrase final solution did not yet appear, and the document is silent about the meaning of a final aim. Hence Eichmann could have said, all right, the final aim was his Madagascar project which at this time was being kicked around all the German offices. For a mass evacuation, the concentration of all Jews was a necessary preliminary stage. But Eichmann, after reading the document carefully, said immediately that he was convinced that final aim could only mean physical extermination, and concluded that this basic idea was already rooted in the minds of the higher leaders, or the men at the very top. This might indeed have been the truth, but then he would have had to admit that the Madagascar project could not have been more than a hoax. Well, he did not. He never changed his Madagascar story, and probably he just could not change it. It was as though this story ran along a different tape in his memory, and it was this taped memory that showed itself to be proof against reason and argument and information and insight of any kind. His memory informed him that there had existed a lull in the activities against Western and Central European Jews between the outbreak of the war, Hitler in his speech to the Reichstag of January 30, 1939, had prophesied that war would bring the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe and the invasion of Russia. To be sure, even then, the various offices in the Reich and in the occupied territories were doing their best to eliminate the opponent, Jury, but there was no unified policy. It seemed as though every office had its own solution and might be permitted to apply it or to pit it against the solutions of its competitors. Eichmann's solution was a police state, and for that he needed a sizable territory. All his efforts failed because of the lack of understanding of the minds concerned, because of rivalries, quarrels, squabbling, because everybody vied for supremacy. And then it was too late. The war against Russia struck suddenly like a thunderclap. That was the end of his dreams, as it marked the end of the era of searching for a solution in the interest of both sides. It was also, as he recognized in the memoirs he wrote in Argentina, the end of an era in which there existed laws, ordinances, decrees for the treatment of individual Jews. And according to him, it was more than that. It was the end of his career. And though this sounded rather crazy in view of his present fame, it could not be denied that he had a point. For his outfit, which either in the actuality of forced emigration or in the dream of a Nazi-ruled Jewish state, had been the final authority in all Jewish matters, now receded into the second rank, so far as the final solution of the Jewish question was concerned. For what was now initiated was transferred to different units, and negotiations were conducted by another head office, under the command of the former Reichsführer SS and chief of the German police. The different units were the picked groups of killers who operated in the rear of the army in the east, and whose special duty consisted of massacring the native civilian population, and especially the Jews. And the other head office was the WVHA under Oswald Pohl, to which Eichmann had to apply to find out the ultimate destination of each shipment of Jews. This was calculated according to the absorptive capacity of the various killing installations, and also according to the requests for slave workers from the numerous industrial enterprises that had found it profitable to establish branches in the neighborhood of some of the death camps. Apart from the not very important industrial enterprises of the SS, such famous German firms as IG Farben, the Kruppwerke, and Siemens Schuckertwerke had established plants in Auschwitz as well as near the Lublin death camps. Cooperation between the SS and the businessmen was excellent. 
Hers of Auschwitz testified to very cordial social relations with the IG Farben representatives. As for working conditions, the idea was clearly to kill through labour. According to Hilberg, at least 25,000 of the approximately 35,000 Jews who worked for one of the IG Farben plants died. As far as Eichmann was concerned, the point was that evacuation and deportation were no longer the last stages of the solution. His department had become merely instrumental. Hence he had every reason to be very embittered and disappointed when the Madagascar project was shelved, and the only thing he had to console him was his promotion to Obersturmbahnführer, which came in October 1941. The last time Eichmann recalled having tried something on his own was in September 1941, three months after the invasion of Russia. This was just after Heydrich, still chief of the security police and the security service, had become protector of Bohemia and Moravia. To celebrate the occasion, he had called a press conference and had promised that in eight weeks the protectorate would be Judenrein. After the conference, he discussed the matter with those who would have to make his word good— with Franz Stahlecker, who was then local commander of the security police in Prague, and with the Undersecretary of State Karl Hermann Frank, a former Sudeten leader who soon after Heydrich's death was to succeed him as Reich protector. Frank, in Eichmann's opinion, was a low type, a Jew hater of the striker kind, who didn't know a thing about political solutions. One of those people who autocratically, and let me say, in the drunkenness of their power, simply gave orders and commands. But otherwise the conference was enjoyable. For the first time Heydrich showed a more human side, and admitted with beautiful frankness that he had allowed his tongue to run away with him. No great surprise to those who knew Heydrich, an ambitious and impulsive character, who often let words slip through the fence of his teeth more quickly than he later might have liked. So... Heydrich himself said, There is the mess, and what are we going to do now? Whereupon Eichmann said, There exists only one possibility if you cannot retreat from your announcement. Give enough room into which to transfer the Jews of the Protectorate, who now live dispersed, a Jewish homeland, a gathering of the exiles in the diaspora. And then, unfortunately, Frank, the Jew hater of the striker kind, made a concrete proposal, and that was that the room be provided at Theresienstadt. Whereupon Heydrich, perhaps also in the drunkenness of his power, simply ordered the immediate evacuation of the native Czech population from Theresienstadt to make room for the Jews. Eichmann was sent there to look things over. Great disappointment. The Bohemian fortress town on the banks of the Eger was far too small, at best, it could become a transfer camp for a certain percentage of the 90,000 Jews in Bohemia and Moravia. For about 50,000 Czech Jews, Theresian start indeed became a transfer camp on the way to Auschwitz, while an estimated 20,000 more reached the same destination directly. We know from better sources that Eichmann's faulty memory that Theresian start from the beginning was designed by Heydrich to serve as a special ghetto for certain privileged categories of Jews, chiefly but not exclusively from Germany, Jewish functionaries, prominent people, war veterans with high decorations, invalids, the Jewish partners of mixed marriages, and German Jews over 65 years of age, hence the nickname Alters Ghetto. The town proved too small even for these restricted categories, and in 1943, about a year after its establishment, there began the thinning out, or loosening up, of Flockerung processes, by which overcrowding was regularly relieved by means of transport to Auschwitz. But in one respect Eichmann's memory did not deceive him. Theresienstadt was in fact the only concentration camp that did not fall under the authority of the WVHA, but remained his own responsibility to the end. Its commanders were men from his own staff, and always his inferiors in rank. It was the only camp in which he had at least some of the power which the prosecution in Jerusalem ascribed to him. Eichmann's memory, jumping with great ease over the years— he was two years ahead of the sequence of events when he told the police examiner the story of Theresienstadt, was certainly not controlled by chronological order, but it was not simply erratic. It was like a storehouse filled with human interest stories of the worst type. When he thought back to Prague, there emerged the occasion when he was admitted to the presence of the great Heydrich, who showed himself to have a more human side. 
A few sessions later, he mentioned a trip to Bratislava in Slovakia, where he happened to be at the time when Heydrich was assassinated. What he remembered was that he was there as the guest of Sano Mack, Minister of the Interior in the German-established Slovakian puppet government. In that strongly anti-Semitic Catholic government, Mack represented the German version of anti-Semitism. He refused to allow exceptions for baptized Jews, and he was one of the persons chiefly responsible for the wholesale deportation of Slovak Jewry. Eichmann remembered this because it was unusual for him to receive social invitations from members of governments. It was an honor. Mack, as Eichmann recalled, was a nice, easy-going fellow who invited him to bowl with him. Did he really have no other business in Pratislava in the middle of the war than to go bowling with the Minister of the Interior? No, absolutely no other business. He remembered it all very well, how they bowled and how drinks were served just before the news of the attempt on Heydrich's life arrived. Four months and fifty-five tapes later, Captain Less, the Israeli examiner, came back to this point, and Eichmann told the same story in nearly identical words, adding that this day had been unforgettable because his superior had been assassinated. This time, however, he was confronted with a document that said he had been sent to Bratislava to talk over the current evacuation action against Jews from Slovakia. He admitted his error at once. Clear, clear, that was an order from Berlin. They did not send me there to go bowling. Had he lied twice with great consistency? Hardly. To evacuate and deport Jews had become routine business. What stuck in his mind was bowling, being the guest of a minister, and hearing of the attack on Heydrich. And it was characteristic of his kind of memory that he could absolutely not recall the year in which this memorable day fell, on which the hangman was shot by Czech patriots. Had his memory served him better, he would never have told the Theresian start story at all. For all has happened when the time of political solutions had passed, and the era of the physical solution had begun. It happened when, as he was to admit freely and spontaneously in another context, he had already been informed of the Führer's order for the final solution. To make a country Judenrein at the date when Heydrich promised to do so for Bohemia and Moravia could mean only concentration and deportation to points from which Jews could easily be shipped to the killing centers. That Theresian start actually came to serve another purpose, that of a showplace for the outside world, it was the only ghetto or camp to which representatives of the International Red Cross were admitted, was another matter, one of which Eichmann at that moment was almost certainly ignorant, and which anyway was altogether outside the scope of his competence. 6. The Final Solution Killing On June 22, 1941, Hitler launched his attack on the Soviet Union, and six or eight weeks later, Eichmann was summoned to Heydrich's office in Berlin. On July 31, Heydrich had received a letter from Reich Marshal Hermann Göring, Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force, Prime Minister of Prussia, Plenipotentiary for the Four-Year Plan, and last but not least, Hitler's deputy in the state, as distinguished from the party hierarchy. The letter commissioned Heydrich to prepare the general solution, Gesamtlösung, of the Jewish question within the area of German influence in Europe and to submit a general proposal for the implementation of the desired final solution, Endlösung, of the Jewish question. At the time Heydrich received these instructions, he had already been, as he was to explain to the high command of the army in a letter dated November 6, 1941, and trusted for years with the task of preparing the final solution of the Jewish problem, Reitlinger, and since the beginning of the war with Russia, he had been in charge of the mass killings by the Einsatzgruppen in the East. Heydrich opened his interview with Eichmann with a little speech about emigration, which had practically ceased, though Himmler's formal order prohibiting all Jewish emigration except in special cases, to be passed upon by him personally, was not issued until a few months later. And then said, The Führer has ordered the physical extermination of the Jews. After which, very much against his habits, he remained silent for a long while, as though he wanted to test the impact of his words. I remember it even today. In the first moment I was unable to grasp the significance of what he had said, because he was so careful in choosing his words. And then I understood, and, 
didn't say anything because there was nothing to say any more, for I had never thought of such a thing, such a solution through violence. I now lost everything, all joy in my work, all initiative, all interest. I was, so to speak, blown out. And then he told me, Eichmann, you go and see Globochnik, one of Himmler's higher SS and police leaders in the general government. In Lublin, the Reichsführer, that is Himmler, has already given him the necessary orders. Have a look at what he has accomplished in the meantime. I think he uses the Russian tank trenches for the liquidation of the Jews. I still remember that, for I'll never forget it, no matter how long I live, those sentences he said during that interview, which was already at an end. Actually, as Eichmann still remembered in Argentina, but had forgotten in Jerusalem, much to his disadvantage, since it had bearing on the question of his own authority in the actual killing process, Heydrich had said a little more. He had told Eichmann that the whole enterprise had been put under the authority of the SS Head Office for Economy and Administration, that is, not of his own RSHA, and also that the official code name for extermination was to be Final Solution. Eichmann was by no means among the first to be informed of Hitler's intention. We've seen that Heydrich had been working in this direction for years, presumably since the beginning of the war and Himmler claimed to have been told, and to have protested against this solution, immediately after the defeat of France in the summer of 1940. By March 1941, about six months before Eichmann had his interview with Heydrich, it was no secret in higher party circles that the Jews were to be exterminated, as Victor Brack, one of the Führer's chancellery, testified at Nuremberg. But Eichmann, as he vainly tried to explain in Jerusalem had never belonged to the higher party circles. He had never been told more than he needed to know in order to do a specific limited job. It is true that he was one of the first men in the lower echelons to be informed of this top-secret matter, which remained top-secret even after the news had spread throughout all the party and state offices, or business enterprises connected with slave labor, and the entire officer corps, at the very least, of the armed forces. Still, the secrecy did have a practical purpose. Those who were told explicitly of the Führer's orders were no longer mere bearers of orders, but were advanced to bearers of secrets, and a special oath was administered to them. The members of the security service, to which Eichmann had belonged since 1934, had in any case taken an oath of secrecy. Furthermore, all correspondence referring to the matter was subject to rigid language rules— and except in the reports from the Einsatzgruppen, it is rare to find documents in which such bald words as extermination, liquidation, or killing occur. The prescribed code names for killing were Final Solution, Evacuation, Ossiedlung, and Special Treatment, Sonderbehandlung. Deportation, unless it involved Jews directed to Theresienstadt, the old people's ghetto for privileged Jews, in which case it was called Change of Residence, received the names of Resettlement, um Seidlung, and Labour in the East, Arbeitseinsatz im Osten. The point of these latter names being that Jews were indeed often temporarily resettled in ghettos, and that a certain percentage of them were temporarily used for labour. Under special circumstances, slight changes in the language rules became necessary. Thus, for instance, a high official in the Foreign Office once proposed that in all correspondence with the Vatican, the killing of Jews be called the Radical Solution. This was ingenious, because the Catholic puppet government of Slovakia, with which the Vatican had intervened, had not been, in the view of the Nazis, radical enough in its anti-Jewish legislation, having committed the basic error of excluding baptized Jews. Only among themselves could the bearers of secrets talk in uncoded language, and it is very unlikely that they did so in the ordinary pursuit of their murderous duties, certainly not in the presence of their stenographers and other office personnel. For whatever other reasons the language rules may have been devised, they proved of enormous help in the maintenance of order and sanity in the various widely diversified services whose cooperation was essential in this matter. Moreover, the very term language rule, Sprachregelung, was itself a code name. It meant what in ordinary language would be called a lie. For when a bearer of secrets was sent to meet someone from the outside world, 
as when Eichmann was sent to show the Theresienstadt ghetto to International Red Cross representatives from Switzerland. He received, together with his orders, his language rule, which in this instance consisted of a lie about a non-existent typhus epidemic in the concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen, which the gentlemen also wished to visit. The net effect of this language system was not to keep these people ignorant of what they were doing, but to prevent them from equating it with their old normal knowledge of murder and lies. Eichmann's great susceptibility to catchwords and stock phrases, combined with his incapacity for ordinary speech, made him, of course, an ideal subject for language rules. The system, however, was not a foolproof shield against reality, as Eichmann was soon to find out. He went to Lublin to see Brigade Führer Odilo Globochnik, former Gauleiter of Vienna, though not, of course, despite what the prosecution maintained to convey to him personally the secret order for the physical extermination of the Jews, which Globochnik certainly knew of before Eichmann did, and he used the phrase final solution as a kind of password by which to identify himself. A similar assertion by the prosecution, which showed to what degree it had got lost in the bureaucratic labyrinth of the Third Reich, referred to Rudolf Hurst, commander of Auschwitz, who it believed had also received the Führer's order through Eichmann. This error was at least mentioned by the defence as being without corroborative evidence. Actually, Hurst himself testified at his own trial that he had received his orders directly from Himmler in June 1941, and added that Himmler had told him Eichmann would discuss with him certain details. These details, Hurst claimed in his memoirs, concerned the use of gas, something Eichmann strenuously denied. And he was probably right, for all other sources contradict Hurst's story and maintain that written or oral extermination orders in the camps always went through the WVHA and were given either by its chief, Obergruppenführer Lieutenant General Oswald Pohl, or by Brigade Führer Richard Glucks, who was Hurst's direct superior. Concerning the doubtful reliability of Hurst's testimony, see also R. Pendorf, Murder und Ermordeter, 1961. And with the use of gas, Eichmann had nothing whatever to do. The details that he went to discuss with Hearst at regular intervals concerned the killing capacity of the camp, how many shipments per week it could absorb, and also perhaps plans for expansion. Globochnik, when Eichmann arrived at Lublin, was very obliging and showed him around with a subordinate. They came to a road through a forest, to the right of which there was an ordinary house where workers lived. A captain of the order police, perhaps criminal commissar Christian Wirther himself, who had been in charge of the technical side of the gassing of incurably sick people in Germany under the auspices of the Führer's chancellery, came to greet them, led them to a few small wooden bungalows, and began, in a vulgar, uneducated, harsh voice, his explanations how he had everything nicely insulated, for the engine of a Russian submarine will be set to work, and the gases will add to this building, and the Jews will be poisoned. For me, too, this was monstrous. I am not so tough as to be able to endure something of this sort without any reaction. If today I am shown a gaping wood, I can't possibly look at it. I am that type of person, so that very often I was told that I couldn't have become a doctor. I still remember how I pictured the thing to myself— and then I became physically weak, as though I had lived through some great agitation. Such things happen to everybody, and it left behind a certain inner trembling. Well, he had been lucky, for he had still seen only the preparations for the future carbon monoxide chambers at Treblinka, one of the six death camps in the East, in which several hundred thousand people were to die. Shortly after this, in the autumn of the same year, he was sent by his direct superior, Müller, to inspect the killing centre in the western regions of Poland that had been incorporated into the Reich, called the Wartegau. The death camp was at Kulm, or in Polish Kelmna, where in 1944 over 300,000 Jews from all over Europe, who had first been resettled in the Lutz ghetto, were killed. Here things were already in full swing, but the method was different. Instead of gas chambers, mobile gas vans were used. This is what Eichmann saw. The Jews were in a large room. They were told to strip. Then a truck arrived, stopping directly before the entrance to the room, and the naked Jews were told to enter it. The doors were closed, and the truck started off. 
I cannot tell how many Jews entered. I hardly looked. I could not. I could not. I had had enough. The shrieking and... I was much too upset and so on, as I later told Muller when I reported to him. He did not get much profit out of my report. I then drove along after the van, and then I saw the most horrible sight I had thus far seen in my life. The truck was making for an open ditch. The doors were opened, and the corpses were thrown out as though they were still alive, so smooth were their limbs. They were hurled into the ditch, and I can still see a civilian extracting the teeth with tooth pliers. And then I was off, jumped into my car, and did not open my mouth any more. After that time I could sit for hours beside my driver without exchanging a word with him. There I got enough. I was finished. I only remember that a physician in white overalls told me to look through a hole into the truck while they were still in it. I refused to do that. I could not. I had to disappear. Very soon after that he was to see something more horrible. This happened when he was sent to Minsk in White Russia, again by Muller, who told him, In Minsk they are killing Jews by shooting. I want you to report on how it is being done. So he went, and at first it seemed as though he would be lucky, for by the time he arrived, as it happened, the affair had almost been finished, which pleased him very much. There were only a few young marksmen who took aim at the skulls of dead people in a large ditch. Still he saw and that was quite enough for me, a woman with her arms stretched backward, and then my knees went weak, and off I went. While driving back, he had the notion of stopping at Lvov. This seemed a good idea, for Lvov, or Lemberg, had been an Austrian city, and when he arrived there, he saw the first friendly picture after the horrors. That was the railway station, built in honour of the sixtieth year of Franz Josef's reign, a period Eichmann had always adored, since he'd heard so many nice things about it in his parents' home, and had also been told how the relatives of his stepmother, we are made to understand that he meant the Jewish ones, had enjoyed a comfortable social status and had made good money. This sight of the railway station drove away all the horrible thoughts, and he remembered it down to its last detail, the engraved year of the anniversary, for instance. But then, right there in lovely Lvov, he made a big mistake— he went to see the local SS commander and told him, "'Well, it is horrible what is being done around here,' I said. "'Young people are being made into sadists.' "'How can one do that? Simply bang away at women and children. That is impossible. Our people will go mad or become insane, our own people.' The trouble was that at Lvov they were doing the same thing they had been doing in Minsk, and his host was delighted to show him the sights although Eichmann tried politely to excuse himself. Thus he saw another horrible sight. A ditch had been there which was already filled in, and there was gushing from the earth a spring of blood like a fountain, such a thing I had never seen before. I had had enough of my commission, and I went back to Berlin and reported to Gruppenführer Müller. This was not yet the end. Although Eichmann told him that he was not tough enough for these sights, that he had never been a soldier, had never been to the front, had never seen action, that he could not sleep and had nightmares, Müller, some nine months later, sent him back to the Lublin region, where the very enthusiastic Globochnik had meanwhile finished his preparations. Eichmann said that this, now, was the most horrible thing he had ever seen in his life. When he first arrived, he could not recognize the place with its few wooden bungalows. Instead, guided by the same man with the vulgar voice, he came to a railway station with the sign Treblinka on it that looked exactly like an ordinary station anywhere in Germany. The same buildings, signs, clocks, installations. It was a perfect imitation. I kept myself back as far as I could. I did not draw near to see all that. Still, I saw how a column of naked Jews filed into a large hall to be gassed. There they were killed, as I was told, by something called cyanic acid. The fact is that Eichmann did not see much. It is true he repeatedly visited Auschwitz, the largest and most famous of the death camps, but Auschwitz, covering an area of 18 square miles in Upper Silesia, was by no means only an extermination camp. It was a huge enterprise with up to a 100,000 inmates— and all kinds of prisoners were held there, including non-Jews and slave labourers, who were not subject to gassing. It was easy to avoid the killing installations, and Hurst, with whom he had a very friendly relationship, 
spared him the gruesome sights. He never actually attended a mass execution by shooting. He never actually watched the gassing process or the selection of those fit for work, about 25% of each shipment on the average, that preceded it at Auschwitz. He saw just enough to be fully informed of how the destruction machinery worked, that there were two different methods of killing, shooting and gassing, that the shooting was done by the Einsatzgruppen and the gassing at the camps, either in chambers or in mobile vans, and in the camps elaborate precautions were taken to fool the victims right up to the end. The police tapes from which I have quoted were played in court during the tenth of the trial's 121 sessions, on the ninth day of the almost nine months it lasted. Nothing the accused said in the curiously disembodied voice that came out of the tape recorder, doubly disembodied, because the body that owned the voice was present, but itself also appeared strangely disembodied through the thick glass walls surrounding it, was denied either by him or by the defence. Dr. Servatius did not object. He only mentioned that, later, when the defence were rise to speak, he too would submit to the court some of the evidence given by the accused to the police. He never did. The defence, one felt, could rise right away, for the criminal proceedings against the accused in this historic trial seemed complete, the case for the prosecution established. The facts of the case, of what Eichmann had done, though not of everything the prosecution wished he had done, were never in dispute. They had been established long before the trial started, and had been confessed to by him over and over again. There was more than enough, as he occasionally pointed out, to hang him. Don't you have enough on me, he objected, when the police examiner tried to ascribe to him powers he never possessed. But since he had been employed in transportation and not in killing, the question remained legally, formally at least, of whether he had known what he was doing. And there was the additional question of whether he had been in a position to judge the enormity of his deeds, whether he was legally responsible, apart from the fact that he was medically sane. Both questions now were answered in the affirmative. He had seen the places to which the shipments were directed, and he had been shocked out of his wits. One last question, the most disturbing of all, was asked by the judges, and especially by the presiding judge, over and over again. Had the killing of Jews gone against his conscience? But this was a moral question, and the answer to it may not have been legally relevant. But if the facts of the case were now established, two more legal questions arose. First, could he be released from criminal responsibility, as Section 10 of the law under which he was tried provided, because he had done his act in order to save himself from the danger of immediate death? And second, could he plead extenuating circumstances, as Section 11 of the same law enumerated them? Had he done his best to reduce the gravity of the consequences of the offence, or to avert consequences more serious than those which resulted? Clearly, Sections 10 and 11 of the Nazis and Nazi collaborators' punishment law of 1950 had been drawn up with Jewish collaborators in mind. Jewish Sonderkommandos, special units, had everywhere been employed in the actual killing process. They had committed criminal acts in order to save themselves from the danger of immediate death, and the Jewish councils and elders had cooperated because they thought they could avert consequences more serious than those which resulted. In Eichmann's case, his own testimony supplied the answer to both questions, and it was clearly negative. It is true he once said his only alternative would have been suicide— but this was a lie, since we know how surprisingly easy it was for members of the extermination squads to quit their jobs without serious consequences for themselves. But he did not insist on this point. He did not mean to be taken literally. In the Nuremberg documents, not a single case could be traced in which an SS member had suffered the death penalty because of a refusal to take part in an execution. Herbert Jäger, Betrachtungen zum Eichmann Prozess in Kriminologie und Strafrechtsreform, 1962. And in the trial itself, there was the testimony of a witness for the defense, von dem Bach Zalewski, who declared it was possible to evade a commission by an application for transfer. To be sure, in individual cases, one had to be prepared for a certain disciplinary punishment. A danger to one's life, however, was not at all involved. Eichmann knew quite well 
that he was by no means in the classical difficult position of a soldier who may be liable to be shot by a court-martial if he disobeys an order and to be hanged by a judge and jury if he obeys it, as Dicey once put it in his famous Law of the Constitution. If only because, as a member of the SS, he had never been subject to a military court, but could only have been brought before a police and SS tribunal. In his last statement to the court, Eichmann admitted that he could have backed out on one pretext or another, and that others had done so. He had always thought such a step was inadmissible, and even now did not think it was admirable. It would have meant no more than a switch to another well-paying job. The post-war notion of open disobedience was a fairy tale. Under the circumstances, such behaviour was impossible. Nobody acted that way. It was unthinkable. Had he been made commander of a death camp like his good friend Hearst, he would have had to commit suicide since he was incapable of killing. Hearst, incidentally, had committed a murder in his youth. He had assassinated a certain Volta Kadov, the man who had betrayed Leo Blagata, a nationalist terrorist in the Rhineland, whom the Nazis later made into a national hero, to the French occupation authorities, and a German court had put him in jail for five years. In Auschwitz, of course, Hearst did not have to kill. But it was very unlikely that Eichmann would have been offered this kind of a job, since those who issued the orders knew full well the limits to which a person can be driven. No, he had not been in danger of immediate death, and since he claimed with great pride that he had always done his duty, obeyed all orders as his oath demanded, he had, of course, always done his best to aggravate the consequences of the offence rather than to reduce them. The only extenuating circumstance he cited was that he had tried to avoid unnecessary hardships as much as possible in carrying out his work. And quite apart from the question of whether this was true, and also apart from the fact that if it was, it would hardly have been enough to constitute extenuating circumstances in this particular case, the claim was not valid, because to avoid unnecessary hardships was among the standard directives he had been given. Hence, after the tape recorder had addressed the court, the death sentence was a foregone conclusion, even legally, except for the possibility that the punishment might be mitigated for acts done under superior orders, also provided for in Section 11 of the Israeli law. But this was a very remote possibility in view of the enormity of the crime. It is important to remember that counsel for the defence pleaded not superior orders but acts of state and asked for acquittal on that ground a strategy Dr. Servatius had already tried unsuccessfully at Nuremberg, where he defended Fritz Saukel, plenipotentiary for labour allocation in Goring's office of the four-year plan, who had been responsible for the extermination of tens of thousands of Jewish workers in Poland, and who was duly hanged in 1946. Acts of State, which German jurisprudence even more tellingly calls Gerichisch frei or Justisloser Hochheitsakt, rest on an exercise of sovereign power. ECS Wade, in the British Yearbook for International Law, 1934, and heads are altogether outside the legal realm, whereas all orders and commands, at least in theory, are still under judicial control. If what Eichmann did had been acts of state, then none of his superiors, least of all Hitler, the head of state, could be judged by any court. The act of state theory agreed so well with Dr. Servatius's general philosophy that it was perhaps not surprising that he should have tried it out again. What was surprising was that he did not fall back on the argument of superior orders as an extenuating circumstance after the judgment had been read and before the sentence was pronounced. At this point one was perhaps entitled to be glad that this was no ordinary trial, where statements without bearing on the criminal proceedings must be thrown out as irrelevant and immaterial. For obviously things were not so simple as the framers of the laws had imagined them to be, and if it was of small legal relevance it was of great political interest, to know how long it takes an average person to overcome his innate repugnance toward crime and what exactly happens to him once he has reached that point. To this question... The case of Adolf Eichmann supplied an answer that could not have been clearer and more precise. In September 1941, shortly after his first official visit to the killing centres in the East, Eichmann organised his first mass deportations from Germany and the Protectorate, in accordance with a wish of Hitler, who had told Himmler to make the Reich Judenrein as quickly as possible. The first shipment contained 20,000 Jews from the Rhineland, 
and 5,000 gypsies, and in connection with this first transport a strange thing happened. Eichmann, who never made a decision on his own, who was extremely careful always to be covered by orders, who, as freely given testimony from practically all the people who had worked with him confirmed, did not even like to volunteer suggestions and always required directives, now, for the first and last time, took an initiative contrary to orders. Instead of sending these people to Russian territory, Riga or Minsk, where they would have immediately been shot by the Einsatzgruppen, he directed the transport to the ghetto of Lodz, where he knew that no preparations for extermination had yet been made, if only because the man in charge of the ghetto, a certain Regierungspräsident Übeler, had found ways and means of deriving considerable profit from his Jews. Lodz, in fact, was the first ghetto to be established and the last to be liquidated. Those of its inmates who did not succumb to disease or starvation survived until the summer of 1944. This decision was to get Eichmann into considerable trouble. The ghetto was overcrowded, and Mr. Ubelor was in no mood to receive newcomers and in no position to accommodate them. He was angry enough to complain to Himmler that Eichmann had deceived him and his men with horse-trading tricks learned from the gypsies. Himmler, as well as Heydrich, protected Eichmann, and the incident was soon forgiven and forgotten. Forgotten, first of all, by Eichmann himself, who did not once mention it, either in the police examination or in his various memoirs. When he had taken the stand and was being examined by his lawyer, who showed him the documents, he insisted he had a choice. Here, for the first and last time, I had a choice. One was Lodz. If there are difficulties in Lodz, these people must be sent onward to the east. And since I had seen the preparations, I was determined to do all I could to send these people to Lodz by any means at my disposal. Counsel for the defense tried to conclude from this incident that Eichmann had saved Jews whenever he could, which was patently untrue. The prosecutor, who cross-examined him later with respect to the same incident, wished to establish that Eichmann himself had determined the final destination of all shipments, and hence had decided whether or not a particular transport was to be exterminated, which was also untrue. Eichmann's own explanation that he had not disobeyed an order, but only taken advantage of a choice, finally was not true either, for there had been difficulties in Lodz, as he knew full well, so that his order read in so many words, Final destination, Minsk or Riga. Although Eichmann had forgotten all about it, this was clearly the only instance in which he actually had tried to save Jews. Three weeks later, however, there was a meeting in Prague called by Heydrich, during which Eichmann stated that the camps used for the detention of Russian communists, a category to be liquidated on the spot by the Einsatzgruppen, can also include Jews, and that he had reached an agreement to this effect with the local commanders. There was also some discussion about the trouble at Lodz, and it was finally resolved to send 50,000 Jews from the Reich, that is, including Austria and Bohemia and Moravia, to the centres of the Einsatzgruppen operations at Riga and Minsk. Thus we are perhaps in a position to answer Judge Landau's question, the question uppermost in the minds of nearly everyone who followed the trial, of whether the accused had a conscience. Yes, he had a conscience, and his conscience functioned in the expected way for about four weeks, whereupon it began to function the other way around. Even during those weeks when his conscience functioned normally, it did its work within rather odd limits. We must remember that weeks and months before he was informed of the Führer's order, Eichmann knew of the murderous activities of the Einsatzgruppen in the East. He knew that right behind the front lines, all Russian functionaries, communists, all Polish members of the professional classes, and all native Jews were being killed in mass shootings. Moreover, in July of the same year, a few weeks before he was called to Heydrich, he had received a memorandum from an SS man stationed in the Wartegau, telling him that Jews in the coming winter could no longer be fed, and submitting for his consideration a proposal as to whether it would not be the most humane solution to kill those Jews who were incapable of work through some quicker means. This, at any rate, would be more agreeable than to let them die of starvation. In an accompanying letter addressed to dear Comrade Eichmann, the writer admitted that these things sound sometimes fantastic, but they are quite feasible. 
the admission shows that the much more fantastic order of the Führer was not yet known to the writer, but the letter also shows to what extent this order was in the air. Eichmann never mentioned this letter, and probably had not been in the least shocked by it. For this proposal concerned only native Jews, not Jews from the Reich or any of the Western countries. His conscience rebelled not at the idea of murder, but at the idea of German Jews being murdered. I never denied that I knew that the Einsatzgruppen had orders to kill, but I did not know that Jews from the Reich, evacuated to the East, were subject to the same treatment. That is what I did not know. It was the same with the conscience of a certain Wilhelm Kuber, an old party member and general commissar in occupied Russia, who was outraged when German Jews with the Iron Cross arrived in Minsk for special treatment. Since Kuber was more articulate than Eichmann, his words may give us an idea of what went on in Eichmann's head during the time he was plagued by his conscience. I am certainly tough, and I am ready to help solve the Jewish question, Kuber wrote to his superior in December 1941. But people who come from our own cultural milieu are certainly something else than the native animalized hordes. This sort of conscience, which, if it rebelled at all, rebelled at the murder of people from our own cultural milieu, has survived the Hitler regime. Among Germans today there exists a stubborn misinformation to the effect that only Ostjuden, Eastern European Jews, were massacred. Nor is this way of thinking that distinguishes between the murder of primitive and of cultured people a monopoly of the German people. Harry Mulish relates how, in connection with the testimony given by Professor Salo W. Barron about the cultural and spiritual achievements of the Jewish people, the following questions suddenly occurred to him. Would the death of the Jews have been less of an evil if they were a people without a culture, such as the gypsies, who were also exterminated? Is Eichmann on trial as a destroyer of human beings or as an annihilator of culture? Is a murderer of human beings more guilty when a culture is also destroyed in the process? And when he put these questions to the Attorney General, it turned out he, Hausner, thinks yes, I think no. How ill we can afford to dismiss this matter, bury the troublesome question along with the past, came to light in the recent film Dr. Strangelove, where the strange lover of the bomb, characterized it is true as a Nazi type, proposes to select in the coming disaster some hundred thousand persons to survive in underground shelters. And who are to be the happy survivors? Those with the highest IQ. This question of conscience, so troublesome in Jerusalem, had by no means been ignored by the Nazi regime. On the contrary, in view of the fact that the participants in the anti-Hitler conspiracy of July 1944 very rarely mentioned the wholesale massacres in the East in their correspondence, or in the statements they prepared for use in the event that the attempt on Hitler's life was successful, one is tempted to conclude that the Nazis greatly overestimated the practical importance of the problem. We may here disregard the early stages of the German opposition to Hitler, when it was still anti-fascist and entirely a movement of the left, which as a matter of principle accorded no significance to moral issues, and even less to the persecution of the Jews, a mere diversion from the class struggle that, in the opinion of the left, determined the whole political scene. Moreover, this opposition had all but disappeared during the period in question, destroyed by the horrible terror of the SA troops in the concentration camps and Gestapo cellars, unsettled by full employment, made possible through rearmament, demoralized by the Communist Party's tactic of joining the ranks of Hitler's party in order to install itself there as a Trojan horse. What was left of this opposition at the beginning of the war, some trade union leaders, some intellectuals of the homeless left, who did not and could not know if there was anything behind them, gained its importance solely through the conspiracy which finally led to the 20th of July. It is, of course, quite inadmissible to measure the strength of the German resistance by the number of those who passed through the concentration camps. Before the outbreak of the war, the inmates belonged in a great number of categories, many of which had nothing whatsoever to do with resistance of any kind. There were the wholly innocent ones, such as the Jews, the asocials, such as confirmed criminals and homosexuals, Nazis who had been found guilty of something or other, etc. During the war, the camps were populated by resistance fighters from all over occupied Europe. 
Most of the July conspirators were actually former Nazis or had held high office in the Third Reich. What had sparked their opposition had been not the Jewish question, but the fact that Hitler was preparing war, and the endless conflicts and crises of conscience under which they laboured hinged almost exclusively on the problem of high treason and the violation of their loyalty oath to Hitler. Moreover, they found themselves on the horns of a dilemma which was indeed insoluble. In the days of Hitler's successes, they felt they could do nothing because the people would not understand. And in the years of German defeats, they feared nothing more than another stab-in-the-back legend. To the last, their greatest concern was how it would be possible to prevent chaos and to ward off the danger of civil war. And the solution was that the Allies must be reasonable and grant a moratorium until order was restored, and with it, of course, the German army's ability to offer resistance. They possessed the most precise knowledge of what was going on in the East, but there is hardly any doubt that not one of them would have dared even to think that the best thing that could have happened to Germany under the circumstances would have been open rebellion and civil war. The active resistance in Germany came chiefly from the right, but in view of the past record of the German Social Democrats, it may be doubted that the situation would have been very different if the left had played a larger part among the conspirators. The question is academic in any case, for no organized socialist resistance existed in Germany during the war years, as the German historian Gerhard Ritter has rightly pointed out. In actual fact, the situation was just as simple as it was hopeless. The overwhelming majority of the German people believed in Hitler, even after the attack on Russia and the feared war on two fronts, even after the United States entered the war, indeed, even after Stalingrad, the defection of Italy and the landings in France. Against this solid majority there stood an indeterminate number of isolated individuals who were completely aware of the national and of the moral catastrophe. They might occasionally know and trust one another, there were friendships among them and an exchange of opinions, but no plan or intention of revolt. Finally, there was the group of those who later became known as the conspirators, but they had never been able to come to an agreement on anything, not even on the question of conspiracy. Their leader was Karl Friedrich Gödeler, former mayor of Leipzig, who had served three years under the Nazis as price controller, but had resigned rather early, in 1936. He advocated the establishment of a constitutional monarchy, and Wilhelm Leuschner, a representative of the left, a former trade union leader and socialist, assured him of mass support. In the Kreisau circle, under the influence of Helmut von Moltke, there were occasional complaints raised that the rule of law was now trampled underfoot, but the chief concern of this circle was the reconciliation of the two Christian churches and their sacred mission in the secular state, combined with an outspoken stand in favor of federalism. On the political bankruptcy of the resistance movement as a whole since 1933, there is a well-documented impartial study, the doctoral dissertation of George K. Romosa, soon to be published. As the war went on and defeat became more certain, political differences should have mattered less and political action become more urgent. But Gerhard Ritter seems right here too. Without the determination of Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, the resistance movement would have bogged down in more or less helpless inactivity. What united these men was that they saw in Hitler a swindler, a dilettante, who sacrificed whole armies against the counsel of his experts, a madman and a demon, the incarnation of all evil, which in the German context meant something both more and less than when they called him a criminal and a fool, which they occasionally did. But to hold such opinions about Hitler at this late date in no way precluded membership in the SS or the party or the holding of a government post, for its Hesse. Hence it did not exclude from the circle of the conspirators quite a number of men who themselves were deeply implicated in the crimes of the regime, as, for instance, Count Heldorf, then police commissioner of Berlin, who would have become chief of the German police if the coup d'etat had been successful, according to one of Gödel's lists of prospective ministers, or Arthur Nebe of the RSHA, former commander of one of the mobile killing units in the East. In the summer of 1943, when the Himmler-directed extermination program had reached its climax, Gödeler was considering Himmler and Goebbels as potential allies, since these two men have realized that they are lost with Hitler. 
Himmler indeed became a potential ally, though Goebbels did not, and was fully informed of their plans. He acted against the conspirators only after their failure. I am quoting from the draft of a letter by Gödler to Field Marshal von Kluger, but these strange alliances cannot be explained away by tactical considerations necessary vis-à-vis -vis the army commanders. But it was, on the contrary, Kluger and Rommel who given special orders that those two monsters, Himmler and Goring, should be liquidated, Ritter, quite apart from the fact that Gödler's biographer, Ritter, insists that the above-quoted letter represents the most passionate expression of his hatred against the Hitler regime. No doubt these men who opposed Hitler, however belatedly, paid with their lives and suffered a most terrible death. The courage of many of them was admirable, but it was not inspired by moral indignation or by what they knew other people had been made to suffer. They were motivated almost exclusively by their conviction of the coming defeat and ruin of Germany. This is not to deny that some of them, such as Count Jörg von Wartenberg, may have been roused to political opposition initially by the revolting agitation against the Jews in November 1938, Ritter, but that was the month when the synagogues went up in flames and the whole population seemed in the grip of some fear. Houses of God had been set on fire, and believers as well as the superstitious feared the vengeance of God. To be sure, the higher officer corps was disturbed when Hitler's so-called Commissar Order was issued in May 1941, and they learned that in the coming campaign against Russia, all Soviet functionaries, and naturally all Jews, were simply to be massacred. In these circles, there was, of course, some concern about the fact that, as Gödel has said, in the occupied areas and against the Jews, techniques of liquidating human beings and of religious persecution are practiced, which will always rest as a heavy burden on our history. But it never seems to have occurred to them that this signified something more and more dreadful than that it will make our position, negotiating a peace treaty with the Allies, enormously difficult that it was a blot on Germany's good name and was undermining the morale of the army. What on earth have they made of the proud army of the Wars of Liberation against Napoleon in 1814 and of Wilhelm I in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870? Gödel cried when he heard the report of an SS man who nonchalantly related that it wasn't exactly pretty to spray with machine-gun fire ditches crammed with thousands of Jews and then to throw earth on the bodies that were still twitching. Nor did it occur to them that these atrocities might be somehow connected with the Allies' demand for unconditional surrender, which they felt free to criticise as both nationalistic and unreasonable, inspired by blind hatred. In 1943, when the eventual defeat of Germany was almost a certainty, and indeed even later, they still believed that they had a right to negotiate with their enemies as equals for a just peace although they knew only too well what an unjust and totally unprovoked war Hitler had started. Even more startling are their criteria for a just peace. Gödel has stated them again and again in numerous memoranda. The re-establishment of the national borders of 1914, which meant the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine, with the addition of Austria and the Sudetenland. Furthermore, a leading position for Germany on the continent and perhaps the regaining of South Tyrol. We also know from statements they prepared how they intended to present their case to the people. There is, for instance, a draft proclamation to the army by General Ludwig Beck, who is to become chief of state, in which he talks at length about the obstinacy, the incompetence and lack of moderation of the Hitler regime, its arrogance and vanity. But the crucial point the most unscrupulous act of the regime, was that the Nazis wanted to hold the leaders of the armed forces responsible for the calamities of the coming defeat, to which Beck added that crimes had been committed which are a blot on the honour of the German nation and a defilement of the good reputation it had gained in the eyes of the world. And what would be the next step after Hitler had been liquidated? The German army would go on fighting until an honourable conclusion of the war has been assured which meant the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine, Austria, and the Sudetenland. There is, indeed, every reason to agree with the bitter judgment on these men by the German novelist Friedrich P. Reck Malechevin, who was killed in a concentration camp on the eve of the collapse and did not participate in the anti-Hitler conspiracy. 
In his almost totally unknown Diary of a Man in Despair, Tagebuch eines Fetz Weifelten, 1947, Rechmer Letzeven wrote, after he'd heard of the failure of the attempt on Hitler's life, which of course he regretted, A little late, gentlemen, you who made this arch-destroyer of Germany and ran after him as long as everything seemed to be going well. You, who without hesitation swore every oath demanded of you, and reduced yourself to the despicable flunkies of this criminal, who is guilty of the murder of hundreds of thousands, burdened with the lamentations and the curse of the whole world? Now you have betrayed him. Now, when the bankruptcy can no longer be concealed, they betray the house that went broke in order to establish a political alibi for themselves, the same men who had betrayed everything that was in the way of their claim to power. There is no evidence and no likelihood that Eichmann ever came into personal contact with the men of July 20, and we know that even in Argentina he still considered them all to have been traitors and scoundrels. Had he ever had the opportunity, though, to become acquainted with Gödler's original ideas on the Jewish question, he might have discovered some points of agreement. To be sure, Gödler proposed to pay indemnity to German Jews for their losses and mistreatment, this in 1942, at a time when it was not only a matter of German Jews, and when these were not just being mistreated and robbed, but gassed. But in addition to such technicalities, he had something more constructive in mind, namely, a permanent solution that would save all European Jews from their unseemly position as a more or less undesirable guest nation in Europe. In Eichmann's jargon, this was called giving them some firm ground under their feet. For this purpose, Gödel claimed an independent state in a colonial country, Canada or South America, a sort of Madagascar, of which he certainly had heard. Still, he made some concessions. Not all Jews would be expelled. Quite in line with the early stages of the Nazi regime and the privileged categories which were then current, he was prepared not to deny German citizenship to those Jews who could produce evidence of special military sacrifice for Germany or who belonged to families with long-established traditions. Well, whatever Gödel's permanent solution of the Jewish question might have meant, it was not exactly original, as Professor Ritter, even in 1954, full of admiration for his hero, called it, and Gödel would have been able to find plenty of potential allies for this part of his program, too, within the ranks of the party and even the SS. In the letter to Field Marshal von Kluger, quoted above, Gödel once appealed to Kluger's voice of conscience, but all he meant was that even a general must understand that to continue the war with no chance for victory was an obvious crime. From the accumulated evidence, one can only conclude that conscience, as such, had apparently got lost in Germany, and this to a point where people hardly remembered it, and had ceased to realize that the surprising new set of German values was not shared by the outside world. This, to be sure, is not the entire truth, but there were individuals in Germany who, from the very beginning of the regime, and without ever wavering, were opposed to Hitler. No one knows how many there were of them, perhaps a hundred thousand, perhaps many more, perhaps many fewer, but their voices were never heard. They could be found everywhere, in all strata of society, among the simple people as well as among the educated, in all parties, perhaps even in the ranks of the NSDAP, very few of them were known publicly, as were the aforementioned Rek Malechevin or the philosopher Karl Jaspers. Some of them were truly and deeply pious, like an artisan of whom I know, who preferred having his independent existence destroyed and becoming a simple worker in a factory to taking upon himself the little formality of entering the Nazi party. A few still took an oath seriously and preferred, for example, to renounce an academic career rather than swear by Hitler's name. A more numerous group were the workers, especially in Berlin, and socialist intellectuals who tried to aid the Jews they knew. There were, finally, the two peasant boys, whose story is related in Gunther Weissenborn's Der Lautlos Aufstand, 1953, who were drafted into the SS at the end of the war and refused to sign. They were sentenced to death, and on the day of their execution they wrote in their last letter to their families, we too would rather die than burden our conscience with such terrible things. We know what the SS must carry out. The position of these people, who, practically speaking, did nothing, was altogether different from that of the conspirators. 
Their ability to tell right from wrong had remained intact, and they never suffered a crisis of conscience. There may also have been such persons among the members of the resistance, but they were hardly more numerous in the ranks of the conspirators than among the people at large. They were neither heroes nor saints, and they remained completely silent. Only on one occasion, in a single desperate gesture, did this wholly isolated and mute element manifest itself publicly. This was when the Scrolls, two students at Munich University, brother and sister, under the influence of their teacher, Kurt Huber, distributed the famous leaflets of which Hitler was finally called what he was, a mass murderer. If, however, one examines the documents and prepared statements of the so-called other Germany that would have succeeded Hitler had the July 20 conspiracy succeeded, one can only marvel at how great a gulf separated even them from the rest of the world. How else can one explain the illusions of Gödele in particular, or the fact that Himmler, of all people, but also Ribbentrop, should have started dreaming during the last months of the war of a magnificent new role as negotiators with the Allies for a defeated Germany. And if Ribbentrop certainly was simply stupid, Himmler, whatever else he might have been, was no fool. The member of the Nazi hierarchy most gifted at solving problems of conscience was Himmler. He coined slogans, like the famous watchword of the SS, taken from a Hitler speech before the SS in 1931, My honour is my loyalty. Catchphrases, which Eichmann called winged words, and the judges empty talk, and issued them, as Eichmann recalled, around the turn of the year, presumably along with a Christmas bonus. Eichmann remembered only one of them and kept repeating it. These are battles which future generations will not have to fight again, alluding to the battles against women, children, old people, and other useless mouths. Other such phrases taken from speeches Himmler made to the commanders of the Einsatzgruppen and the higher SS and police leaders were to have stuck it out, and apart from exceptions caused by human weakness, to have remained decent. That is what has made us hard. This is a page of glory in our history which has never been written and is never to be written. Or, the order to solve the Jewish question, this was the most frightening order an organization could ever receive. Or, we realize that what we are expecting from you is superhuman to be superhumanly inhuman. All one can say is that their expectations were not disappointed. It is noteworthy, however, that Himmler hardly ever attempted to justify in ideological terms, and if he did, it was apparently quickly forgotten. What stuck in the minds of these men who had become murderers was simply the notion of being involved in something historic, grandiose, unique, a great task that occurs once in two thousand years, which must therefore be difficult to bear. This was important because the murderers were not sadists or killers by nature, on the contrary, a systematic effort was made to weed out all those who derived physical pleasure from what they did. The troops of the Einsatzgruppen had been drafted from the armed SS, a military unit with hardly more crimes in its record than any ordinary unit of the German army, and their commanders had been chosen by Heydrich from the SS elite with academic degrees. Hence the problem was how to overcome not so much their conscience as the animal pity by which all normal men are affected in the presence of physical suffering. The trick used by Himmler, who apparently was rather strongly afflicted with these instinctive reactions himself, is very simple and probably very effective. It consisted in turning these instincts around, as it were, in directing them toward the self, so that instead of saying, What horrible things I did to people, the murderers would be able to say, what horrible things I had to watch in the pursuance of my duties! How heavily the task weighed upon my shoulders! Eichmann's defective memory, where Himmler's ingenious watchwords were concerned, may be an indication that there existed other and more effective devices for solving the problem of conscience. Foremost among them was, as Hitler had rightly foreseen, the simple fact of war. Eichmann insisted time and again on the different personal attitude toward death when dead people were seen everywhere, and when everyone looked forward to his own death with indifference. We did not care if we died today or only tomorrow, and there were times when we cursed the morning that found us still alive. Especially effective in this atmosphere of violent death 
was the fact that the final solution in its later stages was not carried out by shooting, hence through violence, but in the gas factories, which from beginning to end were closely connected with the euthanasia program, ordered by Hitler in the first weeks of the war and applied to the mentally sick in Germany up to the invasion of Russia. The extermination program that was started in the autumn of 1941 ran, as it were, on two altogether different tracks. One track led to the gas factories and the other to the Einsatzgruppen, whose operations in the rear of the army, especially in Russia, were justified by the pretext of partisan warfare and whose victims were by no means only Jews. In addition to real partisans, they dealt with Russian functionaries, gypsies, the asocial, the insane, and Jews. Jews were included as potential enemies, and unfortunately it was months before the Russian Jews came to understand this, and then it was too late to scatter. The older generation remembered the First World War when the German army had been greeted as liberators. Neither the young nor the old had heard anything about how Jews were treated in Germany, or for that matter in Warsaw. They were remarkably ill-informed, as the German intelligence service reported from White Russia, Hilberg. More remarkable, occasionally even German Jews arrived in these regions who were under the illusion they'd been sent here as pioneers for the Third Reich. These mobile killing units, of which there existed just four, each of battalion size, with a total of no more than 3,000 men, needed and got the close cooperation of the armed forces. Indeed, relations between them were usually excellent, and in some instances affectionate, herzlich. The general showed a surprisingly good attitude toward the Jews. Not only did they hand their Jews over to the Einsatzgruppen, they often lent their own men, ordinary soldiers, to assist in the massacres. The total number of their Jewish victims is estimated by Hilberg to have reached almost a million and a half, but this was not the result of the Führer's order for the physical extermination of the whole Jewish people. It was the result of an earlier order which Hitler gave to Himmler in March 1941 to prepare the SS and the police to carry out special duties in Russia. The Führer's order for the extermination of all, not only Russian and Polish Jews, though issued later, can be traced much farther back. It originated not in the RSHA, or in any of Heydrich's or Himmler's other offices, but in the Führer's Chancellery, Hitler's personal office. It had nothing to do with the war, and never used military necessities as a pretext. It is one of the great merits of Gerald Reitlinger's The Final Solution to have proved, with documentary evidence that leaves no doubt, that the extermination program in the eastern gas factories grew out of Hitler's euthanasia program, and it is deplorable that the Eichmann trial, so concerned with historical truth, paid no attention to this factual connection. This would have thrown some light on the much-debated question of whether Eichmann, of the RSHA, was involved in Gasgeschichten. It is unlikely that he was, though one of his men, Rolf Gunther, might have become interested of his own accord. Globochnik, for instance, who set up the gassing installations in the Lublin area and whom Eichmann visited, did not address himself to Himmler or any other police or SS authority when he needed more personnel. He wrote to Victor Brach of the Führer's Chancellery, who then passed the request on to Himmler. The first gas chambers were constructed in 1939 to implement a Hitler decree dated September 1 of that year, which said that incurably sick persons should be granted a mercy death. It was probably this medical origin of gassing that inspired Dr. Servatius's amazing conviction that killing by gas must be regarded as a medical matter. The idea itself was considerably older. As early as 1935, Hitler had told his Reich medical leader, Gerhard Wagner, that if war came, he would take up and carry out this question of euthanasia because it was easier to do so in wartime. The decree was immediately carried out in respect to the mentally sick, and between December 1939 and August 1941, about 50,000 Germans were killed with carbon monoxide gas in institutions where the death rooms were disguised, exactly as they later were in Auschwitz, as shower rooms and bathrooms. The program was a flop. It was impossible to keep the gassing a secret from the surrounding German population. There were protests on all sides, from people who presumably had not yet attained the objective insight into the nature of medicine and the task of a physician. The gassing in the East, 
or to use the language of the Nazis, the humane way of killing by granting people a mercy death, began on almost the very day when the gassing in Germany was stopped. The men who had been employed in the euthanasia program in Germany were now sent east to build the new installations for the extermination of whole peoples, and these men came either from Hitler's chancellery or from the Reich Health Department and were only now put under the administrative authority of Himmler. None of the various language rules carefully contrived to deceive and to camouflage had a more decisive effect on the mentality of the killers than this first war decree of Hitler, in which the word for murder was replaced by the phrase to grant a mercy death. Eichmann, asked by the police examiner if the directive to avoid unnecessary hardships was not a bit ironic, in view of the fact that the destination of these people was certain death anyhow, did not even understand the question. So firmly was it still anchored in his mind that the unforgivable sin was not to kill people, but to cause unnecessary pain. During the trial, he showed unmistakable signs of sincere outrage when witnesses told of cruelties and atrocities committed by SS men, though the court and much of the audience failed to see these signs, because his single-minded effort to keep his self-control had misled them into believing that he was unmovable and indifferent. And it was not the accusation of having sent millions of people to their death that ever caused him real agitation, but only the accusation, dismissed by the court, of one witness that he had once beaten a Jewish boy to death. To be sure, he had also sent people into the area of the Einsatzgruppen, who did not grant a mercy death but kill by shooting, but he was probably relieved when in the later stages of the operation this became unnecessary because of the ever-growing capacity of the gas chambers. He must also have thought that the new method indicated a decisive improvement in the Nazi government's attitude toward the Jews, since at the beginning of the gassing program it had been expressly stated that the benefits of euthanasia were to be reserved for true Germans. As the war progressed, with violent and horrible death raging all around, on the front in Russia, in the deserts of Africa, in Italy, on the beaches of France, in the ruins of the German cities— the gassing centres in Auschwitz and Kelino, in Majdanek and Belzec, in Treblinka and Sobibor, must actually have appeared the charitable foundations for institutional care that the experts in mercy death called them. Moreover, from January 1942 on, there were euthanasia teams operating in the east to help the wounded in ice and snow, and though this killing of wounded soldiers was also top secret, it was known to many, certainly to the executors of the final solution. It has frequently been pointed out that the gassing of the mentally sick had to be stopped in Germany because of protests from the population and from a few courageous dignitaries of the churches, whereas no such protests were voiced when the program switched to the gassing of Jews, though some of the killing centres were located in what was then German territory and were surrounded by German populations. The protests, however, occurred at the beginning of the war. Quite apart from the effects of education in euthanasia, the attitude toward a painless death through gassing very likely changed in the course of the war. This sort of thing is difficult to prove. There are no documents to support it because of the secrecy of the whole enterprise, and none of the war criminals ever mentioned it, not even the defendants in the doctor's trial at Nuremberg, who were full of quotations from the international literature on the subject. Perhaps they'd forgotten the climate of public opinion in which they killed. Perhaps they never cared to know it, since they felt, wrongly, that their objective and scientific attitude was far more advanced than the opinions held by ordinary people. However, a few truly priceless stories to be found in the war diaries of trustworthy men who were fully aware of the fact that their own shocked reaction was no longer shared by their neighbours have survived the moral debacle of a whole nation. Rek Malechevin, whom I mentioned before, tells of a female leader who came to Bavaria to give the peasants a pep talk in the summer of 1944. She seems not to have wasted much time on miracle weapons and victory. She faced frankly the prospect of defeat, about which no good German needed to worry, because the Führer, in his great goodness, had prepared for the whole German people a mild death through gassing in case the war should have an unhappy end. And the writer adds, Oh, no, I'm not imagining things. This lovely lady is not a mirage. I saw her with my own eyes, a yellow-skinned female pushing forty with insane eyes. And what happened? Did these Bavarian peasants at least put her into the local lake to cool off her enthusiastic readiness for death? 
They did nothing of the sort. They went home, shaking their heads. My next story is even more to the point, since it concerns someone who was not a leader, may not even have been a party member. It happened in Königsberg, in East Prussia, an altogether different corner of Germany, in January 1945, a few days before the Russians destroyed the city, occupied its ruins, and annexed the whole province. The story is told by Count Hans von Lehnsdorf in his Ostprussisches Tagebuch, 1961. He had remained in the city as a physician to take care of wounded soldiers who could not be evacuated. He was called to one of the huge centres for refugees from the countryside, which was already occupied by the Red Army. There he was accosted by a woman who showed him a varicose vein she'd had for years but wanted to have treated now because she had time. I tried to explain that it is more important for her to get away from Königsberg and to leave the treatment for some later time. Where do you want to go? I ask her. She does not know, but she knows that they will all be brought into the Reich. And then she adds surprisingly, The Russians will never get us. The Fuhrer will never permit it. Much sooner he will gas us. I look around furtively, but no one seems to find this statement out of the ordinary. The story, one feels, like most true stories, is incomplete. There should have been one more voice, preferably a female one, which, sighing heavily, replied, Ah, oh, and now all that good, expensive gas has been wasted on the Jews. 7. The Vance Conference, or Pontius Pilate My report on Eichmann's conscience has thus far followed evidence which he himself had forgotten. In his own presentation of the matter, the turning point came not four weeks but four months later, in January 1942, during the conference of the Stutt Secretary, Under Secretaries of State, as the Nazis used to call it, or the Vance Conference, as it is now usually called, because Heydrich had invited the gentlemen to a house in that suburb of Berlin. As the formal name of the conference indicates, the meeting had become necessary because the final solution, if it was to be applied to the whole of Europe, clearly required more than tacit acceptance from the Reich state apparatus. It needed the active cooperation of all ministries and of the whole civil service. The ministers themselves, nine years after Hitler's rise to power, were all party members of long standing. Those who in the initial stages of the regime had merely coordinated themselves, smoothly enough, had been replaced. Yet most of them were not completely trusted, since few among them owed their careers entirely to the Nazis, as did Heydrich or Himmler. And those who did, like Joachim von Ribbentrop, head of the Foreign Office, a former champagne salesman, were likely to be non-entities. The problem was much more acute, however, with respect to the higher career men in the civil service directly under the ministers. For these men, the backbone of every government administration, were not easily replaceable, and Hitler had tolerated them, just as Adenauer was to tolerate them, unless they were compromised beyond salvation. Hence the undersecretaries and the legal and other experts in the various ministries were frequently not even party members and Heydrich's apprehensions about whether he would be able to enlist the active help of these people in mass murder were quite comprehensible. As Eichmann put it, Heydrich expected the greatest difficulties. Well, he could not have been more wrong. The aim of the conference was to coordinate all efforts toward the implementation of the final solution. The discussion turned first on complicated legal questions, such as the treatment of half- and quarter-Jews, should they be killed or only sterilized. This was followed by a frank discussion of the various types of possible solutions to the problem, which meant the various methods of killing. And here, too, there was more than happy agreement on the part of the participants. The final solution was greeted with extraordinary enthusiasm by all present, and particularly by Dr. Wilhelm Stuckart, undersecretary in the Ministry of the Interior, who was known to be rather reticent and hesitant in the face of radical party measures, and was, according to Dr. Hans Globke's testimony at Nuremberg, a staunch supporter of the law. There were certain difficulties, however. Undersecretary Josef Bühler, second in command in the general government in Poland, was dismayed at the prospect that Jews would be evacuated from the west to the east, because this meant more Jews in Poland. 
and he proposed that these evacuations be postponed and that the final solution be started in the general government where no problems of transport existed. The gentlemen from the Foreign Office appeared with their own carefully elaborated memorandum expressing the desires and ideas of the Foreign Office with respect to the total solution of the Jewish question in Europe, to which nobody paid much attention. The main point, as Eichmann rightly noted, was that the members of the various branches of the civil service did not merely express opinions but made concrete propositions. The meeting lasted no more than an hour or an hour and a half, after which drinks were served and everybody had lunch, a cosy little social gathering designed to strengthen the necessary personal contacts. It was a very important occasion for Eichmann, who had never before mingled socially with so many high personages. He was by far the lowest in rank and social position of those present. He had sent out the invitations and had prepared some statistical material, full of incredible errors, for Heydrich's introductory speech, Eleven million Jews had to be killed, an undertaking of some magnitude, and later he was to prepare the minutes. In short, he acted as secretary of the meeting. This was why he was permitted, after the dignitaries had left, to sit down near the fireplace with his chief Müller and Heydrich, and that was the first time I saw Heydrich smoke and drink. They did not talk shop, but enjoyed some rest after long hours of work, being greatly satisfied, and especially Heydrich, in very high spirits. There was another reason that made the day of this conference unforgettable for Eichmann. Although he had been doing his best right along to help with the final solution, he had still harboured some doubts about such a bloody solution through violence, and these doubts had now been dispelled. Here, now, during this conference, the most prominent people had spoken, the popes of the Third Reich. Now he could see with his own eyes and hear with his own ears that not only Hitler, not only Heydrich or the Sphinx Müller, not just the SS or the party, but the elite of the good old civil service were vying and fighting with each other for the honour of taking the lead in these bloody matters. At that moment I sensed a kind of Pontius Pilate feeling, for I felt free of all guilt. Who was he to judge? Who was he to have his own thoughts in this matter? Well, he was neither the first nor the last to be ruined by modesty. What followed, as Eichmann recalled it, went more or less smoothly and soon became routine. He quickly became an expert in forced evacuation, as he had been an expert in forced emigration. In country after country the Jews had to register, were forced to wear the yellow badge for easy identification, were assembled and deported, the various shipments being directed to one or another of the extermination centres in the East, depending on their relative capacity at the moment. When a trainload of Jews arrived at a centre, the strong among them were selected for work, often operating the extermination machinery. All others were immediately killed. There were hitches, but they were minor. The Foreign Office was in contact with the authorities in those foreign countries that were either occupied or allied with the Nazis to put pressure on them to deport their Jews or, as the case might be, to prevent them from evacuating them to the east, helter-skelter, out of sequence, without proper regard for the absorptive capacity of the death centres. This was how Eichmann remembered it. It was, in fact, not quite so simple. The legal experts drew up the necessary legislation for making the victims stateless, which was important on two counts. It made it impossible for any country to inquire into their fate— and it enabled the state in which they were resident to confiscate their property. The Ministry of Finance and the Reichsbank prepared facilities to receive the huge loot from all over Europe, down to watches and gold teeth, all of which was sorted out in the Reichsbank and then sent to the Prussian state mint. The Ministry of Transport provided the necessary railroad cars, usually freight cars, even in times of great scarcity of rolling stock, and they saw to it that the schedule of the deportation trains did not conflict with other timetables. The Jewish councils of elders were informed by Eichmann or his men of how many Jews were needed to fill each train, and they made out the list of deportees. The Jews registered, filled out innumerable forms, answered pages and pages of questionnaires regarding their property, so that it could be seized the more easily. They then assembled at the collection points and boarded the trains. The few who tried to hide or to escape were rounded up by a special Jewish police force. 
As far as Eichmann could see, no one protested, no one refused to cooperate. Immer zu fahren hier die Leute zu ihrem eigenen Begrabnis. Day in, day out, the people here leave for their own funeral, as a Jewish observer put it in Berlin in 1943. Mere compliance would never have been enough either to smooth out all the enormous difficulties of an operation that was soon to cover the whole of Nazi-occupied and Nazi-allied Europe, or to soothe the consciences of the operators, who, after all, had been brought up on the commandment, Thou shalt not kill, and who knew the verse from the Bible, Thou hast murdered and thou hast inherited, that the judgment of the district court of Jerusalem quoted so appropriately. What Eichmann called the death whirl that descended upon Germany after the immense losses at Stalingrad, the saturation bombing of German cities, his stock excuse for killing civilians, and still the stock excuse offered in Germany for the massacres, making an everyday experience of sights different from the atrocities reported at Jerusalem, but no less horrible, might have contributed to the easing, or rather to the extinguishing, of conscience, had any conscience been left when it occurred. But according to the evidence, such was not the case. The extermination machinery had been planned and perfected in all its details long before the horror of war struck Germany herself, and its intricate bureaucracy functioned with the same unwavering precision in the years of easy victory as in those last years of predictable defeat. Defections from the ranks of the ruling elite, and notably from among the higher SS officers, hardly occurred at the beginning when people might still have had a conscience. They made themselves felt only when it had become obvious that Germany was going to lose the war. Moreover, such defections were never serious enough to throw the machinery out of gear. They consisted of individual acts, not of mercy, but of corruption, and they were inspired not by conscience, but by the desire to salt some money or some connections away for the dark days to come. Himmler's order, in the fall of 1944, to halt the extermination and to dismantle the installations at the death factories, sprang from his absurd but sincere conviction that the Allied powers would know how to appreciate this obliging gesture. He told a rather incredulous Eichmann that on the strength of it he would be able to negotiate a Hubertusburger Frieden, an allusion to the peace treaty of Hubertusburg that concluded the Seven Years' War of Frederick II of Prussia in 1763 and enabled Prussia to retain Silesia, although she had lost the war. As Eichmann told it, the most potent factor in the soothing of his own conscience was the simple fact that he could see no one, no one at all, who actually was against the final solution. He did encounter one exception, however, which he mentioned several times and which must have made a deep impression on him. This happened in Hungary, when he was negotiating with Dr. Kastner over Himmler's offer to release one million Jews in exchange for 10,000 trucks. Kastner, apparently emboldened by the new turn of affairs, had asked Eichmann to stop the death mills at Auschwitz, and Eichmann had answered that he would do it with the greatest pleasure, herzlich gern but that, alas, it was outside his competence and outside the competence of his superiors, as indeed it was. Of course, he did not expect the Jews to share the general enthusiasm over their destruction, but he did expect more than compliance. He expected, and received to a truly extraordinary degree, their cooperation. This was, of course, the very cornerstone of everything he did, as it had been the very cornerstone of his activities in Vienna. Without Jewish help in administrative and police work, the final rounding up of Jews in Berlin was, as I've mentioned, done entirely by Jewish police. There would have been either complete chaos or an impossibly severe drain on German manpower. There can be no doubt that without the cooperation of the victims, it would hardly have been possible for a few thousand people, most of whom moreover worked in offices, to liquidate many hundreds of thousands of other people. Over the whole way to their deaths, the Polish Jews got to see hardly more than a handful of Germans. Thus R. Pendorf, in the publication mentioned above. To an even greater extent, this applies to those Jews who were transported to Poland to find their deaths there. Hence, the establishing of quisling governments in occupied territories was always accompanied by the organization of a central Jewish office. And as we shall see later, where the Nazis did not succeed in setting up a puppet government, they also failed to enlist the cooperation of the Jews. But whereas the members of the quisling governments were usually taken from the opposition parties, 
The members of the Jewish councils were, as a rule, the locally recognized Jewish leaders, to whom the Nazis gave enormous powers, until they too were deported to Theresienstadt or Bergen-Belsen, if they happened to be from Central or Western Europe, to Auschwitz, if they were from an Eastern European community. To a Jew, this role of the Jewish leaders in the destruction of their own people is undoubtedly the darkest chapter of the whole dark story. It had been known about before, but it has now been exposed for the first time in all its pathetic and sordid detail by Raoul Hilberg, whose standard work, The Destruction of the European Jews, I mentioned before. In the matter of cooperation, there was no distinction between the highly assimilated Jewish communities of Central and Western Europe and the Yiddish-speaking masses of the East. In Amsterdam, as in Warsaw, in Berlin, as in Budapest, Jewish officials could be trusted to compile the lists of persons and of their property, to secure money from the deportees, to defray the expenses of their deportation and extermination, to keep track of vacated apartments, to supply police forces to help seize Jews and get them on trains, until, as a last gesture, they handed over the assets of the Jewish community in good order for final confiscation. They distributed the yellow star badges, and sometimes, as in Warsaw, the sale of the armbands became a regular business. There were ordinary armbands of cloth and fancy plastic armbands, which were washable. In the Nazi-inspired but not Nazi-dictated manifestos they issued, we still can sense how they enjoyed their new power. The Central Jewish Council has been granted the right of absolute disposal over all Jewish spiritual and material wealth and over all Jewish manpower, as the first announcement of the Budapest Council phrased it. We know how the Jewish officials felt when they became instruments of murder— like captains whose ships were about to sink and who succeeded in bringing them safe to port by casting overboard a great part of their precious cargo. Like saviors, who with a hundred victims save a thousand people, with a thousand ten thousand. The truth was even more gruesome. Dr. Kastner in Hungary, for instance, saved exactly 1,684 people with approximately 476,000 victims. In order not to leave the selection to blind fate, truly holy principles were needed as the guiding force of the weak human hand, which puts down on paper the name of the unknown person and with this decides his life or death. And whom did these holy principles single out for salvation? Those who had worked all their lives for the tzibur, the community, that is, the functionaries and the most prominent Jews, as Kastner says in his report. No one bothered to swear the Jewish officials to secrecy. They were voluntary bearers of secrets, either in order to assure quiet and prevent panic, as in Dr. Kastner's case, or out of humane considerations, such as that living in the expectation of death by gassing would only be the harder, as in the case of Dr. Leo Beck, former chief rabbi of Berlin. During the Eichmann trial, one witness pointed out the unfortunate consequences of this kind of humanity— People volunteered for deportation from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz and denounced those who tried to tell them the truth as being not sane. We know the physiognomies of the Jewish leaders during the Nazi period very well. They ranged all the way from Chaim Rumkowski, eldest of the Jews in Lodz, called Chaim I, who issued currency notes bearing his signature and postage stamps engraved with his portrait, and who rode around in a broken-down, horse-drawn carriage, through Leo Beck, scholarly, mild-mannered, highly educated, who believed Jewish policemen would be more gentle and helpful and would make the ordeal easier, whereas, in fact, they were, of course, more brutal and less corruptible, since so much more was at stake for them, to, finally, a few who committed suicide, like Adam Cherniakov, chairman of the Warsaw Jewish Council, who was not a rabbi but an unbeliever, a Polish-speaking Jewish engineer, but who must still have remembered the rabbinical saying, Let them kill you, but don't cross the line. That the prosecution in Jerusalem, so careful not to embarrass the Adenauer administration, should have avoided, with even greater and more obvious justification, bringing this chapter of the story into the open was almost a matter of course. These issues, however, are discussed quite openly and with astonishing frankness in Israeli school books, 
as may conveniently be gathered from the article Young Israelis and Jews Abroad, a study of selected history textbooks by Mark M. Krug in Comparative Education Review, October 1963. The chapter must be included here, however, because it accounts for certain otherwise inexplicable lacunae in the documentation of a generally over-documented case. The judges mentioned, one such instance, the absence of H. G. Adler's book Theresienstadt, 1941 to 1945, published 1955, which the prosecution, in some embarrassment, admitted to be authentic based on irrefutable sources. The reason for the omission was clear. The book describes in detail how the feared transport lists were put together by the Jewish Council of Theresienstadt after the SS had given some general directives, stipulating how many should be sent away and of what age, sex, profession and country of origin. The prosecution's case would have been weakened if it had been forced to admit that the naming of individuals who were sent to their doom had been, with few exceptions, the job of the Jewish administration. And the deputy state attorney, Mr. Yakov Baror, who handled the intervention from the bench, in a way indicated this when he said, I am trying to bring out those things which somehow refer to the accused without damaging the picture in its entirety. The picture would indeed have been greatly damaged by the inclusion of Adler's book, since it would have contradicted testimony given by the chief witness on Theresienstadt, who claimed that Eichmann himself had made these individual selections. Even more important, the prosecution's general picture of a clear-cut division between persecutors and victims would have suffered greatly. To make available evidence that does not support the case for the prosecution is usually the job of the defense, and the question why Dr. Servatius, who perceived some minor inconsistencies in the testimony, did not avail himself of such easily obtainable and widely known documentation is difficult to answer. He could have pointed to the fact that Eichmann, immediately upon being transformed from an expert in emigration into an expert in evacuation, appointed his old Jewish associates in the emigration business, Dr. Paul Epstein, who had been in charge of emigration in Berlin, and Rabbi Benjamin Mermelstein, who had held the same job in Vienna, as Jewish elders in Theresienstadt. This would have done more to demonstrate the atmosphere in which Eichmann worked than all the unpleasant and often downright offensive talk about oaths, loyalty, and the virtues of unquestioning obedience. The testimony of Mrs. Charlotte Salzberger on Theresienstadt, from which I quoted above, permitted us to cast at least a glance into this neglected corner of what the prosecution kept calling the general picture. The presiding judge did not like the term, and he did not like the picture. He told the Attorney General several times that we are not drawing pictures here, that there is an indictment, and this indictment is the framework for our trial, that the court has its own view about this trial according to the indictment, and that the prosecution must adjust to what the court lays down. Admirable admonitions for criminal proceedings, none of which was heeded. The prosecution did worse than not heed them. It simply refused to guide its witnesses. Or, if the court became too insistent, it asked a few haphazard questions, very casually, with the result that the witnesses behaved as though they were speakers at a meeting chaired by the Attorney General, who introduced them to the audience before they took the floor. They could talk almost as long as they wished, and it was a rare occasion when they were asked a specific question. This atmosphere, not of a show trial but of a mass meeting, at which speaker after speaker does his best to arouse the audience, was especially noticeable when the prosecution called witness after witness to testify to the rising in the Warsaw Ghetto, and to the similar attempts in Vilna and Kovna, matters that had no connection whatever with the crimes of the accused. The testimony of these people would have contributed something to the trial if they had told of the activities of the Jewish councils, which had played such a great and disastrous role in their own heroic efforts. Of course, there was some mention of this, witnesses speaking of SS men and their helpers, pointed out that they counted among the latter the ghetto police, which was also an instrument in the hands of the Nazi murderers, as well as the Judenrat. But they were only too glad not to elaborate on this side of their story, and they shifted the discussion to the role of real traitors, of whom there were few, and who were nameless people unknown to the Jewish public, such as all undergrounds which fought against the Nazis suffered from. 
The audience while these witnesses testified had changed again. It consisted now of kibbutzniks, members of the Israeli communal settlements to which the speakers belonged. The purest and clearest account came from Tsivia Lubetkin Tsukerman, today a woman of perhaps forty, still very beautiful, completely free of sentimentality or self-indulgence, her facts well organized and always quite sure of the point she wished to make. Legally, the testimony of these witnesses was immaterial. Mr. Hausner did not mention one of them in his last plaidoyer, except insofar as it constituted proof of close contacts between Jewish partisans and the Polish and Russian underground fighters, which, apart from contradicting other testimony, we had the whole population against us, could have been useful to the defense, since it offered much better justification for the wholesale slaughter of civilians than Eichmann's repeated claim that Weizmann had declared war on Germany in 1939. This was sheer nonsense. All that Chaim Weizmann had said at the close of the last pre-war Zionist Congress was that the war of the Western democracies is our war. Their struggle is our struggle. The tragedy, as Hausner rightly pointed out, was precisely that the Jews were not recognized by the Nazis as belligerents, for if they had been, they would have survived in prisoner of war or civilian internment camps. Had Dr. Servatius made this point... The prosecution would have been forced to admit how pitifully small these resistance groups had been, how incredibly weak and essentially harmless, and moreover how little they had represented the Jewish population, who at one point even took arms against them. While the legal irrelevance of all this very time-consuming testimony remained pitifully clear, the political intention of the Israeli government in introducing it was also not difficult to guess. Mr. Hausner, or Mr. Ben-Gurion, probably wanted to demonstrate that whatever resistance there had been had come from Zionists, as though, of all Jews, only the Zionists knew that if you could not save your life, it might still be worthwhile to save your honor, as Mr. Zuckerman put it. That the worst that could happen to the human person under such circumstances was to be and to remain innocent, as became clear from the tenor and drift of Mrs. Zuckerman's testimony. However, these political intentions misfired, for the witnesses were truthful and told the court that all Jewish organizations and parties had played their role in the resistance, so the true distinction was not between Zionists and non-Zionists, but between organized and unorganized people, and even more important, between the young and the middle-aged. To be sure, those who resisted were a minority, a tiny minority. But under the circumstances, the miracle was, as one of them pointed out, that this minority existed. Legal considerations aside, the appearance in the witness box of the former Jewish resistance fighters was welcome enough. It dissipated the haunting specter of universal cooperation, the stifling, poisoned atmosphere which had surrounded the final solution. The well-known fact that the actual work of killing in the extermination centers was usually in the hands of Jewish commandos had been fairly and squarely established by witnesses for the prosecution, how they had worked in the gas chambers of the crematories, how they had pulled the gold teeth and cut the hair of the corpses, how they had dug the graves and later dug them up again to extinguish the traces of mass murder, how Jewish technicians had built gas chambers in Theresienstad, where the Jewish autonomy had been carried so far that even the hangman was a Jew. But this was only horrible. It was no moral problem. The selection and classification of workers in the camps was made by the SS, who had a marked predilection for the criminal elements. And anyhow, it could only have been the selection of the worst. This was especially true in Poland, where the Nazis had exterminated a large proportion of the Jewish intelligentsia at the same time that they killed Polish intellectuals and members of the professions. In marked contrast, incidentally, to their policy in Western Europe, where they tended to save prominent Jews in order to exchange them for German civilian internees or prisoners of war. Bergen-Belsen was originally a camp for exchange Jews. The moral problem lay in the amount of truth there was in Eichmann's description of Jewish cooperation, even under the conditions of the final solution. In the formation of the Jewish Council at Theresienstadt and the distribution of business was left to the discretion of the council, except for the appointment of the president, who the president was to be, which depended upon us, of course. However, disappointment was not in the form of a dictatorial decision. The functionaries with whom we were in constant contact 
Well, they have to be treated with kid gloves. They were not ordered around for the simple reason that if the chief officials had been told what to do in the form of you must, you have to, that would not have helped matters any. If the person in question does not like what he is doing, the whole works will suffer. We did our best to make everything somehow palatable. No doubt they did. The problem is, how was it possible for them to succeed? Thus, the gravest omission from the general picture was that of a witness to testify to the cooperation between the Nazi rulers and the Jewish authorities, and hence of an opportunity to raise the question, why did you cooperate in the destruction of your own people and eventually in your own ruin? The only witness who had been a prominent member of a Judenrat was Pincus Freudiger, the former Baron Philip von Freudiger of Budapest, and during his testimony the only serious incidents in the audience took place. People screamed at the witness in Hungarian and in Yiddish, and the court had to interrupt the session. Freudiger, an Orthodox Jew of considerable dignity, was shaken. There are people here who say they were not told to escape, but fifty percent of the people who escaped were captured and killed, as compared with ninety-nine percent for those who did not escape. Where could they have gone to? Where could they have fled? But he himself fled to Romania, because he was rich, and Vislitsany helped him. What could we have done? What could we have done? And the only response to this came from the presiding judge. I do not think this is an answer to the question. A question raised by the gallery, but not by the court. The matter of cooperation was twice mentioned by the judges. Judge Yitzhak Rave elicited from one of the resistance witnesses an admission that the ghetto police were an instrument in the hands of murderers and an acknowledgment of the Judenrat's policy of cooperating with the Nazis. And Judge Halivai found out from Eichmann in cross-examination that the Nazis had regarded this cooperation as the very cornerstone of their Jewish policy. But the question the prosecutor regularly addressed to each witness except the resistance fighters which sounded so very natural to those who knew nothing of the factual background of the trial, the question, why did you not rebel, actually served as a smokescreen for the question that was not asked. And thus it came to pass that all answers to the unanswerable question Mr. Hausner put to his witnesses were considerably less than the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. True it was that the Jewish people as a whole had not been organized, that they had possessed no territory, no government and no army, that in the hour of their greatest need they had no government in exile to represent them among the Allies. The Jewish Agency for Palestine under Dr. Weizmann's presidency was at best a miserable substitute. No caches of weapons, no youth with military training. But the whole truth was that there existed Jewish community organizations and Jewish party and welfare organizations on both the local and the international level. Wherever Jews lived, there were recognized Jewish leaders, and this leadership, almost without exception, cooperated in one way or another, for one reason or another, with the Nazis. The whole truth was that if the Jewish people had really been unorganized and leaderless, there would have been chaos and plenty of misery, but the total number of victims would hardly have been between four and a half and six million people. According to Freudiger's calculations, about half of them could have saved themselves if they had not followed the instructions of the Jewish councils. This is, of course, a mere estimate, which, however, oddly jibes with the rather reliable figures we have from Holland, and which I owe to Dr. Elder Jong, the head of the Netherlands State Institute for War Documentation. In Holland, where the Judscherad, like all the Dutch authorities, very quickly became an instrument of the Nazis, 103,000 Jews were deported to the death camps, and some 5,000 to Theresienstadt in the usual way, that is, with the cooperation of the Jewish Council. Only 519 Jews returned from the death camps. In contrast to this figure, 10,000 of those 20 to 25,000 Jews who escaped the Nazis, and that meant also the Jewish Council, and went underground, survived. Again, 40 to 50 percent. Most of the Jews sent to Theresienstadt returned to Holland. I have dwelt on this chapter of the story, which the Jerusalem trial failed to put before the eyes of the world in its true dimensions, because it offers the most striking insight into the totality 
of the moral collapse the Nazis caused in respectable European society, not only in Germany, but in almost all countries, not only among the persecutors, but also among the victims. Eichmann, in contrast to other elements in the Nazi movement, had always been overawed by good society, and the politeness he often showed to German-speaking Jewish functionaries was to a large extent the result of his recognition that he was dealing with people who were socially his superiors. He was not at all, as one witness called him, a Landsknechtnatur, a mercenary who wanted to escape to regions where there aren't no Ten Commandments and a man can raise a thirst. What he fervently believed in up to the end was success, the chief standard of good society as he knew it. Typical was his last word on the subject of Hitler, whom he and his comrade Sassen had agreed to shur out of their story. Hitler, he said, may have been wrong all down the line, but one thing is beyond dispute— the man was able to work his way up from Lance Corporal in the German army to Führer of a people of almost 80 million. His success alone proved to me that I should subordinate myself to this man. His conscience was indeed set at rest when he saw the zeal and eagerness with which good society everywhere reacted as he did. He did not need to close his ears to the voice of conscience, as the judgment has it, not because he had none, but because his conscience spoke with a respectable voice with the voice of respectable society around him. That there were no voices from the outside to arouse his conscience was one of Eichmann's points, and it was the task of the prosecution to prove that this was not so, that there were voices he could have listened to, and that, anyhow, he had done his work with a zeal far beyond the call of duty. Which turned out to be true enough, except that, strange as it may appear, his murderous zeal was not altogether unconnected with the ambiguity in the voices of those who at one time or another tried to restrain him. We need mention here, only in passing, the so-called inner emigration in Germany, those people who frequently had held positions, even high ones, in the Third Reich, and who, after the end of the war, told themselves and the world at large that they had always been inwardly opposed to the regime. The question here is not whether or not they are telling the truth— the point is, rather, that no secret in the secret-ridden atmosphere of the Hitler regime was better kept than such inward opposition. This was almost a matter of course under the conditions of Nazi terror, as a rather well-known inner emigrant who certainly believed in his own sincerity once told me they had to appear outwardly even more like Nazis than ordinary Nazis did in order to keep their secret. This, incidentally, may explain why the few known protests against the extermination program came not from the army commanders, but from old party members. Hence, the only possible way to live in the Third Reich and not act as a Nazi was not to appear at all. Withdrawal from significant participation in public life was indeed the only criterion by which one might have measured individual guilt— as Otto Kirchheimer recently remarked in his Political Justice, 1961. If the term was to make any sense, the inner emigrant could only be one who lived as though outcast among his own people amidst blindly believing masses, as Professor Hermann Jarreis pointed out in his Statement for All Defense Attorneys before the Nuremberg Tribunal. For opposition was indeed utterly pointless in the absence of all organization. It is true that there were Germans who lived for twelve years in this outer cold, but their number was insignificant even among the members of the resistance. In recent years, the slogan of the inner emigration, the term itself has a definitely equivocal flavour, as it can mean either an emigration into the inward regions of one's soul or a way of conducting oneself as though he were an emigrant, has become a sort of joke. The sinister Dr. Otto Bradfisch, former member of one of the Einsatzgruppen, who presided over the killing of at least 15,000 people, told a German court that he had always been inwardly opposed to what he was doing. Perhaps the death of 15,000 people was necessary to provide him with an alibi in the eyes of true Nazis. The same argument was advanced, though with considerably less success, in a Polish court by former Gauleiter Otto Greiser of the Wartegau. Only his official soul had carried out the crimes for which he was hanged in 1946. His private soul had always been against them. While Eichmann may never have encountered an inner emigrant, he must have been well acquainted with many of those numerous civil servants who today assert that they stayed in their jobs for no other reason than to mitigate matters and prevent real Nazis from taking over their posts. 
We mentioned the famous case of Dr. Hans Globke, Under Secretary of State, and from 1953 to 1963, Chief of the Personnel Division in the West German Chancellery. Since he was the only civil servant in this category to be mentioned during the trial, it may be worthwhile to look into his mitigating activities. Dr. Globke had been employed in the Prussian Ministry of the Interior before Hitler's rise to power, and had shown there a rather premature interest in the Jewish question. He formulated the first of the directives in which proof of Aryan descent was demanded. In this case, of persons who applied for permission to change their names. This circular letter of December 1932, issued at a time when Hitler's rise to power was not yet a certainty but a strong probability, oddly anticipated the top-secret decrees, that is, the typically totalitarian rule by means of laws that are not brought to the attention of the public. Which the Hitler regime introduced much later in notifying the recipients that these directives are not for publication. Dr. Globke, as I've mentioned, kept his interest in names, and since it is true that his commentary on the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 was considerably harsher than the earlier interpretation of Russian Shanda by the Ministry of the Interior's expert on Jewish affairs, Dr. Bernhard Lusner, an old member of the party. One could even accuse him of having made things worse than they were under real Nazis. But even if we were to grant him all his good intentions, it is hard indeed to see what he could have done under the circumstances to make things better than they would otherwise have been. Recently, however, a German newspaper, after much searching, came up with an answer to this puzzling question. They found a document duly signed by Dr. Globke. Which decreed that Czech brides of German soldiers had to furnish photographs of themselves in bathing suits in order to obtain a marriage license, and Dr. Globke explained, with this confidential ordinance, a three-year-old scandal was somewhat mitigated, for until his intervention, Czech brides had to furnish snapshots that showed them stark naked. Dr. Globke, as he explained at Nuremberg, was fortunate in that he worked under the orders of another mitigator, Staatssekretär under Secretary of State Wilhelm Stuckart, whom we met as one of the eager members of the Vanse Conference. Stuckart's attenuation activities concerned half Jews, whom he proposed to sterilize. The Nuremberg Court, in possession of the minutes of the Vanse Conference, may not have believed that he had known nothing of the extermination program. But it sentenced him to time served on account of ill health. A German denazification court fined him five hundred marks and declared him a nominal member of the party, a Mitlaufer. Although they must have known at least that Stuckart belonged to the old guard of the party and had joined the SS early as an honorary member. Clearly, the story of the mitigators in Hitler's offices belongs among the post-war fairy tales. And we can dismiss them too as voices that might possibly have reached Eichmann's conscience. The question of these voices became serious in Jerusalem with the appearance in court of Probst Heinrich Gruber, a Protestant minister who had come to the trial as the only German, and incidentally, except for Judge Michael Musmano from the United States, the only non-Jewish witness for the prosecution. German witnesses for the defense were excluded from the outset. Since they would have exposed themselves to arrest and prosecution in Israel under the same law as that under which Eichmann was tried, Probst Gruber had belonged to the numerically small and politically irrelevant group of persons who were opposed to Hitler on principle and not out of nationalist considerations, and whose stand on the Jewish question had been without equivocation. He promised to be a splendid witness, since Eichmann had negotiated with him several times, and his mere appearance in the courtroom created a kind of sensation. Unfortunately, his testimony was vague. He did not remember, after so many years, when he had spoken with Eichmann, or—and this was more serious—on what subjects. All he recalled clearly was that he had once asked for unleavened bread to be shipped to Hungary for Passover. And that he had travelled to Switzerland during the war to tell his Christian friends how dangerous the situation was, and to urge that more opportunities for emigration be provided. The negotiations must have taken place prior to the implementing of the final solution, which coincided with Himmler's decree forbidding all emigration. They probably occurred before the invasion of Russia. He got his unleavened bread, and he got safely to Switzerland and back again. His trouble started later, when the deportations had begun. Probst Gruber 
and his group of Protestant clergymen first intervened merely on behalf of people who had been wounded in the course of the First World War and of those who had been awarded high military decorations. On behalf of the old and on behalf of the widows of those killed in World War I. These categories corresponded to those that had originally been exempted by the Nazis themselves. Now Gruber was told that what he was doing ran counter to the policy of the government, but nothing serious happened to him. But shortly after this, Propst Gruber did something really extraordinary. He tried to reach the concentration camp of Gurs in southern France, where Vichy France had interned, together with German Jewish refugees, some 7,500 Jews from Baden and the Saafplatz, whom Eichmann had smuggled across the German-French border in the fall of 1940, and who, according to Propst Gruber's information, were even worse off than the Jews deported to Poland. The result of this attempt was that he was arrested and put in a concentration camp, first in Sachsenhausen and then in Dachau. A similar fate befell the Catholic priest Domprost Bernard Lichtenberg of St. Hedwig's Cathedral in Berlin. He not only had dared to pray publicly for all Jews, baptized or not, which was considerably more dangerous than to intervene for special cases, but he had also demanded that he be allowed to join the Jews on their journey to the East. He died on his way to a concentration camp. Apart from testifying to the existence of another Germany, Propst Gruber did not contribute much to either the legal or the historical significance of the trial. He was full of pat judgments about Eichmann. He was like a block of ice, like marble, a Landsknechtnatur, a bicycle rider, a current German idiom for someone who kowtows to his superiors and kicks his subordinates, none of which showed him as a particularly good psychologist, quite apart from the fact that the bicycle rider charge was contradicted by evidence which showed Eichmann to have been rather decent toward his subordinates. Anyway, these were interpretations and conclusions that would normally have been stricken from any court record, though in Jerusalem they even found their way into the judgment. Without them, Propst Gruber's testimony could have strengthened the case for the defence, for Eichmann had never given Gruber a direct answer. He'd always told him to come back as he had to ask for further instructions. More important, Dr. Servatius for once took the initiative and asked the witness a highly pertinent question. Did you try to influence him? Did you, as a clergyman, try to appeal to his feelings, preach to him and tell him that his conduct was contrary to morality? Of course, the very courageous Propscht had done nothing of the sort, and his answers now were highly embarrassing. He said that uh, deeds are more effective than words, and that words would have been useless. He spoke in clichés that had nothing to do with the reality of the situation, where mere words would have been deeds, and where it had perhaps been the duty of a clergyman to test the uselessness of words. Even more pertinent than Dr. Servatius's question was what Eichmann said about this episode in his last statement. Nobody, he repeated, came to me and reproached me for anything in the performance of my duties. Not even Pastor Gruber claims to have done so. He then added, He came to me and sought alleviation of suffering, but did not actually object to the very performance of my duties as such. From Propst Gruber's own testimony, it appeared that he sought not so much alleviation of suffering as exemptions from it, in accordance with well-established categories recognized earlier by the Nazis. The categories had been accepted without protest by German jury from the very beginning. And the acceptance of privileged categories, German Jews as against Polish Jews, war veterans and decorated Jews as against ordinary Jews, families whose ancestors were German-born as against recently naturalized citizens, etc., had been the beginning of the moral collapse of respectable Jewish society. In view of the fact that today such matters are often treated as though there existed a law of human nature compelling everybody to lose his dignity in the face of disaster, we may recall the attitude of the French Jewish war veterans who were offered the same privileges by their government and replied, we solemnly declare that we renounce any exceptional benefits we may derive from our status as ex-servicemen. Needless to say, the Nazis themselves never took these distinctions seriously. For them, a Jew was a Jew, but the categories played a certain role up to the very end, since they helped put to rest a certain uneasiness among the German population. Only Polish Jews were deported, only people who would shirk military service, and so on. 
For those who did not want to close their eyes, it must have been clear from the beginning that it was a general practice to allow certain exceptions in order to be able to maintain the general rule all the more easily. In the words of Louis de Jong, in an illuminating article on Jews and non-Jews in Nazi-occupied Holland, what was morally so disastrous in the acceptance of these privileged categories was that everyone who demanded to have an exception made in his case implicitly recognized the rule. But this point apparently was never grasped by these good men, Jewish and Gentile, who busied themselves about all those special cases for which preferential treatment could be asked. The extent to which even the Jewish victims had accepted the standards of the final solution is perhaps nowhere more glaringly evident than in the so-called Kastner Report, available in German Der Kastner Bericht über Eichmanns Menschenhandel in Ungarn, 1961. Even after the end of the war, Kastner was proud of his success in saving prominent Jews, a category officially introduced by the Nazis in 1942, as though in his view, too, it went without saying that a famous Jew had more right to stay alive than an ordinary one. To take upon himself such responsibilities, to help the Nazis in their efforts to pick out famous people from the anonymous mass, for this is what it amounted to, required more courage than to face death. But if the Jewish and Gentile pleaders of special cases were unaware of their involuntary complicity, this implicit recognition of the rule— which spelled death for all non-special cases, must have been very obvious to those who were engaged in the business of murder. They must have felt at least that by being asked to make exceptions, and by occasionally granting them and thus earning gratitude, they had convinced their opponents of the lawfulness of what they were doing. Moreover, Propst Gruber and the Jerusalem court were quite mistaken in assuming that requests for exemptions originated only with opponents of the regime. On the contrary, as Heydrich explicitly stated during the Van Say conference, the establishment of Theresienstadt as a ghetto for privileged categories was prompted by the great number of such interventions from all sides. Theresienstadt later became a showplace for visitors from abroad and served to deceive the outside world, but this was not its original raison d'etre. The horrible thinning-out process that regularly occurred in this paradise, distinguished from other camps as day is from night— as Eichmann rightly remarked, was necessary because there was never enough room to provide for all who were privileged. And we know from a directive issued by Ernst Kaltenbrunner, head of the RSHA, that special care was taken not to deport Jews with connections and important acquaintances in the outside world. In other words, the less prominent Jews were constantly sacrificed to those whose disappearance in the East would create unpleasant inquiries. The acquaintances in the outside world did not necessarily live outside Germany, according to Himmler. There were 80 million good Germans, each of whom has his decent Jew. It is clear the others are pigs, but this particular Jew is first-rate. Hilberg. Hitler himself is said to have known 340 first-rate Jews, whom he had either altogether assimilated to the status of Germans or granted the privileges of half-Jews. Thousands of half-Jews had been exempted from all restrictions, which might explain Heydrich's role in the SS and Generalfeldmarschall Erhard Milk's role in Göring's Air Force, for it was generally known that Heydrich and Milk were half-Jews. Among the major war criminals, only two repented in the face of death. Heydrich, during the nine days it took him to die from the wounds inflicted by Czech patriots, and Hans Frank in his death cell at Nuremberg. It is an uncomfortable fact, for it is difficult not to suspect that what Heydrich at least repented of was not murder, but that he had betrayed his own people. If interventions on behalf of prominent Jews came from prominent people, they often were quite successful. Thus Sven Hedin, one of Hitler's most ardent admirers, intervened for a well-known geographer, a Professor Philipson of Bonn, who was living under undignified conditions at Theresienstadt. In a letter to Hitler, Hedin threatened that his attitude to Germany would be dependent upon Philipson's fate. Whereupon, according to H. G. Adler's book on Theresienstadt, Mr. Philipson was promptly provided with better quarters. In Germany today, this notion of prominent Jews has not yet been forgotten. While the veterans and other privileged groups are no longer mentioned, the fate of famous Jews is still deplored at the expense of all others. 
There are more than a few people, especially among the cultural elite, who still publicly regret the fact that Germany sent Einstein packing, without realizing that it was a much greater crime to kill little Hans Kohn from around the corner, even though he was no genius. 8. Duties of a Law-Abiding Citizen So Eichmann's opportunities for feeling like Pontius Pilate were many, and as the months and the years went by, he lost the need to feel anything at all. This was the way things were. This was the new law of the land, based on the Fuhrer's order. Whatever he did, he did as far as he could see as a law-abiding citizen. He did his duty, as he told the police and the court over and over again. He not only obeyed orders, he also obeyed the law. Eichmann had a muddled inkling that this could be an important distinction, but neither the defense nor the judges ever took him up on it. The well-worn coins of superior orders versus acts of state were handed back and forth. They had governed the whole discussion of these matters during the Nuremberg trials for no other reason than that they gave the illusion that the altogether unprecedented could be judged according to precedents and the standards that went with them. Eichmann, with his rather modest mental gifts, was certainly the last man in the courtroom to be expected to challenge these notions and to strike out on his own. Since, in addition to performing what he conceived to be the duties of a law-abiding citizen, he had also acted upon orders, always so careful to be covered, he became completely muddled and ended by stressing alternately the virtues and the vices of blind obedience or the obedience of corpses, cadavergehortsam, as he himself called it. The first indication of Eichmann's vague notion that there was more involved in this whole business than the question of the soldiers carrying out orders that are clearly criminal in nature and intent appeared during the police examination, when he suddenly declared with great emphasis that he had lived his whole life according to Kant's moral precepts, and especially according to a Kantian definition of duty. This was outrageous on the face of it, and also incomprehensible, since Kant's moral philosophy is so closely bound up with man's faculty of judgment, which rules out blind obedience. The examining officer did not press the point, but Judge Rave, either out of curiosity or out of indignation at Eichmann's having dared to invoke Kant's name in connection with his crimes, decided to question the accused. And to the surprise of everybody, Eichmann came up with an approximately correct definition of the categorical imperative. I meant by my remark about Kant that the principle of my will must always be such that it can become the principle of general laws, which is not the case with theft or murder, for instance, because the thief or the murderer cannot conceivably wish to live under a legal system that would give others the right to rob or murder him. Upon further questioning, he added that he had read Kant's critique of practical reason. He then proceeded to explain that from the moment he was charged with carrying out the final solution, he had ceased to live according to Kantian principles, that he had known it, and that he had consoled himself with the thought that he no longer was master of his own deeds, that he was unable to change anything. What he failed to point out in court was that in this period of crimes legalized by the state, as he himself now called it, he had not simply dismissed the Kantian formula as no longer applicable, he had distorted it to read, act as if the principle of your actions were the same as that of the legislator or of the law of the land. Or in Hans Frank's formulation of the categorical imperative in the Third Reich, which Eichmann might have known, act in such a way that the Führer, if he knew your action, would approve it. Die Technik des Staates, 1942, pages 15 to 16. Kant, to be sure, had never intended to say anything of the sort. On the contrary, to him, every man was a legislator the moment he started to act. By using his practical reason, man found the principles that could and should be the principles of law. But it is true that Eichmann's unconscious distortion agrees with what he himself called the version of Kant for the household use of the little man. In this household use, all that is left of Kant's spirit is the demand that a man do more than obey the law— that he go beyond the mere call of obedience and identify his own will with the principle behind the law, the source from which the law sprang. In Kant's philosophy, that source was practical reason. In Eichmann's household use of him, it was the will of the Führer. Much of the horribly painstaking thoroughness in the execution of the final solution a thoroughness that usually strikes the observer as typically German or else as characteristic of the perfect bureaucrat can be traced to the odd notion, indeed very common in Germany, 
that to be law-abiding means not merely to obey the laws, but to act as though one were the legislator of the laws that one obeys. Hence the conviction that nothing less than going beyond the call of duty will do. Whatever Kant's role in the formation of the little man's mentality in Germany may have been, there is not the slightest doubt that in one respect, Eichmann did indeed follow Kant's precepts. A law was a law. There could be no exceptions. In Jerusalem, he admitted only two such exceptions during the time when eighty million Germans had each had his decent Jew. He had helped a half-Jewish cousin and a Jewish couple in Vienna for whom his uncle had intervened. This inconsistency still made him feel somewhat uncomfortable, and when he was questioned about it during cross-examination, he became openly apologetic. He had confessed his sins to his superiors. This uncompromising attitude toward the performance of his murderous duties damned him in the eyes of the judges more than anything else, which was comprehensible. But in his own eyes, it was precisely what justified him, as it had once silenced whatever conscience he might have had left. No exceptions. This was the proof that he had always acted against his inclinations, whether they were sentimental or inspired by interest. That he had always done his duty. Doing his duty finally brought him into open conflict with orders from his superiors. During the last year of the war, more than two years after the Vansay conference, he experienced his last crisis of conscience. As the defeat approached, he was confronted by men from his own ranks who fought more and more insistently for exceptions, and eventually for the cessation of the final solution. That was the moment when his caution broke down, and he began once more taking initiatives. For instance, he organized the foot marches of Jews from Budapest to the Austrian border after Allied bombing had knocked out the transportation system. It now was the fall of 1944, and Eichmann knew that Himmler had ordered the dismantling of the extermination facilities in Auschwitz, and that the game was up. Around this time, Eichmann had one of his very few personal interviews with Himmler, in the course of which, the latter allegedly shouted at him. If up till now you have been busy liquidating Jews, you will from now on, since I order it, take good care of Jews, act as their nursemaid. I remind you that it was I, and neither Gruppenführer Müller nor you, who founded the RSHA in 1933. I am the one who gives orders here. Sole witness to substantiate these words was the very dubious Mr. Kurt Becker. Eichmann denied that Himmler had shouted at him, but he did not deny that such an interview had taken place. Himmler cannot have spoken in precisely these words. He surely knew that the RSHA was founded in 1939, not in 1933, and not simply by himself, but by Heydrich with his endorsement. Still, something of the sort must have occurred. Himmler was then giving orders right and left that the Jews be treated well. They were his soundest investment. And it must have been a shattering experience for Eichmann. Eichmann's last crisis of conscience began with his missions to Hungary in March 1944, when the Red Army was moving through the Carpathian Mountains toward the Hungarian border. Hungary had joined the war on Hitler's side in 1941 for no other reason than to receive some additional territory from her neighbors, Slovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia. The Hungarian government had been outspokenly anti-Semitic even before that. And now it began to deport all stateless Jews from the newly acquired territories. In nearly all countries, anti-Jewish action started with stateless persons. This was quite outside the final solution, and as a matter of fact, didn't fit in with the elaborate plans then in preparation under which Europe would be combed from west to east, so that Hungary had a rather low priority in the order of operations. The stateless Jews had been shoved by the Hungarian police into the nearest part of Russia. And the German occupation authorities on the spot had protested their arrival. The Hungarians had taken back some thousands of able-bodied men and had let the others be shot by Hungarian troops under the guidance of German police units. Admiral Horthy, the country's fascist ruler, had not wanted to go any further. However, probably due to the restraining influence of Mussolini and Italian fascism. And in the intervening years, Hungary, not unlike Italy, had become a haven for Jews, to which even refugees from Poland and Slovakia could sometimes still escape. 
The annexation of territory and the trickle of incoming refugees had increased the number of Jews in Hungary from about 500,000 before the war to approximately 800,000 in 1944, when Eichmann moved in. As we know today, the safety of these 300,000 Jews newly acquired by Hungary was due to the Germans' reluctance to start a separate action for a limited number rather than to the Hungarians' eagerness to offer asylum. In 1942, under pressure from the German Foreign Office, which never failed to make it clear to Germany's allies that the touchstone of their trustworthiness was their helpfulness not in winning the war but in solving the Jewish question, Hungary had offered to hand over all Jewish refugees. The Foreign Office had been willing to accept this as a step in the right direction, but Eichmann had objected. For technical reasons, he thought it preferable to defer this action until Hungary is ready to include the Hungarian Jews. It would be too costly to set in motion the whole machinery of evacuation for only one category, and hence without making any progress in the solution of the Jewish problem in Hungary. Now, in 1944, Hungary was ready, because on the 19th of March, two divisions of the German army had occupied the country. With them had arrived the new Reich Plenipotentiary, SS Standartenführer Dr. Edmund Wiesenmeier, Himmler's agent in the Foreign Office, and SS Obergruppenführer Otto Winkelmann, a member of the Higher SS and Police Leader Corps, and therefore under the direct command of Himmler. The third SS official to arrive in the country was Eichmann, the expert on Jewish evacuation and deportation, who was under the command of Müller and Koltenbrunner of the RSHA. Hitler himself had left no doubt what the arrival of the three gentlemen meant. In a famous interview, prior to the occupation of the country, he had told Horty that Hungary had not yet introduced the steps necessary to settle the Jewish question, and had charged him with not having permitted the Jews to be massacred. Eichmann's assignment was clear. His whole office was moved to Budapest. In terms of his career, this was a gliding down to enable him to see to it that all necessary steps were taken. He had no foreboding of what was to happen. His worst fear concerned possible resistance on the part of the Hungarians, which he would have been unable to cope with because he lacked manpower and also lacked knowledge of local conditions. These fears proved quite unfounded. The Hungarian gendarmerie was more than eager to do all that was necessary, and the new state secretary in charge of political, that is, Jewish affairs, in the Hungarian Ministry of the Interior, Lazla Endra, was a man well-versed in the Jewish problem, and became an intimate friend with whom Eichmann could spend a good deal of his free time. Everything went like a dream, as he repeated whenever he recalled this episode. There were no difficulties whatsoever. Unless, of course, one calls difficulties a few minor differences between his orders and the wishes of his new friends. For instance, probably because of the approach of the Red Army from the east, his orders stipulated that the country was to be combed from east to west, which meant that Budapest Jews would not be evacuated during the first weeks or months, a matter for great grief among the Hungarians who wanted their capital to take the lead in becoming Judenrein. Eichmann's dream was an incredible nightmare for the Jews. Nowhere else were so many people deported and exterminated in such a brief span of time. In less than two months, 147 trains carrying 434,351 people in sealed freight cars, a hundred persons to a car, left the country, and the gas chambers of Auschwitz were hardly able to cope with this multitude. The difficulties arose from another quarter. Not one man, but three, had orders specifying that they were to help in the solution of the Jewish problem. Each of them belonged to a different outfit and stood in a different chain of command. Technically, Winkelmann was Eichmann's superior, but the higher SS and police leaders were not under the command of the RSHA, to which Eichmann belonged, and Wiesenmeier of the Foreign Office was independent of both. At any rate, Eichmann refused to take orders from either of the others and resented their presence. But the worst trouble came from a fourth man, whom Himmler had charged with a special mission in the only country in Europe that still harbored not only a sizable number of Jews, but Jews who were still in an important economic position. Of a total of 110,000 commercial stores and industrial enterprises in Hungary, 40,000 were reported to be in Jewish hands. This man was Obersturmbahnführer, later Standartenführer, 
Kurt Becker. Becker, an old enemy of Eichmann, who is today a prosperous merchant in Bremen, was called, strangely enough, as a witness for the defence. He could not come to Jerusalem for obvious reasons, and he was examined in his German hometown. His testimony had to be dismissed, since he had been shown well ahead of time the questions he was later called on to answer under oath. It was a great pity that Eichmann and Becker could not have been confronted with each other, and this not merely for juridical reasons. Such a confrontation would have revealed another part of the general picture, which even legally was far from irrelevant. According to his own account, the reason Becker joined the SS was that, from 1932 to the present day, he'd been actively engaged in horseback riding. Thirty years ago, this was a sport engaged in only by Europe's upper classes. In 1934, his instructor had persuaded him to enter the SS Cavalry Regiment, which at that moment was the very thing for a man to do if he wished to join the movement and at the same time maintain a proper regard for his social standing. A possible reason Becker, in his testimony, stressed horseback riding was never mentioned. The Nuremberg Tribunal had excluded the Reiter SS from its list of criminal organizations. The war saw Becker on active duty at the front as a member not of the army but of the armed SS, in which he was a liaison officer with the army commanders. He soon left the front to become the principal buyer of horses for the SS personnel department, a job that earned him nearly all the decorations that were then available. Becker claimed that he had been sent to Hungary only in order to buy 20,000 horses for the SS. This is unlikely, since immediately upon his arrival, he began a series of very successful negotiations with the heads of big Jewish business concerns. His relations with Himmler were excellent. He could see him whenever he wished. His special mission was clear enough. He was to obtain control of major Jewish business concerns behind the backs of the Hungarian government, and in return to give the owners free passage out of the country, plus a sizable amount of money in foreign currency. His most important transaction was with the Manfred Weiss Steel Combine, a mammoth enterprise with 30,000 workers, which produced everything from airplanes, trucks and bicycles, to tinned goods, pins and needles. The result was that 45 members of the Weiss family emigrated to Portugal, while Mr. Becker became head of their business. When Eichmann heard of this Schweinerei, he was outraged. The deal threatened to compromise his good relations with the Hungarians, who naturally expected to take possession of Jewish property confiscated on their own soil. He had some reason for his indignation, since these deals were contrary to the regular Nazi policy, which had been quite generous. For their help in solving the Jewish question in any country, the Germans had demanded no part of the Jews' property, only the costs of their deportation and extermination, and these costs had varied widely from country to country. The Slovaks had been supposed to pay between 300 and 500 Reichmarks per Jew, the Croats only 30, the French 700, and the Belgians 250. It seems that no one ever paid except the Croats. In Hungary, at this late stage of the war, the Germans were demanding payment in goods, shipments of food to the Reich, in quantities determined by the amount of food the deported Jews would have consumed. The Weiss affair was only the beginning, and things were to get considerably worse from Eichmann's point of view. Becker was a born businessman, and where Eichmann saw only enormous tasks of organization and administration, he saw almost unlimited possibilities for making money. The one thing that stood in his way was the narrow-mindedness of subordinate creatures like Eichmann, who took their job seriously. Obersturmbahnführer Becker's projects soon led him to cooperate closely in the rescue efforts of Dr. Rudolf Kastner. It was to Kastner's testimony on his behalf that Becker, later at Nuremberg, owed his freedom. Being an old Zionist, Kastner had moved to Israel after the war, where he held a high position, until a journalist published a story about his collaboration with the SS, whereupon Kastner sued him for libel. His testimony at Nuremberg weighed heavily against him. And when the case came before the Jerusalem District Court, Judge Halivai, one of the three judges in the Eichmann trial, told Kastner that he had sold his soul to the devil. In March 1957, shortly before his case was to be appealed before the Israeli Supreme Court, Kastner was murdered. None of the murderers, it seems, came from Hungary. In the hearing that followed, the verdict of the lower court was repealed and Kastner was fully rehabilitated. 
The deals Becker made through Kastner were much simpler than the complicated negotiations with the business magnates. They consisted in fixing a price for the life of each Jew to be rescued. It was considerable haggling over prices, and at one point it seems Eichmann also got involved in some of the preliminary discussions. Characteristically, his price was the lowest, a mere two hundred dollars per Jew. Not, of course, because he wished to save more Jews, but simply because he was not used to thinking big. The price finally arrived at was a thousand dollars, and one group, consisting of one thousand six hundred and eighty-four Jews and including Dr. Kastner's family, actually left Hungary for the exchange camp at Bergen-Belsen, from which they eventually reached Switzerland. A similar deal, through which Becker and Himmler hoped to obtain twenty million Swiss francs from the American Joint Distribution Committee for the purchase of merchandise of all sorts, kept everybody busy until the Russians liberated Hungary. But nothing came of it. There is no doubt that Becker's activities had the full approval of Himmler and stood in the sharpest possible opposition to the old radical orders, which still reached Eichmann through Müller and Kaltenbrunner, his immediate superiors in the RSHA. In Eichmann's view, people like Becker were corrupt, but corruption could not very well have caused his crisis of conscience. For although he was apparently not susceptible to this kind of temptation, he must by this time have been surrounded by corruption for many years. It is difficult to imagine that he did not know that his friend and subordinate Hauptstum Führer Dieter Wislitzeni had, as early as 1942, accepted fifty thousand dollars from the Jewish Relief Committee in Bratislava for delaying the deportations from Slovakia, though it is not altogether impossible. But he cannot have been ignorant of the fact that Himmler, in the fall of 1942, had tried to sell exit permits to the Slovakian Jews in exchange for enough foreign currency to pay for the recruitment of a new SS division. Now, however, in 1944 in Hungary, it was different, not because Himmler was involved in business, but because business had now become official policy. It was no longer mere corruption. At the beginning, Eichmann tried to enter the game and play it according to the new rules. That was when he got involved in the fantastic blood for wares negotiations: one million Jews for ten thousand trucks for the crumbling German army, which certainly were not initiated by him. The way he explained his role in this matter in Jerusalem showed clearly how he had once justified it to himself as a military necessity that would bring him the additional benefit of an important new role in the emigration business. What he probably never admitted to himself was that the mounting difficulties on all sides made it every day more likely that he would soon be without a job. Indeed, this happened a few months later, unless he succeeded in finding some foothold amid the new jockeying for power that was going on all around him. When the exchange project met with its predictable failure, there was already common knowledge that Himmler, despite his constant vacillations, chiefly due to his justified physical fear of Hitler. Had decided to put an end to the whole final solution, regardless of business, regardless of military necessity, and without anything to show for it except the illusions he had concocted about his future role as the bringer of peace to Germany. It was at this time that a moderate wing of the SS came into existence, consisting of those who were stupid enough to believe that a murderer who could prove he had not killed as many people as he could have killed would have a marvelous alibi. And those who were clever enough to foresee a return to normal conditions, when money and good connections would again be of paramount importance, Eichmann never joined this moderate wing, and it is questionable whether he would have been admitted if he had tried to. Not only was he too deeply compromised, and because of his constant contact with Jewish functionaries too well known. He was too primitive for these well-educated upper-middle-class gentlemen, against whom he harboured the most violent resentment up to the very end. He was quite capable of sending millions of people to their death, but he was not capable of talking about it in the appropriate manner without being given his language rule. In Jerusalem, without any rules, he spoke freely of killing and of murder, of crimes legalised by the state. He called a spade a spade. In contrast, a counsel for the defence, whose feeling of social superiority to Eichmann was more than once in evidence, Servetius's assistant, Dr. Dieter Wechtenbruch, a disciple of Karl Schmidt, who attended the first few weeks of the trial, then was sent to Germany to question witnesses for the defence, and reappeared for the last week in August, was readily available to reporters out of court. 
He seemed to be shocked less by Eichmann's crimes than by his lack of taste and education. Small fry, he said. We must see how we get him over the hurdles. We will das Wörtchen über die Runden bringen. Servatius himself had declared even prior to the trial that his client's personality was that of a common mailman. When Himmler became moderate, Eichmann sabotaged his orders as much as he dared, to the extent at least that he felt he was covered by his immediate superiors. How does Eichmann dare to sabotage Himmler's orders? In this case, to stop the foot marches in the fall of 1944, Kastner once asked Wislet Saini, and the answer was, he can probably show some telegram. Müller and Kaltenbrunner must have covered him. It is quite possible that Eichmann had some confused plan for liquidating Theresienstadt before the arrival of the Red Army, although we know this only through the dubious testimony of Dieter Wislitzeny, who months and perhaps years before the end began carefully preparing an alibi for himself at the expense of Eichmann, to which he then treated the court at Nuremberg, where he was a witness for the prosecution. It did him no good, for he was extradited to Czechoslovakia, prosecuted and executed in Prague, where he had no connections and where money was of no help to him. Other witnesses claimed that it was Rolf Gunther, one of Eichmann's men, who planned this, and that there existed, on the contrary, a written order from Eichmann that the ghetto be left intact. In any event, there is no doubt that even in April 1945, when practically everybody had become quite moderate, Eichmann took advantage of a visit that Monsieur Paul Dunon of the Swiss Red Cross paid to Theresienstadt to put it on record that he himself did not approve of Himmler's new line in regard to the Jews. That Eichmann had at all times done his best to make the final solution final was therefore not in dispute. The question was only whether this was indeed proof of his fanaticism, his boundless hatred of Jews, and whether he had lied to the police and committed perjury in court when he claimed that he had always obeyed orders. No other explanation ever occurred to the judges, who tried so hard to understand the accused and treated him with a consideration and an authentic shining humanity such as he had probably never encountered before in his whole life. Dr. Vechtenbruch told reporters that Eichmann had great confidence in Judge Landau, as though Landau would be able to sort things out, and described this confidence to Eichmann's need for authority. Whatever its basis, the confidence was apparent throughout the trial, and it may have been the reason the judgment caused Eichmann such great disappointment. He had mistaken humanity for softness. That they never did come to understand him may be proof of the goodness of the three men, of their untroubled and slightly old-fashioned faith in the moral foundations of their profession. But the sad and very uncomfortable truth of the matter probably was that it was not his fanaticism, but his very conscience that prompted Eichmann to adopt his uncompromising attitude during the last year of the war, as it had prompted him to move in the opposite direction for a short time three years before. Eichmann knew that Himmler's orders ran directly counter to the Führer's order. For this he needed to know no factual details, though such details would have backed him up. As the prosecution underlined in the proceedings before the Supreme Court, when Hitler heard through Kaltenbrunner of negotiations to exchange Jews for trucks, Himmler's position in Hitler's eyes was completely undermined. And only a few weeks before Himmler stopped the extermination at Auschwitz, Hitler, obviously unaware of Himmler's newest moves, had sent an ultimatum to Horty, telling him he expected that the measures against Jews in Budapest would now be taken without any further delay by the Hungarian government. When Himmler's order to stop the evacuation of Hungarian Jews arrived in Budapest, Eichmann threatened, according to a telegram from Wiesenmeyer, to seek a new decision from the Führer. And this telegram, the judgment found, more damning than a hundred witnesses could be. Eichmann lost his fight against the moderate wing, headed by the Reichsführer SS and chief of the German police. The first indication of his defeat came in January 1945, when Obersturmbahnführer Kurt Becker was promoted to Standartenführer, the very rank Eichmann had been dreaming about all during the war. His story that no higher rank was open to him in his outfit was a half-truth. He could have been made chief of Department 4B instead of occupying the desk of 4B4 and would then have been automatically promoted. 
The truth probably was that people like Eichmann, who had risen from the ranks, were never permitted to advance beyond a lieutenant colonelcy except at the front. That same month, Hungary was liberated, and Eichmann was called back to Berlin. There, Himmler had appointed his enemy Becker Reich Sonderkommissar in charge of all concentration camps, and Eichmann was transferred from the desk concerned with Jewish affairs to the utterly insignificant one concerned with the fight against the churches, of which, moreover, he knew nothing. The rapidity of his decline during the last months of the war is a most telling sign of the extent to which Hitler was right when he declared in his Berlin bunker in April 1945 that the SS were no longer reliable. In Jerusalem, confronted with documentary proof of his extraordinary loyalty to Hitler and the Fuhrer's order, Eichmann tried a number of times to explain that during the Third Reich, the Fuhrer's words had the force of law. Fuhrer Worte haben Gesetzekraft, which meant, among other things, that if the order came directly from Hitler, it did not have to be in writing. He tried to explain that this was why he had never asked for a written order from Hitler. No such document relating to the final solution has ever been found. Probably it never existed, but had demanded to see a written order from Himmler. To be sure, this was a fantastic state of affairs, and how libraries of very learned juridical comment have been written, all demonstrating that the Fuhrer's words, his oral pronouncements, were the basic law of the land. Within this legal framework... Every order contrary in letter or spirit to a word spoken by Hitler was, by definition, unlawful. Eichmann's position, therefore, showed a most unpleasant resemblance to that of the often cited soldier, who, acting in a normal legal framework, refuses to carry out orders that run counter to his ordinary experience of lawfulness, and hence can be recognized by him as criminal. The extensive literature on the subject usually supports its case with the common equivocal meaning of the word law, which in this context means sometimes the law of the land, that is, posited, positive law, and sometimes the law that supposedly speaks in all men's hearts with an identical voice. Practically speaking, however, orders to be disobeyed must be manifestly unlawful, and unlawfulness must fly like a black flag above them as a warning reading prohibited, as the judgment pointed out. And in a criminal regime, this black flag with its warning sign flies as manifestly above what normally is a lawful order, for instance, not to kill innocent people just because they happen to be Jews, as it flies above a criminal order under normal circumstances. To fall back on an unequivocal voice of conscience, or in the even vaguer language of the jurists, on a general sentiment of humanity, Oppenheim Leiter parked in International Law 1952, not only begs the question, it signifies a deliberate refusal to take notice of the central, moral, legal, and political phenomena of our century. To be sure, it was not merely Eichmann's conviction that Himmler was now giving criminal orders that determined his actions. But the personal element undoubtedly involved was not fanaticism. It was his genuine, boundless, and immoderate admiration for Hitler, as one of the defense witnesses called it for the man who had made it from Lance Corporal to Chancellor of the Reich. It would be idle to try to figure out which was stronger in him, his admiration for Hitler or his determination to remain a law-abiding citizen of the Third Reich when Germany was already in ruins. Both motives came into play once more during the last days of the war when he was in Berlin and saw with violent indignation how everybody around him was, sensibly enough, getting himself fixed up with forged papers before the arrival of the Russians or the Americans. A few weeks later, Eichmann, too, began to travel under an assumed name, but by then Hitler was dead, and the law of the land was no longer in existence, and he, as he pointed out, was no longer bound by his oath. For the oath taken by the members of the SS differed from the military oath sworn by the soldiers in that it bound them only to Hitler, not to Germany. The case of the conscience of Adolf Eichmann, which is admittedly complicated but is by no means unique, is scarcely comparable to the case of the German generals, one of whom, when asked at Nuremberg, how was it possible that all you honourable generals could continue to serve a murderer with such unquestioning loyalty? replied that it was not the task of a soldier to act as judge over his supreme commander. Let history do that, O God in heaven. Thus General Alfred Jodl hanged at Nuremberg. 
Eichmann, much less intelligent and without any education to speak of, at least dimly realized that it was not an order, but a law, which had turned them all into criminals. The distinction between an order and the Führer's word was that the latter's validity was not limited in time and space, which is the outstanding characteristic of the former. This is also the true reason why the Führer's order for the final solution was followed by a huge shower of regulations and directives, all drafted by expert lawyers and legal advisers, not by mere administrators. This order, in contrast to ordinary orders, was treated as a law. Needless to add, the resulting legal paraphernalia, far from being a mere symptom of German pedantry or thoroughness, served most effectively to give the whole business its outward appearance of legality. And just as the law in civilized countries assumes that the voice of conscience tells everybody, thou shalt not kill, even though man's natural desires and inclinations may at times be murderous, so the law of Hitler's land demanded that the voice of conscience tell everybody, thou shalt kill, although the organizers of the massacres knew full well that murder is against the normal desires and inclinations of most people. Evil in the Third Reich had lost the quality by which most people recognize it, the quality of temptation. Many Germans, and many Nazis, probably an overwhelming majority of them, must have been tempted not to murder, not to rob, not to let their neighbors go off to their doom, for that the Jews were transported to their doom they knew, of course, even though many of them may not have known the gruesome details, and not to become accomplices in all these crimes by benefiting from them. But God knows they had learned how to resist temptation. 9. Deportations from the Reich, Germany, Austria, and the Protectorate Between the Wannsee Conference in January 1942, when Eichmann felt like Pontius Pilate and washed his hands in innocence, and Himmler's orders in the summer and fall of 1944, when behind Hitler's back the final solution was abandoned, as though the massacres had been nothing but a regrettable mistake, Eichmann was troubled by no questions of conscience. His thoughts were entirely taken up with the staggering job of organization and administration in the midst not only of a world war, but more important for him, of innumerable intrigues and fights over spheres of authority among the various state and party offices that were busy solving the Jewish question. His chief competitors were the higher SS and police leaders, who were under the direct command of Himmler, had easy access to him, and always outranked Eichmann. There was also the Foreign Office, which, under its new Under-Secretary of State, Dr. Martin Luther, a protégé of Ribbentrop, had become very active in Jewish affairs. Luther tried to oust Ribbentrop in an elaborate intrigue in 1943, failed, and was put into a concentration camp. Under his successor, Legationsrat Eberhard von Tadden, a witness for the defense at the trial in Jerusalem, became referent in Jewish affairs. It occasionally issued deportation orders to be carried out by its representatives abroad, who, for reasons of prestige, preferred to work through the higher SS and police leaders. There were, furthermore, the army commanders in the eastern-occupied territories who liked to solve problems on the spot, which meant shooting. The military men in Western countries were, on the other hand, always reluctant to cooperate and to lend their troops for the rounding up and seizure of Jews. Finally, there were the Gauleiters, the regional leaders, each of whom wanted to be the first to declare his territory Judenrein and who occasionally started deportation procedures on their own. Eichmann had to coordinate all these efforts to bring some order out of what he described as complete chaos, in which everyone issued his own orders and did as he pleased. And indeed he succeeded, though never completely, in acquiring a key position in the whole process, because his office organized the means of transportation. According to Dr. Rudolf Mildner, Gestapo head in Upper Silesia, where Auschwitz was located, and later chief of the security police in Denmark, who testified for the prosecution at Nuremberg, orders for deportations were given by Himmler in writing to Koltenbrunner, head of the RSHA, who notified Müller, head of the Gestapo, or Section 4 of RSHA, who in turn transmitted the orders orally to his referent in 4B4, that is, to Eichmann. Himmler also issued orders to the local higher SS and police leaders, and informed Koltenbrunner accordingly. Questions of what should be done with the Jewish deportees, how many should be exterminated, and how many spared for hard labor, were also decided by Himmler, 
and his orders concerning these matters went to Pohl's WVHA, which communicated them to Richard Glucks, inspector of the concentration and extermination camps, who in turn passed them along to the commanders of the camps. The prosecution ignored these documents from the Nuremberg trials, since they contradicted its theory of the extraordinary power held by Eichmann. The defense mentioned Mildner's affidavits, but not to much purpose. Eichmann himself, after consulting Polyakov and Reitlinger, produced seventeen multicolored charts, which contributed little to a better understanding of the intricate bureaucratic machinery of the Third Reich, although his general description, everything was always in a state of continuous flux, a steady stream, sounded plausible to the student of totalitarianism, who knows that the monolithic quality of this form of government is a myth. He still remembered vaguely how his men, his advisers on Jewish matters in all occupied and semi-independent countries, had reported back to him what action was at all practicable, how he had then prepared reports, which were later either approved or rejected, and how Müller then had issued his directives. In practice, this could mean that a proposal that came in from Paris or The Hague went out a fortnight later to Paris or The Hague in the form of a directive approved by the RSHA. Eichmann's position was that of the most important conveyor belt in the whole operation, because it was always up to him and his men how many Jews could or should be transported from any given area, and it was through his office that the ultimate destination of the shipment was cleared, though that destination was not determined by him. But the difficulty in synchronizing departures and arrivals, the endless worry over wrangling enough rolling stock from the railroad authorities and the Ministry of Transport, over fixing timetables and directing trains to centers with sufficient absorptive capacity, over having enough Jews on hand at the proper time so that no trains would be wasted, over enlisting the help of the authorities in occupied or allied countries to carry out arrests, over following the rules and directives with respect to the various categories of Jews, which were laid down separately for each country and constantly changing. All this became a routine whose details he'd forgotten long before he was brought to Jerusalem. What for Hitler, the sole lonely plotter of the final solution, never had a conspiracy, if such it was needed fewer conspirators and more executors, was among the war's main objectives, with its implementation given top priority regardless of economic and military considerations, and what for Eichmann was a job with its daily routine, its ups and downs, was for the Jews quite literally the end of the world. For hundreds of years they had been used to understanding their own history, rightly or wrongly, as a long story of suffering, much as the prosecutor described it in his opening speech at the trial. But behind this attitude, there had been for a long time the triumphant conviction of, of Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel shall live. Individual Jews, whole Jewish families might die in pogroms, whole communities might be wiped out, but the people would survive. They'd never been confronted with genocide. Moreover, the old consolation no longer worked, anyhow, at least not in Western Europe. Since Roman antiquity, that is, since the inception of European history, the Jews had belonged, for better or worse, in misery or in splendor, to the European Comity of Nations. But during the past hundred and fifty years, it had been chiefly for better, and the occasions of splendor had become so numerous that in Central and Western Europe they were felt to be the rule. Hence the confidence that the people would eventually survive no longer held great significance for large sections of the Jewish communities. They could no more imagine Jewish life outside the framework of European civilization than they could have pictured to themselves a Europe that was Judenrein. The end of the world, though carried through with remarkable monotony, took almost as many different shapes and appearances as there existed countries in Europe. This will come as no surprise to the historian familiar with the development of European nations and with the rise of the nation-state system, but it came as a great surprise to the Nazis, who were genuinely convinced that anti-Semitism could become the common denominator that would unite all Europe. This was a huge and costly error. It quickly turned out that in practice, though perhaps not in theory, there existed great differences among anti-Semites in the various countries. What was even more annoying, though it might easily have been predicted, was that the German radical variety was fully appreciated only by those peoples in the East, the Ukrainians, the Estonians, the Latvians, the Lithuanians, 
and to some extent the Romanians, whom the Nazis had decided to regard as subhuman barbarian hordes. Notably deficient in proper hostility toward the Jews were the Scandinavian nations. Knut Hansen and Sven Hedin were exceptions, which, according to the Nazis, were Germany's blood brethren. The end of the world began, of course, in the German Reich, which at the time embraced not only Germany but Austria, Moravia and Bohemia, the Czech Protectorate, and the annexed Polish Western regions. In the last of these, the so-called Wartegau, Jews, together with Poles, had been deported eastward after the beginning of the war in the first huge resettlement project in the East, an organized wandering of nations, as the judgment of the district court in Jerusalem called it, while Poles of German origin, Volkdeutsch, were shipped westward back into the Reich. Himmler, in his capacity as Reich Commissioner for the Strengthening of German Folkdom, had entrusted Heydrich with this emigration and evacuation, and in January 1940, Eichmann's first official department in the RSHA, Bureau 4D4, was set up. Though this position proved administratively to be the stepping stone to his later job in Bureau 4B4, Eichmann's work here was no more than a kind of apprenticeship, the transition between his old job of making people emigrate and his future task of deporting them. His first deportation jobs did not belong to the final solution. They occurred before the official Hitler order. In view of what happened later, they can be regarded as test cases, as an experiment in catastrophe. The first was the deportation of 1,300 Jews from Stettin, which was carried out in a single night on February 13, 1940. This was the first deportation of German Jews, and Heydrich had ordered it under the pretext that their apartments were urgently required for reasons connected with the war economy. They were taken, under unusually atrocious conditions, to the Lublin area of Poland. The second deportation took place in the fall of the same year. All the Jews in Baden and the Tsarpfalz, about 7,500 men, women and children, were shipped, as I mentioned earlier, to unoccupied France which was at that moment quite a trick, since nothing in the Franco-German armistice agreement stipulated that Vichy France could become a dumping ground for Jews. Eichmann had to accompany the train himself in order to convince the French stationmaster at the border that this was a German military transport. These two operations entirely lacked the later elaborate legal preparations. No laws had yet been passed depriving Jews of their nationality the moment they were deported from the Reich, and instead of the many forms Jews eventually had to fill out in arranging for the confiscation of their property, the Stettin Jews simply signed a general waiver covering everything they owned. Clearly, it was not the administrative apparatus that these first operations were supposed to test. The objective seems to have been a test of general political conditions, whether Jews could be made to walk to their doom on their own feet, carrying their own little valises in the middle of the night, without any previous notification what the reaction of their neighbours would be when they discovered the empty apartments in the morning. And last but not least, in the case of the Jews from Baden, how a foreign government would react to being suddenly presented with thousands of Jewish refugees. As far as the Nazis could see, everything turned out very satisfactorily. In Germany there were a number of interventions for special cases. For the poet Alfred Mombert, for instance, a member of the Stefan Georg Circle, who was permitted to depart to Switzerland, but the population at large obviously could not have cared less. It was probably at this moment that Heydrich realized how important it would be to separate Jews with connections from the anonymous masses, and decided, with Hitler's agreement, to establish Theresienstadt and Bergen-Belsen. In France, something even better happened. The Vichy government put all 7,500 Jews from Baden in the notorious concentration camp at Gurs, at the foot of the Pyrenees, which had originally been built for the Spanish Republican Army and had been used since May of 1940 for the so-called réfugiés provenant d'Allemagne, the large majority of whom were, of course, Jewish. When the final solution was put into effect in France, the inmates of the Gurs camp were all shipped to Auschwitz. The Nazis, always eager to generalize, thought they had demonstrated that Jews were undesirables everywhere and that every non-Jew was an actual or potential anti-Semite. Why then should anybody be bothered if they tackled this problem radically? 
Still under the spell of these generalizations, Eichmann complained over and over in Jerusalem that no country had been ready to accept Jews, that this and only this had caused the great catastrophe. As though those tightly organized European nation-states would have reacted any differently if any other group of foreigners had suddenly descended upon them in hordes, penniless, passportless, unable to speak the language of the country. However, to the never-ending surprise of the Nazi officials, even the convinced anti-Semites in foreign lands were not willing to be consistent and showed a deplorable tendency to shy away from radical measures. Few of them put it as bluntly as a member of the Spanish embassy in Berlin. If only one could be sure they wouldn't be liquidated, he said, of some six hundred Jews of Spanish descent who had been given Spanish passports, though they had never been in Spain, and whom the Franco government wished very much to transfer to German jurisdiction. But most of them thought precisely along these lines. After these first experiments, there followed a lull in deportations, and we've seen how Eichmann used his enforced inactivity to play around with Madagascar. But in March 1941, during the preparation for the war against Russia, Eichmann was suddenly put in charge of a new subsection, or rather, the name of his subsection was changed from Emigration and Evacuation to Jewish Affairs Evacuation. From then on, though he was not yet informed of the final solution, he should have been aware not only that emigration had definitely come to an end, but that deportation was to take its place. But Eichmann was not a man to take hints, and since no one had yet told him differently, he continued to think in terms of emigration. Thus, at a meeting with representatives of the Foreign Office in October 1940, during which it had been proposed that the citizenship of all German Jews abroad be cancelled, Eichmann protested vigorously that such a step might influence other countries, which to date were still ready to open their gates to Jewish immigrants and to grant entry permits. He always thought within the narrow limits of whatever laws and decrees were valid at a given moment, and the shower of new anti-Jewish legislation descended upon the Reich's Jews only after Hitler's order for the final solution had been officially handed down to those who were to implement it. At the same time, it had been decided that the Reich was to be given top priority, its territories made Judenrein with all speed. It is surprising that it still took almost two years to do the job. The preparatory regulations, which were soon to serve as models for all other countries, consisted first of the introduction of the Yellow Badge, September 1, 1941. Second, of a change in the nationality law, providing that a Jew could not be considered a German national if he lived outside the borders of the Reich, whence, of course, he was to be deported. Third, of a decree that all property of German Jews who had lost their nationality was to be confiscated by the Reich, November 25, 1941. The preparations culminated in an agreement between Otto Tirach, the Minister of Justice, and Himmler, whereby the former relinquished jurisdiction over Poles, Russians, Jews, and Gypsies in favor of the SS, since the Ministry of Justice can make only a small contribution to the extermination, that is the word used, of these people. This open language, in a letter dated October 1942, from the Minister of Justice to Martin Bormann, head of the party chancellery, is noteworthy. Slightly different directives had to be issued to cover those who were deported to Theresienstadt, because Theresienstadt being on Reich territory, the Jews deported there did not automatically become stateless. In the case of these privileged categories, an old law of 1933 permitted the government to confiscate property that had been used for activities hostile to the nation and the state. This kind of confiscation had been customary in the case of political prisoners in the concentration camps, and though Jews did not belong in this category, all concentration camps in Germany and Austria had become Judenreich by the fall of 1942, it took only one more regulation, issued in March 1942, to establish that all deported Jews were hostile to the nation and the state. The Nazis took their own legislation quite seriously, and though they talked among themselves of the Theresienstadt ghetto, or the ghetto for old people, Theresienstadt was officially classified as a concentration camp, and the only people who did not know this, one did not want to hurt their feelings since this place of residence was reserved for special cases, were the inmates. And to make sure that the Jews sent there would not become suspicious, the Jewish Association in Berlin, the Reichsvereinigung, 
was directed to draw up an agreement with each deportee for the acquisition of residence in Theresienstadt. The candidate transferred all his property to the Jewish Association, in consideration whereof the Association guaranteed him housing, food, clothing, and medical care for life. When, finally, the last officials of the Reich für Heinigung were themselves sent to Theresienstadt, the Reich simply confiscated the considerable amount of money then in the association's treasury. All deportations from west to east were organized and coordinated by Eichmann and his associates in Section 4b4 of the RSHA, a fact that was never disputed during the trial. But to put the Jews on the trains, he needed the help of ordinary police units. In Germany, the order police guarded the trains and posted escorts, and in the east, the security police, not to be confused with Himmler's security service or SD, stood ready at the places of destination to receive the trains and hand their inmates over to the authorities in the killing centers. The Jerusalem court followed the definitions of criminal organizations established at Nuremberg. This meant that neither the order police nor the security police were ever mentioned, although their active involvement in the implementation of the final solution had by this time been amply substantiated. But even if all the police units had been added to the four organizations recognized as criminal, the leadership corps of the Nazi party, the Gestapo, the SD, and the SS, the Nuremberg distinctions would have remained inadequate and inapplicable to the reality of the Third Reich. For the truth of the matter is that there existed not a single organization or public institution in Germany, at least during the war years, that did not become involved in criminal actions and transactions. After the troublesome issue of personal interventions had been resolved through the establishment of Theresienstadt, two things still stood in the way of a radical and final solution. One was the problem of half-Jews, whom the radicals wanted to deport along with the full Jews, and whom the moderates wished to sterilize, because if you permitted the half-Jews to be killed, it meant that you abandoned that half of their blood which is German, as Stuckart of the Ministry of the Interior phrased it at the Wannsee Conference. Actually, nothing was ever done about the Mischlinger, or about Jews who had made mixed marriages. A forest of difficulties, in Eichmann's words, surrounded and protected them, their non-Jewish relatives for one, and for another, the disappointing fact that the Nazi physicians, despite all their promises, never discovered a quick means of mass sterilization. The second problem was the presence in Germany of a few thousand foreign Jews whom Germany could not deprive of their nationality through deportation. A few hundred American and English Jews were interned and held for exchange purposes, but the methods devised for dealing with nationals of neutral countries or those allied with Germany are interesting enough to be recorded, especially since they played a certain role in the trial. It was in reference to these people that Eichmann was accused of having shown inordinate zeal lest a single Jew escape him. This zeal he shared, as Reitlinger says, with the professional bureaucrats of the Foreign Office, to whom the flight of a few Jews from torture and slow death was a matter of the gravest concern, and whom he had to consult on all such cases. As far as Eichmann was concerned, the simplest and most logical solution was to deport all Jews, regardless of their nationality. According to the directives of the Wannsee Conference, which was held in the heyday of Hitler's victories, the final solution was to be applied to all European Jews, whose number was estimated at 11 million, and such things as nationality or the rights of allied or neutral countries with respect to their citizens were not even mentioned. But since Germany, even in the brightest days of the war, depended upon local goodwill and cooperation everywhere, these little formalities could not be sneezed at. It was the task of the experienced diplomats of the Foreign Service to find ways out of this particular forest of difficulties, and the most ingenious of these consisted in the use of foreign Jews in German territory to test the general atmosphere in their home countries. The method by which this was done, though simple, was somewhat subtle, and was certainly quite beyond Eichmann's mental grasp and political apprehension. This was borne out by documentary evidence. Letters that his department addressed to the Foreign Office in these matters were signed by Koltenbrunner or Müller. The Foreign Office wrote to the authorities in other countries, saying that the German Reich was in the process of becoming Judenrein, and that it was therefore imperative that foreign Jews be called home if they were not to be included in the anti-Jewish measures. 
There was more in this ultimatum than meets the eye. These foreign Jews, as a rule, either were naturalized citizens of their respective countries, or worse, were in fact stateless, but had obtained passports by some highly dubious method that worked well enough as long as their bearers stayed abroad. This was especially true of Latin American countries, whose consuls abroad sold passports to Jews quite openly. The fortunate holders of such passports had every right, including some consular protection, except the right ever to enter their homeland. Hence, the ultimatum of the Foreign Office was aimed at getting foreign governments to agree to the application of the final solution, at least to those Jews who were only nominally their nationals. Was it not logical to believe that a government that had shown itself unwilling to offer asylum to a few hundred or a few thousand Jews, who in any case were in no position to establish permanent residence there, would be unlikely to raise many objections on the day when its whole Jewish population was to be expelled and exterminated? Perhaps it was logical, but it was not reasonable, as we shall see shortly. On June 30, 1943, considerably later than Hitler had hoped, the Reich, Germany, Austria, and the Protectorate was declared Judenrein. There are no definite figures as to how many Jews were actually deported from this area, but we know that of the 265,000 people who, according to German statistics, were either deported or were eligible for deportation by January 1942, very few escaped. Perhaps a few hundred, at the most a few thousand, succeeded in hiding and surviving the war. How easy it was to set the conscience of the Jews' neighbors at rest is best illustrated by the official explanation of the deportations given in a circular issued by the party chancellery in the fall of 1942. It is in the nature of things that these, in some respects very difficult problems, can be solved in the interest of the permanent security of our people only with ruthless toughness. 10. Deportations from Western Europe, France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Italy. Ruthless toughness, a quality held in the highest esteem by the rulers of the Third Reich, is frequently characterized in post-war Germany, which has developed a veritable genius for understatement with respect to her Nazi past, as being ungut, lacking goodness, as though nothing had been wrong with those endowed with this quality, but a deplorable failure to act according to the exacting standards of Christian charity. In any case, men sent by Eichmann's office to other countries as advisers on Jewish affairs, to be attached to the regular diplomatic missions or to the military staff or to the local command of the security police, were all chosen because they possessed this virtue to the highest degree. In the beginning, during the fall and winter of 1941-42, to their main job seems to have been to establish satisfactory relations with the other German officials in the countries concerned, especially with the German embassies in nominally independent countries and with the Reich commissioners in occupied territories. In either case, there was perpetual conflict over jurisdiction in Jewish matters. In June 1942, Eichmann recalled his advisers in France, Belgium and Holland in order to lay plans for deportations from these countries. Himmler had ordered that France be given top priority in combing Europe from west to east, partly because of the inherent importance of the nation par excellence, and partly because the Vichy government had shown a truly amazing understanding of the Jewish problem, and had introduced on its own initiative a great deal of anti-Jewish legislation. It had even established a special department for Jewish affairs, headed first by Xavier Vallon, and somewhat later by Darquier de Pellepoix, both well-known anti-Semites. As a concession to the French brand of anti-Semitism, which was intimately connected with a strong, generally chauvinistic xenophobia in all strata of the population, the operation was to start with foreign Jews. And since in 1942 more than half of France's foreign Jews were stateless, refugees and emigres from Russia, Germany, Austria, Poland, Romania, Hungary, that is, from areas that either were under German domination or had passed anti-Jewish legislation before the outbreak of war, it was decided to begin by deporting an estimated 100,000 stateless Jews. The total Jewish population of the country was now well over 300,000. In 1939, before the influx of refugees from Belgium and Holland in the spring of 1940, there had been about 270,000 Jews, of whom at least 170,000 were foreign or foreign-born. 
Fifty thousand each were to be evacuated from the occupied zone and from Vichy, France, with all speed. This was a considerable undertaking, which needed not only the agreement of the Vichy government, but the active help of the French police, who were to do the work done in Germany by the order police. At first, there were no difficulties whatever, since, as Pierre Laval, premier under Marshal Pétain, pointed out, these foreign Jews had always been a problem in France. So that the French government was glad that a change in the German attitude toward them gave France an opportunity to get rid of them. It must be added that Laval and Pétain thought in terms of these Jews being resettled in the East. They did not yet know what resettlement meant. Two incidents in particular attracted the attention of the Jerusalem court, both of which occurred in the summer of 1942, a few weeks after the operation had started. The first concerned a train due to leave Bordeaux on July 15, which had to be cancelled because only 150 stateless Jews could be found in Bordeaux, not enough to fill the train, which Eichmann had obtained with great difficulty. Whether or not Eichmann recognized this as the first indication that things might not be quite as easy as everybody felt entitled to believe, he became very excited, telling his subordinates that this was a matter of prestige. Not in the eyes of the French, but in those of the Ministry of Transport, which might get wrong ideas about the efficiency of his apparatus, and that he would have to consider whether France should not be dropped altogether as far as evacuation was concerned, if such an incident was repeated. In Jerusalem, this threat was taken very seriously as proof of Eichmann's power. If he wished, he could drop France. Actually, it was one of Eichmann's ridiculous boasts. Proof of his driving power, but hardly evidence of his status in the eyes of his subordinates, except in so far as he had plainly threatened them with losing their very cosy war jobs. But if the Bordeaux incident was a farce, the second was the basis for one of the most horrible of the many hair-raising stories told at Jerusalem. This was the story of four thousand children separated from their parents who were already on their way to Auschwitz. The children had been left behind at the French collection point, the concentration camp at Drancy, and on July 10, Eichmann's French representative, Hauptsturmführer Theodor Danneker, phoned him to ask what was to be done with them. Eichmann took ten days to decide. Then he called Danneker back to tell him that as soon as transports could again be dispatched to the general government area of Poland, transports of children could roll. Doctor Savatius pointed out that the whole incident actually demonstrated that the persons affected were determined neither by the accused nor by any members of his office. But what, unfortunately, no one mentioned was that Danneke had informed Eichmann that Laval himself had proposed that children under sixteen be included in the deportations. This meant that the whole gruesome episode was not even the result of superior orders. But the outcome of an agreement between France and Germany negotiated at the highest level. During the summer and fall of 1942, twenty-seven thousand stateless Jews, eighteen thousand from Paris, and nine thousand from Vichy, France, were deported to Auschwitz. Then, when there were about seventy thousand stateless Jews left in all of France, the Germans made their first mistake. Confident that the French had by now become so accustomed to deporting Jews that they wouldn't mind. They asked for permission to include French Jews also, simply to facilitate administrative matters. This caused a complete turnabout. The French were adamant in their refusal to hand over their own Jews to the Germans, and Himmler, upon being informed of the situation, not by Eichmann or his men, incidentally, but by one of the higher SS and police leaders, immediately gave in and promised to spare French Jews. But now it was too late. The first rumors about resettlement had reached France, and while French anti-Semites and non-anti-Semites too would have liked to see foreign Jews settle somewhere else, not even the anti-Semites wished to become accomplices in mass murder. Hence, the French now refused to take a step they had eagerly contemplated only a short time before, that is, to revoke naturalizations granted to Jews after 1927. Or after 1933, which would have made about 50,000 more Jews eligible for deportation, they also started making such endless difficulties with regard to the deportation of stateless and other foreign Jews that all the ambitious plans for the evacuation of Jews from France did indeed have to be dropped. Tens of thousands of stateless persons went into hiding, 
while thousands more fled to the Italian-occupied French zone, the Côte d'Azur, where Jews were safe, whatever their origin or nationality. In the summer of 1943, when Germany was declared Judenrein and the Allies had just landed in Sicily, no more than 52,000 Jews, suddenly less than 20% of the total, had been deported, and of these no more than 6,000 possessed French nationality. Not even Jewish prisoners of war in the German internment camps for the French army were singled out for special treatment. In April 1944, two months before the Allies landed in France, there were still 250,000 Jews in the country, and they all survived the war. The Nazis, it turned out, possessed neither the manpower nor the willpower to remain tough when they met determined opposition. The truth of the matter was, as we shall see, that even the members of the Gestapo and the SS combined ruthlessness with softness. At the June 1942 meeting in Berlin, the figures set for immediate deportations from Belgium and the Netherlands had been rather low, probably because of the high figure set for France. No more than 10,000 Jews from Belgium and 15,000 from Holland were to be seized and deported in the immediate future. In both cases, the figures were later significantly enlarged, probably because of the difficulties encountered in the French operation. The situation of Belgium was peculiar in some respects. The country was ruled exclusively by German military authorities, and the police, as a Belgian government report submitted to the court pointed out, did not have the same influence upon the other German administration services that they enjoyed in other places. Belgium's governor, General Alexander von Falkenhausen, was later implicated in the July 1944 conspiracy against Hitler. Native collaborators were of importance only in Flanders. The fascist movement among the French-speaking Walloons, headed by de Grel, had little influence. The Belgian police did not cooperate with the Germans, and the Belgian railwaymen could not even be trusted to leave deportation trains alone. They contrived to leave doors unlocked or to arrange ambushes so that Jews could escape. Most peculiar was the composition of the Jewish population. Before the outbreak of war, there were 90,000 Jews, of whom about 30,000 were German Jewish refugees, while another 50,000 came from other European countries. By the end of 1940, nearly 40,000 Jews had fled the country, and among the 50,000 who remained, there were at the most 5,000 native-born Belgian citizens. Moreover, among those who had fled away were all the more important Jewish leaders, most of whom had been foreigners anyway, so that the Jewish council did not command any authority among native Jews. With this lack of understanding on all sides, it is not surprising that very few Belgian Jews were deported. But recently naturalized and stateless Jews of Czech, Polish, Russian and German origin, many of whom had only recently arrived, were easily recognizable and most difficult to hide in the small, completely industrialized country. By the end of 1942, 15,000 had been shipped to Auschwitz, and by the fall of 1944, when the Allies liberated the country, a total of 25,000 had been killed. Eichmann had his usual advisor in Belgium, but the advisor seems not to have been very active in these operations. They were carried out, finally, by the military administration under increased pressure from the Foreign Office. As in practically all other countries, the deportations from Holland started with stateless Jews, who in this instance consisted almost entirely of refugees from Germany, whom the pre-war Dutch government had officially declared to be undesirable. There were about 35,000 foreign Jews altogether, in a total Jewish population of 140,000. Unlike Belgium, Holland was placed under a civil administration, and unlike France, the country had no government of its own, since the cabinet, together with the royal family, had fled to London. The small nation was utterly at the mercy of the Germans and of the SS. Eichmann's advisor in Holland was a certain Willi Zopf, recently arrested in Germany, while a much more efficient advisor in France, Mr. Daneker, is still at large. But he apparently had very little to say, and could hardly do more than keep the Berlin office posted. Deportations and everything connected with them were handled by the lawyer Erich Rajakovitz, Eichmann's former legal advisor in Vienna and Prague, who was admitted to the SS upon Eichmann's recommendation. He had been sent to Holland by Heydrich in April 1941 and was directly responsible not to the RSHA in Berlin, 
but to the local head of the security service in The Hague, Dr. Wilhelm Harsten, who in turn was under the command of the higher SS and police leader Obergruppenführer Hans Rauter and his assistant in Jewish affairs, Ferdinand aus de Funten. Rauter and Funten were condemned to death by a Dutch court. Rauter was executed, and Funten's sentence, allegedly after special intervention from Adenauer, was commuted to life imprisonment. Harsten, too, was brought to trial in Holland, sentenced to twelve years' imprisonment, and released in 1957, whereupon he entered the civil service of the Bavarian state government. The Dutch authorities are considering proceedings against Rajakovic, who seems to live in either Switzerland or Italy. All these details have become known in the last year through the publication of Dutch documents and the report by E. Jakob, Dutch correspondent for the Basler National Zeitung, a Swiss newspaper. The prosecution in Jerusalem, partly because it wanted to build up Eichmann at all costs and partly because it got genuinely lost in the intricacies of German bureaucracy, claimed that all these officers had carried out Eichmann's orders. But the higher SS and police leaders took orders only directly from Himmler, and that Rajakovich was still taking orders from Eichmann at this time is highly unlikely, especially in view of what was then going to happen in Holland. The judgment, without engaging in polemics, quietly corrected a great number of errors made by the prosecution, though probably not all, and showed the constant jockeying for position that went on between the RSHA and the higher SS and police leaders and other offices, the tenacious, eternal, everlasting negotiations, as Eichmann called them. Eichmann had been especially upset by the arrangements in Holland, because it was clearly Himmler himself who was cutting him down to size, quite apart from the fact that the zeal of the gentlemen in residence created great difficulties for him in the timing of his own transports, and generally made a mockery of the importance of the coordinating centre in Berlin. Thus, right at the beginning, 20,000 instead of 15,000 Jews were deported, and Eichmann's Mr. Zopf, who was far inferior in rank as well as in position to all others present, was almost forced to speed up deportations in 1943. Conflicts of jurisdiction in these matters were to plague Eichmann at all times, and it was in vain that he explained to anybody who would listen that it would be contradictory to the order of the Reichsführer SS that is, Himmler, and illogical if at this stage other authorities again were to handle the Jewish problem. The last clash in Holland came in 1944, and this time even Kaltenbrunner tried to intervene for the sake of uniformity. In Holland, Sephardic Jews of Spanish origin had been exempted, although Jews of that origin had been sent to Auschwitz from Salonika. The judgment was in error when it ventured that the RSHA had the upper hand in this dispute. For God knows what reasons, some 370 Sephardic Jews remained unmolested in Amsterdam. The reason Himmler preferred to work in Holland through his higher SS and police leaders was simple. These men knew their way around the country, and the problem posed by the Dutch population was by no means an easy one. Holland had been the only country in all Europe where students went on strike when Jewish professors were dismissed and where a wave of strikes broke out in response to the first deportation of Jews to German concentration camps, and that deportation, in contrast to those to extermination camps, was merely a punitive measure taken long before the final solution had reached Holland. The Germans, as de Jong points out, were taught a lesson. From now on, the persecution was carried out not with the cudgels of the Nazi stormtroops, but by decrees published in Verodeningenblad, which the Jüdische Weekblad was forced to carry. Police raids in the streets no longer occurred, and there were no strikes on the part of the population. However, the widespread hostility in Holland toward anti-Jewish measures and the relative immunity of the Dutch people to anti-Semitism were held in check by two factors, which eventually proved fatal to the Jews. First, there existed a very strong Nazi movement in Holland— which could be trusted to carry out such police measures as seizing Jews, ferreting out their hiding places, and so on. Second, there existed an inordinately strong tendency among the native Jews to draw a line between themselves and the new arrivals, which was probably the result of the very unfriendly attitude of the Dutch government toward refugees from Germany, and probably also because anti-Semitism in Holland, just as in France, focused on foreign Jews. 
This made it relatively easy for the Nazis to form their Jewish council, the Judgerad, which remained for a long time under the impression that only German and other foreign Jews would be victims of the deportations. And it also enabled the SS to enlist, in addition to Dutch police units, the help of a Jewish police force. The result was a catastrophe unparalleled in any Western country. It can be compared only with the extinction and a vastly different and from the beginning completely desperate conditions of Polish Jewry. Although in contrast with Poland, the attitude of the Dutch people permitted a large number of Jews to go into hiding, 20 to 25,000, a very high figure for such a small country, yet an unusually large number of Jews living underground, at least half of them, were eventually found, no doubt through the efforts of professional and occasional informers. By July 1944, 113,000 Jews had been deported, most of them to Sobibor, a camp in the Lublin area of Poland by the River Bug, where no selections of able-bodied workers ever took place. Three-fourths of all Jews living in Holland were killed, about two-thirds of these native-born Dutch Jews. The last shipments left in the fall of 1944 when Allied patrols were at the Dutch borders. Of the 10,000 Jews who survived in hiding, about 75% were foreigners, a percentage that testifies to the unwillingness of Dutch Jews to face reality. At the Vonse conference, Martin Luther of the Foreign Office warned of great difficulties in the Scandinavian countries, notably in Norway and Denmark. Sweden was never occupied, and Finland, though in the war on the side of the Axis, was the one country the Nazis hardly ever even approached on the Jewish question. This surprising exception of Finland with some 2,000 Jews may have been due to Hitler's great esteem for the Finns, whom perhaps he did not want to subject to threats and humiliating blackmail. Luther proposed postponing evacuations from Scandinavia for the time being, and as far as Denmark was concerned, this really went without saying, since the country retained its independent government and was respected as a neutral state until the fall of 1943 although it, along with Norway, had been invaded by the German army in April 1940. There existed no fascist or Nazi movement in Denmark worth mentioning, and therefore no collaborators. In Norway, however, the Germans had been able to find enthusiastic supporters. Indeed, Vidkun Quisling, leader of the pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic Norwegian party, gave his name to what later became known as a Quisling government. The bulk of Norway's 1,700 Jews were stateless refugees from Germany. They were seized and interned in a few lightning operations in October and November 1942. When Eichmann's office ordered their deportation to Auschwitz, some of Quisling's own men resigned their government posts. This may not have come as a surprise to Mr. Luther and the Foreign Office, but what was much more serious, and certainly totally unexpected, was that Sweden immediately offered asylum, and sometimes even Swedish nationality, to all who were persecuted. Ernst von Wietzsacker, Under Secretary of State of the Foreign Office, who received the proposal, refused to discuss it, but the offer helped nevertheless. It is always relatively easy to get out of a country illegally, whereas it is nearly impossible to enter the place of refuge without permission and to dodge the immigration authorities. Hence, about 900 people, slightly more than half of the small Norwegian community, could be smuggled into Sweden. It was in Denmark, however, that the Germans found out how fully justified the Foreign Office's apprehensions had been. The story of the Danish Jews is sui generis, and the behaviour of the Danish people and their government was unique among all the countries of Europe, whether occupied, or a partner of the Axis, or neutral and truly independent. One is tempted to recommend the story as required reading in political science for all students who wish to learn something about the enormous power potential inherent in non-violent action and in resistance to an opponent possessing vastly superior means of violence. To be sure, a few other countries in Europe lacked proper understanding of the Jewish question, and actually a majority of them were opposed to radical and final solutions. Like Denmark, Sweden, Italy and Bulgaria proved to be nearly immune to anti-Semitism. But of the three that were in the German sphere of influence, only the Danes dared speak out on the subject to their German masters. Italy and Bulgaria sabotaged German orders and indulged in a complicated game of double-dealing and double-crossing, saving their Jews by a tour de force of sheer ingenuity— 
but they never contested the policy as such. That was totally different from what the Danes did. When the Germans approached them rather cautiously about introducing the yellow badge, they were simply told that the king would be the first to wear it, and the Danish government officials were careful to point out that anti-Jewish measures of any sort would cause their own immediate resignation. It was decisive in this whole matter that the Germans did not even succeed in introducing the vitally important distinction between native Danes of Jewish origin, of whom there were about 6,400, and the 1,400 German Jewish refugees who had found asylum in the country prior to the war and who now had been declared stateless by the German government. This refusal must have surprised the Germans no end, since it appeared so illogical for a government to protect people to whom it had categorically denied naturalization and even permission to work. Legally, the pre-war situation of refugees in Denmark was not unlike that in France, except that the general corruption in the Third Republic civil services enabled a few of them to obtain naturalization papers through bribes or connections, and most refugees in France could work illegally without a permit. But Denmark, like Switzerland, was no country pour se débrouiller. The Danes, however, explained to the German officials that because the stateless refugees were no longer German citizens, the Nazis could not claim them without Danish assent. This was one of the few cases in which statelessness turned out to be an asset, although it was, of course, not statelessness per se that saved the Jews, but, on the contrary, the fact that the Danish government had decided to protect them. Thus, none of the preparatory moves so important for the bureaucracy of murder could be carried out, and operations were postponed until the fall of 1943. What happened then was truly amazing. Compared with what took place in other European countries, everything went topsy-turvy. In August 1943, after the German offensive in Russia had failed, the Africa Corps had surrendered in Tunisia, and the Allies had invaded Italy— the Swedish government cancelled its 1940 agreement with Germany, which had permitted German troops the right to pass through the country. Thereupon, the Danish workers decided that they could help a bit in hurrying things up. Riots broke out in Danish shipyards, where the dock workers refused to repair German ships and then went on strike. The German military commander proclaimed a state of emergency and imposed martial law— and Himmler thought this was the right moment to tackle the Jewish question, whose solution was long overdue. What he did not reckon with was that, quite apart from Danish resistance, the German officials who'd been living in the country for years were no longer the same. Not only did General von Hanneken, the military commander, refuse to put troops at the disposal of the Reich plenipotentiary, Dr. Werner Best, the special SS units, Einsatzkommandos employed in Denmark, very frequently objected to the measures they were ordered to carry out by the central agencies, according to Best's testimony at Nuremberg. And Best himself, an old Gestapo man and former legal advisor to Heydrich, author of a then-famous book on the police, who'd worked for the military government in Paris to the entire satisfaction of his superiors, could no longer be trusted although it is doubtful that Berlin ever learned the extent of his unreliability. Still, it was clear from the beginning that things were not going well, and Eichmann's office sent one of its best men to Denmark, Rolf Gunther, whom no one had ever accused of not possessing the required ruthless toughness. Gunther made no impression on his colleagues in Copenhagen, and now von Hanneken refused even to issue a decree requiring all Jews to report for work. Best went to Berlin and obtained a promise that all Jews from Denmark would be sent to Theresienstadt, regardless of their category, a very important concession from the Nazis' point of view. The night of October 1 was set for their seizure and immediate departure. Ships were ready in the harbour, and since neither the Danes nor the Jews nor the German troops stationed in Denmark could be relied on to help, police units arrived from Germany for a door-to-door -door search. At the last moment, Best told them that they were not permitted to break into apartments because the Danish police might then interfere and they were not supposed to fight it out with the Danes. Hence, they could seize only those Jews who voluntarily opened their doors. They found exactly 477 people, out of a total of more than 7,800, at home and willing to let them in. A few days before the date of doom, a German shipping agent, Georg F. Duckwitz, having probably been tipped off by Best himself, 
had revealed the whole plan to Danish government officials, who in turn had hurriedly informed the heads of the Jewish community. They, in marked contrast to Jewish leaders in other countries, had then communicated the news openly in the synagogues on the occasion of the New Year services. The Jews had just time enough to leave their apartments and go into hiding, which was very easy in Denmark, because in the words of the judgment, all sections of the Danish people, from the king down to simple citizens, stood ready to receive them. They might have remained in hiding until the end of the war if the Danes had not been blessed with Sweden as a neighbour. It seemed reasonable to ship the Jews to Sweden, and this was done with the help of the Danish fishing fleet. The cost of transportation for people without means, about a hundred dollars per person, was paid largely by wealthy Danish citizens, and that was perhaps the most astounding feat of all, since this was a time when Jews were paying for their own deportation, when the rich among them were paying fortunes for exit permits, in Holland, Slovakia, and later in Hungary, either by bribing the local authorities or by negotiating legally with the SS, who accepted only hard currency and sold exit permits in Holland to the tune of five or ten thousand dollars per person. Even in places where Jews met with genuine sympathy and a sincere willingness to help, they had to pay for it, and the chances poor people had of escaping were nil. It took the better part of October to ferry all the Jews across the five to fifteen miles of water that separates Denmark from Sweden. The Swedes received 5,919 refugees, of whom at least 1,000 were of German origin, 1,310 were half-Jews, and 686 were non-Jews married to Jews. Almost half the Danish Jews seem to have remained in the country and survived the war in hiding. The non-Danish Jews were better off than ever before. They all received permission to work. The few hundred Jews whom the German police had been able to arrest were shipped to Theresienstadt. They were old or poor people who either had not received the news in time or had not been able to comprehend its meaning. In the ghetto, they enjoyed greater privileges than any other group because of the never-ending fuss made about them by Danish institutions and private persons. Forty-eight persons died, a figure that was not particularly high in view of the average age of the group. When everything was over, it was the considered opinion of Eichmann that, for various reasons, the action against the Jews in Denmark has been a failure, whereas the curious Dr. Best declared that the objective of the operation was not to seize a great number of Jews, but to clean Denmark of Jews, and this objective has now been achieved. Politically and psychologically, the most interesting aspect of this incident is perhaps the role played by the German authorities in Denmark, their obvious sabotage of orders from Berlin. It is the only case we know of in which the Nazis met with open native resistance, and the result seems to have been that those exposed to it changed their minds. They themselves apparently no longer looked upon the extermination of a whole people as a matter of course. They had met resistance based on principle, and their toughness had melted like butter in the sun. They'd even been able to show a few timid beginnings of genuine courage. But the ideal of toughness, except perhaps for a few half-demented brutes, was nothing but a myth of self-deception, concealing a ruthless desire for conformity at any price, was clearly revealed at the Nuremberg trials, where the defendants accused and betrayed each other and assured the world that they had always been against it, or claimed, as Eichmann was to do, that their best qualities had been abused by their superiors. In Jerusalem, he accused those in power of having abused his obedience. The subject of a good government is lucky. The subject of a bad government is unlucky. I had no luck. The atmosphere had changed, and although most of them must have known that they were doomed, not a single one of them had the guts to defend the Nazi ideology. Werner Best claimed at Nuremberg that he had played a complicated double role and that it was thanks to him that the Danish officials had been warned of the impending catastrophe. Documentary evidence showed, on the contrary, that he himself had proposed the Danish operation in Berlin, but he explained that this was all part of the game. He was extradited to Denmark and there condemned to death, but he appealed the sentence with surprising results. Because of new evidence... His sentence was commuted to five years in prison, from which he was released soon afterward. He must have been able to prove to the satisfaction of the Danish court that he really had done his best. Italy, 
was Germany's only real ally in Europe, treated as an equal and respected as a sovereign, independent state. The alliance presumably rested on the very highest kind of common interest, binding together two similar, if not identical, new forms of government, and it is true that Mussolini had once been greatly admired in German Nazi circles. But by the time war broke out, and Italy, after some hesitation, joined in the German enterprise, this was a thing of the past. The Nazis knew well enough that they had more in common with Stalin's version of communism than with Italian fascism, and Mussolini, on his part, had neither much confidence in Germany nor much admiration for Hitler. All this, however, belonged among the secrets of the higher-ups, especially in Germany, and the deep, decisive differences between the totalitarian and the fascist forms of government were never entirely understood by the world at large. Nowhere did they come more conspicuously into the open than in the treatment of the Jewish question. Prior to the Badoglio coup d'etat in the summer of 1943 and the German occupation of Rome and northern Italy, Eichmann and his men were not permitted to be active in the country. They were, however, confronted with the Italian way of not solving anything in the Italian-occupied areas of France, Greece and Yugoslavia because the persecuted Jews kept escaping into these zones where they could be sure of temporary asylum. On levels much higher than Eichmann's, Italy's sabotage of the final solution had assumed serious proportions, chiefly because of Mussolini's influence on other fascist governments in Europe, on Pétain's in France, on Horti's in Hungary, on Antonescu's in Romania, and even on Franco's in Spain. If Italy could get away with not murdering her Jews, German satellite countries might try to do the same. Thus, Dome Stohai, the Hungarian prime minister, whom the Germans had forced upon Horty, always wanted to know when it came to anti-Jewish measures if the same regulations applied to Italy. Eichmann's chief, Gruppenführer Müller, wrote a long letter on the subject to the Foreign Office, pointing all this out. But the gentlemen of the Foreign Office could not do much about it, because they always met the same subtly veiled resistance, the same promises, and the same failures to fulfil them. The sabotage was all the more infuriating as it was carried out openly in an almost mocking manner. The promises were given by Mussolini himself or other high-ranking officials, and if the generals simply failed to fulfil them, Mussolini would make excuses for them on the ground of their different intellectual formation. Only occasionally would the Nazis be met with a flat refusal, as when General Roata declared that it was incompatible with the honour of the Italian army to deliver the Jews from Italian-occupied territory in Yugoslavia to the appropriate German authorities. It could be considerably worse when Italians seemed to be fulfilling their promises. One instance of this took place after the Allied landing in French North Africa, when all of France was occupied by the Germans except the Italian zone in the south, where about 50,000 Jews had found safety. Under considerable German pressure, an Italian Commissariat for Jewish Affairs was established, whose sole function was to register all Jews in this region and expel them from the Mediterranean coast. 22,000 Jews were indeed seized and removed to the interior of the Italian zone, with the result, according to Reitlinger, that a thousand Jews of the poorest class were living in the best hotels of Isar and Savoy. Eichmann thereupon sent Alois Brunner, one of his toughest men, down to Nice and Marseille. But by the time he arrived, the French police had destroyed all the lists of the registered Jews. In the fall of 1943, when Italy declared war on Germany, the German army could finally move into Nice, and Eichmann himself hastened to the Côte d'Azur. There he was told, and believed, that between ten and fifteen thousand Jews were living in hiding in Monaco, that tiny principality with some twenty-five thousand residents altogether, whose territory, the New York Times magazine noted, could fit comfortably inside Central Park, which caused the RSHA to start a kind of research program. It sounds like a typically Italian joke. The Jews, in any event, were no longer there. They had fled to Italy proper, and those who were still hiding in the surrounding mountains found their way to Switzerland or to Spain. The same thing happened when the Italians had to abandon their zone in Yugoslavia. The Jews left with the Italian army and found refuge in Fiume. An element of farce had never been lacking even in Italy's most serious efforts to adjust to its powerful friend and ally. 
When Mussolini, under German pressure, introduced anti-Jewish legislation in the late 30s, he stipulated the usual exemptions, war veterans, Jews with high decorations and the like, but he added one more category, namely former members of the fascist party, together with their parents and grandparents, their wives and children and grandchildren. I know of no statistics relating to this matter, but the result must have been that the great majority of Italian Jews were exempted. There can hardly have been a Jewish family without at least one member in the fascist party, for this happened at a time when Jews, like other Italians, had been flocking for almost twenty years into the fascist movement, since positions in the civil service were open only to members. And the few Jews who had objected to fascism on principle, socialists and communists chiefly, were no longer in the country. Even convinced Italian anti-Semites seemed unable to take the thing seriously, and Roberto Farinacci, head of the Italian anti-Semitic movement, had a Jewish secretary in his employ. To be sure, such things had happened in Germany, too. Eichmann mentioned, and there is no reason not to believe him, that there were Jews even among ordinary SS men. But the Jewish origin of people like Heydrich, Milk, and others was a highly confidential matter, known only to a handful of people, whereas in Italy these things were done openly and, as it were, innocently. The key to the riddle was, of course, that Italy actually was one of the few countries in Europe where all anti-Jewish measures were decidedly unpopular, since, in the words of Ciano, they raised a problem which fortunately did not exist. Assimilation, that much-abused word, was a sober fact in Italy, which had a community of not more than 50,000 native Jews, whose history reached back into the centuries of the Roman Empire. It was not an ideology, something one was supposed to believe in, as in all German-speaking countries, or a myth and an obvious self-deception, as notably in France. Italian fascism, not to be outdone in ruthless toughness, had tried to rid the country of foreign and stateless Jews prior to the outbreak of the war. This had never been much of a success because of the general unwillingness of the minor Italian officials to get tough, and when things had become a matter of life and death, they refused, under the pretext of maintaining their sovereignty, to abandon this part of their Jewish population. They put them instead into Italian camps, where they were quite safe until the Germans occupied the country. This conduct can hardly be explained by objective conditions alone, the absence of a Jewish question. For these foreigners naturally created a problem in Italy, as they did in every European nation-state, based upon the ethnic and cultural homogeneity of its population. What in Denmark was the result of an authentically political sense, an inbred comprehension of the requirements and responsibilities of citizenship and independence, for the Danes, the Jewish question was a political and not a humanitarian question, Leni Yahil, was in Italy the outcome of the almost automatic general humanity of an old and civilized people. Italian humanity, moreover, withstood the test of the terror that descended upon the people during the last year and a half of the war. In December 1943, the German Foreign Office addressed a formal request for help to Eichmann's boss, Müller, in view of the lack of zeal shown over the last months by Italian officials in the implementation of anti-Jewish measures recommended by the Duce, we of the Foreign Office deem it urgent and necessary that the implementation be supervised by German officials. Whereupon famous Jew killers from Poland, such as Odilo Globocznik, from the death camps in the Lublin area, were dispatched to Italy. Even the head of the military administration was not an army man, but a former governor of Polish Galicia, Gruppenführer Otto Wachter. This put an end to practical jokes. Eichmann's office sent out a circular, advising its branches that Jews of Italian nationality would at once become subject to the necessary measures, and the first blow was to fall upon 8,000 Jews in Rome, who were to be arrested by German police regiments, since the Italian police were not reliable. They were warned in time frequently by old fascists, and 7,000 escaped. The Germans, yielding, as usual when they met resistance, now agreed that Italian Jews, even if they did not belong to exempted categories, should not be subject to deportation, but should merely be concentrated in Italian camps. This solution should be final enough for Italy. 
Approximately 35,000 Jews in northern Italy were caught and put into concentration camps near the Austrian border. In the spring of 1944, when the Red Army had occupied Romania and the Allies were about to enter Rome, the Germans broke their promise and began shipping Jews from Italy to Auschwitz, about 7,500 people, of whom no more than 600 returned. Still, this came to considerably less than 10% of all Jews then living in Italy. 11. Deportations from the Balkans Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Greece, Romania To those who followed the case for the prosecution and read the judgment, which reorganized its confused and confusing general picture, it came as a surprise that the line sharply distinguishing the Nazi-controlled territories to the east and southeast from the system of nation-states in Central and Western Europe was never mentioned. The belt of mixed population that stretches from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Adriatic in the south, the whole area, most of which today lies behind the Iron Curtain, then consisted of the so-called successor states, established by the victorious powers after the First World War. A new political order was granted to the numerous ethnic groups that had lived for centuries under the domination of empires, the Russian Empire in the north, the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the south, and the Turkish Empire in the southeast. Of the nation-states that resulted, none possessed anything even approaching the ethnic homogeneity of the old European nations that had served as models for their political constitutions. The result was that each of these countries contained large ethnic groups that were violently hostile to the ruling government because their own national aspirations had been frustrated in favour of their only slightly more numerous neighbours. If any proof of the political instability of these recently founded states had been needed, the case of Czechoslovakia amply provided it. When Hitler marched into Prague in March 1939, he was enthusiastically welcomed not only by the Sudetendeutschen, the German minority, but also by the Slovaks, whom he liberated by offering them an independent state. Exactly the same thing happened later in Yugoslavia, where the Serbian majority, the former rulers of the country, was treated as the enemy, and the Croatian minority was given its own national government. Moreover, because the populations in these regions fluctuated, there existed no natural or historical boundaries, and those that had been established by the treaties of Trianon and Saint-Germain were quite arbitrary. Hence, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria could be won as Axis partners by generous enlargements of their territories, and the Jews in these newly annexed areas were always denied the status of nationals. They automatically became stateless, and therefore suffered the same fate as the refugees in Western Europe. They were invariably the first to be deported and liquidated. What also came crashing down during these years was the elaborate system of minority treaties, whereby the Allies had vainly hoped to solve a problem that, within the political framework of the nation-state, is insoluble. The Jews were an officially recognized minority in all successor states, and this status had not been forced upon them, but had been the outcome of claims entered and negotiations conducted by their own delegates to the Versailles Peace Conference. This had marked an important turning point in Jewish history, because it was the first time that Western or assimilated Jews had not been recognized as the spokesmen for the whole Jewish people. To the surprise and also sometimes to the dismay of the Western-educated Jewish notables, it had turned out that the large majority of the people desired some sort of social and cultural, though not political, autonomy. Legally, the status of the Eastern European Jews was just like that of any other minority, but politically, and this was to be decisive, they were the only ethnic group in the region without a homeland, that is, without a territory in which they formed the majority of the population. Still, they did not live in the same kind of dispersion as their brethren in Western and Central Europe, and whereas there, prior to Hitler, it had been a sign of anti-Semitism to call a Jew a Jew, Eastern European Jews were recognized by friend and foe alike as a distinct people. This was a great consequence for the status of those Jews in the East who were assimilated, making it utterly different from that in the West, where assimilation in one form or another had been the rule. The great body of middle-class Jews so characteristic of Western and Central Europe did not exist in the East. 
In its stead, we find a thin layer of upper-middle-class families who actually belong to the ruling classes, and the degree of whose assimilation through money, through baptism, through intermarriage to Gentile society was infinitely greater than that of most Jews in the West. Among the first countries in which the executors of the final solution were confronted with these conditions was the puppet state of Croatia in Yugoslavia, whose capital was Zagreb. The Croat government, headed by Dr. Ante Pavlic, very obligingly introduced anti-Jewish legislation three weeks after its establishment, and when asked what was to be done with the few dozen Croat Jews in Germany, it sent word that they would appreciate deportation to the east. The Reich Minister of the Interior demanded that the country be Judenrein by February 1942, and Eichmann sent Hauptsturmführer Franz Abromeit to work with the German police attaché in Zagreb. The deportations were carried out by the Croats themselves, notably by members of the strong fascist movement, the Ostasche, and the Croats paid the Nazis 30 marks for each Jew deported. In exchange, they received all the property of the deportees. This was in accordance with the Germans' official territorial principle, applicable to all European countries, whereby the state inherited the property of every murdered Jew who had resided within its boundaries, regardless of his nationality. The Nazis did not by any means always respect the territorial principle. There were many ways to get around it if it seemed worth the trouble. German businessmen could buy directly from the Jews before they were deported, and the Einsatzstab Rosenberg, initially empowered to confiscate all Hebraica and Judaica for German anti-Semitic research centers, soon enlarged its activities to include valuable furnishings and artworks. The original deadline of February 1942 could not be met, because Jews were able to escape from Croatia to Italian-occupied territory. But after the Badoglio coup, Hermann Krumi, another of Eichmann's men, arrived in Zagreb, and by the fall of 1943, 30,000 Jews had been deported to the killing centers. Only then did the Germans realize that the country was still not Judenrein. In the initial anti-Jewish legislation, they had noted a curious paragraph that transformed into honorary Aryans all Jews who made contributions to the Croat cause. The number of these Jews had, of course, greatly increased during the intervening years. The very rich, in other words, who parted voluntarily with their property, were exempted. Even more interesting was the fact that the SS Intelligence Service under Sturmbannführer Wilhelm Hottel, who was first called as a defense witness in Jerusalem but whose affidavit was then used by the prosecution, had discovered that nearly all members of the ruling clique in Croatia, from the head of the government to the leader of the Ustache, were married to Jewish women. The 1,500 survivors among the Jews in this area, 5%, according to a Yugoslav government report, were clearly all members of this highly assimilated and extraordinarily rich Jewish group. And since the percentage of assimilated Jews among the masses in the East has often been estimated at about 5%, it is tempting to conclude that assimilation in the East, when it was at all possible, offered a much better chance for survival than it did in the rest of Europe. Matters were very different in the adjoining territory of Serbia, where the German occupation army, almost from its first day there, had to contend with a kind of partisan warfare that can be compared only with what went on in Russia behind the front. I mentioned earlier the single incident that connected Eichmann with the liquidation of Jews in Serbia. The judgment admitted that the ordinary lines of command in dealing with the Jews of Serbia did not become quite clear to us, and the explanation is that Eichmann's office was not involved at all in that area because no Jews were deported. The problem was all taken care of on the spot. On the pretext of executing hostages taken in partisan warfare, the army killed the male Jewish population by shooting. Women and children were handed over to the commander of the security police, a certain Dr. Emmanuel Schaefer, a special protégé of Heydrich, who killed him in gas vans. In August 1942, Staatsrat Harald Turner, head of the civilian branch of the military government, reported proudly that Serbia was the only country in which the problems of both Jews and gypsies were solved, and returned the gas fans to Berlin. An estimated 5,000 Jews joined the partisans, and this was the only avenue of escape. Schaefer had to stand trial in a German criminal court after the war. 
For the gassing of 6,280 women and children, he was sentenced to six years and six months in prison. The military governor of the region, General Franz Burma, committed suicide, but Staatsrat Turner was handed over to the Yugoslav government and condemned to death. It is the same story repeated over and over again. Those who escaped the Nuremberg trials and were not extradited to the countries where they had committed their crimes either were never brought to justice or found in the German courts the greatest possible understanding. One is unhappily reminded of the Weimar Republic, whose specialty it was to condone political murder if the killer belonged to one of the violently anti-Republican groups of the right. Bulgaria had more cause than any other of the Balkan countries to be grateful to Nazi Germany because of the considerable territorial aggrandizement she received at the expense of Romania, Yugoslavia and Greece. And yet Bulgaria was not grateful. Neither her government nor her people were soft enough to make a policy of ruthless toughness workable. This showed not only on the Jewish question. The Bulgarian monarchy had no reason to be worried about the native fascist movement, the Ratnitsi, because it was numerically small and politically without influence, and the parliament remained a highly respected body which worked smoothly with the king. Hence they dared refuse to declare war on Russia, and never even sent a token expeditionary force of volunteers to the Eastern Front. But most surprising of all, in the belt of mixed populations where anti-Semitism was rampant among all ethnic groups and had become official governmental policy long before Hitler's arrival, the Bulgarians had no understanding of the Jewish problem whatever. It is true that the Bulgarian army had agreed to have all the Jews, they numbered about 15,000, deported from the newly annexed territories, which were under military government and whose population was anti-Semitic, but it is doubtful that they knew what resettlement in the East actually signified. Somewhat earlier, in January 1941, the government had also agreed to introduce some anti-Jewish legislation, but that, from the Nazi viewpoint, was simply ridiculous. Some 6,000 able-bodied men were mobilized for work. All baptized Jews, regardless of the date of their conversion, were exempted, with the result that an epidemic of conversions broke out, 5,000 more Jews, out of a total of approximately 50,000, received special privileges. And for Jewish physicians and businessmen, a numerous clauses was introduced that was rather high, since it was based on the percentage of Jews in the cities rather than in the country at large. When these measures had been put into effect, Bulgarian government officials declared publicly that things were now stabilized to everybody's satisfaction. Clearly, the Nazis would not only have to enlighten them about the requirements for a solution of the Jewish problem, but also to teach them that legal stability and a totalitarian movement could not be reconciled. The German authorities must have had some suspicion of the difficulties that lay ahead. In January 1942, Eichmann wrote a letter to the Foreign Office in which he declared that sufficient possibilities exist for the reception of Jews from Bulgaria. He proposed that the Bulgarian government be approached and assured the Foreign Office that the police attaché in Sofia would take care of the technical implementation of the deportation. This police attaché seems not to have been very enthusiastic about his work either, for shortly thereafter Eichmann sent one of his own men, Theodor Danneke, from Paris to Sofia as advisor. It is quite interesting to note that this letter ran directly contrary to the notification Eichmann had sent to Serbia only a few months earlier, stating that no facilities for the reception of Jews were yet available, and that even Jews from the Reich could not be deported. The high priority given to the task of making Bulgaria Judenrein can be explained only by Berlin's having received accurate information that great speed was necessary then in order to achieve anything at all. Well, the Bulgarians were approached by the German embassy, but not until about six months later did they take the first step in the direction of radical measures, the introduction of the Jewish badge. For the Nazis, even this turned out to be a great disappointment. In the first place, as they dutifully reported, the badge was only a very little star. Second, most Jews simply did not wear it. And third, those who did wear it received so many manifestations of sympathy from the misled population that they actually are proud of their sign. As Walter Schellenberg, chief of counterintelligence in the RSHA, wrote in an SD report transmitted to the Foreign Office in November 1942, whereupon the Bulgarian government revoked the decree. 
Under great German pressure, the Bulgarian government finally decided to expel all Jews from Sofia to rural areas. But this measure was definitely not what the Germans demanded, since it dispersed the Jews instead of concentrating them. This expulsion actually marked an important turning point in the whole situation, because the population of Sofia tried to stop Jews from going to the railroad station, and subsequently demonstrated before the king's palace. The Germans were under the illusion that King Boris was primarily responsible for keeping Bulgaria's Jews safe, and it is reasonably certain that German intelligence agents murdered him. But neither the death of the monarch nor the arrival of Danneker early in 1943 changed the situation in the slightest, because both Parliament and the population remained clearly on the side of the Jews. Danneker succeeded in arriving at an agreement with the Bulgarian Commissar for Jewish Affairs to deport 6,000 leading Jews to Treblinka, but none of these Jews ever left the country. The agreement itself is noteworthy because it shows that the Nazis had no hope of enlisting the Jewish leadership for their own purposes. The chief rabbi of Sofia was unavailable, having been hidden by Metropolitan Stefan of Sofia, who had declared publicly that God had determined the Jewish fate and men had no right to torture Jews and to persecute them, Hilberg, which was considerably more than the Vatican had ever done. Finally, the same thing happened in Bulgaria, as was to happen in Denmark a few months later. The local German officials became unsure of themselves and were no longer reliable. This was true of both the police attaché, a member of the SS, who was supposed to round up and arrest the Jews, and the German ambassador in Sofia, Adolf Beckerl, who in June 1943 had advised the Foreign Office that the situation was hopeless because the Bulgarians had lived for too long with peoples like Armenians, Greeks and Gypsies to appreciate the Jewish problem, which of course was sheer nonsense, since the same could be said mutatis mutandis for all countries of Eastern and Southeastern Europe. It was Beckerl, too, who informed the RSHA in a clearly irritated tone that nothing more could be done. And the result was that not a single Bulgarian Jew had been deported or had died an unnatural death when, in August 1944, with the approach of the Red Army, the anti-Jewish laws were revoked. I know of no attempt to explain the conduct of the Bulgarian people, which is unique in the belt of mixed populations. But one is reminded of Georgi Dimitrov, a Bulgarian communist who happened to be in Germany when the Nazis came to power and whom they chose to accuse of the Reichstag brand, the mysterious fire in the Berlin Parliament of February 27, 1933. He was tried by the German Supreme Court and confronted with Goring, whom he questioned as though he were in charge of the proceedings. And it was thanks to him that all those accused, except van der Lubbe, had to be acquitted. His conduct was such that it won him the admiration of the whole world, Germany not excluded. There is one man left in Germany, people used to say, and he is a Bulgarian. Greece, being occupied in the north by the Germans and in the south by the Italians, offered no special problems and could therefore be left waiting her turn to become Judenrein. In February 1943, two of Eichmann's specialists, Hauptsturmführers Dieter Wislitzeni and Alois Brunner, arrived to prepare everything for the deportation of the Jews from Salonika, where two-thirds of Greek Jewry, approximately 55,000 people, were concentrated. This was according to plan, within the framework of the final solution of the Jewish problem in Europe, as their letter of appointment from 4B4 had it. Working closely with a certain Kriegsverwaltungsrat, Dr. Max Merton, who represented the military government of the region, they immediately set up the usual Jewish council, with Chief Rabbi Koretz at its head. Wislitzeni, who headed the Sonderkommando for Juden Angelenheiten in Salonika, introduced the yellow badge and promptly made it known that no exemptions would be tolerated. Dr. Merton moved the whole Jewish population into a ghetto, from which they could easily be removed since it was near the railroad station. The only privileged categories were Jews with foreign passports, and, as usual, the personnel of the Judenrat, not more than a few hundred persons all told, who were eventually shipped to the exchange camp of Bergen-Belsen. There was no avenue of escape except flight to the south, where the Italians, as elsewhere, refused to hand Jews over to the Germans, and the safety in the Italian zone was short-lived. The Greek population was indifferent at best, and even some of the partisan groups looked upon the operations with approval. 
Within two months, the whole community had been deported. Trains for Auschwitz, leaving almost daily, carrying from 2,000 to 2,500 Jews each in freight cars. In the fall of the same year, when the Italian army had collapsed, evacuation of some 13,000 Jews from the southern part of Greece, including Athens and the Greek islands, was swiftly completed. In Auschwitz, many Greek Jews were employed in the so-called death commandos, which operated the gas chambers and the crematoria, and they were still alive in 1944 when the Hungarian Jews were exterminated and the Lodz ghetto was liquidated. At the end of that summer, when rumour had it that the gassing would soon be terminated and the installations dismantled, one of the very few revolts in any of the camps broke out. The death commandos were certain that now they too would be killed. The revolt was a complete disaster. Only one survivor remained to tell the story. It would seem that the indifference of the Greeks to the fate of their Jews has somehow survived their liberation. Dr. Merton, a witness for the defence in Eichmann's trial, today, somewhat inconsistently, claims both to have known nothing and to have saved the Jews from the fate of which he was ignorant. He quietly returned to Greece after the war as a representative of a travel agency. He was arrested, but was soon released and allowed to return to Germany. His case is perhaps unique, since trials for war crimes in countries other than Germany have always resulted in severe punishment. And his testimony for the defence, which he gave in Berlin in the presence of representatives of both the defence and the prosecution, was certainly unique. He claimed that Eichmann had been very helpful in an attempt to save some 20,000 women and children in Salonika, and that all the evil had come from Wislitzeny. However, he eventually stated that before testifying he had been approached by Eichmann's brother, a lawyer in Linz, and by a German organisation of former members of the SS. Eichmann himself denied everything. He had never been in Salonika, and he had never seen the helpful Dr. Merton. Eichmann claimed more than once that his organisational gifts, the coordination of evacuations and deportations achieved by his office, had in fact helped his victims. It had made their fate easier. If this thing had to be done at all, he argued, it was better that it be done in good order. During the trial, no one, not even counsel for the defence, paid any attention to this claim, which was obviously in the same category as his foolish and stubborn contention that he had saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of Jews through forced emigration. And yet, in the light of what took place in Romania, one begins to wonder. Here, too, everything was topsy-turvy, but not as in Denmark, where even the men of the Gestapo began sabotaging orders from Berlin— in Romania, even the SS were taken aback and occasionally frightened by the horrors of old-fashioned spontaneous pogroms on a gigantic scale. They often intervened to save Jews from sheer butchery, so that the killing could be done in what, according to them, was a civilised way. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that Romania was the most anti-Semitic country in pre-war Europe. Even in the 19th century, Romanian anti-Semitism was a well-established fact. In 1878, the great powers had tried to intervene through the Treaty of Berlin and to get the Romanian government to recognize its Jewish inhabitants as Romanian nationals, though they would have remained second-class citizens. They did not succeed, and at the end of the First World War, all Romanian Jews, with the exception of a few hundred Sephardic families and some Jews of German origin, were still resident aliens. It took the whole might of the Allies during the peace treaty negotiations to persuade the Romanian government to accept a minority treaty and to grant the Jewish minority citizenship. This concession to world opinion was withdrawn in 1937 and 1938, when, trusting in the power of Hitler Germany, the Romanians felt they could risk denouncing the minority treaties as an imposition upon their sovereignty— and could deprive several hundred thousand Jews, roughly a quarter of the total Jewish population, of their citizenship. Two years later, in August 1940, some months prior to Romania's entry into the war on the side of Hitler, Germany, Marshal Ion Antonescu, head of the new Iron God dictatorship, declared all Romanian Jews to be stateless, with the exception of the few hundred families who had been Romanian citizens before the peace treaties. That same month, he also instituted anti-Jewish legislation that was the severest in Europe, Germany not excluded. 
The privileged categories, war veterans and Jews who had been Romanians prior to 1918, comprised no more than 10,000 people, hardly more than 1% of the whole group. Hitler himself was aware that Germany was in danger of being outdone by Romania, and he complained to Goebbels in August 1941, a few weeks after he had given the order for the final solution, that a man like Antonescu proceeds in these matters in a far more radical fashion than we have done up to the present. Romania entered the war in February 1941, and the Romanian Legion became a military force to be reckoned with in the coming invasion of Russia. In Odessa alone, Romanian soldiers were responsible for the massacre of 60,000 people. In contrast to the governments of other Balkan countries, the Romanian government had very exact information from the very beginning about the massacres of Jews in the East, and Romanian soldiers, even after the Iron Guard had been ousted from the government in the summer of 1941, embarked upon a program of massacres and deportations that even dwarfed the Bucharest outburst of the Iron Guard in January of the same year, a program that for sheer horror is unparalleled in the whole atrocity-stricken record. Hilberg. Deportation Romanian style consisted in herding 5,000 people into freight cars and letting them die there of suffocation while the train travelled through the countryside without plan or aim for days on end. A favourite follow-up to these killing operations was to expose the corpses in Jewish butcher shops. Also, the horrors of Romanian concentration camps, which were established and run by the Romanians themselves because deportation to the East was not feasible, were more elaborate and more atrocious than anything we know of in Germany. When Eichmann sent the customary advisor on Jewish affairs, Hauptsturmführer Gustav Richter, to Bucharest, Richter reported that Antonescu now wished to ship 110,000 Jews into two forests across the river Burg, that is, into German-held Russian territory, for liquidation. The Germans were horrified, and everybody intervened. The army commanders, Rosenberg's Ministry for Occupied Eastern Territories, the Foreign Office in Berlin, the Minister to Bucharest, Freiherr Manfred von Killinger. The last a former high SA officer, a personal friend of Rums, and therefore suspect in the eyes of the SS, was probably spied upon by Richter, who advised him on Jewish affairs. On this matter, however, they were all in agreement. Eichmann himself implored the Foreign Office in a letter dated April 1942 to stop these unorganized and premature Romanian efforts to get rid of the Jews at this stage. The Romanians must be made to understand that the evacuation of German Jews, which is already in full swing, had priority, and he concluded by threatening to bring the security police into action. However reluctant the Germans were to give Romania a higher priority in the final solution that had originally been planned for any Balkan country, they had to come around if they did not want the situation to deteriorate into bloody chaos— and much as Eichmann may have enjoyed his threat to use the security police, the saving of Jews was not exactly what they had been trained for. Hence, in the middle of August, by which time the Romanians had killed close to 300,000 of their Jews, mostly without any German help, the Foreign Office concluded an agreement with Antonescu for the evacuation of Jews from Romania to be carried out by German units and Eichmann began negotiations with the German railroads for enough cars to transport 200,000 Jews to the Lublin death camps. But now, when everything was ready and these great concessions had been granted, the Romanians suddenly did an about-face. Like a bolt from the blue, a letter arrived in Berlin from the trusted Mr. Richter. Marshal Antonescu had changed his mind. As Ambassador Killinger reported, the marshal now wanted to get rid of Jews in a comfortable manner. What the Germans had not taken into account was that this was not only a country with an inordinately high percentage of plain murderers, but that Romania was also the most corrupt country in the Balkans. Side by side with the massacres, there had sprung up a flourishing business in exemption sales, in which every branch of the bureaucracy, national or municipal, had happily engaged. The government's own specialty was huge taxes— which were levied haphazardly upon certain groups or whole communities of Jews. Now it had discovered that one could sell Jews abroad for hard currency, so the Romanians became the most fervent adherents of Jewish emigration at $1,300 a head. 
This is how Romania came to be one of the few outlets for Jewish emigration to Palestine during the war. And as the Red Army drew nearer, Antonescu became even more moderate. He now was willing to let Jews go without any compensation. It is a curious fact that Antonescu, from beginning to end, was not more radical than the Nazis, as Hitler thought, but simply always a step ahead of German developments. He had been the first to deprive all Jews of nationality, and he had started large-scale massacres, openly and unashamedly, at a time when the Nazis were still busy trying out their first experiments. He had hit upon the sales idea more than a year before Himmler offered blood for trucks, and he ended, as Himmler finally did, by calling the whole thing off as though it had been a joke. In August 1944, Romania surrendered to the Red Army, and Eichmann, specialist in evacuation, was sent pell-mell to the area in order to save some ethnic Germans, without success. About half of Romania's 850,000 Jews survived, a great number of whom, several hundred thousand, found their way to Israel. Nobody knows how many Jews are left in the country today. The Romanian murderers were all duly executed, and Killinger committed suicide before the Russians could lay their hands on him. Only Hauptsturmführer A.D. Richter, who it is true had never had a chance to get into the act, lived peacefully in Germany until 1961, when he became a belated victim of the Eichmann trial. 12. Deportations from Central Europe, Hungary and Slovakia Hungary, mentioned earlier in connection with the troublesome question of Eichmann's conscience, was constitutionally a kingdom without a king. The country, though without access to the sea and possessing neither navy nor merchant fleet, was ruled, or rather held in trust for the non-existent king, by an admiral, regent or Reichsverweser Nikolaus von Horty. The only visible sign of royalty was an abundance of Hofrater, councillors to the non-existent court. Once upon a time, the Holy Roman Emperor had been king of Hungary, and more recently, after 1806, the kaiserlich Königliche monarchy on the Danube had been precariously held together by the Habsburgs, who were emperors, Kaiser, of Austria, and kings of Hungary. In 1918, the Habsburg Empire had been dissolved into successor states, and Austria was now a republic, hoping for Anschluss, for union with Germany. Otto von Habsburg was in exile, and he would never have been accepted as king of Hungary by the fiercely nationalistic Magyars. An authentically Hungarian royalty, on the other hand, did not even exist as a historical memory. So what Hungary was, in terms of recognized forms of government, only Admiral Horty knew. Behind the delusions of royal grandeur was an inherited feudal structure, with greater misery among the landless peasants and greater luxury among the few aristocratic families who literally owned the country than anywhere else in these poverty-stricken territories, the homeland of Europe's stepchildren. It was this background of unsolved social questions and general backwardness that gave Budapest society its specific flavour, as though Hungarians were a group of illusionists who had fed so long on self-deception that they'd lost any sense of incongruity. Early in the thirties, under the influence of Italian fascism, they had produced a strong fascist movement, the so-called Arrow Cross Men, and in 1938 they followed Italy, bypassing their first anti-Jewish legislation. Despite the strong influence of the Catholic Church in the country, the rulings applied to baptized Jews who had been converted after 1919, and even those converted before that date were included three years later. And yet when an all-inclusive anti-Semitism based on race had become official government policy, eleven Jews continued to sit in the upper chamber of the parliament, and Hungary was the only Axis country to send Jewish troops, 130,000 of them, in auxiliary service but in Hungarian uniform, to the Eastern Front. The explanation of these inconsistencies is that the Hungarians, their official policy notwithstanding, were even more emphatic than other countries in distinguishing between native Jews and Ostjuden, between the Magyarized Jews of Trianon, Hungary, established like the other successor states by the Treaty of Trianon, and those of recently annexed territories. Hungary's sovereignty was respected by the Nazi government until March 1944, with the result that for Jews the country became an island of safety in an ocean of destruction. While it is understandable enough that, 
with the Red Army approaching through the Carpathian Mountains and the Hungarian government desperately trying to follow the example of Italy and conclude a separate armistice, the German government should have decided to occupy the country. It is almost incredible that at this stage of the game it should still have been the order of the day to come to grips with the Jewish problem, the liquidation of which was a prerequisite for involving Hungary in the war, as Wiesenmeyer put it in a report to the Foreign Office in December 1943. For the liquidation of this problem involved the evacuation of 800,000 Jews, plus an estimated 100 or 150,000 converted Jews. Be that as it may, as I've said earlier, because of the greatness and the urgency of the task, Eichmann arrived in Budapest in March 1944 with his whole staff, which he could easily assemble since the job had been finished everywhere else. He called Vislitseni and Brunner from Slovakia and Greece, Abramite from Yugoslavia, Danneke from Paris and Bulgaria, Siegfried Seidel from his post as commander of Theresienstadt, and from Vienna, Hermann Krumi, who became his deputy in Hungary. From Berlin, he brought all the more important members of his office staff, Rolf Gunther, who had been his chief deputy, Franz Novak, his deportation officer, and Otto Hunscher, his legal expert. Thus, the Zonderein Satz Kommando Eichmann, Eichmann's special operation unit, consisted of about ten men, plus some clerical assistants, when it set up its headquarters in Budapest. On the very evening of their arrival, Eichmann and his men invited the Jewish leaders to a conference to persuade them to form a Jewish council, through which they could issue their orders, and to which they would give in return absolute jurisdiction over all Jews in Hungary. This was no easy trick at this moment and in that place. It was a time when, in the words of the papal nuncio, the whole world knew what deportation meant in practice. In Budapest, moreover, the Jews had had a unique opportunity to follow the fate of European Jewry. We knew very well about the work of the Einsatzgruppen. We knew more than was necessary about Auschwitz, as Dr. Kastner was to testify at Nuremberg. Clearly, more than Eichmann's allegedly hypnotic powers was needed to convince anyone that the Nazis would recognize the sacred distinction between Magyarized and Eastern Jews. Self-deception had to have been developed to a high art to allow Hungarian Jewish leaders to believe at this moment that it can't happen here. How can they send the Jews of Hungary outside Hungary and to keep believing it even when the realities contradicted this belief every day of the week? How this was achieved came to light at one of the most remarkable non-sequiturs uttered on the witness stand. The future members of the Central Jewish Committee, as the Jewish Council was called in Hungary, had heard from neighbouring Slovakia that Vislitseni, who was now negotiating with them, accepted money readily, and they also knew that despite all bribes he had deported all the Jews in Slovakia, from which Mr. Freudiger concluded... I understood that it was necessary to find ways and means to establish relationships with Vitslitseni. Eichmann's cleverest trick in his difficult negotiations was to see to it that he and his men acted as though they were corrupt. The president of the Jewish community, Hofrat Samuel Steim, a member of Horty's Privy Council, was treated with exquisite courtesy and agreed to be head of the Jewish Council. He and the other members of the council felt reassured when they were asked to supply typewriters and mirrors, women's lingerie and eau de cologne, original wattos and eight pianos, even though seven of these were gracefully returned by Hauptsturmführer Novak, who remarked, But, gentlemen, I don't want to open a piano store. I only want to play the piano. Eichmann himself visited the Jewish library and the Jewish museum and assured everybody that all measures would be temporary. And corruption, first simulated as a trick, soon turned out to be real enough, though it did not take the form the Jews had hoped. Nowhere else did Jews spend so much money without any results whatever. In the words of the strange Mr. Kastner, a Jew who trembles for his life and that of his family loses all sense of money. This was confirmed during the trial through testimony given by Philip von Freudiger mentioned above, as well as through the testimony of Joel Brandt, who had represented a rival Jewish body in Hungary, the Zionist Relief and Rescue Committee. Krumi received no less than $250,000 from Freudiger in April 1944, and the Rescue Committee paid $20,000 merely for the privilege of meeting with Vislitseni and some men of the SS Counterintelligence Service. 
At this meeting, each of those present received an additional tip of a thousand dollars, and Vislitseni brought up again the so-called Europe Plan, which he had proposed in vain in 1942, and according to which Himmler supposedly would be prepared to spare all Jews except those in Poland for a ransom of two or three million dollars. On the strength of this proposal, which had been shelved long before, the Jews now started paying installments to Vislitseni. Even Eichmann's idealism broke down in this land of unheard-of abundance. The prosecution, though it could not prove that Eichmann had profited financially while on the job, stressed rightly his high standard of living in Budapest, where he could afford to stay at one of the best hotels, was driven around by a chauffeur in an amphibious car, an unforgettable gift from his later enemy Kurt Becher, went hunting and horseback riding, and enjoyed all sorts of previously unknown luxuries under the tutelage of his new friends in the Hungarian government. There existed, however, a sizable group of Jews in the country whose leaders, at least, indulged less in self-deception. The Zionist movement had always been particularly strong in Hungary, and it now had its own representation in the recently formed Relief and Rescue Committee, the Vadat Ezra Vahazala, which, maintaining close contact with the Palestine office, had helped refugees from Poland and Slovakia, from Yugoslavia and Romania. The committee was in constant communication with the American Joint Distribution Committee, which financed their work, and they had also been able to get a few Jews into Palestine, legally or illegally. Now that catastrophe had come to their own country, they turned to forging Christian papers, certificates of baptism, whose bearers found it easier to go underground. Whatever else they might have been, the Zionist leaders knew they were outlaws, and they acted accordingly. Joel Brand the unlucky emissary who was to present to the Allies in the midst of the war, Himmler's proposal to give them a million Jewish lives in exchange for 10,000 trucks, was one of the leading officials of the Relief and Rescue Committee, and he came to Jerusalem to testify about his dealings with Eichmann, as did his former rival in Hungary, Philipp von Freudiger. While Freudiger, whom Eichmann incidentally did not remember at all, recalled the rudeness with which he had been treated at these interviews, Brandt's testimony actually substantiated much of Eichmann's own account of how he had negotiated with the Zionists. Brandt had been told that an idealistic German was now talking to him, an idealistic Jew, two honourable enemies meeting as equals during a lull in the battle. Eichmann had said to him, "'Tomorrow perhaps we shall again be on the battlefield.' It was, of course, a horrible comedy— but it did go to show that Eichmann's weakness for uplifting phrases with no real meaning was not a pose fabricated expressly for the Jerusalem trial. What is more interesting, one cannot fail to note that in meeting with the Zionists, neither Eichmann nor any other member of the Zondereinsatz Kommando employed the tactics of sheer lying that they had used for the benefit of the gentlemen of the Jewish Council. Even language rules were suspended, and most of the time a spade was called a spade. Moreover, when it was a question of serious negotiations over the amount of money that might buy an exit permit, over the Europe plan, over the exchange of lives for trucks, not only Eichmann, but everybody concerned, Vislitseni, Becker, the gentleman of the counterintelligence service, whom Joel Brand used to meet every morning in a coffee house, turned to the Zionists as a matter of course. The reason for this was that the Relief and Rescue Committee possessed the required international connections and could more easily produce foreign currency, whereas the members of the Jewish Council had nothing behind them but the more than dubious protection of Regent Haughty. It also became clear that the Zionist functionaries in Hungary had received greater privileges than the usual temporary immunity to arrest and deportation granted the members of the Jewish Council. The Zionists were free to come and go practically as they pleased, they were exempt from wearing the Yellow Star, they received permits to visit concentration camps in Hungary, and somewhat later Dr. Kastner, the original founder of the Relief and Rescue Committee, could even travel about Nazi Germany without any identification papers showing he was a Jew. The organization of a Jewish council was for Eichmann, with all his experience in Vienna, Prague and Berlin, a routine matter that took no more than two weeks. The question now was whether he himself would be able to enlist the help of Hungarian officials for an operation of this magnitude. For him this was something new. In the ordinary course of events, it would have been handled for him by the Foreign Office and its representatives. 
In this instance, by the newly appointed Reich plenipotentiary, Dr. Edmund Fiesenmayer, to whom Eichmann would have sent a Jewish advisor. Eichmann himself clearly had no inclination for playing the role of advisor, a post that had nowhere carried a rank higher than Hauptsturmführer or captain, whereas he was an Obersturmbahnführer or lieutenant colonel, two ranks higher. His greatest triumph in Hungary was that he could establish his own contacts. Three men were primarily concerned, Laszlo Endre, who, because of an anti-Semitism that even Horty had called insane, had recently been appointed state secretary in charge of political, that is, Jewish, affairs in the Ministry of the Interior, Laszlo Baki, also an undersecretary in the Ministry of the Interior, who was in charge of the gendarmerie, the Hungarian police, and the police officer, Lieutenant Colonel Ferenczi, who was directly in charge of deportations. With their help, Eichmann could be sure that everything, the issuance of the necessary decrees and the concentration of the Jews in the provinces, would proceed with lightning speed. In Vienna, a special conference was held with the German state railroad officials, since this matter involved the transportation of nearly half a million people. Huss, at Auschwitz, was informed of the plans through his own superior, General Richard Glucks, of the WVHA, and ordered a new branch line of the railway built to bring the cars within a few yards of the crematoria. The number of death commandos manning the gas chambers was increased from 224 to 860, so that everything was ready for killing between 6,000 and 12,000 people a day. When the trains began arriving in May 1944, very few able-bodied men were selected for labour, and these few worked in Krupp's fuse factory at Auschwitz. Krupp's newly built factory near Breslau in Germany, the Bertewerk, collected Jewish manpower wherever it could find it and kept those men in conditions that were unsurpassed even among the labour gangs in the death camps. The whole operation in Hungary lasted less than two months, and came to a sudden stop at the beginning of July. Thanks chiefly to the Zionists, it had been better publicized than any other phase of the Jewish catastrophe, and Horty had been deluged with protest from neutral countries and from the Vatican. The papal nuncio, though, deemed it appropriate to explain that the Vatican's protest did not spring from a false sense of compassion, a phrase that is likely to be a lasting monument to what the continued dealings with and the desire to compromise with the men who preached the gospel of ruthless toughness had done to the mentality of the highest dignitaries of the Church. Sweden once more led the way with regard to practical measures by distributing entry permits, and Switzerland, Spain and Portugal followed her example, so that finally about 33,000 Jews were living in special houses in Budapest under the protection of neutral countries. The Allies had received and made public a list of 70 men whom they knew to be the chief culprits, and Roosevelt had sent an ultimatum threatening that Hungary's fate will not be like any other civilized nation unless the deportations are stopped. The point was driven home by an unusually heavy air raid on Budapest on July 2. Thus pressed from all sides, Horty gave the order to stop the deportations. And one of the most damning pieces of evidence against Eichmann was the rather obvious fact that he had not obeyed the old fool's order, but in mid-July deported another 1,500 Jews who were at hand in a concentration camp near Budapest. To prevent the Jewish officials from informing Horty, he assembled the members of the two representative bodies in his office, where Dr. Hunscher detained them on various pretexts, until he learned that the train had left Hungarian territory. Eichmann remembered nothing of this episode in Jerusalem, and although the judges were convinced that the accused remembers his victory over Horty very well, this is doubtful, since to Eichmann Horty was not such a great personage. This seems to have been the last train that left Hungary for Auschwitz. In August 1944, the Red Army was in Romania, and Eichmann was sent there on his wild goose chase. When he came back, the haughty regime had gathered sufficient courage to demand the withdrawal of the Eichmann commando, and Eichmann himself asked Berlin to let him and his men return, since they had become superfluous. But Berlin did nothing of the sort and was proved right, for in mid-October the situation once more changed abruptly. With the Russians no more than a hundred miles from Budapest, the Nazis succeeded in overthrowing the haughty government and in appointing the leader of the Arrow Crossmen, Ferenc Salazi, head of state. 
No more transports could be sent to Auschwitz, since the extermination facilities were about to be dismantled, while at the same time the German shortage of labor had grown even more desperate. Now it was Wiesenmeyer, the Reich plenipotentiary, who negotiated with the Hungarian Ministry of the Interior for permission to ship 50,000 Jews, men between 16 and 60 and women under 40, to the Reich. He added in his report that Eichmann hoped to send 50,000 more. Since railroad facilities no longer existed, this led to the foot marches of November 1944, which were stopped only by an order from Himmler. The Jews who were sent on the marches had been arrested at random by the Hungarian police, regardless of exemptions, to which by now many were entitled, regardless also of the age limits specified in the original directives. The marches were escorted by Arrow crossmen who robbed them and treated them with the utmost brutality. And that was the end. Of an original Jewish population of 800,000, some 160,000 must still have remained in the Budapest ghetto, the countryside was Judenrein, and of these tens of thousands became victims of spontaneous pogroms. On February 13, 1945, the country surrendered to the Red Army. The chief Hungarian culprits in the massacre were all put on trial, condemned to death, and executed. None of the German initiators, except Eichmann, paid with more than a few years in prison. Slovakia, like Croatia, was an invention of the German Foreign Office. The Slovaks had come to Berlin to negotiate their independence, even before the Germans occupied Czechoslovakia in March 1939, and at that time they'd promised Goring that they would follow Germany faithfully in their handling of the Jewish question. But this had been in the winter of 1938-39, when no one had yet heard of such a thing as the final solution. The tiny country, with a poor peasant population of about two and a half million and with 90,000 Jews, was primitive, backward, and deeply Catholic. It was ruled at the time by a Catholic priest, Father Josef Tieso. Even its fascist movement, the Hlinka Guard, was Catholic in outlook, and the vehement anti-Semitism of these clerical fascists, or fascist clerics, differed in both style and content from the ultra-modern racism of their German masters. There was only one modern anti-Semite in the Slovak government, and that was Eichmann's good friend Sano Mack, Minister of the Interior. All the others were Christians, or thought they were, whereas the Nazis were in principle, of course, as anti-Christian as they were anti-Jewish. The Slovaks being Christians meant not only that they felt obliged to emphasize what the Nazis considered an obsolete distinction between baptized and non-baptized Jews, but also that they thought of the whole issue in medieval terms. For them, a solution consisted in expelling the Jews and inheriting their property, but not in systematic exterminating, although they did not mind occasional killing. The greatest sin of the Jews was not that they belonged to an alien race, but that they were rich. The Jews in Slovakia were not very rich by Western standards, but when 52,000 of them had to declare their possessions because they owned more than $200 worth, and it turned out that their total property amounted to a hundred million dollars, every single one of them must have looked to the Slovaks like an incarnation of Croesus. During their first year and a half of independence, the Slovaks were busy trying to solve the Jewish question according to their own lights. They transferred the larger Jewish enterprises to non-Jews, enacted some anti-Jewish legislation, which according to the Germans had the basic defect of exempting baptized Jews who had been converted prior to 1918, planned to set up ghettos, following the example of the general government, and mobilize Jews for forced labor. Very early in September 1940, they had been given a Jewish advisor. Hauptsturm Führer Dieter Wislitzeni, once Eichmann's greatly admired superior and friend in the security service, his eldest son was named Dieter, and now his equal in rank, was attached to the German legation in Bratislava. Wislitzeni did not marry and therefore could not be promoted further, so a year later he was outranked by Eichmann and became his subordinate. Eichmann thought that this must have rankled with him, and that it helped explain why he had given such damning evidence against him as witness in the Nuremberg trials, and had even offered to find out his hiding place. But this is doubtful. Wislitzeni probably was interested only in saving his own skin. He was utterly unlike Eichmann. He belonged to the educated stratum of the SS, 
lived among books and records, had himself addressed as Baron by the Jews in Hungary, and generally was much more concerned with money than worried about his career. Consequently, he was one of the very first in the SS to develop moderate tendencies. Nothing much happened in Slovakia during these early years, until March 1942, when Eichmann appeared in Bratislava to negotiate the evacuation of 20,000 young and strong labor Jews. Four weeks later, Heydrich himself came to see the Prime Minister, Wojtek Tuka, and persuaded him to let all Jews be resettled in the East, including the converted Jews who had thus far been exempted. The government, with a priest at its head, did not at all mind correcting the basic defect of distinguishing between Christians and Jews on the grounds of religion when it learned that no claim was put forward by the Germans in regard to the property of these Jews except the payment of 500 Reichmarks in exchange for each Jew received. On the contrary, the government demanded an additional guarantee from the German Foreign Office that Jews removed from Slovakia and received by the Germans would stay in the eastern areas forever and would not be given an opportunity of returning to Slovakia. To follow up these negotiations on the highest level, Eichmann paid a second visit to Bratislava, the one that coincided with Heydrich's assassination, and by June 1942, 52,000 Jews had been deported by the Slovak police to the killing centers in Poland. There were still some 35,000 Jews left in the country, and they all belonged to the originally exempted categories, converted Jews and their parents, members of certain professions, young men in forced labor battalions, a few businessmen. It was at this moment, when most of the Jews had already been resettled, that the Bratislava Jewish Relief and Rescue Committee, a sister body of the Hungarian Zionist group, succeeded in bribing Vislit Saini, who promised to help to slow down the pace of the deportations, and also proposed the so-called Europe Plan, which he was to bring up again later in Budapest. It is very unlikely that Vislitsany ever did anything except read books and listen to music, and, of course, accept whatever he could get. But it was just at this moment that the Vatican informed the Catholic clergy of the true meaning of the word resettlement. From then on, as the German ambassador Hans Elard Ludin reported to the Foreign Office in Berlin, the deportations became very unpopular, and the Slovak government began pressing the Germans for permission to visit the resettlement centres, which, of course, neither Vislitseni nor Eichmann could grant, since the resettled Jews were no longer among the living. In December 1943, Dr. Edmund Wiesenmeyer came to Bratislava to see Father Tiso himself. He had been sent by Hitler, and his orders specified that he should tell Tiso to come down to earth, fraktor mit ihm reden. Tiso promised to put between 16 and 18,000 unconverted Jews in concentration camps, and to establish a special camp for about 10,000 baptized Jews, but he did not agree to deportations. In June 1944, Wiesenmeyer, now Reich Plenipotentiary in Hungary, appeared again, and demanded that the remaining Jews in the country be included in the Hungarian operations. Tiso refused again. In August 1944, as the Red Army drew near, a full-fledged revolt broke out in Slovakia, and the Germans occupied the country. By this time, Vislitseni was in Hungary, and he probably was no longer trusted anyway. The RSHA sent Alois Brunner to Bratislava to arrest and deport the remaining Jews. Brunner first arrested and deported the officials of the Relief and Rescue Committee, and then, this time with the help of German SS units, deported another twelve or 14,000 people. On April 4, 1945, when the Russians arrived in Bratislava, there were perhaps 20,000 Jews left who had survived the catastrophe. 13. The Killing Centers in the East When the Nazis spoke of the East, they meant a huge area that embraced Poland, the Baltic states, and occupied Russian territory. It was divided into four administrative units, the Wartegau, consisting of the Polish western regions annexed to the Reich and the Gauleiter Arte Greiser, the Ostland, including Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and the rather indefinite area of White Russia, with Riga as the seat of the occupation authorities, the General Government of Central Poland, under Hans Frank, and the Ukraine, under Alfred Rosenberg's Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories. These were the first countries on which testimony was presented in the case for the prosecution, 
and they were the last to be dealt with in the judgment. No doubt both the prosecution and the judges had excellent reasons for their opposite decisions. The East was the central scene of Jewish suffering, the gruesome terminal of all deportations, the place from which there was hardly ever any escape, and where the number of survivors rarely reached more than five percent. The East, moreover, had been the centre of the pre-war Jewish population in Europe. More than three million Jews had lived in Poland, 260,000 in the Baltic states, and more than half of the estimated three million Russian Jews in White Russia, the Ukraine, and the Crimea. Since the prosecution was interested primarily in the suffering of the Jewish people and the dimensions of the genocide attempted upon it, it was logical to start here and then see how much specific responsibility for this unmitigated hell could be blamed upon the accused. The trouble was that the evidence relating Eichmann to the East was scanty, and this was blamed on the fact that the Gestapo files, and particularly the files of Eichmann's section, had been destroyed by the Nazis. This scarcity of documentary evidence gave the prosecution a probably welcome pretext for calling an endless procession of witnesses to testify to events in the East, though this was hardly its only reason for doing so. The prosecution, as had been hinted during the trial but was fully described later in the special bulletin issued in April 1962 by Yad Vashem, the Israeli archive on the Nazi period, had been under considerable pressure from Israeli survivors, who constitute about 20% of the present population of the country. They had flocked spontaneously to the trial authorities and also to Yad Vashem, which had been officially commissioned to prepare some of the documentary evidence, to offer themselves as witnesses. The worst cases of strong imagination, people who had seen Eichmann at various places where he had never been, were weeded out. But 56 sufferings of the Jewish people witnesses, as the trial authorities called them, were finally put on the stand, instead of some 15 or 20 background witnesses as originally planned. 23 sessions out of a total of 121 were entirely devoted to background, which meant they had no apparent bearing upon the case. Though the witnesses for the prosecution were hardly ever cross-examined by either the defence or the judges, the judgment did not accept evidence that had bearing on Eichmann unless it was given some other corroboration. Thus the judges refused to charge Eichmann with the murder of the Jewish boy in Hungary, or with having instigated the Kristallnacht in Germany and Austria, of which he certainly knew nothing at the time, and even in Jerusalem knew considerably less than the least well-informed student of the period, or with the murder of ninety-three children of Lidice, who after Heydrich's assassination were deported to Lodz, since it has not been proved beyond reasonable doubt, according to the evidence before us, that they were murdered. Or, with responsibility for the hideous operations of Unit 1005, amongst the most horrifying parts of all the evidence submitted by the prosecution, which had had the task of opening the mass graves in the East and disposing of the corpses in order to efface all traces of slaughter, and was commanded by Standartenführer Paul Blobel, who, according to his own testimony at Nuremberg, took orders from Müller, the head of Section 4 of the RSHA. Or, with the dreadful conditions under which Jews left alive in the extermination camps, were evacuated to German concentration camps, especially to Bergen-Belsen during the last months of the war. The gist of the background witnesses' testimony about conditions in the Polish ghettos, about procedures in the various death camps, about forced labour, and generally the attempt to exterminate through labour, was never in dispute. On the contrary, there was hardly anything in what they told that had not been known before. If Eichmann's name was mentioned at all, it obviously was hearsay evidence, rumours testified to, hence without legal validity. The testimony of all witnesses who had seen him with their own eyes collapsed the moment a question was addressed to them, and the judgment found that the centre of gravity of his activities was within the Reich itself, the Protectorate, and in the countries of Europe to the West, North, South, Southeast, and Central Europe, that is, everywhere except in the East. Why then did the court not waive these hearings, which lasted for weeks and months on end? In discussing this question, the judgment was somewhat apologetic, and finally gave an explanation that was curiously inconsistent. Since the accused denied all the counts in the indictment, the judges could not dismiss evidence on the factual background. The accused, however, had never denied these facts in the indictment. He had only denied that he was responsible for them, in the sense of the indictment. 
Actually, the judges were faced with a highly unpleasant dilemma. At the very beginning of the trial, Dr. Servatius had impugned the impartiality of the judges. No Jew, in his opinion, was qualified to sit in judgment on the implementers of the final solution, and the presiding judge had replied, We are professional judges, used and accustomed to weighing evidence brought before us, and to doing our work in the public eye and subject to public criticism. When a court sits in judgment, the judges who compose it are human beings, are flesh and blood with feelings and senses, but they are obliged by the law to restrain those feelings and senses. Otherwise, no judge could ever be found to try a criminal case where his abhorrence might be aroused. It cannot be denied that the memory of the Nazi Holocaust stirs every Jew, but while this case is being tried before us, it will be our duty to restrain these feelings, and this duty we shall honour. Which was good and fair enough, unless Dr. Servatius meant to imply that Jews might lack a proper understanding of the problem their presence caused in the midst of the nations of the world, and hence would fail to appreciate a final solution of it. But the irony of the situation was that in case he had felt inclined to make this argument, he could have been answered that the accused, according to his own emphatically repeated testimony, had learned all he knew about the Jewish question from Jewish Zionist authors, from the basic books of Theodor Herzl and Adolf Bohm. Who then could be better qualified to try him than these three men who had all been Zionists since their early youth? It was not with respect to the accused then, but with respect to the background witnesses, that the fact of the Jewishness of the judges, of their living in a country where every fifth person was a survivor, became acute and troublesome. Mr. Hausner had gathered together a tragic multitude of sufferers, each of them eager not to miss this unique opportunity, each of them convinced of his right to his day in court. The judges might and did quarrel with the prosecutor about the wisdom and even the appropriateness of using the occasion for painting general pictures, but once a witness had taken the stand, it was difficult indeed to interrupt him, to cut short such testimony, because of the honour of the witness and because of the matters about which he speaks, as Judge Landau put it. Who were they, humanly speaking, to deny any of these people their day in court? And who would have dared, humanly speaking, to question their veracity as to detail, when they poured out their hearts as they stood in the witness box? even though what they had to tell could only be regarded as by-products of the trial. There was an additional difficulty. In Israel, as in most other countries, a person appearing in court is deemed innocent until proved guilty. But in the case of Eichmann, this was an obvious fiction. If he had not been found guilty before he appeared in Jerusalem, guilty beyond any reasonable doubt, the Israelis would never have dared or wanted to kidnap him. Prime Minister Ben-Gurion, explaining to the President of Argentina in a letter dated June 3, 1960, why Israel had committed a formal violation of Argentine law, wrote that it was Eichmann who organized the mass murder of six million of our people on a gigantic and unprecedented scale throughout Europe. In contrast to normal arrests in ordinary criminal cases, where suspicion of guilt must be proved to be substantial and reasonable, but not beyond reasonable doubt, that is, the task of the ensuing trial, Eichmann's illegal arrest could be justified, and was justified in the eyes of the world, only by the fact that the outcome of the trial could be safely anticipated. His role in the final solution, it now turned out, had been wildly exaggerated, partly because of his own boasting, partly because the defendants at Nuremberg and in other post-war trials had tried to exculpate themselves at his expense and chiefly because he had been in close contact with Jewish functionaries, since he was the one German official who was an expert in Jewish affairs and in nothing else. The prosecution, basing its case upon sufferings that were not a bit exaggerated, had exaggerated the exaggeration beyond rhyme or reason, or so one thought until the judgment of the Court of Appeal was handed down, in which one could read, it was a fact that the appellant had received no superior orders at all. He was his own superior, and he gave all orders in matters that concerned Jewish affairs. That had been precisely the argument of the prosecution, which the judges in the district court had not accepted. But dangerous nonsense though it was, the Court of Appeal fully endorsed it. It was supported chiefly by the testimony of Justice Michael Amos Mano, author of Ten Days to Die, 1950, and a former judge at Nuremberg, who had come from America to testify for the prosecution. 
Mr. Musmano had sat on the trials of the administrators of the concentration camps and of the members of the mobile killing units in the East. And while Eichmann's name had come up in the proceedings, he had mentioned it only once in his judgments. He had, however, interviewed the Nuremberg defendants in their prison. And their Ribbentrop had told him that Hitler would have been all right if he had not fallen under Eichmann's influence. Well, Mr. Musmano did not believe all he was told, but he did believe that Eichmann had been given his commission by Hitler himself, and that his power came by speaking through Himmler and through Heydrich. A few sessions later, Mr. Gustav M. Gilbert, professor of psychology at Long Island University and author of Nuremberg Diary, 1947, appeared as a witness for the prosecution. He was more cautious than Justice Musmano, whom he had introduced to the defendants at Nuremberg. Gilbert testified that Eichmann wasn't thought of very much by the major Nazi war criminals at that time, and also that Eichmann, whom they both assumed dead, had not been mentioned in discussions of the war crimes between Gilbert and Musmano. The district court judges then, because they saw through the exaggerations of the prosecution and had no wish to make Eichmann the superior of Himmler and the inspirer of Hitler, were put in the position of having to defend the accused. The task, apart from its unpleasantness, was of no consequence for either judgment or sentence as the legal and moral responsibility of him who delivers the victim to his death is, in our opinion, no smaller and may even be greater than the liability of him who does the victim to death. The judge's way out of all these difficulties was through compromise. The judgment falls into two parts— and the by far larger part consists of a rewriting of the prosecution's case. The judges indicated their fundamentally different approach by starting with Germany and ending with the East, for this meant that they intended to concentrate on what had been done instead of on what the Jews had suffered. In an obvious rebuff to the prosecution, they said explicitly that sufferings on so gigantic a scale were beyond human understanding, a matter for great authors and poets— and did not belong in a courtroom, whereas the deeds and motives that had caused them were neither beyond understanding nor beyond judgment. They even went so far as to state that they would base their findings upon their own presentation, and indeed they would have been lost if they had not gone to the enormous amount of work that this implied. They got a firm grasp on the intricate bureaucratic setup of the Nazi machinery of destruction, so that the position of the accused could be understood. In contrast to the introductory speech of Mr. Hausner, which has already been published as a book, the judgment can be studied with profit by those with a historical interest in this period. But the judgment, so pleasantly devoid of cheap oratory, would have destroyed the case for the prosecution altogether if the judges had not found reason to charge Eichmann with some responsibility for crimes in the East, in addition to the main crime to which he had confessed, namely that he had shipped people to their death in full awareness of what he was doing. Four points were chiefly in dispute. There was first the question of Eichmann's participation in the mass slaughter carried out in the East by the Ansatzgruppen, which had been set up by Heydrich, at a meeting held in March 1941 at which Eichmann was present. However, since the commanders of the Einsatzgruppen were members of the intellectual elite of the SS, while their troops were either criminals or ordinary soldiers drafted for punitive duty, nobody could volunteer, Eichmann was connected with this important phase of the final solution, only in that he received the reports of the killers, which he then had to summarize for his superiors. These reports, though top secret, were mimeographed and went to between 50 and 70 other offices in the Reich in each of which there sat, of course, some Oberregierungsrat who summarized them for the higher-ups. There was, in addition to this, the testimony of Justice Musmano, who claimed that Walter Schellenberg, who had drawn up the draft agreement between Heydrich and General Walter von Brauschitz of the military command, specifying that the Einsatzgruppen were to enjoy full freedom in the execution of their plans as regards the civil population, that is, in the killing of civilians, had told him in a conversation at Nuremberg that Eichmann had controlled these operations and had even personally supervised them. The judges, for reasons of caution, were unwilling to rely on an uncorroborated statement of Schellenberg's and threw out this evidence. 
Schellenberg must have had a remarkably low opinion of the Nuremberg judges and their ability to find their way through the labyrinthine administrative structure of the Third Reich. Hence, all that was left was evidence that Eichmann was well informed of what was going on in the East, which had never been in dispute, and the judgment, surprisingly, concluded that this evidence was sufficient to constitute proof of actual participation. The second point, dealing with the deportation of Jews from Polish ghettos to the nearby killing centers, had more to recommend it. It was indeed logical to assume that the transportation expert would have been active in the territory under the general government. However, we know from many other sources that the higher SS and police leaders were in charge of transportation for this whole area, to the great grief of Governor General Hans Frank, who in his diary complained endlessly about interference in this matter without ever mentioning Eichmann's name. Franz Novak, Eichmann's transportation officer, testifying for the defense, corroborated Eichmann's version. Occasionally, of course, they had had to negotiate with the manager of the Ustbahn, the Eastern Railways, because shipments from the western parts of Europe had to be coordinated with local operations. Of these transactions, Wislitzany had given a good account at Nuremberg. Novak used to contact the Ministry of Transport, which in turn had to obtain clearance from the army if the trains entered a theatre of war. The army could veto transports. What Wislitzany did not tell, and what is perhaps more interesting, is that the army used its right of veto only in the initial years, when German troops were on the offensive. In 1944, when the deportations from Hungary clogged the lines of retreat for whole German armies in desperate flight, no vetoes were forthcoming. But when, for instance, the Warsaw Ghetto was evacuated in 1942 at the rate of 5,000 people a day, Himmler himself conducted the negotiations with the railway authorities, and Eichmann and his outfit had nothing whatever to do with them. The judgment finally fell back on testimony given by a witness at the Hearst trial that some Jews from the general government area had arrived in Auschwitz together with Jews from Bialystok, a Polish city that had been incorporated into the German province of East Prussia and hence fell within Eichmann's jurisdiction. Yet even in the Wartegau, which was Reich territory, it was not the RSHA but Gauleiter Greiser who was in charge of extermination and deportation. And although in January 1944 Eichmann visited the Lotz ghetto, the largest in the east and the last to be liquidated, again it was Himmler himself who a month later came to see Greiser and ordered the liquidation of Lotz. Unless one accepted the prosecution's preposterous claim that Eichmann had been able to inspire Himmler's orders, the mere fact that Eichmann shipped Jews to Auschwitz could not possibly prove that all Jews who arrived there had been shipped by him. In view of Eichmann's strenuous denials and the utter lack of corroborative evidence, the conclusions of the judgment on this point appeared unhappily to constitute a case of indubio contra reum. The third point to be considered was Eichmann's liability for what went on in the extermination camps, in which, according to the prosecution, he had enjoyed great authority. It spoke for the high degree of independence and fairness of the judges that they threw out all the accumulated testimony of the witnesses on these matters. Their argument here was foolproof and showed their true understanding of the whole situation. They started by explaining that there had existed two categories of Jews in the camps, the so-called transport Jews, transport Juden, who made up the bulk of the population and who had never committed an offence, even in the eyes of the Nazis, and the Jews in protective custody, Schutzhaftjuden who had been sent to German concentration camps for some transgression, and who, under the totalitarian principle of directing the full terror of the regime against the innocents, were considerably better off than the others, even when they were shipped to the east in order to make the concentration camps in the Reich Judenrein. In the words of Mrs. Raya Kagan, an excellent witness on Auschwitz, it was the great paradox of Auschwitz, those caught committing a criminal offence were treated better than the others. They were not subject to the selection, and, as a rule, they survived. Eichmann had nothing to do with Schutzhaftjuden, but Transportjuden, his specialty, were, by definition, condemned to death, except for the 25% of especially strong individuals who might be selected for labor in some camps. In the version presented by the judgment, however, that question was no longer at issue. Eichmann knew, of course, that the overwhelming majority of his victims were condemned to death, 
But since the selection for labour was made by the SS physicians on the spot, and since the list of deportees were usually made up by the Jewish councils in the home countries or by the order police, but never by Eichmann or his men, the truth was that he had no authority to say who would die and who would live. He could not even know. The question was whether Eichmann had lied when he said, I never killed a Jew, or for that matter, I never killed a non-Jew. I never gave an order to kill a Jew, nor an order to kill a non-Jew. The prosecution, unable to understand a mass murderer who had never killed, and who in this particular instance probably did not even have the guts to kill, was constantly trying to prove individual murder. This brings us to the fourth and last question concerning Eichmann's general authority in the Eastern Territories, the question of his responsibility for living conditions in the ghettos, for the unspeakable misery endured in them, and for their final liquidation, which had been the subject of testimony by most witnesses. Again, Eichmann had been fully informed, but none of this had anything to do with his job. The prosecution made a laborious effort to prove that it had, on the ground that Eichmann had freely admitted that every once in a while he had to decide, according to ever-changing directives on this matter, what to do with the Jews of foreign nationality who were trapped in Poland. This, he said, was a question of national importance, involving the foreign office, and was beyond the horizon of the local authorities. With respect to such Jews, there existed two different trends in all German offices, the radical trend, which would have ignored all distinctions, a Jew was a Jew, period, and the moderate trend, which thought it better to put these Jews on ice for exchange purposes. The notion of exchange Jews seems to have been Himmler's idea. After America's entry into the war, he wrote to Müller in December 1942 that all Jews with influential relatives in the United States should be put into a special camp, and stay alive, adding, such Jews are for us precious hostages. I have a figure of ten thousand in mind. Needless to say, Eichmann belonged to the radicals. He was against making exceptions, for administrative as well as idealistic reasons. But when in April 1942 he wrote to the Foreign Office that, in the future foreign nationals would be included in the measures taken by the security police within the Warsaw Ghetto, where Jews with foreign passports had previously been carefully weeded out, he was hardly acting as a decision-maker on behalf of the RSHA in the East, and he certainly did not possess executive powers there. Still less could such powers or authority be derived from his having been used occasionally by Heydrich or Himmler to transmit certain orders to local commanders. In a sense, the truth of the matter was even worse than the court in Jerusalem assumed. Heydrich, the judgment argued, had been given central authority over the implementation of the final solution without any territorial limitations. Hence Eichmann, his chief deputy in this field, was everywhere equally responsible. This was quite true for the framework of the final solution. But although Heydrich, for purposes of coordination, had called a representative of Hans Frank's general government under Secretary of State Dr. Josef Bühler to the Wannsee Conference, the final solution did not really apply to the eastern occupied territories, for the simple reason that the fate of the Jews there had never been in the balance. The massacre of Polish Jewry had been decided on by Hitler, not in May or June 1941, the date of the order for the final solution, but in September 1939, as the judges knew from testimony given at Nuremberg by Erwin Lachhausen of the German counterintelligence. As early as September 1939, Hitler had decided the murder of Polish Jews. Hence the Jewish star was introduced into the general government immediately after the occupation of the territory in November 1939, while it was introduced into the German Reich only in 1941, at the time of the final solution. The judges had before them also the minutes of two conferences at the beginning of the war, one of which Heydrich had called on September 21, 1939, as a meeting of department heads and commanders of the mobile killing units, at which Eichmann, then still a mere Hauptsturmführer, had represented the Berlin Center for Jewish Emigration. The other took place on January 30, 1940, and dealt with questions of evacuation and resettlement. At both meetings, the fate of the entire native population in the occupied territories was discussed, that is, the solution of the Polish as well as the Jewish question. Even at this early date, the solution of the Polish problem was well advanced. 
Of the political leadership, it was reported no more than 3% was left. In order to render this 3% harmless, they would have to be sent into concentration camps. The middle strata of the Polish intelligentsia were to be registered and arrested. Teachers, clergy, nobility, legionaries, returning officers, etc., while the primitive Poles were to be added to German manpower as migratory laborers and to be evacuated from their homes. The goal is the Pole has to become the eternal seasonal and migratory laborer. His permanent residence should be in the region of Krakow. The Jews were to be gathered into urban centers and assembled in ghettos where they can be easily controlled and conveniently evacuated later on. Those eastern territories that have been incorporated into the Reich, the so-called Wartegau, West Prussia, Danzig, the province of Poznan, and Upper Silesia, had to be immediately cleared of all Jews. Together with 30,000 gypsies, they were sent in freight trains into the general government. Himmler, finally, in his capacity as Reich Commissioner for the Strengthening of German Folkdom, gave orders for the evacuation of large portions of the Polish population from these territories recently annexed to the Reich. The implementation of this organized migration of peoples, as the judgment called it, was assigned to Eichmann as chief of subsection 4D4 in the RSHA, whose task consisted in emigration, evacuation. It is important to remember that this negative demographic policy was by no means improvised as a result of German victories in the East. It had been outlined as early as November 1937 in the secret speech addressed by Hitler to members of the German High Command, see the so-called Hörsbach Protocol. Hitler had pointed out that he rejected all notions of conquering foreign nations, that what he demanded was an empty space, Volkless Raum, in the East, for the settlement of Germans. His audience, Blomberg, Fritsch, and Reder, among others, knew quite well that no such empty space existed. Hence, they must have known that a German victory in the East would automatically result in the evacuation of the entire native population. The measures against Eastern Jews were not only the result of anti-Semitism, they were part and parcel of an all-embracing demographic policy, in the course of which, had the Germans won the war, the Poles would have suffered the same fate as the Jews, genocide. This is no mere conjecture. The Poles in Germany were already being forced to wear a distinguishing badge in which the P replaced the Jewish star, and this, as we have seen, was always the first measure to be taken by the police in instituting the process of destruction. An express letter sent to the commanders of the mobile killing units after the September meeting was among the documents submitted at the trial and was of special interest. It refers only to the Jewish question in occupied territories and distinguishes between the final goal, which must be kept secret, and preliminary measures for reaching it. Among the latter, the document mentions expressly the concentration of Jews in the vicinity of railroad tracks. It is characteristic that the phrase final solution of the Jewish question does not occur. The final goal, probably, was the destruction of Polish Jews, clearly nothing new to those present at the meeting. What was new was only that those Jews who lived in newly annexed provinces of the Reich should be evacuated to Poland, for this was indeed a first step toward making Germany Judenrein, hence toward the final solution. As far as Eichmann was concerned, the documents clearly showed that even at this stage he had next to nothing to do with what happened in the East. Here, too, his role was that of an expert for transportation and emigration. In the East, no Jewish expert was needed, no special directives were required, and there existed no privileged categories. Even the members of the Jewish councils were invariably exterminated when the ghettos were finally liquidated. There were no exceptions, for the fate accorded the slave laborers was only a different, slower kind of death. Hence the Jewish bureaucracy, whose role in these administrative massacres was felt to be so essential that the institution of Jewish councils of elders was immediately established, played no part in the seizure and the concentration of the Jews. The whole episode signals the end of the initial wild mass shootings in the rear of the armies. It seems that the army commanders had protested against the massacres of civilians, and that Heydrich had come to an agreement with the German High Command, establishing the principle of a complete clean-up once and for all of Jews, the Polish intelligentsia, the Catholic clergy, and the nobility, 
but determining that, because of the magnitude of an operation in which two million Jews would have to be cleaned up, the Jews should first be concentrated in ghettos. If the judges had cleared Eichmann completely on these counts connected with the hair-raising stories told over and over by witnesses at the trial, they would not have arrived at a different judgment of guilt, and Eichmann would not have escaped capital punishment. The result would have been the same. But they would have destroyed utterly and without compromise the case as the prosecution presented it. 14. Evidence and Witnesses during the last weeks of the war, the SS bureaucracy was occupied chiefly with forging identity papers and with destroying the paper mountains that testified to six years of systematic murder. Eichmann's department, more successful than others, had burned its files, which of course did not achieve much, since all its correspondence had been addressed to other state and party offices whose files fell into the hands of the Allies. There were more than enough documents left to tell the story of the final solution, most of them known already from the Nuremberg trials and the successor trials. The story was confirmed by sworn and unsworn statements, usually given by witnesses and defendants in previous trials, and frequently by persons who were no longer alive. All this, as well as a certain amount of hearsay testimony, was admitted as evidence according to Section 15 of the law under which Eichmann was tried, which stipulates that the court may deviate from the rules of evidence, provided it places on record the reasons which prompted such deviation. The documentary evidence was supplemented by testimony taken abroad in German, Austrian and Italian courts from 16 witnesses who could not come to Jerusalem, because the Attorney General had announced that he intended to put them on trial for crimes against the Jewish people. Although during the first session he had declared... And if the defence has people who are ready to come and be witnesses, I shall not block the way. I shall not put any obstacles. He later refused to grant such people immunity. Such immunity was entirely dependent upon the good will of the government. Prosecution under the Nazis and Nazi collaborators' punishment law is not mandatory. Since it was highly unlikely that any of the sixteen gentlemen would have come to Israel under any circumstances, seven of them were in prison, this was a technical point, but it was of considerable importance. It served to refute Israel's claim that an Israeli court was, at least technically, the most suitable for a trial against the implementers of the final solution, because documents and witnesses were more abundant than in any other country. And the claim with respect to documents was doubtful in any event, since the Israeli archive Yad Vashem was founded at a comparatively late date and is in no way superior to other archives. It quickly turned out that Israel was the only country in the world where defense witnesses could not be heard, and where certain witnesses for the prosecution, those who had given affidavits in previous trials, could not be cross-examined by the defense. And this was all the more serious, as the accused and his lawyer were indeed not in a position to obtain their own defense documents. Dr. Servatius had submitted 110 documents, as against 1,500 submitted by the prosecution. But of the former, only about a dozen originated with the defence, and they consisted mostly of excerpts from books by Polyakov or Reitlinger. All the rest, with the exception of the seventeen charts drawn by Eichmann, had been picked out of the wealth of material gathered by the prosecution and the Israeli police. Obviously the defence had received the crumbs from the rich man's table. In fact, it had neither the means nor the time to conduct the affair properly. It did not have at its disposal the archives of the world and the instruments of government. The same reproach had been levelled against the Nuremberg trials, where the inequality of status between prosecution and defence was even more glaring. The chief handicap of the defence at Nuremberg, as at Jerusalem, was that it lacked the staff of trained research assistants needed to go through the mass of documents and find whatever might be useful in the case. Even today, 18 years after the war, our knowledge of the immense archival material of the Nazi regime rests to a large extent on the selection made for purposes of prosecution. No one could have been more aware of this decisive disadvantage for the defence than Dr. Servatius, who was one of the defence counsels at Nuremberg, which obviously makes the question of why he offered his services to begin with even more intriguing. His answer to this question was that for him this was a mere business matter and that he wished to make money. 
but he must have known from his Nuremberg experience that the sum paid him by the Israeli government, twenty thousand dollars as he himself had stipulated, was ridiculously inadequate, even though Eichmann's family in Linz had given him another fifteen thousand marks. He began complaining about being underpaid almost the first day of the trial, and soon thereafter he openly voiced the hope that he would be able to sell whatever memoirs Eichmann would write in prison for future generations. Leaving aside the question of whether such a business deal would have been proper, his hopes were disappointed because the Israeli government confiscated all papers written by Eichmann while in jail. They have now been deposited in the National Archives. Eichmann had written a book in the time between the adjournment of the court in August and the pronouncement of judgment in December, and the defence offered it as new factual evidence in the revision proceedings before the Court of Appeal, which, of course, the newly written book was not. As to the position of the defendant, the court could rely upon the detailed statement he had made to the Israeli police examiner, supplemented by many handwritten notes he had handed in during the eleven months needed for the preparation of the trial. No doubt was ever raised that these were voluntary statements. Most of them had not even been elicited by questions. Eichmann had been confronted with sixteen hundred documents, some of which it turned out he must have seen before, because they'd been shown to him in Argentina during his interview with Sasson, which Mr. Hausner, with some justification, called a dress rehearsal. But he had started working on them seriously only in Jerusalem, and when he was put on the stand it soon became apparent that he had not wasted his time. Now he knew how to read documents, something he had not known during the police examination, and he could do it better than his lawyer. Eichmann's testimony in court turned out to be the most important evidence in the case. His counsel put him on the stand on June 20 during the 75th session and interrogated him almost uninterruptedly for 14 sessions until July 7. That same day, during the 88th session, the cross-examination by the prosecution began, and it lasted for another 17 sessions, up to the 20th of July. There were a few incidents— Eichmann once threatened to confess everything, Moscow-style, and he once complained that he'd been grilled until the steak was done. But he was usually quite calm, and he was not serious when he threatened that he would refuse to answer any more questions. He told Judge Halevi how pleased he was at this opportunity to sift the truth from the untruths that had been unloaded upon him for fifteen years, and how proud of being the subject of a cross-examination that lasted longer than any known before. After a short re-examination by his lawyer, which took less than a session, he was examined by the three judges, and they got more out of him in two and a half short sessions than the prosecution had been able to elicit in seventeen. Eichmann was on the stand from June 20 to July 24, or a total of thirty-three and a half sessions. Almost twice as many sessions, sixty-two out of a total of a hundred and twenty-one, were spent on a hundred prosecution witnesses, who country after country told their tales of horrors. Their testimony lasted from April 24 to June 12, the entire intervening time being taken up with the submission of documents, most of which the Attorney General read into the record of the Court's proceedings, which was handed out to the press each day. All but a mere handful of the witnesses were Israeli citizens— and they had been picked from hundreds and hundreds of applicants. Ninety of them were survivors in the strict sense of the word. They had survived the war in one form or another of Nazi captivity. How much wiser it would have been to resist these pressures altogether? It was done up to a point, for none of the potential witnesses mentioned in Minister of Death, written by Quentin Reynolds on the basis of material provided by two Israeli journalists and published in 1960, was ever called to the stand, and to seek out those who had not volunteered. As though to prove the point, the prosecution called upon a writer, well known on both sides of the Atlantic under the name of K. Zeknik, a slang word for a concentration camp inmate, as the author of several books on Auschwitz that dealt with brothels, homosexuals, and other human interest stories. He started off, as he had done at many of his public appearances, with an explanation of his adopted name. It was not a pen name, he said. I must carry this name as long as the world will not awaken after the crucifying of the nation, as humanity has risen after the crucifixion of one man. He continued with a little excursion into astrology, 
The star influencing our fate in the same way as the star of ashes at Auschwitz is there facing our planet, radiating toward our planet. And when he had arrived at the unnatural power above nature, which had sustained him thus far, and now for the first time paused to catch his breath, even Mr. Hausner felt that something had to be done about this testimony, and very timidly, very politely interrupted, "'Could I perhaps put a few questions to you, if you will consent?' Whereupon the presiding judge saw his chance as well. "'Mr. Dinor, please, please listen to Mr. Hausner and to me.' In response, the disappointed witness, probably deeply wounded, fainted and answered no more questions. This, to be sure, was an exception, but if it was an exception that proved the rule of normality, it did not prove the rule of simplicity or of ability to tell a story, let alone of the rare capacity for distinguishing between things that had happened to the storyteller more than sixteen and sometimes twenty years ago, and what he had read and heard and imagined in the meantime. These difficulties could not be helped, but they were not improved, by the predilection of the prosecution for witnesses of some prominence, many of whom had published books about their experiences, and who now told what they had previously written, or what they had told and retold many times. The procession started, in a futile attempt to proceed according to chronological order, with eight witnesses from Germany, all of them sober enough, but they were not survivors. They had been high-ranking Jewish officials in Germany, and were now prominent in Israeli public life, and they had all left Germany prior to the outbreak of war. They were followed by five witnesses from Prague, and then by just one witness from Austria, on which country the prosecution had submitted the valuable reports of the late Dr. Lohenherz, written during and shortly after the end of the war. There appeared one witness each from France, Holland, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Italy, Greece, and Soviet Russia, two from Yugoslavia, three each from Romania and Slovakia, and thirteen from Hungary. But the bulk of the witnesses, fifty-three, came from Poland and Lithuania, where Eichmann's competence and authority had been almost nil. Belgium and Bulgaria were the only countries not covered by witnesses. These were all background witnesses, and so were the sixteen men and women who told the court about Auschwitz, ten, and Treblinka, four, about Kellner and Majdanek. It was different with those who testified on Theresienstadt, the old-age ghetto on Reich territory, the only camp in which Eichmann's power had indeed been considerable. There were four witnesses for Theresienstadt and one for the exchange camp at Bergen-Belsen. At the end of this procession, the right of the witnesses to be irrelevant, as Yad Vashem, summing up the testimony in its bulletin, phrased it, was so firmly established that it was a mere formality when Mr. Hausner, during the 73rd session, asked permission of the court to complete his picture, and Judge Landau, who some fifty sessions before had protested so strenuously against this picture painting, agreed immediately to the appearance of a former member of the Jewish Brigade, the fighting force of Palestine Jews that had been attached to the British Eighth Army during the war. This last witness for the prosecution, Mr. Aharon Chota Yishai, now an Israeli lawyer, had been assigned the task of coordinating all efforts to search for Jewish survivors in Europe under the auspices of Aliyah Beth, the organization responsible for arranging for illegal immigration into Palestine. The surviving Jews were dispersed among some eight million displaced persons from all over Europe, a floating mass of humanity that the Allies wanted to repatriate as quickly as possible. The danger was that the Jews, too, would be returned to their former homes. Mr. Hote Yishai told how he and his comrades were greeted when they presented themselves as members of the Jewish fighting nation, and how it was sufficient to draw a star of David on a sheet in ink and pin it to a broomstick to shake these people out of the dangerous apathy of near starvation. He also told how some of them had wandered home from the DP camps, only to come back to another camp, for home was, for instance, a small Polish town where, of 6,000 former Jewish inhabitants, 15 had survived, and where four of these survivors had been murdered upon their return by the Poles. He described, finally, how he and the others had tried to forestall the repatriation attempts of the Allies, and how they frequently arrived too late. In Theresienstadt there were 32,000 survivors. After a few weeks we found only 4,000, 
About twenty-eight thousand had returned, or been returned. Those four thousand whom we found there, of them, of course, not one person returned to his place of origin, because in the meantime the road was pointed out to them. That is, the road to what was then Palestine, and was soon to become Israel. This testimony perhaps smacked more strongly of propaganda than anything heard previously, and the presentation of the facts was indeed misleading. In November 1944, after the last shipment had left Theresienstadt for Auschwitz, there were only about 10,000 of the original inmates left. In February 1945, there arrived another six to 8,000 people, the Jewish partners of mixed marriages, whom the Nazis shipped to Theresienstadt at a moment when the whole German transportation system was already in a state of collapse. All the others, roughly 15,000, had poured in in open freight cars or on foot in April 1945, after the camp had been taken over by the Red Cross. These were survivors of Auschwitz, members of the labor gangs, and they were chiefly from Poland and Hungary. When the Russians liberated the camp on May 9, 1945, many Czech Jews, who had been in Theresienstadt since the beginning, left the camp immediately and started home. They were in their own country. When the quarantine, ordered by the Russians because of the epidemics, was lifted, the majority left on its own initiative, so that the remnant found by the Palestine emissaries probably consisted of people who could not return or be returned for various reasons, the ill, the aged, single, lonely survivors of families who did not know where to turn. And yet Mr. Hote Yishai told the simple truth. Those who had survived the ghettos and the camps, who had come out alive from the nightmare of absolute helplessness and abandonment, as though the whole world was a jungle and they its prey, had only one wish, to go where they would never see a non-Jew again. They needed the emissaries of the Jewish people in Palestine in order to learn that they could come, legally or illegally, by hook or by crook, and that they would be welcome. They did not need them in order to be convinced. Thus, every once in a long while one was glad that Judge Landau had lost his battle, and the first such moment occurred even before the battle had started. For Mr. Hasner's first background witness did not look as though he had volunteered. He was an old man, wearing the traditional Jewish skullcap, small, very frail, with sparse white hair and beard, holding himself quite erect. In a sense, his name was famous, and one understood why the prosecution wanted to begin its picture with him. He was Zindel Grinspan, father of Herschel Grinspan, who on November 7, 1938, at the age of 17, had walked up to the German embassy in Paris and shot to death its third secretary, the young Legationsrat Ernst vom Rath. The assassination had triggered the pogroms in Germany and Austria, the so-called Kristallnacht of November 9, which was indeed a prelude to the final solution, but with whose preparation Eichmann had nothing to do. The motives for Grinspan's act had never been cleared up, and his brother, whom the prosecution also put on the stand, was remarkably reluctant to talk about it. The court took it for granted that it was an act of vengeance for the expulsion of some 17,000 Polish Jews, the Grinspan family among them, from German territory during the last days of October 1938. But it is generally known that this explanation is unlikely. Herschel Grinspan was a psychopath, unable to finish school, who for years had knocked about Paris and Brussels being expelled from both places. His lawyer, in the French court that tried him, introduced a confused story of homosexual relations, and the Germans, who later had him extradited, never put him on trial. There are rumours that he survived the war, as though to substantiate the paradox of Auschwitz, that those Jews who had committed a criminal offence were spared. Fomrat was a singularly inadequate victim. He had been shadowed by the Gestapo because of his openly anti-Nazi views and his sympathy for Jews. The story of his homosexuality was probably fabricated by the Gestapo. Greenspan might have acted as an unwitting tool of Gestapo agents in Paris, who could have wanted to kill two birds with one stone, create a pretext for pogroms in Germany, and get rid of an opponent to the Nazi regime, without realizing that they could not have it both ways, that is, could not slander vom Rat as a homosexual, having illicit relations with Jewish boys, and also make of him a martyr and a victim of world Jewry. 
However that may have been, it is a fact that the Polish government in the fall of 1938 decreed that all Polish Jews residing in Germany would lose their nationality by October 29. It probably was in possession of information that the German government intended to expel these Jews to Poland and wanted to prevent this. It is more than doubtful that people like Mr. Zindel Grinspan even knew that such a decree existed. He had come to Germany in 1911, a young man of 25, to open a grocery store in Hanover, where in due time eight children were born to him. In 1938, when catastrophe overcame him, he'd been living in Germany for 27 years, and like many such people, he'd never bothered to change his papers and to ask for naturalization. Now he had come to tell his story, carefully answering questions put to him by the prosecutor, he spoke clearly and firmly, without embroidery, using a minimum of words. On the 27th of October, 1938, it was a Thursday night, at eight o'clock, a policeman came and told us to come to Region, police station 11. He said, You are going to come back immediately. Don't take anything with you on your passports. Greenspan went with his family, a son, a daughter, and his wife. When they arrived at the police station, he saw a large number of people, some sitting, some standing. People were crying. They, the police, were shouting, Sign! 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 I had to sign. All of them did. One of us did not. His name was, I believe, Gerson Silber, and he had to stand in the corner for twenty-four hours. They took us to the concert hall, and there were people from all over town, about six hundred people. There we stayed until Friday night, about twenty-four hours. Yes, until Friday night. Then they took us in police trucks, in prisoners' lorries, about twenty men in each truck, and they took us to the railroad station. The streets were black with people shouting, Juden raus to Palestine. They took us by train to Neubenschen on the German-Polish border. It was Shabbat morning when we arrived there, six o'clock in the morning. There came trains from all sorts of places, from Leipzig, Cologne, Dusseldorf, Essen, Bielefeld, Bremen. Together we were about twelve thousand people. It was the Shabbat, the 29th of October. When we reached the border, we were searched to see if anybody had any money, and anybody who had more than ten marks, the balance was taken away. This was the German law. No more than ten marks could be taken out of Germany. The Germans said, you didn't bring any more with you when you came. You can't take out any more. They had to walk a little over a mile to the Polish border, since the Germans intended to smuggle them into Polish territory. The SS men were whipping us. Those who lingered, they hit, and blood was flowing on the road. They tore away our suitcases from us. They treated us in a most brutal way. This was the first time that I'd seen the wild brutality of the Germans. They shouted at us, run, run. I was hit and fell into the ditch. My son helped me, and he said, run, father, run, or you'll die. When we got to the open border, the women went in first. The Poles knew nothing. They called a Polish general and some officers who examined our papers, and they saw that we were Polish citizens, that we had special passports. It was decided to let us enter. They took us to a village of about 6,000 people, and we were 12,000. The rain was driving hard, people were fainting, and all sides one saw old men and women. Our suffering was great. There was no food. Since Thursday we had not eaten. They were taken to a military camp and put into stables, as there was no room elsewhere. I think it was our second day in Poland. On the first day a lorry with bread came from Poznan. That was on Sunday. And then I wrote a letter to France. To my son, don't write any more letters to Germany. We are now in Zbazin. The story took no more than perhaps ten minutes to tell, and when it was over, the senseless, needless destruction of twenty-seven years in less than twenty-four hours, one thought foolishly, everyone, everyone, should have his day in court. Only to find out in the endless sessions that followed how difficult it was to tell the story that, at least outside the transforming realm of poetry, it needed a purity of soul and unmirrored, unreflected innocence of heart and mind that only the righteous possess. 
No one, either before or after, was to equal the shining honesty of Zindel Grinspan. No one could claim that Grinspan's testimony created anything remotely resembling a dramatic moment. But such a moment came a few weeks later, and it came unexpectedly, just when Judge Landau was making an almost desperate attempt to bring the proceedings back under the control of normal criminal court procedures. On the stand was Abba Kovner, a poet and an author, who had not so much testified as addressed an audience with the ease of someone who was used to speaking in public and resents interruptions from the floor. He had been asked by the presiding judge to be brief, which he obviously disliked, and Mr. Hausner, who had defended his witness, had been told that he could not complain about a lack of patience on the part of the court, which, of course, he did not like either. At this slightly tense moment, the witness happened to mention the name of Anton Schmidt, a Feldwebel or sergeant in the German army, a name that was not entirely unknown to this audience, for Yad Vashem had published Schmidt's story some years before in its Hebrew bulletin, and a number of Yiddish papers in America had picked it up. Anton Schmidt was in charge of a patrol in Poland that collected stray German soldiers who were cut off from their units. In the course of doing this, he had run into members of the Jewish underground, including Mr. Kovner, a prominent member, and he'd helped the Jewish partisans by supplying them with forged papers and military trucks. Most important of all, he did not do it for money. This had gone on for five months, from October 1941 to March 1942, when Anton Schmidt was arrested and executed. The prosecution had elicited the story because Kovner declared that he had first heard the name of Eichmann from Schmidt, who had told him about rumours in the army that it was Eichmann who arranges everything. This was by no means the first time that help from the outside non-Jewish world had been mentioned. Judge Halevi had been asking the witnesses, Did the Jews get any help? with the same regularity as that with which the prosecution had asked, Why did you not rebel? The answers had been various and inconclusive. We had the whole population against us. Jews hidden by Christian families could be counted on the fingers of one hand, perhaps five or six out of a total of thirteen thousand. But on the whole the situation had, surprisingly, been better in Poland than in any other Eastern European country. There was... I've said no testimony on Bulgaria. A Jew, now married to a Polish woman and living in Israel, testified how his wife had hidden him and twelve other Jews throughout the war. Another had a Christian friend from before the war, to whom he had escaped from a camp and who had helped him, and who was later executed because of the help he had given to Jews. One witness claimed that the Polish underground had supplied many Jews with weapons and had saved thousands of Jewish children by placing them with Polish families. The risks were prohibitive. There was the story of an entire Polish family who'd been executed in the most brutal manner because they had adopted a six-year-old Jewish girl. But this mention of Schmidt was the first and the last time that any such story was told of a German, for the only other incident involving a German was mentioned only in a document. An army officer had helped indirectly by sabotaging certain police orders. Nothing happened to him, but the matter had been thought sufficiently serious to be mentioned in correspondence between Himmler and Bormann. During the few minutes it took Kovner to tell of the help that had come from a German sergeant, a hush settled over the courtroom. It was as though the crowd had spontaneously decided to observe the usual two minutes of silence in honour of the man named Anton Schmidt. And in those two minutes, which were like a sudden burst of light, in the midst of impenetrable, unfathomable darkness. A single thought stood out clearly, irrefutably, beyond question. How utterly different everything would be today in this courtroom, in Israel, in Germany, in all of Europe, and perhaps in all countries of the world, if only more such stories could have been told. There are, of course, explanations of this devastating shortage, and they have been repeated many times. I shall give the gist of them in the words of one of the few subjectively sincere memoirs of the war published in Germany. Peter Bam, a German army physician who served at the Russian front, tells in Der Unsichtbare Flagge, 1952, of the killing of Jews in Sevastopol. They were collected by the others, as he calls the SS mobile killing units, to distinguish them from ordinary soldiers, whose decency the book extols, 
and were put into a sealed-off part of the former GPU prison that abutted on the officers' lodgings, where Bam's own unit was quartered. They were then made to board a mobile gas van in which they died after a few minutes, whereupon the driver transported the corpses outside the city and unloaded them into tank ditches. He knew this, but he did nothing. Anyone who had seriously protested or done anything against the killing unit would have been arrested within twenty-four hours and would have disappeared. It belongs among the refinements of totalitarian governments in our century that they don't permit their opponents to die a great, dramatic martyr's death for their convictions. A good many of us might have accepted such a death. The totalitarian state lets its opponents disappear in silent anonymity. It is certain that anyone who had dared to suffer death rather than silently tolerate the crime would have sacrificed his life in vain. This is not to say that such a sacrifice would have been morally meaningless. It would only have been practically useless. None of us had a conviction so deeply rooted that we could have taken upon ourselves a practically useless sacrifice for the sake of a higher moral meaning. Needless to add, the writer remains unaware of the emptiness of his much-emphasized decency in the absence of what he calls a higher moral meaning. But the hollowness of respectability, for decency under such circumstances is no more than respectability, was not what became apparent in the example afforded by Sergeant Anton Schmidt. Rather, it was the fatal flaw in the argument itself, which at first sounds so hopelessly plausible. It is true that totalitarian domination tried to establish these holes of oblivion into which all deeds, good and evil, would disappear. But just as the Nazis' feverish attempts from June 1942 on to erase all traces of the massacres, through cremation, through burning in open pits, through the use of explosives and flamethrowers and bone-crushing machinery, were doomed to failure, so all efforts to let their opponents disappear in silent anonymity were in vain. The holes of oblivion do not exist. Nothing human is that perfect, and there are simply too many people in the world to make oblivion possible. One man will always be left alive to tell the story. Hence nothing can ever be practically useless, at least not in the long run. It will be of great practical usefulness for Germany today, not merely for her prestige abroad, but for her sadly confused inner condition, if there were more such stories to be told. For the lesson of such stories is simple and within everybody's grasp. Politically speaking, it is that under conditions of terror, most people will comply, but some people will not. Just as the lesson of the countries to which the final solution was proposed is that it could happen in most places, but it did not happen everywhere. Humanly speaking, no more is required, and no more can reasonably be asked for this planet to remain a place fit for human habitation. 15. Judgment, Appeal, and Execution Eichmann spent the last months of the war cooling his heels in Berlin, with nothing to do, cut by the other department heads in the RSHA, who had lunch together every day in the building where he had his office, but did not once ask him to join them. He kept himself busy with his defence installations, so as to be ready for the last battle for Berlin, and, as his only official duty, paid occasional visits to Theresienstadt, where he showed Red Cross delegates around. To them, of all people, he unburdened his soul about Himmler's new humane line in regard to the Jews, which included an avowed determination to have, next time, concentration caps after the English model. In April 1945, Eichmann had the last of his rare interviews with Himmler, who ordered him to select a hundred to two hundred prominent Jews in Theresienstadt, transport them to Austria, and install them in hotels, so that Himmler could use them as hostages in his forthcoming negotiations with Eisenhower. The absurdity of this commission seems not to have dawned upon Eichmann. He went with grief in my heart as I had to desert my defence installations. But he never reached Theresienstadt, because all the roads were blocked by the approaching Russian armies. Instead, he ended up at Alt Aussee in Austria, where Kaltenbrunner had taken refuge. Kaltenbrunner had no interest in Himmler's prominent Jews, and told Eichmann to organize a commando for partisan warfare in the Austrian mountains. Eichmann responded with the greatest enthusiasm. This was again something worth doing, a task I enjoyed. 
But just as he'd collected some hundred more or less unfit men, most of whom had never seen a rifle, and had taken possession of an arsenal of abandoned weapons of all sorts, he received the latest Himmler order. No fire is to be opened on English and Americans. This was the end. He sent his men home and gave a small strong box containing paper money and gold coins to his trusted legal adviser, Regier Rungsrat Hünscher. Because I said to myself he is a man from the higher civil services, he will be correct in the management of funds. He will put down his expenses. For I still believe that accounts would be demanded some day. With these words, Eichmann had to conclude the autobiography he'd spontaneously given the police examiner. It had taken only a few days and filled no more than 315 of the 3,564 pages copied off the tape recorder. He would like to have gone on, and he obviously did tell the rest of the story to the police. But the trial authorities, for various reasons, had decided not to admit any testimony covering the time after the close of the war. However, from affidavits given at Nuremberg, and more important, from a much-discussed indiscretion on the part of a former Israeli civil servant, Moshe Perlman, whose book The Capture of Adolf Eichmann appeared in London four weeks before the trial opened, it is possible to complete the story. Mr. Perlman's account was obviously based upon material from Bureau 06, the police office that was in charge of the preparations for the trial. Mr. Perlman's own version was that since he had retired from government service three weeks before Eichmann was kidnapped, he had written the book as a private individual, which is not very convincing, because the Israeli police must have known of the impending capture several months before his retirement. The book caused some embarrassment in Israel, not only because Mr. Perlman had been able to divulge information about important prosecution documents prematurely, and had stated that the trial authorities had already made up their minds about the untrustworthiness of Eichmann's testimony, but because a reliable account of how Eichmann was captured in Buenos Aires was, of course, the last thing they wanted to have published. The story told by Mr. Perlman was considerably less exciting than the various rumours upon which previous tales had been based. Eichmann had never been in the Near East or the Middle East. He had no connection with any Arab country. He had never returned to Germany from Argentina. He had never been to any other Latin American country. He had played no role in post-war Nazi activities or organizations. At the end of the war, he had tried to speak once more with Kaltenbrunner, who was still in alt Alsace playing solitaire. But his former chief was in no mood to receive him, since, for this man, he saw no chances any more. Colton Brunner's own chances were not so very good, either. He was hanged at Nuremberg. Almost immediately thereafter, Eichmann was caught by American soldiers and put in a camp for SS men, where numerous interrogations failed to uncover his identity, although it was known to some of his fellow prisoners. He was cautious and did not write to his family, but let them believe he was dead. His wife tried to obtain a death certificate— but failed when it was discovered that the only eyewitness to her husband's death was her brother-in-law. She had been left penniless, but Eichmann's family in Linz supported her and the three children. In November 1945, the trials of the major war criminals opened in Nuremberg, and Eichmann's name began to appear with uncomfortable regularity. In January 1946, Vislitsani appeared as a witness for the prosecution and gave his damning evidence whereupon Eichmann decided that he had better disappear. He escaped from the camp with the help of the inmates and went to the Lüneburger Heide, a heath about 50 miles south of Hamburg, where the brother of one of his fellow prisoners provided him with work as a lumberjack. He stayed there, under the name of Otto Henninger, for four years, and he was probably bored to death. Early in 1950, he succeeded in establishing contact with Odessa, a clandestine organization of SS veterans and in May of that year he was passed through Austria to Italy, where a Franciscan priest, fully informed of his identity, equipped him with a refugee passport in the name of Richard Clement, and sent him on to Buenos Aires. He arrived in mid-July, and without any difficulty obtained identification papers and a work permit as Ricardo Clement, Catholic, a bachelor, stateless, aged thirty-seven, seven years less than his real age. He was still cautious— but he now wrote to his wife in his own handwriting and told her that her children's uncle was alive. He worked at a number of odd jobs, 
sales representative, laundryman, worker on a rabbit farm, all poorly paid, but in the summer of 1952 he had his wife and children join him. Mrs. Eichmann obtained a German passport in Zurich, Switzerland, though she was a resident of Austria at the time, and under her real name as a divorcee from a certain Eichmann. How this came about has remained a mystery, and the file containing her application has disappeared from the German consulate in Zurich. Upon her arrival in Argentina, Eichmann got his first steady job in the Mercedes-Benz factory in Suarez, a suburb of Buenos Aires, first as a mechanic and later as a foreman, and when a fourth son was born to him, he remarried his wife, supposedly under the name of Clement. This is not likely, however, for the infant was registered as Ricardo Francisco, presumably as a tribute to the Italian priest, Clement Eichmann. And this was only one of many hints that Eichmann dropped in regard to his identity as the years went by. It does seem to be true, however, that he told his children he was Adolf Eichmann's brother, though the children, being well acquainted with their grandparents and uncles in Linz, must have been rather dull to believe it. The oldest son, at least, who had been nine years old when he last saw his father, should have been able to recognize him seven years later in Argentina. Mrs. Eichmann's Argentine identity card, moreover, was never changed. It read, Veronica Liebler de Eichmann. And in 1959, when Eichmann's stepmother died, and a year later when his father died, the newspaper announcements in Linz carried Mrs. Eichmann's name among the survivors, contradicting all stories of divorce and remarriage. Early in 1960, a few months before his capture, Eichmann and his elder sons finished building a primitive brick house in one of the poor suburbs of Buenos Aires, no electricity, no running water, where the family settled down. They must have been very poor, and Eichmann must have led a dreary life, for which not even the children could compensate, for they showed absolutely no interest in being educated and did not even try to develop their so-called talents. Eichmann's only compensation consisted in talking endlessly with members of the large Nazi colony, to whom he readily admitted his identity. In 1955, this finally led to the interview with the Dutch journalist Willem S. Sassen, a former member of the armed SS who had exchanged his Dutch nationality for a German passport during the war and had later been condemned to death in absentia in Belgium as a war criminal. Eichmann made copious notes for the interview, which was tape-recorded and then rewritten by Sassen with considerable embellishments. The notes in Eichmann's own handwriting were discovered, and they were admitted as evidence at his trial, though the statement as a whole was not. Sassen's version appeared in abbreviated form, first in the German illustrated magazine Der Stern in July 1960, and then in November and December as a series of articles in Life. But Sassen, obviously with Eichmann's consent, had offered the story four years before to a time-life correspondent in Buenos Aires, and even if it is true that Eichmann's name was withheld, the content of the material could have left no doubt about the original source of the information. The truth of the matter is that Eichmann had made many efforts to break out of his anonymity, and it is rather strange that it took the Israeli secret services several years, until August 1959, to learn that Adolf Eichmann was living in Argentina under the name of Ricardo Clement. Israel has never divulged the source of her information, and today at least half a dozen persons claim they found Eichmann, while well-informed circles in Europe insist that it was the Russian intelligence service that spilled the news. However that may have been, the puzzle is not how it was possible to discover Eichmann's hideout, but rather how it was possible not to discover it earlier, provided, of course, that the Israelis had indeed pursued this search through the years, which, in view of the facts, seems doubtful. No doubt, however, exists about the identity of the captors. All talk of private avengers was contradicted at the outset by Ben-Gurion himself, who on May 23, 1960, announced to Israel's wildly cheering Nesset that Eichmann had been found by the Israeli Secret Service. Dr. Servatius, who tried strenuously and unsuccessfully, both before the District Court and before the Court of Appeal, to call Zvito Ha, chief pilot of the El Al plane that flew Eichmann out of the country, and Yad Shimoni, an official of the airline in Argentina, as witnesses, 
mentioned Ben-Gurion's statement. The Attorney General countered by saying that the Prime Minister had admitted no more than that Eichmann was found out by the Secret Service, not that he also had been kidnapped by government agents. Well, in actual fact, it seems that it was the other way round. Secret Service men had not found him, but only picked him up, after making a few preliminary tests to assure themselves that the information they had received was true. And even this was not done very expertly, for Eichmann had been well aware that he was being shadowed. I told you that months ago, I believe, when I was asked if I had known that I was found out, and I could give you then precise reasons, that is, in the part of the police examination that was not released to the press, I learned that people in my neighborhood had made inquiries about real estate purchases and so on and so forth for the establishment of a factory for sewing machines. I think that was quite impossible, since there existed neither electricity nor water in that area. Furthermore, I was informed that these people were Jews from North America. I could easily have disappeared, but I did not do it. I just went on as usual and let things catch up with me. I could have found employment without any difficulty with my papers and references, but I did not want that. There was more proof than was revealed in Jerusalem of his willingness to go to Israel and stand trial. Counsel for the defense, of course, had to stress the fact that, after all, the accused had been kidnapped and brought to Israel in conflict with international law, because this enabled the defense to challenge the right of the court to prosecute him. And though neither the prosecution nor the judges ever admitted that the kidnapping had been an act of state, they did not deny it, either. They argued that the breach of international law concerned only the states of Argentina and Israel, not the rights of the defendant and that this breach was cured through the joint declaration of the two governments on August 3, 1960, that they resolved to view as settled the incident which was caused in the wake of the action of citizens of Israel, which violated the basic rights of the state of Argentina. The court decided that it did not matter whether these Israelis were government agents or private citizens. What neither the defense nor the court mentioned was that Argentina would not have waived her rights so obligingly had Eichmann been an Argentine citizen. He had lived there under an assumed name, thereby denying himself the right to government protection, at least as Ricardo Clement, born on May 23, 1913, at Bolzano in southern Tyrol, as his Argentine identity card stated, although he had declared himself of German nationality and he had never invoked the dubious right of asylum, which would not have helped him anyway, since Argentina, although she has in fact offered asylum to many known Nazi criminals, had signed an international convention declaring that the perpetrators of crimes against humanity will not be deemed to be political criminals. All this did not make Eichmann stateless. It did not legally deprive him of his German nationality, but it gave the West German Republic a welcome pretext for withholding the customary protection due its citizens abroad. In other words, and despite pages and pages of legal argument, based on so many precedents that one finally got the impression that kidnapping was among the most frequent modes of arrest, it was Eichmann's de facto statelessness and nothing else that enabled the Jerusalem court to sit in judgment on him. Eichmann, though no legal expert, should have been able to appreciate that, for he knew from his own career that one could do as one pleased, only with stateless people. The Jews had had to lose their nationality before they could be exterminated. But he was in no mood to ponder such niceties, for if it was a fiction that he had come voluntarily to Israel to stand trial, it was true that he'd made fewer difficulties than anybody had expected. In fact, he had made none. On May 11, 1960, at 6.30 in the evening, when Eichmann alighted, as usual, from the bus that brought him home from his place of work, he was seized by three men, and in less than a minute bundled into a waiting car, which took him to a previously rented house in a remote suburb of Buenos Aires. No drugs, no ropes, no handcuffs were used, and Eichmann immediately recognized that this was professional work, as no unnecessary violence had been applied. He was not hurt. Asked who he was, he instantly said, Ich bin Adolf Eichmann, and surprisingly added, I know I am in the hands of Israelis. He later explained that he had read in some newspaper a Ben-Gurion's order that he be found and caught. For eight days, while the Israelis were waiting for the El Al plane that was to carry them and their prisoner to Israel, Eichmann was tied to a bed, 
which was the only aspect of the whole affair that he complained about, and on the second day of his captivity he was asked to state in writing that he had no objection to being tried by an Israeli court. The statement was, of course, already prepared, and all he was supposed to do was to copy it. To everybody's surprise, however, he insisted on writing his own text, for which, as can be seen from the following lines, he probably used the first sentences of the prepared statement. I, the undersigned Adolf Eichmann, hereby declare out of my own free will that since now my true identity has been revealed, I see clearly that it is useless to try and escape judgment any longer. I hereby express my readiness to travel to Israel to face a court of judgment, an authorized court of law. It is clear and understood that I shall be given legal advice. Thus far he probably copied. And I shall try to write down the facts of my last years of public activities in Germany without any embellishments, in order that future generations will have a true picture. This declaration I declare out of my own free will, not for promises given and not because of threats. I wish to be at peace with myself at last. Since I cannot remember all the details, and since I seem to mix up facts, I request assistance by putting at my disposal documents and affidavits to help me in my effort to seek the truth. Signed, Adolf Eichmann, Buenos Aires, May 1960. This document, though doubtless genuine, has one peculiarity. Its date omits the day it was signed. The omission gives rise to the suspicion that the letter was written not in Argentina but in Jerusalem, where Eichmann arrived on May 22. The letter was needed less for the trial, during which the prosecution did submit it as evidence, but without attaching much importance to it, than for Israel's first explanatory official note to the Argentine government, to which it was duly attached. Servatius, who asked Eichmann about the letter in court, did not mention the peculiarity of the date, and Eichmann could not very well mention it himself, since upon being asked a leading question by his lawyer, he confirmed, though somewhat reluctantly, that he had given the statement under duress while tied to the bed in the Buenos Aires suburb. The prosecutor, who may have known better, did not cross-examine him on this point. Clearly, the less said about this matter, the better. Mrs. Eichmann had notified the Argentine police of her husband's disappearance, but without revealing his identity, so no check of railway stations, highways and airfields was made. The Israelis were lucky. They would never have been able to spirit Eichmann out of the country ten days after his capture if the police had been properly alerted. Eichmann provided two reasons for his astounding cooperation with the trial authorities. Even the judges, who insisted that Eichmann was simply a liar, had to admit that they knew no answer to the question, why did the accused confess before Superintendent Less to a number of incriminating details of which, on the face of it, there could be no proof but for his confession, in particular to his journeys to the East, where he saw the atrocities with his own eyes? In Argentina, years before his capture, he had written how tired he was of his anonymity, and the more he read about himself, the more tired he must have become. His second explanation, given in Israel, was more dramatic. About a year and a half ago, that is in the spring of 1959, I heard from an acquaintance who had just returned from a trip to Germany that a certain feeling of guilt had seized some sections of German youth, and the fact of this guilt complex was for me as much of a landmark as, let us say, the landing of the first man-bearing rocket on the moon. It became an essential point of my inner life, around which many thoughts crystallized. This was why I did not escape, when I knew the search commander was closing in on me. After these conversations about the guilt feeling among young people in Germany, which made such a deep impression on me, I felt I no longer had the right to disappear. This is also why I offered, in a written statement at the beginning of this examination, to hang myself in public. I wanted to do my part in lifting the burden of guilt from German youth, for these young people are, after all, innocent of the events and of the acts of their fathers during the last war, which, incidentally, he was still calling in another context, a war forced upon the German Reich. Of course, all this was empty talk, or prevented him from returning to Germany of his own free will to give himself up. He was asked this question, and he replied that, in his opinion, German courts still lacked the objectivity needed for dealing with people like him. 
But if he did prefer to be tried by an Israeli court, as he somehow implied, and which was just barely possible, he could have spared the Israeli government much time and trouble. We have seen before that this kind of talk gave him feelings of elation, and indeed it kept him in something approaching good spirit throughout his stay in the Israeli prison. It even enabled him to look upon death with remarkable equanimity. I know that the death sentence is in store for me, he declared at the beginning of the police examination. There was some truth behind the empty talk, and the truth emerged quite clearly when the question of his defence was put to him. For obvious reasons, the Israeli government had decided to admit a foreign counsellor, and on July 14, 1960, six weeks after the police examination had started, with Eichmann's explicit consent, he was informed that there were three possible counsellors among whom he might choose in arranging his defence— Dr. Robert Servatius, who is recommended by his family. Servatius had offered his services in a long-distance call to Eichmann's stepbrother in Linz. Another German lawyer, now residing in Chile, and an American law firm in New York, which had contacted the trial authorities. Only Dr. Servatius's name was divulged. There might, of course, be other possibilities which Eichmann was entitled to explore, and he was told repeatedly that he could take his time. He did nothing of the sort, but said, on the spur of the moment, that he would like to retain Dr. Servatius, since he seemed to be an acquaintance of his stepbrother, and also had defended other war criminals, and he insisted on signing the necessary papers immediately. Half an hour later it occurred to him that the trial could assume global dimensions, that it might become a monster process, that there were several attorneys for the prosecution, and that Servatius alone would hardly be able to digest all the material. He was reminded that Servatius, in a letter asking for power of attorney, had said that he would lead a group of attorneys. He never did. And the police officer added, It must be assumed that Dr. Servatius won't appear alone. That would be a physical impossibility. But Dr. Servatius, as it turned out, appeared quite alone most of the time. The result of all this was that Eichmann became the chief assistant to his own defense counsel and quite apart from writing books for future generations, worked very hard throughout the trial. On June 29, 1961, ten weeks after the opening of the trial on April 11, the prosecution rested its case, and Dr. Servatius opened the case for the defence. On August 14, after 114 sessions, the main proceedings came to an end. The court then adjourned for four months and reassembled on December 11 to pronounce judgment. For two days, divided into five sessions, the three judges read the 244 sections of the judgment. Dropping the prosecution's charge of conspiracy, which would have made him a chief war criminal, automatically responsible for everything which had to do with the final solution, they convicted Eichmann on all 15 counts of the indictment, although he was acquitted on some particulars. Together with others, he had committed crimes against the Jewish people, that is, crimes against Jews with intent to destroy the people, on four counts. One, by causing the killing of millions of Jews. Two, by placing millions of Jews under conditions which were likely to lead to their physical destruction. Three, by causing serious bodily and mental harm to them. And four, by directing that births be banned and pregnancies interrupted among Jewish women in Theresienstadt but they acquitted him of any such charges bearing on the period prior to August 1941, when he was informed of the Führer's order. In his earlier activities in Berlin, Vienna and Prague, he had no intention to destroy the Jewish people. These were the first four counts of the indictment. Counts 5 through 12 dealt with crimes against humanity, a strange concept in the Israeli law, inasmuch as it included both genocide, if practiced against non-Jewish people, such as the Gypsies or the Poles, and all other crimes, including murder, committed against either Jews or non-Jews, provided that these crimes were not committed with intent to destroy the people as a whole. Hence, everything Eichmann had done prior to the Führer's order, and all his acts against non-Jews, were lumped together as crimes against humanity to which were added, once again, all his later crimes against Jews, since these were ordinary crimes as well. The result was that Count Five convicted him of the same crimes enumerated in Counts One and Two, and that Count Six convicted him of having persecuted Jews on racial, religious, and political grounds. 
Count seven dealt with the plunder of property linked with the murder of these Jews, and Count eight summed up all these deeds again as war crimes since most of them had been committed during the war. Counts nine through twelve dealt with crimes against non-Jews. Count nine convicted him of the expulsion of hundreds and thousands of Poles from their homes, Count ten of the expulsion of 14,000 Slovenes from Yugoslavia, Count eleven of the deportation of scores of thousands of gypsies to Auschwitz. But the judgment held that it has not been proved before us that the accused knew that the gypsies were being transported to destruction, which meant that no genocide charge except the crime against the Jewish people was brought. This was difficult to understand, for apart from the fact that the extermination of gypsies was common knowledge, Eichmann had admitted during the police examination that he knew of it. He'd remembered vaguely that this had been an order from Himmler, that no directives had existed for gypsies as they existed for Jews, and that there had been no research done on the gypsy problem, origins, customs, habits, organization, folklore, economy. His department had been commissioned to undertake the evacuation of 30,000 gypsies from Reich territory, and he could not remember the details very well because there had been no intervention from any side. But the gypsies, like Jews, were shipped off to be exterminated. He had never doubted. He was guilty of their extermination in exactly the same way he was guilty of the extermination of the Jews. Count 12 concerned the deportation of 93 children from Lidice, the Czech village whose inhabitants had been massacred after the assassination of Heydrich. He was, however, rightly acquitted of the murder of these children. The last three counts charged him with membership in three of the four organizations that the Nuremberg trials had classified as criminal. The SS, the Security Service, or SD, and the Secret State Police, or Gestapo. The fourth such organization, the leadership core of the National Socialist Party, was not mentioned because Eichmann obviously had not been one of the party leaders. His membership in them prior to May 1940 fell under the statute of limitations, 20 years, for minor offences. The law of 1950 under which Eichmann was tried specifies that there is no statute of limitation for major offences and that the argument raised judicata shall not avail. A person can be tried in Israel even if he has already been tried abroad, whether before an international tribunal or a tribunal of a foreign state, for the same offence. All crimes enumerated under counts 1 through 12 carried the death penalty. Eichmann, it will be remembered, had steadfastly insisted that he was guilty only of aiding and abetting in the commission of the crimes with which he was charged, that he himself had never committed an overt act. The judgment, to one's great relief, in a way recognized that the prosecution had not succeeded in proving him wrong on this point, for it was an important point. It touched upon the very essence of this crime, which was no ordinary crime, and the very nature of this criminal, who was no common criminal. By implication, it also took cognizance of the weird fact that, in the death camps, it was usually the inmates and the victims who had actually wielded the fatal instrument with their own hands. What the judgment had to say on this point was more than correct, it was the truth. Expressing his activities in terms of Section 23 of our Criminal Code Ordinance, we should say that they were mainly those of a person soliciting by giving counsel or advice to others, and of one who enabled or aided others in the criminal act. But in such an enormous and complicated crime as the one we are now considering, wherein many people participated on various levels and in various modes of activity, the planners, the organizers, and those executing the deeds according to their various ranks, there is not much point in using the ordinary concepts of counseling and soliciting to commit a crime. For these crimes were committed en masse, not only in regard to the number of victims, but also in regard to the numbers of those who perpetrated the crime and the extent to which any one of the many criminals was close to or remote from the actual killer of the victim means nothing as far as the measure of his responsibility is concerned. On the contrary, in general, the degree of responsibility increases as we draw further away from the man who uses the fatal instrument with his own hands. What followed the reading of the judgment was routine. Once more, the prosecution rose to make a rather lengthy speech demanding the death penalty, which in the absence of mitigating circumstances was mandatory, 
and Dr. Servatius replied even more briefly than before. The accused had carried out acts of state. What had happened to him might happen in future to anyone. The whole civilized world faced this problem. Eichmann was a scapegoat, whom the present German government had abandoned to the court in Jerusalem, contrary to international law, in order to clear itself of responsibility. The competence of the court, never recognized by Dr. Servatius, could be construed only as trying the accused in a representative capacity as representing the legal powers vested in a German court, as indeed one German state prosecutor had formulated the task of Jerusalem. Dr. Zervatius had argued earlier that the court must acquit the defendant, because according to the Argentine Statute of Limitations, he had ceased to be liable to criminal proceedings against him on May 7, 1960, a very short time before the abduction. He now argued, in the same vein, that no death penalty could be pronounced because capital punishment had been abolished unconditionally in Germany. Then came Eichmann's last statement. His hopes for justice were disappointed. The court had not believed him, though he had always done his best to tell the truth. The court did not understand him. He had never been a Jew-hater, and he had never willed the murder of human beings. His guilt came from his obedience, and obedience is praised as a virtue. His virtue had been abused by the Nazi leaders, but he was not one of the ruling clique. He was a victim, and only the leaders deserved punishment. He did not go quite as far as many of the other low-ranking war criminals, who complained bitterly that they'd been told never to worry about responsibilities and that they were now unable to call those responsible to account because these had escaped and deserted them by committing suicide or by having been hanged. I am not the monster I am made out to be. Eichmann said. I am the victim of a fallacy. He did not use the word scapegoat, but he confirmed what Servatius had said. It was his profound conviction that he must suffer for the acts of others. After two more days, on Friday, December 15, 1961, at nine o'clock in the morning, the death sentence was pronounced. Three months later, on March 22, 1962, review proceedings were opened before the Court of Appeal, Israel's Supreme Court, before five judges presided over by Itzhak Olson. Mr. Hausner appeared again with four assistants for the prosecution and Dr. Servatius with none for the defense. Counsel for the defense repeated all the old arguments against the competence of the Israeli court, and since all his efforts to persuade the West German government to start extradition proceedings had been in vain, he now demanded that Israel offer extradition. He had brought with him a new list of witnesses, but there was not a single one among them who could conceivably have produced anything resembling new evidence. He had included in the list Dr. Hans Globke, whom Eichmann had never seen in his life, and of whom he had probably heard for the first time in Jerusalem, and even more startling, Dr. Chaim Weizmann, who had been dead for ten years. The plaidoyer was an incredible hodgepodge, full of errors— in one instance, the defense offered as new evidence the French translation of a document that had already been submitted by the prosecution. In two other cases, it had simply misread the documents, and so on. Its carelessness contrasted vividly with the rather careful introduction of certain remarks that were bound to be offensive to the court. Gassing was again a medical matter. A Jewish court had no right to sit in judgment over the fate of the children from Lidice, since they were not Jewish. Israeli legal procedure ran counter to continental procedure, to which Eichmann, because of his national origin, was entitled, in that it required the defendant to provide the evidence for his defense, and this the accused had been unable to do because neither witnesses nor defense documents were available in Israel. In short, the trial had been unfair, the judgment unjust. The proceedings before the Court of Appeal lasted only a week, after which the court adjourned for two months. On May 29, 1962, the second judgment was read, somewhat less voluminous than the first, but still 51 single-spaced legal-sized pages. It ostensibly confirmed the district court on all points, and to make this confirmation, the judges would not have needed two months and 51 pages. The judgment of the Court of Appeal was actually a revision of the judgment of the lower court, although it did not say so. In conspicuous contrast to the original judgment, it was now found that the appellant had received no superior orders at all. He was his own superior, and he gave all orders in matters that concerned Jewish affairs. He had, moreover, eclipsed in importance all his superiors, including Muller. 
and in reply to the obvious argument of the defence that the Jews would have been no better off had Eichmann never existed, the judges now stated that the idea of the final solution would never have assumed the infernal forms of the flayed skin and tortured flesh of millions of Jews without the fanatical zeal and the unquenchable bloodthirst of the appellant and his accomplices. Israel's Supreme Court had not only accepted the arguments of the prosecution, it had adopted its very language. The same day, May 29, Itzhak ben Svi, President of Israel, received Eichmann's plea for mercy. Four handwritten pages made upon instructions of my counsel, together with letters from his wife and his family in Linz. The President also received hundreds of letters and telegrams from all over the world, pleading for clemency. Outstanding among the senders were the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the representative body of Reform Judaism in this country, and a group of professors from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, headed by Martin Buber, who had been opposed to the trial from the start, and who now tried to persuade Ben-Gurion to intervene for clemency. Mr. Ben Svi rejected all pleas for mercy on May 31, two days after the Supreme Court had delivered its judgment. And a few hours later on that same day, it was a Thursday, shortly before midnight, Eichmann was hanged, his body was cremated, and the ashes were scattered in the Mediterranean outside Israeli waters. The speed with which the death sentence was carried out was extraordinary, even if one takes into account that Thursday night was the last possible occasion before the following Monday, since Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are all religious holidays for one or another of the three denominations in the country. The execution took place less than two hours after Eichmann was informed of the rejection of his plea for mercy. There had not even been time for a last meal. The explanation may well be found in two last-minute attempts Dr. Servatius made to save his client— an application to a court in West Germany to force the government to demand Eichmann's extradition, even now, and a threat to invoke Article 25 of the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Neither Dr. Servatius nor his assistant was in Israel when Eichmann's plea was rejected, and the Israeli government probably wanted to close the case, which had been going on for two years, before the defense could even apply for a stay in the date of execution. The death sentence had been expected, and there was hardly anyone to quarrel with it. But things were altogether different when it was learned that the Israelis had carried it out. The protests were short-lived, but they were widespread, and they were voiced by people of influence and prestige. The most common argument was that Eichmann's deeds defied the possibility of human punishment, that it was pointless to impose the death sentence for crimes of such magnitude, which of course was true, in a sense— except that it could not conceivably mean that he who had murdered millions should, for this very reason, escape punishment. On a considerably lower level, the death sentence was called unimaginative, and very imaginative alternatives were proposed forthwith. Eichmann should have spent the rest of his life at hard labor in the arid stretches of the Negev, helping with his sweat to reclaim the Jewish homeland. A punishment he would probably not have survived for more than a single day— to say nothing of the fact that in Israel, the desert of the South is hardly looked upon as a penal colony. Or, in Madison Avenue style, Israel should have reached divine heights, rising above the understandable legal, political, and even human considerations, by calling together all those who took part in the capture, trial, and sentencing to a public ceremony, with Eichmann there in shackles, and with television cameras and radio to decorate them as the heroes of the century. Martin Buber called the execution a mistake of historical dimensions, as it might serve to expiate the guilt felt by many young persons in Germany. An argument that oddly echoed Eichmann's own ideas on the matter, though Buber hardly knew that he had wanted to hang himself in public in order to lift the burden of guilt from the shoulders of German youngsters. It is strange that Buber, a man not only of eminence but of very great intelligence, should not see how spurious these much-publicized guilt feelings necessarily are. It is quite gratifying to feel guilty if you haven't done anything wrong. How noble! Whereas it is rather hard, and certainly depressing, to admit guilt and to repent. The youth of Germany is surrounded, on all sides and in all walks of life, by men in positions of authority and in public office who are very guilty indeed, but who feel nothing of the sort. The normal reaction to this state of affairs should be indignation, but indignation would be quite risky, 
Not a danger to life and limb, but definitely a handicap in a career. Those young German men and women who every once in a while, on the occasion of all the diary of Anne Frank hubbub and of the Eichmann trial, treat us to hysterical outbreaks of guilt feelings, are not staggering under the burden of the past, their father's guilt. Rather, they are trying to escape from the pressure of very present and actual problems into a cheap sentimentality. Professor Buber went on to say that he felt no pity at all for Eichmann, because he could feel pity only for those whose actions I understand in my heart. And he stressed what he had said many years ago in Germany, that he had, only in a formal sense, a common humanity with those who took part in the acts of the Third Reich. This lofty attitude was, of course, more of a luxury than those who had to try Eichmann could afford— since the law presupposes precisely that we have a common humanity with those whom we accuse and judge and condemn. As far as I know, Buber was the only philosopher to go on public record on the subject of Eichmann's execution. Shortly before the trial started, Karl Jaspers had given a radio interview in Basel, later published in Der Monat, in which he argued the case for an international tribunal. It was disappointing to find him dodging, on the highest possible level, the very problem Eichmann and his deeds had posed. Least of all was heard from those who were against the death penalty on principle, unconditionally. Their arguments would have remained valid, since they would not have needed to specify them for this particular case. They seemed to have felt, rightly, I think, that this was not a very promising case on which to fight. Adolf Eichmann went to the gallows with great dignity. He had asked for a bottle of red wine and had drunk half of it. He refused the help of the Protestant minister, the Reverend William Hull, who offered to read the Bible with him. He had only two more hours to live and therefore no time to waste. He walked the fifty yards from his cell to the execution chamber, calm and erect, with his hands bound behind him. When the guards tied his ankles and knees, he asked them to loosen the bond so that he could stand straight. I don't need that, he said, when the black hood was offered him. He was in complete command of himself. Nay, he was more. He was completely himself. Nothing could have demonstrated this more convincingly than the grotesque silliness of his last words. He began by stating emphatically that he was a Gottglaubiger, to express in common Nazi fashion that he was no Christian and did not believe in life after death. He then proceeded, After a short while, gentlemen, we shall all meet again. Such is the fate of all men. Long live Germany, long live Argentina, long live Austria. I shall not forget them. In the face of death he had found the cliché used in funeral oratory. Under the gallows his memory played him the last trick. He was elated, and he forgot that this was his own funeral. It was as though in those last minutes he was summing up the lesson that this long course in human wickedness had taught us, the lesson of the fearsome, word-and-thought-defying banality of evil. Epilogue The irregularities and abnormalities of the trial in Jerusalem were so many, so varied and of such legal complexity, that they overshadowed during the trial, as they have in the surprisingly small amount of post-trial literature, the central moral, political and even legal problems that the trial inevitably posed. Israel herself, through the pre-trial statements of Prime Minister Ben-Gurion and through the way the accusation was framed by the prosecutor, confused the issues further by listing a great number of purposes the trial was supposed to achieve, all of which were ulterior purposes with respect to the law and to courtroom procedure. The purpose of a trial is to render justice, and nothing else. Even the noblest of ulterior purposes— the making of a record of the Hitler regime which would withstand the test of history, as Robert G. Storey, executive trial counsel at Nuremberg, formulated the supposed higher aims of the Nuremberg trials, can only detract from the law's main business, to weigh the charges brought against the accused, to render judgment, and to mete out due punishment. The judgment in the Eichmann case, whose first two sections were written in reply to the higher purpose theory, as it was expounded both inside and outside the courtroom, could not have been clearer in this respect and more to the point. All attempts to widen the range of the trial had to be resisted, because the court could not allow itself to be enticed into provinces which are outside its sphere. The judicial process has ways of its own, which are laid down by law and which do not change whatever the subject of the trial may be. 
The court, moreover, could not overstep these limits without ending in complete failure. Not only does it have at its disposal the tools required for the investigation of general questions, it speaks with an authority whose very weight depends upon its limitation. No one has made us judges of matters outside the realm of law, and no greater weight is to be attached to our opinion on them than to that of any person devoting study and thought to them. Hence to the question most commonly asked about the Eichmann trial, what good does it do, there is but one possible answer. It will do justice. The objections raised against the Eichmann trial were of three kinds. First, there were those objections that had been raised against the Nuremberg trials and were now repeated. Eichmann was tried under a retroactive law and appeared in the court of the victors. Second, there were those objections that applied only to the Jerusalem court, in that they questioned either its competence as such or its failure to take into account the act of kidnapping. And finally, and most important, there were objections to the charge itself that Eichmann had committed crimes against the Jewish people instead of against humanity, and hence to the law under which he was tried. And this objection led to the logical conclusion that the only proper court to try these crimes was an international tribunal. The court's reply to the first set of objections was simple. The Nuremberg trials were cited in Jerusalem as valid precedent, and acting under municipal law, the judges could hardly have done otherwise, since the Nazis and Nazi collaborators' punishment law of 1950 was itself based on this precedent. This particular legislation, the judgment pointed out, is totally different from any other legislation usual in criminal codes, and the reason for its difference lies in the nature of the crimes it deals with. Its retroactivity, one may add, violates only formally, not substantially, the principle nullum crimen nulla poena sine lege, since this applies meaningfully only to acts known to the legislator. If a crime unknown before, such as genocide, suddenly makes its appearance, justice itself demands a judgment according to a new law. In the case of Nuremberg, this new law was the Charter, the London Agreement of 1945. In the case of Israel, it was the Law of 1950. The question is not whether these laws were retroactive, which of course they had to be, but whether they were adequate. That is, whether they applied only to crimes previously unknown. This prerequisite for retroactive legislation had been seriously marred in the charter that provided for the establishment of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, and it may be for this reason that the discussion of these matters has remained somewhat confused. The charter accorded jurisdiction over three sorts of crimes, crimes against peace, which the tribunal called the supreme international crime, in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Of these, only the last, the crime against humanity, was new and unprecedented. Aggressive warfare is at least as old as recorded history, and while it had been denounced as criminal many times before, it had never been recognized as such in any formal sense. None of the current justifications of the Nuremberg Court's jurisdiction over this matter has much to commend it. It is true that Wilhelm II had been cited before a tribunal of the Allied powers after the First World War, but the crime the former German Kaiser had been charged with was not war, but breach of treaties, and specifically the violation of Belgium's neutrality. It is also true that the briand kellogg Pact of August 1928 had ruled out war as an instrument of national policy, but the pact contained neither a criterion of aggression nor a mention of sanctions, quite apart from the fact that the security system that the pact was meant to bring about had collapsed prior to the outbreak of war. Moreover, one of the judging countries, namely Soviet Russia, was open to the tu quoque argument. Hadn't the Russians attacked Finland and divided Poland in 1939 with complete impunity? War crimes, on the other hand, surely no more unprecedented than the crimes against peace, were covered by international law. The Hague and Geneva Conventions had defined these violations of the laws or customs of war. They consisted chiefly of ill-treatment of prisoners and of warlike acts against civilian populations. No new law with retroactive force was needed here, and the main difficulty at Nuremberg 
lay in the indisputable fact that here again the two quoque argument applied. Russia, which had never signed the Hay Convention, Italy, incidentally, had not ratified it either, was more than suspected of mistreatment of prisoners, and according to recent investigations, the Russians also seemed to be responsible for the murder of 15,000 Polish officers, whose bodies were found at Katyn Forest in the neighborhood of, of Smolensk in Russia. Worse, the saturation bombing of open cities and, above all, the dropping of atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki clearly constituted war crimes in the sense of the Hague Convention. And while the bombing of German cities had been provoked by the enemy, by the bombing of London and Coventry and Rotterdam, the same cannot be said of the use of an entirely new and overwhelmingly powerful weapon whose existence could have been announced and demonstrated in many other ways. To be sure, the most obvious reason that the violations of the Hague Convention committed by the Allies were never even discussed in legal terms was that the international military tribunals were international in name only, that they were, in fact, the courts of the victors, and the authority of their judgment, doubtful in any case, was not enhanced when the coalition that had won the war and then undertaken this joint enterprise broke up, to quote Otto Kirchheimer, before the ink on the Nuremberg judgments had time to dry. But this most obvious reason is neither the only nor perhaps the most potent reason that no allied war crimes, in the sense of the Hague Convention, were cited and prosecuted. And it is only fair to add that the Nuremberg Tribunal was at least very cautious about convicting the German defendants on charges that were open to the two quoque argument. For the truth of the matter was that by the end of the Second World War, everybody knew that technical developments in the instruments of violence had made the adoption of criminal warfare inevitable. It was precisely the distinction between soldier and civilian, between army and home population, between military targets and open cities, upon which the Hague Convention's definitions of war crimes rested, that had become obsolete. Hence it was felt that under these new conditions war crimes were only those outside all military necessities where a deliberate, inhuman purpose could be demonstrated. This factor of gratuitous brutality was a valid criterion for determining what, under the circumstances, constituted a war crime. It was not valid for, but was unfortunately introduced into the fumbling definitions of, the only entirely new crime, the crime against humanity, which the Charter, in Article 6c, defined as an inhuman act, as though this crime too were a matter of criminal excess in the pursuit of war and victory. However, it was by no means this sort of well-known offence that had prompted the Allies to declare, in the words of Churchill, that punishment of war criminals was one of the principal war aims. But on the contrary, reports of unheard-of atrocities, the blotting out of whole peoples, the clearance of whole regions of their native population. That is, not only crimes that no conception of military necessity could sustain, but crimes that were in fact independent of the war and that announced a policy of systematic murder to be continued in time of peace. This crime was indeed not covered by international or municipal law, and moreover it was the only crime to which the two quoque argument did not apply. And yet there was no other crime in the face of which the Nuremberg judges felt so uncomfortable and which they left in a more tantalizing state of ambiguity. It is perfectly true that, in the words of the French judge at Nuremberg, Donadieu de Fabre, to whom we owe one of the best analyses of the trial, Le Procès de Nuremberg, 1947, the category of crimes against humanity which the Charter had let enter by a very small door evaporated by virtue of the tribunal's judgment. The judges, however, were as little consistent as the Charter itself, for although they preferred to convict, as Kirchheimer says, on the war crime charge, which embraced all the traditional common crimes, while underemphasizing as much as possible the charges of crimes against humanity, when it came to pronouncing sentence, they revealed their true sentiment by meeting out their most severe punishment, the death penalty, only to those who had been found guilty of those quite uncommon atrocities that actually constituted a crime against humanity or as the French prosecutor François de Monton called it with greater accuracy, a crime against the human status. The notion that aggression is the supreme international crime was silently abandoned 
when a number of men were sentenced to death who had never been convicted of a conspiracy against peace. In justification of the Eichmann trial, it has frequently been maintained that although the greatest crime committed during the last war had been against the Jews, the Jews had been only bystanders in Nuremberg, and the judgment of the Jerusalem court made the point that now, for the first time, the Jewish catastrophe occupied the central place in the court proceedings, and that it was this fact which distinguished this trial from those which preceded it at Nuremberg and elsewhere. But this is at best a half-truth. It was precisely the Jewish catastrophe that prompted the Allies to conceive of a crime against humanity in the first place, because, Julius Stone has written in Legal Controls of International Conflict, 1954, the mass murder of the Jews, if they were Germany's own nationals, could only be reached by the humanity count. And what had prevented the Nuremberg Tribunal from doing full justice to this crime was not that its victims were Jews, but that the Charter demanded that this crime, which had so little to do with war, that its commission actually conflicted with and hindered the war's conduct, was to be tied up with the other crimes. How deeply the Nuremberg judges were aware of the outrage perpetrated against the Jews may perhaps best be gauged by the fact that the only defendant to be condemned to death on a crime against humanity charge alone was Julius Streicher, whose specialty had been anti-Semitic obscenities. In this instance, the judges disregarded all other considerations. What distinguished the trial in Jerusalem from those that preceded it was not that the Jewish people now occupied the central place. In this respect, on the contrary, the trial resembled the post-war trials in Poland and Hungary, in Yugoslavia and Greece, in Soviet Russia and France, in short, in all formerly Nazi-occupied countries. The International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg had been established for war criminals whose crimes could not be localized. All others were delivered to the countries where they had committed their crimes. Only the major war criminals had acted without territorial limitations, and Eichmann certainly was not one of them. This, and not as was frequently maintained his disappearance, was the reason he was not accused at Nuremberg. Martin Bormann, for instance, was accused, tried, and condemned to death in absentia. If Eichmann's activities had spread all over occupied Europe, this was so not because he was so important that territorial limits did not apply to him, but because it was in the nature of his task, the collection and deportation of all Jews, that he and his men had to roam the continent. It was the territorial dispersion of the Jews that made the crime against them an international concern, in the limited legal sense of the Nuremberg Charter. Once the Jews had a territory of their own, the state in Israel— they obviously had as much right to sit in judgment on the crimes committed against their people as the Poles had to judge crimes committed in Poland. All objections raised against the Jerusalem trial on the ground of the principle of territorial jurisdiction were legalistic in the extreme, and although the court spent a number of sessions discussing all these objections, they were actually of no great relevance. It was not the slightest doubt that Jews had been killed, qua Jews, irrespective of their nationalities at the time, and though it is true that the Nazis killed many Jews who had chosen to deny their ethnic origin and would perhaps have preferred to be killed as Frenchmen or as Germans, justice could be done, even in these cases, only if one took the intent and the purpose of the criminals into account. Equally unfounded, I think, was the even more frequent argument against the possible partiality of Jewish judges, that they, especially if they were citizens of a Jewish state, were judging in their own cause. It is difficult to see how the Jewish judges differed in this respect from their colleagues in any of the other successor trials, where Polish judges pronounced sentence for crimes against the Polish people, or Czech judges sat in judgment on what had happened in Prague and in Bratislava. Mr. Hausner, in the last of his articles in the Saturday Evening Post, unwittingly added new fuel to this argument. He said that the prosecution realized at once that Eichmann could not be defended by an Israeli lawyer because there would be a conflict between professional duties and national emotions. Well, this conflict constituted the gist of all the objections to Jewish judges, and Mr. Hausner's argument in their favor that a judge may hate the crime and yet be fair to the criminal applies to the defense counsel as well. The lawyer who defends a murderer does not defend murder. 
The truth of the matter is that pressures outside the courtroom made it inadvisable, to put it mildly, to charge an Israeli citizen with a defense of Eichmann. Finally, the argument that no Jewish state had existed at the time when the crime was committed is surely so formalistic, so out of tune with reality and with all demands that justice must be done, that we may safely leave it to the learned debates of the experts. In the interest of justice, as distinguished from the concern with certain procedures which, important in its own right, can never be permitted to overrule justice, the law's chief concern, the court, to justify its competence, would have needed to invoke neither the principle of passive personality, that the victims were Jews and that only Israel was entitled to speak in their names, nor the principle of universal jurisdiction, applying to Eichmann, because he was hostis generis humani, the rules that are applicable to piracy. Both theories, discussed at length inside and outside the Jerusalem courtroom, actually blurred the issues and obscured the obvious similarity between the Jerusalem trial and the trials that had preceded it in other countries, where special legislation had likewise been enacted to ensure the punishment of the Nazis or their collaborators. The passive personality principle, which in Jerusalem was based upon the learned opinion of P. N. Drost in Crime of State, 1959, that under certain circumstances the forum patriae victimae may be competent to try the case, unfortunately implies that criminal proceedings are initiated by the government in the name of the victims, who are assumed to have a right to revenge. This was indeed the position of the prosecution, and Mr. Hausner opened his address with the following words. When I stand before you, judges of Israel, in this court to accuse Adolf Eichmann, I do not stand alone. Here with me at this moment stand six million prosecutors, but alas, they cannot rise to level the finger of accusation in the direction of the glass dock and cry out, J'accuse, against the man who sits there. Their blood cries to heaven, but their voice cannot be heard. Thus it falls to me to be their mouthpiece and to deliver the heinous accusation in their name. With such rhetoric, the prosecution gave substance to the chief argument against the trial, that it was established not in order to satisfy the demands of justice, but to still the victim's desire for, and perhaps right to, vengeance. Criminal proceedings, since they are mandatory, and thus initiated even if the victim would prefer to forgive and forget, rest on laws whose essence, to quote Telford Taylor, writing in the New York Times magazine, is that a crime is not committed only against the victim, but primarily against the community whose law is violated. The wrongdoer is brought to justice because his act has disturbed and gravely endangered the community as a whole, and not because, as in civil suits, damage has been done to individuals who are entitled to reparation. The reparation effected in criminal cases is of an altogether different nature. It is the body politic itself that stands in need of being repaired, and it is the general public order that has been thrown out of gear and must be restored, as it were, it is, in other words, the law, not the plaintiff, that must prevail. Even less justifiable than the prosecution's effort to rest its case on the passive personality principle was the inclination of the court to claim competence in the name of universal jurisdiction, for it was in flagrant conflict with the conduct of the trial as well as with the law under which Eichmann was tried. The principle of universal jurisdiction, it was said, was applicable because crimes against humanity are similar to the old crime of piracy, and who commits them has become, like the pirate in traditional international law, hostis humani generis. Eichmann, however, was accused chiefly of crimes against the Jewish people, and his capture, which the theory of universal jurisdiction was meant to excuse, was certainly not due to his also having committed crimes against humanity, but exclusively to his role in the final solution of the Jewish problem. Yet even if Israel had kidnapped Eichmann solely because he was hostis humani generis, and not because he was hostis judeorum, it would have been difficult to justify the legality of his arrest. The pirate's exception to the territorial principle, which in the absence of an international penal code remains the only valid legal principle, is made not because he is the enemy of all, and hence can be judged by all, but because his crime is committed on the high seas, and the high seas are no man's land. The pirate, moreover, in defiance of all law, acknowledging obedience to no flag whatsoever, 
H. Seisel, Britannica Book of the Year, 1962, is by definition in business entirely for himself. He is an outlaw because he has chosen to put himself outside all organized communities, and it is for this reason that he has become the enemy of all alike. Surely no one will maintain that Eichmann was in business for himself, or that he acknowledged obedience to no flag whatsoever. In this respect, the piracy theory served only to dodge one of the fundamental problems posed by crimes of this kind, namely that they were and could only be committed under a criminal law and by a criminal state. The analogy between genocide and piracy is not new, and it is therefore of some importance to note that the Genocide Convention, whose resolutions were adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on December 9, 1948, expressly rejected the claim to universal jurisdiction and provided instead that persons charged with genocide shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the states in the territory of which the act was committed or by such international penal tribunal as may have jurisdiction. In accordance with this convention, of which Israel was a signatory, the court should have either sought to establish an international tribunal or tried to reformulate the territorial principle in such a way that it applied to Israel. Both alternatives lay definitely within the realm of possibility and within the court's competence. The possibility of establishing an international tribunal was cursorily dismissed by the court, for reasons which we shall discuss later. But the reason no meaningful redefinition of the territorial principle was sought, so that the court finally claimed jurisdiction on the ground of all three principles, territorial as well as passive personality and universal jurisdiction, as though merely adding together three entirely different legal principles would result in a valid claim, was certainly closely connected with the extreme reluctance of all concerned to break fresh ground and act without precedence. Israel could easily have claimed territorial jurisdiction if she'd only explained that territory, as the law understands it, is a political and a legal concept, and not merely a geographical term. It relates not so much, and not primarily, to a piece of land, as to the space between individuals in a group whose members are bound to, and at the same time separated and protected from each other, by all kinds of relationships based on a common language, religion, a common history, customs, and laws. Such relationships become spatially manifest, insofar as they themselves constitute the space wherein the different members of a group relate to and have intercourse with each other. No state of Israel would ever have come into being if the Jewish people had not created and maintained its own specific in-between space throughout the long centuries of dispersion, that is, prior to the seizure of its old territory. The court, however, never rose to the challenge of the unprecedented, not even in regard to the unprecedented nature of the origins of the Israel state, which certainly was closest to its heart and thought. Instead, it buried the proceedings under a flood of precedents, during the sessions of the first week of the trial, to which the first fifty-three sections of the judgment correspond, many of which sounded, at least to the layman's ear, like elaborate sophisms. The Eichmann trial, then, was in actual fact no more, but also no less, than the last of the numerous successor trials which followed the Nuremberg trials. And the indictment quite properly carried in an appendix the official interpretation of the law of 1950 by Pincus Rosen, then Minister of Justice, which could not be clearer and less equivocal. While other peoples passed suitable legislation for the punishment of the Nazis and their collaborators soon after the end of the war, and some even before it was over, the Jewish people had no political authority to bring the Nazi criminals and their collaborators to justice until the establishment of the state. Hence the Eichmann trial differed from the successor trials only in one respect. The defendant had not been duly arrested and extradited to Israel. On the contrary, a clear violation of international law had been committed in order to bring him to justice. We mentioned before that only Eichmann's de facto statelessness enabled Israel to get away with kidnapping him and it is understandable that despite the innumerable precedents cited in Jerusalem to justify the act of kidnapping, the only relevant one, the capture of Bertolt Jacob, a leftist German-Jewish journalist in Switzerland by Gestapo agents in 1935, was never mentioned. None of the other precedents applied because they invariably concerned a fugitive from justice 
who was brought back not only to the place of his crimes, but to a court that had issued, or could have issued, a valid warrant of arrest, conditions that Israel could not have fulfilled. In this instance, Israel had indeed violated the territorial principle, whose great significance lies in the fact that the earth is inhabited by many peoples, and that these peoples are ruled by many different laws, so that every extension of one's territory's law, beyond the borders and limitations of its validity, will bring it into immediate conflict with the law of another territory. This, unhappily, was the only almost unprecedented feature in the whole Eichmann trial, and certainly it was the least entitled ever to become a valid precedent. What are we going to say if tomorrow it occurs to some African state to send its agents into Mississippi and to kidnap one of the leaders of the segregationist movement there? And what are we going to reply if a court in Ghana or the Congo quotes the Eichmann case as a precedent? Its justification was the unprecedentedness of the crime and the coming into existence of a Jewish state. There were, moreover, important mitigating circumstances in that there hardly existed a true alternative if one indeed wished to bring Eichmann to justice. Argentina had an impressive record for not extraditing Nazi criminals. Even if there had been an extradition treaty between Israel and Argentina, an extradition request would almost certainly not have been honoured. Nor would it have helped to hand Eichmann over to the Argentine police for extradition to West Germany for the Bonn government had earlier sought extradition from Argentina of such well-known Nazi criminals as Karl Klingenfuss and Dr. Josef Mengele, the latter implicated in the most horrifying medical experiments at Auschwitz and in charge of the selection, without any success. In the case of Eichmann, such a request would have been doubly hopeless, since according to Argentine law, all offences connected with the last war had fallen under the statute of limitation fifteen years after the end of the war, so that after May 7, 1960, Eichmann could not have been legally extradited anyway. In short, the realm of legality offered no alternative to kidnapping. Those who are convinced that justice, and nothing else, is the end of law, will be inclined to condone the Kidnapping Act, though not because of precedence, but, on the contrary, as a desperate, unprecedented, and no-precedent-setting act, necessitated by the unsatisfactory condition of international law. In this perspective, there existed but one real alternative to what Israel had done. Instead of capturing Eichmann and flying him to Israel, the Israeli agents could have killed him right then and there in the streets of Buenos Aires. This course of action was frequently mentioned in the debates on the case, and somewhat oddly was recommended most fervently by those who were most shocked by the kidnapping. The notion was not without merit, because the facts of the case were beyond dispute, but those who proposed it forgot that he who takes the law into his own hands will render a service to justice only if he is willing to transform the situation in such a way that the law can again operate and his act can, at least posthumously, be validated. Two precedents in the recent past come immediately to mind. There was the case of Shalom Schwarzbad, who in Paris on May 25, 1926, shot and killed Simon Petliura, former hetman of the Ukrainian armies and responsible for the pogroms during the Russian Civil War that claimed about a 100,000 victims between 1917 and 1920. And there was the case of the Armenian Telerian, who in 1921, in the middle of Berlin, shot to death Talat Bey, the great killer in the Armenian pogroms of 1915, in which it is estimated that a third, 600,000, of the Armenian population in Turkey was massacred. The point is that neither of these assassins were satisfied with killing his criminal, but that both immediately gave themselves up to the police and insisted on being tried. Each used his trial to show the world through court procedure what crimes against his people had been committed and gone unpunished. In the Schwarzbad trial, especially, methods very similar to those in the Eichmann trial were used. There was the same stress on extensive documentation of the crimes, but that time it was prepared for the defence by the Comité des Délégations Juives under the chairmanship of the late Dr. Leo Motzkin, which needed a year and a half to collect the material, and then published it in Les Pogroms en Ukraine sous les gouvernements ukrainiens, 1917-1920, published in 1927. Just as that time, it was the accused and his lawyer who spoke in the name of the victims, 
and who, incidentally, even then raised the point about the Jews who had never defended themselves. Both men were acquitted, and in both cases it was felt that their gesture signified that their race had finally decided to defend itself, to leave behind its moral abdication, to overcome its resignation in the face of insults, as Georges Suarez admiringly put it in the case of Shalom Schwarzbard. The advantages of this solution to the problem of legalities that stand in the way of justice are obvious. The trial, it is true, is again a show trial, and even a show. But its hero, the one in the centre of the play on whom all eyes are fastened, is now the true hero, while at the same time the trial character of the proceedings is safeguarded, because it is not a spectacle with prearranged results, but contains that element of irreducible risk— which, according to Kirschheimer, is an indispensable factor in all criminal trials. Also, the jacques, so indispensable from the viewpoint of the victim, sounds, of course, much more convincing in the mouth of a man who has been forced to take the law into his own hands than in the voice of a government-appointed agent who risks nothing. And yet, quite apart from practical considerations, such as that Buenos Aires in the 60s hardly offers either the same guarantees or the same publicity for the defendant that Paris and Berlin offered in the 20s, it is more than doubtful that this solution would have been justifiable in Eichmann's case, and it is obvious that it would have been altogether unjustifiable if carried out by government agents. The point in favour of Schwarzbad and Tillerian was that each was a member of an ethnic group that did not possess its own state and legal system, that there was no tribunal in the world to which either group could have brought its victims. Schwarzbad, who died in 1938, more than ten years before the proclamation of the Jewish state, was not a Zionist and not a nationalist of any sort. But there is no doubt that he would have welcomed the state of Israel enthusiastically, for no other reason than that it would have provided a tribunal for crimes that had so often gone unpunished. His sense of justice would have been satisfied. And when we read the letter he addressed from his prison in Paris to his brothers and sisters in Odessa, Faites savoir dans les villes et dans les villages de Bolta, Proscuro, Tcherkas, Oumon, Jitomir, portez-y le message édifiant, la colère juive a tiré sa vengeance. Le sang de l'assassin Petliura, qui a jailli dans la ville mondiale à Paris, rappellera le crime féroce commise envers le pauvre et abandonné peuple juif. We recognize immediately, not perhaps the language that Mr. Hausner actually spoke during the trial, Shalom Schwarzbad's language was infinitely more dignified and more moving, but certainly the sentiments and the state of mind of Jews all over the world to which it was bound to appeal. I have insisted on the similarities between the Schwarzbad trial in 1927 in Paris and the Eichmann trial in 1961 in Jerusalem, because they demonstrate how little Israel, like the Jewish people in general, was prepared to recognize in the crimes that Eichmann was accused of an unprecedented crime, and precisely how difficult such a recognition must have been for the Jewish people. In the eyes of the Jews, thinking exclusively in terms of their own history, the catastrophe that had befallen them under Hitler, in which a third of the people perished, appeared not as the most recent of crimes, the unprecedented crime of genocide, but on the contrary as the oldest crime they knew and remembered. This misunderstanding, almost inevitable if we consider not only the facts of Jewish history, but also, and more important, the current Jewish historical self-understanding, is actually at the root of all the failures and shortcomings of the Jerusalem trial. None of the participants ever arrived at a clear understanding of the actual horror of Auschwitz, which is of a different nature from all the atrocities of the past, because it appeared to prosecution and judges alike as not much more than the most horrible pogrom in Jewish history. They therefore believed that a direct line existed from the early anti-Semitism of the Nazi party to the Nuremberg Laws, and from there to the expulsion of Jews from the Reich, and finally to the gas chambers. Politically and legally, however, these were crimes different not only in degree of seriousness, but in essence. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 legalized the discrimination practiced before that by the German majority against the Jewish minority. According to international law, it was the privilege of the sovereign German nation to declare to be a national minority whatever part of its population it saw fit, 
as long as its minority laws conformed to the rights and guarantees established by internationally recognized minority treaties and agreements. International Jewish organizations therefore promptly tried to obtain for this newest minority the same rights and guarantees that minorities in Eastern and Southeastern Europe had been granted at Geneva. But even though this protection was not granted, the Nuremberg Laws were generally recognized by other nations as part of German law, so that it was impossible for a German national to enter into a mixed marriage in Holland, for instance. The crime of the Nuremberg Laws was a national crime. It violated national constitutional rights and liberties, but it was of no concern to the Committee of Nations. Enforced emigration, however, or expulsion, which became official policy after 1938, did concern the international community, for the simple reason that those who were expelled appeared at the frontiers of other countries, which were forced either to accept the uninvited guests or to smuggle them into another country, equally unwilling to accept them. Expulsion of nationals, in other words, is already an offence against humanity, if by humanity we understand no more than the comity of nations. Neither the national crime of legalized discrimination, which amounted to persecution by law, nor the international crime of expulsion was unprecedented even in the modern age. Legalized discrimination had been practiced by all Balkan countries, and expulsion on a mass scale had occurred after many revolutions. It was when the Nazi regime declared that the German people not only were unwilling to have any Jews in Germany, but wished to make the entire Jewish people disappear from the face of the earth, that the new crime, the crime against humanity, in the sense of a crime against the human status, or against the very nature of mankind, appeared. Expulsion and genocide, though both are international offences, must remain distinct. The former is an offence against fellow nations, whereas the latter is an attack upon human diversity as such, that is, upon a characteristic of the human status, without which the very words mankind or humanity would be devoid of meaning. Had the court in Jerusalem understood that there were distinctions between discrimination, expulsion, and genocide, it would immediately have become clear that the supreme crime it was confronted with, the physical extermination of the Jewish people, was a crime against humanity, perpetrated upon the body of the Jewish people, and that only the choice of victims, not the nature of the crime, could be derived from the long history of Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. Insofar as the victims were Jews, it was right and proper that a Jewish court should sit in judgment. But insofar as the crime was a crime against humanity, it needed an international tribunal to do justice to it. The failure of the court to draw this distinction was surprising because it had actually been made before by the former Israeli Minister of Justice, Mr. Rosen, who in 1950 had insisted on a distinction between this bill, for crimes against the Jewish people, and the law for the prevention and punishment of genocide, which was discussed but not passed by the Israeli parliament. Obviously, the court felt it had no right to overstep the limits of municipal law, so the genocide not being covered by an Israeli law could not properly enter into its considerations. Among the numerous and highly qualified voices that raised objections to the court in Jerusalem and were in favor of an international tribunal, only one, that of Karl Jaspers, stated clearly and unequivocally in a radio interview held before the trial began and later published in Der Monat, that the crime against the Jews was also a crime against mankind, and that consequently the verdict can be handed down only by a court of justice representing all mankind. Jaspers proposed that the court in Jerusalem, after hearing the factual evidence, waive the right to pass sentence, declaring itself incompetent to do so, because the legal nature of the crime in question was still open to dispute, as was the subsequent question of who would be competent to pass sentence on a crime which had been committed on government orders. Jasper stated further that one thing alone was certain. This crime is both more and less than common murder. And though it was not a war crime, either, there was no doubt that mankind would certainly be destroyed if states were permitted to perpetrate such crimes. Jasper's proposal, which no one in Israel even bothered to discuss, would in this form presumably have been impracticable from a purely technical point of view. The question of a court's jurisdiction must be decided before the trial begins, 
and once a court has been declared competent, it must also pass judgment. However, these purely formalistic objections could easily have been met if Jaspers had called not upon the court, but rather upon the state of Israel to waive its right to carry out the sentence once it had been handed down in view of the unprecedented nature of the court's findings. Israel might then have had recourse to the United Nations and demonstrated, with all the evidence at hand, that the need for an international criminal court was imperative in view of these new crimes committed against mankind as a whole. It would then have been in Israel's power to make trouble, to create a wholesome disturbance, by asking again and again just what it should do with this man whom it was holding prisoner. Constant repetition would have impressed on worldwide public opinion the need for a permanent international criminal court. Only by creating in this way an embarrassing situation of concern to the representatives of all nations would it be possible to prevent mankind from setting its mind at ease and massacre of the Jews from becoming a model for crimes to come, perhaps the small scale and quite paltry example of future genocide? The very monstrousness of the events is minimized before a tribunal that represents one nation only. This argument in favor of an international tribunal was unfortunately confused with other proposals based on different and considerably less weighty considerations. Many friends of Israel, both Jews and non-Jews, feared that the trial would harm Israel's prestige and give rise to a reaction against Jews the world over. It was thought that Jews did not have the right to appear as judges in their own case, but could act only as accusers. Israel should therefore hold Eichmann prisoner until a special tribunal could be created by the United Nations to judge him. Quite apart from the fact that Israel, in the proceedings against Eichmann, was doing no more than what all the countries which had been occupied by Germany had long since done, and that justice was at stake here, not the prestige of Israel or of the Jewish people, all these proposals had one flaw in common. They could too easily be countered by Israel. They were indeed quite unrealistic, in view of the fact that the UN General Assembly had twice rejected proposals to consider the establishment of a permanent international criminal court, ADL Bulletin. But another more practical proposition, which usually is not mentioned, precisely because it was feasible, was made by Dr. Nahum Goldman, President of the World Jewish Congress. Goldman called upon Ben-Gurion to set up an international court in Jerusalem, with judges from each of the countries that had suffered under Nazi occupation. This would not have been enough. It would have been only an enlargement of the successor trials, and the chief impairment of justice, that it was being rendered in the court of the victors, would not have been cured, but it would have been a practical step in the right direction. Israel as may be remembered, reacted against all these proposals with great violence. And while it is true, as has been pointed out by Yosel Rogat in the Eichmann Trial and the Rule of Law, published by the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, Santa Barbara, California, 1962, that Ben-Gurion always seemed to misunderstand completely when asked why should he not be tried before an international court. It is also true that those who asked the question did not understand that for Israel the only unprecedented feature of the trial was that for the first time since the year 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, Jews were able to sit in judgment on crimes committed against their own people, that for the first time they did not need to appeal to others for protection and justice or fall back upon the compromised phraseology of the rights of man, rights which, as no one knew better than they, were claimed only by people who were too weak to defend their rights of Englishmen and to enforce their own laws. The very fact that Israel had her own law under which such a trial could be held had been called, long before the Eichmann trial, an expression of a revolutionary transformation that has taken place in the political position of the Jewish people by Mr. Rosen on the occasion of the first reading of the law of 1950 in the Nesset. It was against the background of these very vivid experiences and aspirations that Ben-Gurion said, Israel does not need the protection of an international court. Moreover, the argument that the crime against the Jewish people was first of all a crime against mankind, upon which the valid proposals for an international tribunal rested, stood in flagrant contradiction to the law under which Eichmann was tried. 
Hence, those who proposed that Israel give up her prisoners should have gone one step further and declared, the Nazis and Nazi collaborators' punishment law of 1950 is wrong. It is in contradiction to what actually happened. It does not cover the facts. And this would indeed have been quite true. For just as a murderer is prosecuted because he has violated the law of the community and not because he has deprived the Smith family of its husband, father and breadwinner, so these modern state-employed mass murderers must be prosecuted because they violated the order of mankind and not because they killed millions of people. Nothing is more pernicious to an understanding of these new crimes or stands more in the way of the emergence of an international penal code that could take care of them and the common illusion that the crime of murder and the crime of genocide are essentially the same, and that the latter, therefore, is no new crime, properly speaking. The point of the latter is that an altogether different order is broken, and an altogether different community is violated. And indeed, it was because Ben-Gurion knew quite well that the whole discussion actually concerned the validity of the Israeli law, that he finally reacted nastily, and not just with violence, against the critics of Israeli procedures. Whatever these so-called experts had to say, their arguments were sophisms, inspired either by anti-Semitism or, in the case of Jews, by inferiority complexes. Let the world understand we shall not give up our prisoner. It is only fair to say that this was by no means the tone in which the trial was conducted in Jerusalem but I think it is safe to predict that this last of the successor trials will no more, and perhaps even less than its predecessors, serve as a valid precedent for future trials of such crimes. This might be of little import in view of the fact that its main purpose, to prosecute and to defend, to judge and to punish Adolf Eichmann, was achieved, if it were not for the rather uncomfortable but hardly deniable possibility that similar crimes may be committed in the future. The reasons for this sinister potentiality are general as well as particular. It is in the very nature of things human that every act that has once made its appearance and has been recorded in the history of mankind stays with mankind as a potentiality long after its actuality has become a thing of the past. No punishment has ever possessed enough power of deterrence to prevent the commission of crimes. On the contrary, Whatever the punishment, once a specific crime has appeared for the first time, its reappearance is more likely than its initial emergence could ever have been. The particular reasons that speak for the possibility of a repetition of the crimes committed by the Nazis are even more plausible. The frightening coincidence of the modern population explosion with the discovery of technical devices that, through automation, will make large sections of the population superfluous, even in terms of labour, and that through nuclear energy make it possible to deal with this twofold threat by the use of instruments, beside which Hitler's gassing installations look like an evil child's fumbling toys, should be enough to make us tremble. It is essentially for this reason that the unprecedented, once it has appeared, may become a precedent for the future, that all trials touching upon crimes against humanity must be judged according to a standard that is today still an ideal. If genocide is an actual possibility of the future, then no people on earth, least of all, of course, the Jewish people, in Israel or elsewhere, can feel reasonably sure of its continued existence without the help and the protection of international law. Success or failure in dealing with the hitherto unprecedented can lie only in the extent to which this dealing may serve as a valid precedent on the road to international penal law. And this demand, addressed to the judges in such trials, does not overshoot the mark and ask for more than can reasonably be expected. International law, Justice Jackson pointed out at Nuremberg, is an outgrowth of treaties and agreements between nations and of accepted customs. Yet every custom has its origin in some single act. Our own day has the right to institute customs and to conclude agreements that will themselves become sources of a newer and strengthened international law. What Justice Jackson failed to point out is that in consequence of this yet unfinished nature of international law, it has become the task of ordinary trial judges to render justice without the help of or beyond the limitations set upon them through positive, positive laws. For the judge, this may be a predicament, 
and he is only too likely to protest that the single act demanded of him is not his to perform, but is the business of the legislator. And indeed, before we come to any conclusion about the success or failure of the Jerusalem court, we must stress the judge's firm belief that they had no right to become legislators, that they had to conduct their business within the limits of Israeli law on the one side and of accepted legal opinion on the other. It must be admitted, furthermore, that their failures were neither in kind nor in degree greater than the failures of the Nuremberg trials or the successor trials in other European countries. On the contrary, part of the failure of the Jerusalem court was due to its all-too-eager adherence to the Nuremberg precedent wherever possible. In sum, the failure of the Jerusalem court consisted in its not coming to grips with three fundamental issues, all of which have been sufficiently well known and widely discussed since the establishment of the Nuremberg Tribunal. The problem of impaired justice in the court of the victors, a valid definition of the crime against humanity, and a clear recognition of the new criminal who commits this crime. As to the first of these, justice was more seriously impaired in Jerusalem than it was at Nuremberg, because the court did not admit witnesses for the defence. In terms of the traditional requirements for fair and due process of law, this was the most serious flaw in the Jerusalem proceedings. Moreover, while judgment in the court of the victors was perhaps inevitable at the close of the war, to Justice Jackson's argument in Nuremberg, either the victors must judge the vanquished or we must leave the defeated to judge themselves, should be added the understandable feeling on the part of the Allies that they, who had risked everything, could not admit neutrals. It was not the same sixteen years later, and under circumstances in which the argument against the admission of neutral countries did not make sense. As to the second issue, the findings of the Jerusalem court were incomparably better than those at Nuremberg. I've mentioned before the Nuremberg Charter's definition of crimes against humanity as inhuman acts, which were translated into German as Verbrechen gegen die Menschlichkeit, as though the Nazis had simply been lacking in human kindness, certainly the understatement of the century. To be sure, had the conduct of the Jerusalem trial depended entirely upon the prosecution, the basic misunderstanding would have been even worse than at Nuremberg. But the judgment refused to let the basic character of the crime be swallowed up in a flood of atrocities, and it did not fall into the trap of equating this crime with ordinary war crimes. What had been mentioned at Nuremberg only occasionally, and as it were marginally, that the evidence shows that the mass murders and cruelties were not committed solely for the purpose of stamping out opposition, but were part of a plan to get rid of whole native populations— was in the centre of the Jerusalem proceedings, for the obvious reason that Eichmann stood accused of a crime against the Jewish people, a crime that could not be explained by any utilitarian purpose. Jews had been murdered all over Europe, not only in the East, and their annihilation was not due to any desire to gain territory that could be used for colonisation by Germans. It was the great advantage of a trial centred on the crime against the Jewish people that not only did the difference between war crimes, such as shooting of partisans and killing of hostages, and inhuman acts, such as expulsion and annihilation of native populations to permit colonization by an invader, emerge with sufficient clarity to become part of a future international penal code, but also that the difference between inhuman acts, which were undertaken for some known though criminal purpose such as expansion through colonization, and the crime against humanity, whose intent and purpose were unprecedented, was clarified. At no point, however, either in the proceedings or in the judgment, did the Jerusalem trial ever mention even the possibility that extermination of whole ethnic groups, the Jews or the Poles or the Gypsies, might be more than a crime against the Jewish or the Polish or the Gypsy people, that the international order and mankind in its entirety might have been grievously hurt and endangered. Closely connected with this failure was the conspicuous helplessness the judges experienced when they were confronted with the task they could least escape, the task of understanding the criminal whom they had come to judge. Clearly it was not enough that they did not follow the prosecution in its obviously mistaken description of the accused as a perverted sadist, nor would it have been enough if they had gone one step further and shown the inconsistency of the case for the prosecution, in which Mr. Hausner wanted to try the most abnormal monster the world had ever seen, 
and at the same time try in him many like him, even the whole Nazi movement and anti-Semitism at large. They knew, of course, that it would have been very comforting indeed to believe that Eichmann was a monster, even though if he had been, Israel's case against him would have collapsed or, at the very least, lost all interest. Surely one could hardly call upon the whole world and gather correspondence from the four corners of the earth in order to display Bluebeard in the dock. The trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him, and that the many were neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were and still are terribly and terrifyingly normal. From the viewpoint of our legal institutions and of our moral standards of judgment, this normality was much more terrifying than all the atrocities put together, for it implied, as has been said at Nuremberg over and over again by the defendants and their counsels, that this new type of criminal, who is in actual fact hostis generis humani, commits his crimes under circumstances that make it well-nigh impossible for him to know or to feel that he is doing wrong. In this respect, the evidence in the Eichmann case was even more convincing than the evidence presented in the trial of the major war criminals, whose pleas of a clear conscience could be dismissed more easily because they combined with the argument of obedience to superior orders various boasts about occasional disobedience. But although the bad faith of the defendants was manifest, the only ground on which guilty conscience could actually be proved was the fact that the Nazis, and especially the criminal organizations to which Eichmann belonged, had been so very busy destroying the evidence of their crimes during the last months of the war. And this ground was rather shaky. It proved no more than recognition that the law of mass murder, because of its novelty, was not yet accepted by other nations. Or, in the language of the Nazis, that they had lost their fight to liberate mankind from the rule of subhumans, especially from the domination of the elders of Zion. Or, in ordinary language, it proved no more than the admission of defeat. Would any one of them have suffered from a guilty conscience if they had won? Foremost among the larger issues at stake in the Eichmann trial was the assumption current in all modern legal systems that intent to do wrong is necessary for the commission of a crime. On nothing, perhaps, has civilized jurisprudence prided itself more than on this taking into account of the subjective factor. Where this intent is absent, where, for whatever reasons, even reasons of moral insanity, the ability to distinguish between right and wrong is impaired, we feel no crime has been committed. We refuse and consider as barbaric the propositions that a great crime offends nature, so that the very earth cries out for vengeance, that evil violates a natural harmony which only retribution can restore, that a wronged collectivity owes a duty to the moral order to punish the criminal. Yosal Rogat. And yet I think it is undeniable that it was precisely on the ground of these long-forgotten propositions that Eichmann was brought to justice to begin with, and that they were in fact the supreme justification for the death penalty. Because he had been implicated and had played a central role in an enterprise whose open purpose was to eliminate forever certain races from the surface of the earth, he had to be eliminated. And if it is true that justice must not only be done but must be seen to be done, then the justice of what was done in Jerusalem would have emerged to be seen by all if the judges had dared to address their defendant in something like the following terms. You admitted that the crime committed against the Jewish people during the war was the greatest crime in recorded history, and you admitted your role in it. But you said you'd never acted from base motives, that you'd never had any inclination to kill anybody, that you'd never hated Jews, and still that you could not have acted otherwise and that you did not feel guilty. We find this difficult, though not altogether impossible, to believe. There is some, though not very much, evidence against you in this matter of motivation and conscience that could be proved beyond reasonable doubt. You also said that your role in the final solution was an accident, and that almost anybody could have taken your place so that potentially almost all Germans are equally guilty. What you meant to say was that where all or almost all are guilty, nobody is. This is an indeed quite common conclusion, but one we are not willing to grant you. And if you don't understand our objection, we would recommend to your attention the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, two neighboring cities in the Bible which were destroyed by fire from heaven because all the people in them had become equally guilty. 
This, incidentally, has nothing to do with the newfangled notion of collective guilt, according to which people supposedly are guilty of or feel guilty about things done in their name but not by them, things in which they did not participate and from which they did not profit. In other words, guilt and innocence before the law are of an objective nature, and even if 80 million Germans had done as you did, this would not have been an excuse for you. Luckily, we don't have to go that far. You yourself claimed not the actuality, but only the potentiality of equal guilt on the part of all who lived in a state whose main political purpose had become the commission of unheard-of crimes. And no matter through what accidents of exterior or interior circumstances you were pushed onto the road of becoming a criminal, there is an abyss between the actuality of what you did and the potentiality of what others might have done. We are concerned here only with what you did, and not with the possible non-criminal nature of your inner life and of your motives, or with the criminal potentialities of those around you. You told your story in terms of a hard luck story, and knowing the circumstances, we are up to a point willing to grant you that under more favourable circumstances, it is highly unlikely that you would ever have come before us or before any other criminal court. Let us assume for the sake of argument that it was nothing more than misfortune that made you a willing instrument in the organisation of mass murder. There still remains the fact that you have carried out, and therefore actively supported, a policy of mass murder. For politics is not like the nursery. In politics, obedience and support are the same. And just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people and the people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should and who should not inhabit the world. We find that no one, that is, no member of the human race, can be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason, and the only reason, you must hang. This concludes Eichmann in Jerusalem. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.